if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And welcome to the Before Earth movie, where I am putting all, together all five episodes of the Before Earth playlist into one massive movie so you can see them all in one area. And if you have any questions for our follow-up show on June 22nd, please put them in the comments below and we will try to answer them as best as we can. Thank you for coming and enjoy the movie. Just do it. It'll turn out okay. And welcome to, to the first episode of our currently five-part mini-series for the Earth. Well, we talk about the the structure of the universe. What what happened in the fourteen ten in the tennis billion years before before the Earth decided to crunch together rocks and become uh, become a sphere. With me are three guests today. From the uh, bottom, starting with the starting with the bottom left, introduce yourselves. Okay, I guess I'm the bottom left. Um, hi, hello, hello. My name is Landon Ol. I am an astronomer, uh, and as they say, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on your time zone and latitude, because those two things matter. Um, and I hope you're doing well, and I hope you enjoy this exploration of what I consider uh, our favorite universe. Awesome, yeah, hi, I'm uh, I'm Tapioca Weasel. I'm, I also go by Vandy. Uh, I'm an atomic physicist, so I'm not an astronomer or anything. Um, and yeah, I'm just here to get the opportunity to ask Landon a lot of questions. <laughs> Oh, hello. I uh, I go by the name of Nestlec 20, but you can call me Ness uh, for short. And I'm uh, here to be, I will be happy to hear uh, or to learn about the earliest instances of the cosmos. Very curious. All right. And with that out of the way, Landon, start your introduction. Start your so the big topic of this thing is the Big Bang model. And and by the way, you're talking about atomic physics. Um, we'll be doing a bunch of the, uh, the atomic physics stuff in BE1, which we're going to talk about some of the early fractions of a, of a, of a, of a second, things that we can somewhat simulate in, in accelerators, but but somewhat are beyond our, 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 our reach. Um, BE2 is going to be talking about the, form, you know, the first sort of million years or so, depending on how much time we have. Uh, pun intended, of the uh, of the Big Bang process, and the E three is going to be formation of those large structures of the of the universe with galaxies and and star evolution, and the E four is going to be talking more specifically about the formation of solar systems. I'm a planetary scientist, so I'm I get excited about planets uh, mostly, but but that's just that's just my 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 topic, but. The, the, we're going to talk about the Big Bang model, and I'm going to try to use language um, carefully. I, 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 I have, you know, find in the background who would, would would yell at me if I'm using terms which are are he would call cringe worthy, right? So, so one of the things in particular, what is the Big Bang model? It's a model that the universe started in a or or, or the early universe, I should say, not started. But the, that the universe early on was in a hot, dense state, and it changed from that, and that the Big Bang model is part of the change even to the present day. Uh, the Big Bang 
is is model is, is a model. Um, I know that's not the it's not the show. Uh, in fact, the Big Bang Theory I think is is probably a, a misnomer, but that's a that's a not to be confused with not to, not to be confused with the TV series. Yeah. So 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 it's not the show. It's not the K-pop thing. We're talking about the mo it's a model that cosmo you know, the, the astronomers the people in cosmology talk about about how the, the universe is is transforming. And, and one thing in particular is that the Big Bang model um, does not describe the cause of the Big Bang process. It does not really even address what might have happened before the Big Bang model started, um, even if it, even if it's reasonably even talk about that before. The, the other thing is that the Big Bang model is is the, the term Big Bang um, was was a, a term used by um, astronomer named Hoyle, who was a proponent of the competing model at the time, the steady state model of the universe. And he did it on a, on a, on a radio show, and he, he called the other model, the big model, Big Bang as a pejorative. But, but the name was kind of catchy and stuck, and, and it, uh, it's there. It, it probably is not the best name for the model, right? Um, I, I like uh, what, what Dr. Tyson calls it. He says the main event, right? Think about the Big Bang model is the main event of the cosmos. Um, it's important also to know that the Big Bang is not an explosion. Um, it didn't. It's not a point in time. It's not a a, a place, right? It's a process. And the the, the, the fundamental thing, and this started off with a, with a with a physicist named Elmetri, who using what was around 1927, using Einstein's field equations, looked and applied Einstein's general general relativity to the cosmos, and 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 the the, 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 the the equations, what the equations imply, and 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 along with something that Hubble had observed, which is that the universe was was expanding. And Hubble had had used um, uh, various people's um, observations as well as his own to kind of show that the universe was was expanding and Lemaitre came up with a model that says you know if the universe is expanding if you run it backwards you know run the film backwards um it must the universe must have at some point been a very hot dense uh in a hot dense state and if that's the case how did it get from a hot dense state to now and that's the Big Bang model. It's a process. Um, it's it's important also to understand there's not an explosion. Will um, the Big Bang is a is a is yeah yeah space right where you said a lot of people, especially uh, let's call them creationists, call it explosions and make fun of that. Have you ever had to deal with why you see yours about your subject? Yeah, so though it's not very interesting, I and mean, it's it's sort of like you know if if someone came in and said my um, my view of of chemistry is there's four elements and and you know earth, fire, water, air, and that's it, mm -hmm. and, and ethers. And I would say, well, that's a nice thing, but I'm not interested, right? <laughs> and and so that's usually um, there. The, the, the Big Bang model has an enormous amount of evidence supporting it. It's not just some wild ass thing that someone pulled out of their rear. Um, it has enormous amounts of of uh, observation and data and experiments to back it up. And and in fact, it there, there are very good reasons why the steady state model was dis discarded. Steady state was this notion that the that the universe is infinite. It's been there all the time, all the place, and that and then and at steady state people, when we found the the space was expanding. They sort of said, "Well, what's happening is is matter is being constantly created, so that so that the the the, the universe is basically filling in in these spots." And this is obviously not what's happening now. Um, which is one reason why the Big Bang model was was adopted as sort of became preeminent because of experiments, observations backing it up. I know one of the best analogies that I have seen is like uh, somebody uh, grabbing a a balloon. And uh, drawing with a uh, 
a, pe a pencil or like a, uh, or something like a, like a throwing dots on the balloon and then and then blowing the balloon up and you see that every every single dot is uh, like moving away from each other uh, at equal distance and, th and that's basically the analogy of how, what what yeah. happens with the big bang uh, it's it's not like the balloon is not exploding it's just expanding yeah. of course the yeah. rate of, of course the rate of expansion is different at different times yeah and that's a good that, that there's some some good things on, on an analogy of course one thing we we'll always have to be careful of is analogies are 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 give you hints of what happened they're not the thing um and so so one other thing in particular is that is that the the in the big bang model space if you will the grid of space time um is is undergoing expansion um and but what i think in particular is that if you were to pick some point in the big bang model you have a a horizon that you can observe we're assuming that einstein's um process are, are correct and that nothing can no information can 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 transmit faster than c um so so if if you're if you start observing you know one if you're probably one second you have one light second of stuff that you can interact with right your your observation your your observable universe um gets bigger as time goes on because of the way space time works um so so here's here's i think is 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 a key point um the universe underwent change and one of the things that because because you know metric says universe is expanding so the grid think about the graph paper the grid of space is expanding like if you, if you, have, if you have let's get take out a rubber ruler right and and uh you know a rubber ruler meter long because we're not metrically challenged here uh a meter long ruler uh this rubber right and if you stretch it to be twice as big you know the one millimeter marks are now two millimeters wide because you stretched it and and the the one center marks are now two centimeters and the 10 centimeters are now 20 centimeters everything and in fact in fact the farther you go down that rubber ruler the faster that that mark is moving away when it's doubling that's just what that we talk about the space expanding galaxies and things in it which we'll talk about in be uh three i believe um are really kind of staying put respect to the grid of space effectively i mean they're gravitationally orbiting each other but effectively for the large scale universe they're staying to put they're they're going along for the ride as the grid of space is is expanding and the big bang models is really the the implications of what happens when the grid of space is expanding and expanding in weird ways and expanding in unexpected ways but but again lemaitre said einstein's field equations and hubble's observations based on other people's data and his own that the universe is expanding and if you run that movie backwards it must have been the case that the universe was in a very hot dense state um, and this is really what the Big Bang model probably it doesn't say how that came to be. It doesn't talk about before that process might have started, even if it's reasonable to even ask that question. It's about the process the going going forward. And it made predictions. The model made predictions, which have been borne out uh, in countless experiments, both in in in, in high energy physics and in um in in observations so it's a it's a well-supported model um but it's how the universe evolved now, i'm not talking about evolution as in biological evolution i'm talking about how the universe went from a hot a change state yes to change. so to those people who, who say this is one of the six evolution things you're wrong it's not yeah it's it's a thing like i i'm more of a biology person and uh like many like many evolutionary biologists get gets like they they get annoyed when somebody is using uh the word evolution to mean uh <laughs> change or something else of course i won't for I, I i'm not a i i won't uh complain like that if, if somebody else is using a word in a different way than i'm used yeah. to 
yeah. evolve is a perfectly good English word. Yeah. And it has meaning. Yeah. And and in biology, um, it's been extraordinarily well established about the modern theory of evolution in biological systems, right? And I'm not a biologist, but but for you like you, I you, I, I I I do deference to your your experience in that process. As a planetary scientist, I'm interested in in how the universe creates ends up forming planets for which interesting chemistry starts, uh, the physics and stuff. And, and, and at that point I let biology and biologists carry that stuff forward. And, and a lot of my career has been about in astronomy has been about trying to understand that process, trying to understand the, the, um, the big bang model and what it means for planets. And that, that, understanding has evolved get used to the word <laughs> right um, yeah all right so real fast sure. we're on this topic now this is a full-blown theory not a hypothesis or, or fact or guess or anything like that it's a full at this point the big bang is a theory a full theory yeah right? it, it is it is a physical theory um um and and so uh i guess it, and you understand theory we're using it in the scientific term we're not using it in the I, uh, it's a vague guess, right? Theory is something which is the highest level that you can achieve in science um, of something which is falsifiable, something which has, which has been demonstrated time and time again by, by observations made predictions. Those predictions have found to be, to be reasonably correct. Um, the model evolves as well as we understand more details. Everything about the model is not known. There are parts that we're still learning about, we're discovering, right? It's everything is like that. It, there's also like many people also don't realize that many things that even they would accept as uh, like uh, common knowledge, like uh, for example, that you have also a atomic theory, the idea of atoms are a theory too, and also germ theory of disease. Although, of course, there are always those few people who even who even deny those things, unfortunately, as well. But yeah, yeah. Aside, from, aside from that, the uh, th theory in science is very different from what uh, common, uh, like in the common vernacular, how, how it's used. Yeah, and, and we'll get to that history in a minute. But before we move on to the next topic, anything you two have any other, other discussions, uh, questions about the process of the Big Bang? Before we yeah, on? I uh, so so. When I when I talk about it with people, um, and some of the questions I've had myself in the past have been, if if everything is expanding, if if space itself is is getting bigger, um, it, I I don't really know how else to ask it other than how do you know? Because wouldn't doesn't everything just sort of scale? Like, yeah. So so. There's a couple of things, and this is back to you know talking about unfortunately some of the misconceptions yeah. of, of the Big Bang, the Big Bang model. Um because yeah, because it's not true that it, everything does get bigger yeah. like that. <laughs> so, so um you know the easiest or more concise way to talk about it is looking at field equations and so forth, but those are hard to converse about. So we have to jump into analogies understand the analogies like your the balloon analogy has yeah. limitations right so the universe is not a surface of a balloon right uh an example but it's a good analogy the universe is not a rubber uh rubber yeah. balloon. um so so one of the things that, that that is is there is that the that the big bang model um uh assumes that the big bang process um you know, one way is, is to say one one version of the model is that the Big Bang process uh, established space time. Now, I use the word space time, not space and time, but space time. Space time is a very specific thing developed in relativity theory, which is that space and time are kind of inter intertwined; they're not separate things, um, and that that the space it's if you think about the grid of space over time changes. Um, now, one thing in particular is it's not, the, the, the Big Bang is not an explosion in one spot, right? Because along that, along that, that stretching rubber ruler or a dot on the expanding balloon, 
um, there isn't an origin. Everything is 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 moving away from everything else. Um, but the dot on the ruler, or the or the mark, or the dot on the balloon, doesn't move. Right? It stays the same relative to the grid of space. Um, and and it's and it's the it's it the if you will the graph paper is is expanding. If you think about forward dimensional graph paper. So so. If I understand correctly, um, if if you had two small, almost massless, but if they were actually massless, they'd have to be traveling at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. But if, if you had two small test masses very, 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 very far away from each other in a totally yeah. empty region of space that is expanding like the universe is expanding, those two objects could initially start um, and have some distance that you could measure, for example, with an actual physical ruler. And then a million years later, if you measured it again with that same physical ruler, you would need more of the rulers. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, have yeah, moved yeah, apart. Yeah, more grid space, right? To, to yeah, the, exactly. Your ruler has not gotten bigger. Yes. It, it's the separation between those points has gotten bigger, which is why they had to be very small enough to not be gravitationally bound in this example. And, and 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 so um, another thing to consider is that 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 is that you know it's it's an expansion of space, um, and and in that that, uh, but but one of the implications is that um, my galaxies right. Let's mm -hmm. ignore a, a let's let's talk about a cluster of galaxies. Right? Cluster of galaxies yeah. is orbiting each other, and and for all practical purposes, they're just sort of orbiting around a, a center of mass spinning around each other. Um, that spot tends to stay in place unless there's some force causing it to move through the through the cosmos. It tends to be relatively stationary. And it's the grid between galaxies and galaxy clusters more in particular that is that is expanding. Like there's more, there's actually, there's actually there, it's like it's like adding more tick marks between them. Yeah. Um, one of the implications is and and here again, you have to be careful. When when you hear astronomers saying, you know, here is a quasar, and this quasar is 12 billion light years, right? What they're really saying, if they're being pedantically correct, is 12 billion years ago, when light that we're seeing in our now left, the scale of the universe was such that it took 12 billion years for those photons traveling at effectively C to reach us. That's what he mean by saying something is 12 billion light years away, right? Now, in that intervening 12 billion years, the Big Bang process continues and there's now more, more, more tick marks between here and there, right? The photons eventually reach us after 12 billion years because when they left that quasar, the scale was such that it took 12 billion years to reach us. If we take a mirror and reflect those photons and go backwards, um, a couple things might happen. Is that that for, first of all, the the the, the if, if if those photons ever reach that spot, it'll take a lot longer than twelve billion years. Why? Because the universe is expanding. In fact, it may be that those photons never reach, never get back. Right? There, are, uh, we, we, the, 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 there appear based on observation, there are things we can see now. And are now that light left in back then reached us that we can never reach again because because as the universe one of the things that obviously this universe expansion is accelerating the light will never catch up we'll we'll that that, that is that is that it's going to be more space between here and there than light can travel and 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 so so you the other thing you have to so so it is true that mass cannot move through the grid of space at the speed of light or c right it has to go slower than the speed of light but but the grid of space can expand faster than light can travel um there's nothing with relativity that says that the universe the grid can't expand faster than c it's mass can't move through uh, the grid of space um, 
at C and has to go below, and light must move at C and only C, always C, 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 right? Um, C. Um, so, so one of the things as well is that the concept misconception is that the that the expansion of space does permit objects to recede from each other even faster than light. Now, now one of the things in particular to think about is is you say, well, how big is the universe? And they honestly, we don't know. It's the biggest thing I'm aware of. <laughs> yes, it is. It's pretty big. Um, but what we can talk about is the observable horizon, right? The, the, the best estimates based on data and observation is that the Big Bang process has been going on for 13.787 billion years, plus or minus 20 million years. That's 13 billion, 787 million years, it's a long time, plus or minus about 20 million years. That's, that's sort of the error bar. That's a, that's a very, uh, that's a 20 million years, that's, that's a very low model of uh, error of, of, of reflect, whatever that word is, I can't. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good, you know, error estimate. I mean, it started off, we started off uh, much earlier with a much higher um, uh, uh, error bar, right? And, and it, part of the, the golden age of cosmology has been to really nail down that, that uh, error. But right now we're, we're almost about one part in a thousand. I, well, also, fast, that, I guess this is a good top. So we're talking about that. I think it's a good time to move on to the next topic. Uh, yeah, I would just say in passing, um, getting the error bar that small does require, um, I, I, as far as I understand it, uh, sort of restricting yourself to like the Lambda CDM model, which is the best one, but yeah, and, it, it's a work in progress still. <laughs> and and there are, there are other there are other observations that's really called Hubble tension. We can talk yes. about NBE one, where it, you might say that twenty million year um error bar turns about 170 million years so 13.8 plus or minus 170 million years right it, it, it is it, it it's a it's a it's a it's a refinement um and if we find that the number is that instead of being 13.787 is 13.828 um that's just fine right it, it, it's a refinement not a ref refutation the big bang model still is there the universe started off with the universe was in let me I'm sorry to say start off because it's see the bad language. Um, the universe was in a hot, dense state and it transformed into the universe we visibly see today through a process of the Big Bang process. And that that process has been going on for roughly 13.8 billion years. Um, and we'll have refinements of that sort of stuff and details are being done. That's why we don't have all the answers yet, but, but we have answered a lot of the questions all uh, right so sorry next to topic uh when who and when did someone say hey this is this is my this is this is what happened back then here's my hypothesis at the time for him a theory of how this all began i mean and if you go back to through the history of Cosmology, the study of the cosmos. Um, one of the earlier interesting theories is called uh, um, a gentleman by the name of Singer of, of Barbant um, had a thesis he called the Attorney of the World uh, around uh, in the 13th century, um, where he said that there was no first person, there was no first specimen, the universe did not even have a beginning, it's always been eternal and, and, uh, and, and, and infinite in size. Um, and was condemned by the Pope, uh, of course, because the Pope. So this is so this is when we 17, people people oh, thought 17, the Earth was this, people, this is so this is back when people thought the Earth was still the center of everything. Well, that the universe was 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 had 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 is is, is always the, the the same. There's a bit of that stuff, but 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 there was sort of like this the 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 steady state thing. The universe is is, is eternal, didn't have a beginning. Um, you also had people. Um, uh, um, uh, such as the the, the 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 gentleman who was burned at a stake in Rome. His name just escaped my mind. Um, and he had a notion that 
the dots in the sky were actually stars, just like our sun, or objects just like our sun, and that those things had had uh, life on there. And he also was a priest. He said they have salvation, blah, 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 blah. And he was burnt at, at, at the stake um, for his um, heresy as well. Um, and and uh, Giardino Bruni, Bruno is his name. Um, you go to Rome, there's actually a statue in his his honor, uh, sort of apology, sorry to burden you with this. this <laughs> um, and, and, and you had even people like, like even like Newton who acknowledged that he was very found in his thinking about the fact that, that the, the universe did not start on earth, right? That the universe was bigger than the earth, that, that, that was, there, was, there was a bigger thing. And so moving forward, um, you have people, you, know, for, you, you had Einstein, who described um, space time in his special and then general relativity theory using equations of state and, and and basically talking about how mass and how space time are interwoven and warp and do things that are non-intuitive. Um, and there was a, a physicist by the name of Lemaitre that people often like to say he was, he was a Catholic priest, I think because they're trying to apologize for the many crimes that the Catholic Church um, committed um, in, uh, in, in his lifetime. But, but anyway, Lemaitre was one of the people who took Einstein, he was a role physicist, took Einstein's equations, applied them to the universe, and, and suggested that the universe had to be expanding. Why? Because he said, you've got this gravitational field force, and, and if there's nothing else, that, that everything should be collapsing, right? Gravity should be pulling everything together. The time together, that's not happening. Didn't he determine that the universe had to be either collapsing or expanding? And he, uh, he went with expanding. Of, well, I think, and, right? yeah. and beyond that, you know, he also had um, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, who the, the telescope is named after, who um, used uh, used observations to um, to note that that galaxies were receding in general that the farther away the galaxy was the faster it was receding that the, 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 the universe was expanding right and in fact it's called the hubble lemaitre law um that velocities have been determined by their redshift and that and that, that hubble was first of all the first person to take having a telescope like the mount wilson 100 inch telescope to take pictures of stars in other galaxies that these these nebula things were not just gas clouds but were other islands because people at that time thought the Milky Way was our cosmos. These other fuzzy things are not gas clouds in the sky. They're actually their own galaxies. And that he was able to measure the redshift using data that uh, came about by, um, by a gentleman named Alexander Freeman. This happened in, in, in 1922. So by the eventually it came around in 1927, he had the notion of Hubble's thing about, about the universe expanding. And basically said, the universe expanding, run the movie backwards. The universe had to, at some point, be in a hot, dense state. You keep on saying that. What does that mean? Well, um, if, if, if the grid collapses, right, then, then at some point, um, your observable universe, right? What do you mean by observable universe? The, 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 since this Big Bang process has been going on for, let's call it 13.8 billion years, um, it means that, that we're seeing the limit of our observable universe is photons that have traveled 13.8 billion years. We can't see things beyond that limit because the photons, if they're there, haven't arrived to us. Um, we don't know if the universe is infinite or finite. It could be either, and there's good models to talk about it. But but our observable universe um, is is has been expanding for 13.8 billion years. It is not 13.8 billion year light years in radius. Um, the size of the universe has expanded. The, the numbers are probably closer to about 68 billion light years um, um, in terms of, of 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 distance, because the grid of space has been expanding for those 13.8 billion years. Um, so Lemaitre was saying, hey, um, if you run it backwards, the universe was, 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 was that objects in our observable universe had to be, the distance had to be 
smaller and at some point had to be very, very small. Um, now, some people run all the way backwards to zero and say it had to start a singularity. Um, there's problems with singularities. We can talk about it in just a moment. But, but the model just says the early universe started off very high temperature, right? Because, because when you bring stuff together, you're elevating the temperature. And, and also, it, because things were so close to each other, um, things, the temperature were, were normalized, right? That is, if some spot was a little bit hotter than in the spot next to it, the energy would, tr would, 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 would transfer and they would normalize its temperature. So everything was, was in such close proximity space-wise that it was a very, um, we, that, that early universe was in a very uniform, hot, dense state. Well, today the universe is lumpy. How do you get from a hot, dense state to a lumpy state? And this is part of the Big Bang model that explains that process. But let me mention the, the universe today is also very cold, today. right? They start off this way. Go ahead. And the universe, and the universe is also very cold today. Like it's yes. like a, a, almost near absolute zero. Yeah. Most of the universe. Yeah, we're about a two point seven three Kelvin is the average temperature today. Now, when you run the thing backwards, um, temperatures rise. For example, when you reach a point where you're going running the movie backwards, the universe is is at let's say something around five to six thousand degrees Kelvin. I think it's the temperature. Um, you find that that even like hydrogen atoms can no longer stay atomized. That that they that the electron that the, the hydrogen atom, a proton electron um, pair. That, that, that it is so energetic that electron takes off, right? And atom because no of plasma, you get what's called a plasma. Yes. And in fact, one of the things that the Big Bang model implied was you run it backwards. At some point, the universe is such a hot, dense state. There's no atoms. You just have nuclei. You have charged particles, uh, things flying around. Photons can't go anywhere because they get interrupted and reprocessed and so forth. So, so the result is you just get a a a a a plasma soup. If you've ever seen a really hot kiln or a blast furnace, look inside, what you find is that you have no detail, or you just see glow. You just see a fog of stuff at super, super high temperatures. And that's what the universe was. But at some uh, point- it, it, was opaque. it was opaque. You couldn't see through it. It was like, yes. a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And at some point, the universe cooled. Why? Because it's expanding and cooling same amount of stuff now in, in more space and and that that uh, it cools to the point where those lone little protons could grab hold electron with enough oomph to hold together and 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 form neutral hydrogen right um this is this point and we'll talk about this uh in be2 but this is the point where where um the first atoms formed and the photons that were trapped in this plasma went bing, and then we get the Big Bang flash, right? This is one of the one of the predictions of the Big Bang model, which was then confirmed. But but the universe it is called, it is called re recombination, right? Like the moment yeah. when basically all the electrons were confined into the, uh, ne the neutrally charged atoms yeah. of hydrogen and, and helium. And we'll talk about this in BE too. Um, but but yes, but. When, when was um, that idea, I think it was sort of hinted at in, in um, I, I was doing some research on this the other, the other week or month or something. Mm -hmm. And it was my understanding that it was hinted at sort of kind of by a physicist in maybe like 42 or 47 or something, but that it, it wasn't really proposed as like, you, we expect this afterglow um, that, that, it wasn't sort of explicitly predicted until right around the same time that it was dis discovered though. Is, yeah, is my yeah. timeline and, on that and correct? You have, you have people talking about the implications of the Big Bang model um, in the 40s, 50s, even the point of, of 1960, where they were talking about this and, and the competing other model was steady state. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was the other main model at the time. And so there's there a discussion back and forth about this thing again not a debate not a vote because that's not how science does yeah. but people saying well if 
the steady state model is correct, then we should see this. If the Big Bang model is correct, we should see this. And people talk about what's the implications of this model. And one of them came about was the, the, the microwave um, background radiation, um, the CMB, that um, was predicted that the, that the state state model said shouldn't be there, right? Because um, again, why? Because the state state model was the universe is always there, it's infinite, and, 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 and when they say, hey, the universe is expanding, they say, well, okay, there's matter being sponsorly created so that the universe stays nice and and, and normal, um, yeah. which is obviously now not considered to be, be scientific um, or not not scientifically valid. Uh, whereas the the Big Bang model said, running the film backwards, there got to be a point where it was this case. But, but there's other things as well that we get into atomic physics and BE one and, and BE two. Um, so, so how long was it be between when they first proposed the idea to when they Discover when they discovered it, the idea. It Probably depends the, a little. The, the first, I mean, the first, I mean, either people had has sort of the, the big notions of stuff, but the first real scientific physics, here's papers, equations, blah, 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 and justification for this, this model was uh, George Militri in, in 1927. Um, the applications were. People said, "Well, that sounds that's nice, but that's that sounds absurd because because da 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 da, right?" And and back and forth testing of the model, uh, refining the model, and it wasn't really until probably the 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 discovery of the the microarray background, yeah, cosmic microarray background. That was kind of the first time people said, "Oh," and yeah. so 1985, <laughs> excuse me, 1965 is when. Um, Pendens and Wilson, um, they started work in the 1940s, by the way, in, yes, because they were, they were trying to say, Hey, what they're, they're part of the telephone company. And they thought rather than swinging copper wires around the country, if we could just use like light in the form of like micro radiation called microwaves, we could send stuff point to point without wires, um, and, and wireless telephony. And so. They they built things that operate in what's called the microwave part of the spectrum. It's 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 higher frequencies than radio because radio is noisy and, and has all kinds of stuff. It's it's lower frequencies than infrared or light. But they said let's look at the microwave and see if this is useful for 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 building a telephone system. And they kept finding this hiss this noise um, there. And so they tried to say well and so that was. Well, they're saying, well, let's find out where this noise is. What is this noise? And maybe it's a frequency we can we can ignore or move around or so forth. And so they started looking for this noise. And um, but again, it, it, it turns out that was one of the things that that was discovered, um, 1965, that the Big Bang model had predicted. And the predictions were were being discussed in the 1950s to up until about 1960, where they sort of said, yeah, if the Big Bang model is true, then then this should happen, right? And they so, were, but they were sort of in like a sort, sort of like a like an afterthought kind of way. Yeah, they weren't probably they, 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 they <laughs> were the the, and we'll talk about it again in in in, in BE um, too. But but those Bell Lab scientists were about trying to find out um, what the noise, how to limit this noise, so we can use a telephone system with microwave mm -hmm. lines and and and. And so they they were looking for the source of it. And now, yeah, I think you mentioned during our pre-show discussion that it's very similar to the 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 snow on old school old school TVs. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you have a you know if you have a television that has an aerial right an antenna right as opposed to cable or or internet stuff, um, and you tuned it between channels, so you had basically static. You'll see that snow on on a TV. And about fifteen percent of that snow is um, was is, is generated by the Big Bang process. Um, but I have to say, so so that was the the, the, the time kind of experience for it. Um, I, I think again, it's important to to deal with the misconceptions, right? That um, of of stuff. The 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 thing is that the Big Bang did not occur at any one point. The Big Bang 
um, encompasses the universe of all space time as we know it. Um, and that it's beyond the realm of the Big Bang model to, act, to, 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 to describe what gave rise to the Big Bang process. That's outside the model. Um, now, there's, spec there's speculation about that, right? And, and one of the ones that I like probably the, the, the best, because I think it has the best evidence, is the Hartle-Hawking proposal. So if someone says, well, well, what happened before the Big Bang process started? And, and the Hartle-Hawking proposal, the universe has no origin as we would understand it. Um, so that the, that the saying, that the expression, what happened before the Big Bang has no meaning. So what do you mean it has no meaning? You just said it's been going on for 13.8 billion years. What happened with, with 13.8 billion years in a day or whatever the number is, right? Beyond that. Um, and it, 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 the best way to describe it is that, 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 that conditions of space time um, certainly curved in to a dense state, but, that, but to ask what happened before the Big Bang process started may be irrelevant. Sort of like saying, um, you know, when I was walking towards the South Pole, um, mm -hmm. I've been there multiple times, multiple visitor. Sorry, Father Earthers. It really does exist. I've been there many times um, yeah, when, yes. when, when you when you when you when you walk towards the when i walk towards the south pole and identify where it is i live in about a centimeter or so um walk towards it and you ask what's south of the south pole now i've walked through the south pole gone out the other side back and forth back and forth right that's that's but 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 to ask what's south of the south pole is a there isn't anything it's by definition the South Pole is the most south part on the Earth, right? Um, so, like, what, what, ask, so if the Big Bang process creates space time, so space and time are, are um, established as part of the Big Bang process, the time before the Big Bang process started is irrelevant. It doesn't exist. It's like, what's north of the North Pole? What's south of the South Pole? Well, nothing. Um, I, I know that people would like to think that, and this is back to steady state stuff, that, that, that time is eternal, um, but, but that's an assumption. Um, now, there are other ways to cut it. There, there are models beyond the Big Bang, like cosmic cyclic cosmology and thing going back and forth and so forth. But, 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 but the history of the Big Bang process just talked about that you run the movie backwards, you end up with the universe that's that's hot, uniform, and dense. And the physics of that is very weird. Um, um, some of it is non-intuitive, but we can, all that atomic physics and all that high energy nuclear physics stuff gives us insights into some of that early universe. Yeah, as we went on, we, we found out it was much smaller and much younger. First of all, I think, I think sometimes the older ones were like just like 20 billion years ago or something like that and they get they got less more recent thing and then and because, because part of the thing is early on the the rate of expansion was had a lot of error right you've got a dot and a dot two dots and you draw a line and and the, the lines were dots were had error bars so you had lines that could intersect back to the origin in different spots um we had situations where the slope of the line looked like it might be the, the Big Bang process was going on for maybe as short as 10 billion years, right? Some of the lines were on the order of 40 billion years. But at 10 billion years, we had problems because we have stars and clusters that were older than 10 billion years at the time. So we knew something that that line was absurd, right? Um, uh, you can't have things in the universe older than the universe. Uh, um, but but the refinement has occurred in terms of not only the, the length of time the Big Bang process has been going on, but also that that is not a linear line. So you're running the movie backwards. Um, the frame rate, if you will, of the Big Bang process has changed. And that's probably one of the big things that, that, that uh, happened. Because in the, about the 60s, in the 1970s, early 1980s, the debate was, okay, the universe is expanding, but you have gravity. Is the universe decelerating? Where gravity is going to grab a hold of stuff 
um, and and start to pull it back. Even if space is expanding, grab a hold of matter and and force matter back into a big crunch. Right, the universe was you will have closed. The matter would be drawn back into some spot. Or was the universe expanding and open and just keep keep going forward? Remember, by and large, stuff in space stays where it is unless something's pushing on it. Um, and the grid is expanding. But the question is, could gravity grab a hold of stuff and begin to draw it through mm-hmm. through space into a crunch, right? And this open, closed universe, which was debated, it wasn't until the discovery of the accelerating universe um, and what we call dark energy that we realized that both of those concepts were wrong. And to my under astonishment, that the not only the, the, the greater space expanding, but it's getting faster, right? About 5 billion years ago, it appears, gravity lost. It's slowing down grip. And the universe is now beginning to accelerate and getting faster and faster and faster. Um, and and that's that's. Uh, I have <laughs> I, I have heard that uh, like it, the, the galaxies within our local group, like uh, the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, and also a few other smaller galaxies in the local group, they will they have they are gravitationally interacting with each other, such that they will oh, yeah. eventually collide. But all the other galaxies, they will just move away from us. Yeah, because the, the, the grid of space between galaxies in, it, in its own cluster, or even between clusters of galaxies, is is relatively bound together, right? And then things are going to be, gravity is going to hold them together, right? Um, it, it's that uh, typically where you see more of the expansion is between clusters of galaxies, or between clusters of clusters of galaxies in a larger mm-hmm. scale. We'll talk about some of that in BE3, but um, but that's really the, the the essence of it is that that you know Earth Sun distance has been pretty much consistent over most of the uh, life of our solar system. That's not getting bigger, right? You getting bigger is not because of expansion of space. Um, it, it's probably because of you're eating more than you're exercising. That's how you get. It's also the case that the gra- gravity it gets uh, very weak with greater distance, <laughs> but, the, but, the exp- but the expansion of the universe, like it, yeah. it scales with distance. The further you are away, the faster you're moving away, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and so and so in our local ga- cluster of galaxies, they're orbiting each other and moving around in like a little beehive yeah. thing. Um, that gravity has enough binding energy that those things are going to stay pretty much in that, that state spinning around. Um, and it's going to be the distance to the other co- clusters of galaxies that's going to be expanding. And yeah. and that's within a supercluster, and the distance to the other superclusters are expanding. That's 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 where the grid of space is more, more effective. It's also, ve- it's also very sad in place because like if you are thinking about this, like after many, many billions of years later, uh, all the other galaxies will have moved away so far that we, we won't be able to see even their light anymore. So the, the whole universe will, will only be our own galaxy and yeah, no our, other galaxy will be visible. Of so course, by, of be course by then, I don't think we as humans probably won't be, uh, yeah. be humans anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, but, but moving on that, that objects will become more and more redshifted. We're fading away um, yes. in a far future. But But that's but there's many other problems that occur between now and in that spot, as mm-hmm. as, as, as we pointing out. Yes. I, so before we move on, do do either of you have questions about about the about history, his, the, the theory, history of of, of, of this event, uh, how it came to be, uh, as scientists know it? Any questions? Yeah. We're going from Einstein. Uh, no, not for not not regarding the history, but I have a few other questions. But uh, yeah. if if if. if the summary is Einstein's equation, probably the mm-hmm. good place to start. Hubble detecting galaxies, expanding uh, Hubble Lemaitre redshift, uh, Lemaitre proposing the model, um, debate between that model and steady state, observations that, that favor the Big Bang model and not the steady state, um, and then further refinements to even acceleration and discovery of dark energy and on and online, it's kind of the history of, of stuff. Uh, like I, I remember this, like uh, 
that, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Einstein's equations. And I, I believe, if I remember correctly, that Einstein himself didn't believe in like a changing universe. He also believed that the, that the universe was static. So he had to come up with a, with, with a cosmological constant to to maintain the static universe, basically, right? Well, or, well yeah, I mean, I, 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 well, Einstein's um, favored the time that he was pretty good for his general theory of, of relativity. Um, uh, uh, agreed with or, or thought that the state state model is a reasonable model. And his equations, however, suggested that the universe should be collapsing. Gravity should be in, pulling. Intrinsically. And intrinsically, so yeah, the only stable solutions um, are either an expand, before he added the lambda um, cosmological constant, uh, the, the equations are very clear. They tell you it is either expanding or it's contracting. Maybe it can switch between the two, but if it's going to just stick around and chill, you, then you need to add another thing. There, so, there, there, there is no stable, there is no stable state that can be remain the same. Yeah. Basically. There's no yeah. stable You're state. You're balancing both sides of the equation. Yes. Um, and and that and, and but, but but that that so so Einstein at the time, and then that was a predominant um, mm -hmm. assumption at the time. He asked around. We looked, at, we looked at the universe, it seemed to be a pretty steady state. And so the equation must have what we call the fudge factor, right? I know. Now, when Hubble demonstrated the universe was expanding, they said, oh, okay, I don't need the cosmological constant. That's my greatest blunder. Uh, throw it out because the universe is expanding, and that's why the universe is not collapsing. But he didn't realize was in fact <laughs> was wrong, and his greatest blunder was in fact removing the cosmological constant. We now know the cosmological constant is, is, is a fundamental part of the equations of state of the universe. And in fact, it, it's a dominant state. In fact, most of the universe is the, the model, right? But, uh, that, that, like that cosmological constant is representing the, the dark energy, quote unquote, right? Or yes, uh, am I yeah, mistaken? Yes, that? but it's, it's mathematically the same entity. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, now there's different interpretation of that. Yes. And and you're measuring when you begin to, to to measure the expansion of the universe more 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 carefully, you start to get to some some error bars we're trying to resolve. So it's not and and, and the press does this all the time where they sit there and say, oh, new observation throws out, evalidates, blah blah blah. Like no, um, mm -hmm. there are observations with these data points coming in, just like early Big Bang model stuff. You know when you did the Slope of the linear line, you got a 10 billion year old uh, universe and say, yeah, but this cluster is 12 billion years old. Something's wrong. We, we knew there were errors there. We know there's errors yeah. and there's tension in there that we're trying to resolve, but this is the scientific process, right? This is what science does. It's not throwing out stuff. It's not invalidating the Big Bang model. It's refining it. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question about the, like the expanse of the universe. Like, uh, like is 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 every single place in the universe expanding at the same rate, or like a diff like different places that are expanding at different rates? Maybe is that's, a, or that's not? a really good question. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a team led by Adam Rees and Alex Filipinko, uh, a, a, a wonderful professor at, at UC Berkeley, and if you ever have a chance to take one of his courses or go to one of his lectures, um, he you. Go to his lecture, even if you understand the topic, because the way Alex Filipinko explains it is just wonderful. He's, he's a fantastic communicator. Okay. Hey, but anyway, right. back to the yeah. plug. Um, All right. They, 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 they're, they're looking at the refinement to ask questions like, is, is this dark energy, the, the, the supposedly process by which um, uh, the universe is expanding and accelerating, is this dark energy Cons is it consistent in all directions? If we measure dark energy in different directions, do we see the same amount of expansion? Um, is it consistent over time? And so is it constant? These, these and, and, and um, the, the answer so far is it's reasonably consistent to the error we can measure it, but we're trying to get more refined and understand it um, as to whether or not dark energy is there. The, 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 other, the other thing about dark energy is Asking questions in the future will be as strong. Um, you know, um, I must say that, that the dark energy was a big surprise to me. Um, 
In fact, yeah. the dark defined it of almost about 70% of the universe was something we had completely missed, right? Um, dark, dark energy is one of those examples where it, it actually would have been um, reasonable for, for the journalist to publish this maybe doesn't change everything, but it, it, it was a big surprise. Yes. Um, it fits into the framework, um, but it was not, it, 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 but you, I mean, you have to modify yeah. the framework somewhat. Yeah. Cause in the, in the, in the seventies, even in the late seventies, um, I favor, and I favor, I thought the data coming in favored an open universe. Um, what we didn't realize that that was wrong and that the universe is actually is accelerating, right? It's not even neither closed or open. It's actually ripping. Um, now, will it do that forever going forward? Well, it's hard to say because if we don't understand the process now of, of dark energy, it's hard for you to make yeah. a statement about what's going to happen in the future, let alone in the past. But the model, current observation said that around 5 billion years ago, gravity lost it's contraction fight with the expansion of the universe, right? That is, that is it, 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 it dragging it down and that, that this dark energy is, is taking over. Um, now it is as if, but again, this is an analogy, not, not a statement. It is as if space itself is repulsive to itself, that it, that is space repels itself. And that you could argue this is a, this is this is an interpretation that as the as our observable universe is expanding, there's more space, and space is repulsive to itself. So it 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 gets even more and more and more stuff. Right? It, it 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 is it is it is. Now the question is, does that mean it's going to go at some point, you know, accelerating up to to stuff and have a big rip? Um, there's arguments saying no, but this is now way in the, in, way in the weeds of, of theory. I, like I believe the idea of the big rip is that like uh, eventually the universe exp is expanding so fast that not, not, not even the force that binds the atoms will be able to hold, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so there's, the there, there's been some good arguments and papers published saying that, that may not be the case. Now, I understand that, that, that the assumption that dark energy is going to operate the way it is now, in the assuming future, we understand it now, another assumption, right? Because some people talk about, and we'll talk about in in BE one, the era of inflation. Some people argue that that era of inflation was an example of a dark energy that switched off and then switched on. Um, and the question is, will it, will it do that? Is, is it? Is it is an open question? But see, these are not things that you validate the Big Bang model. These are refinements and people doing research. So that question you asked mm -hmm. about is is the acceleration of the universe, or even the expansion of the universe, consistent over space and time? Answer is we don't know, but we're measuring it, and so far it appears that dark energy is consistent in whatever direction you look, and that dark energy is getting stronger. All right. We can move. We can back, come back to this at the Q and A section, but I think we should move on sure. to the next part. The next topic we had was no, 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 um, I, I think, you know, I, I see the great, great credit in, in the, um, in the proposal, uh, done by, by, by Hawking and by, by Arta, um, that the, that the universe, um, really did not, there really, really was not a, a, uh, a beginning of, that 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 the Big Bang process established time in the first place. That is, that is, in the early moments of the Big Bang process, space and time were established. Now you can say what happened a trillion years ago, but that's like saying uh, if you walk 
a billion kilometers on the surface of the earth, do you get to the edge? No, right? It, it, you can have things that appear to be infinite because you can go around the earth as long as you want. You're not going to get to the edge. Sorry, flat earthers. Um, but, but the notion that, well, um, did this big bang process, if the big bang process established space and time, right? And one interpretation is that the big bang process established even infinite space and time, um, then asking what happened before the big bang is like asking what south of the south pole or what's north of the north pole on the surface of the earth. I know it's not a very satisfactory thing. Now there's other things that talk about many worlds and, and cyclic cosmology and the multiverse and other things like that. Um, the big bang model and theories around the big bang don't dress before. So I even say there isn't a before, right? That the, the big bang process even created or established, you know, a better way word, word, established space and time as part of the inputon field stuff. I also like I've also heard about like uh, the, like I, I mentioned this in the off hair like before we went live uh, about two, two different the definitions for what the the Big Bang is like you have the the common conception of Big Bang uh, which which says uh, t t equals zero the first the first instance of the universe basically but you also have the second definition where it uh, refers to when the universe was uh, hot and then it's basically the, the the hot big bang version of the definition and that according to that definition you may have something called inflation before that hot dense state yeah. of the universe and and there's also a model that says that the big bang process didn't happen once but in the multiverse it's happening all the time a little if you will you know, oh yeah we're I... popping up with our own little big bangs and we have and that, that, that reminds me of an uh, like uh, i i've i've watched uh, bbs space time youtube channel and they like i you remind me of uh, a thing that they said about uh infl like if if inflation is real perhaps inflation is happening uh, infinitely and you have different yeah. batches where the hot the, the hot big bang is established basically everywhere yeah. like about like bubbles in a boiling pot basically and and understand these are really valid questions that cosmologists are wrestling with. The Big Bang model and Big Bang doesn't doesn't address it's outside the model, but it's interesting to ask. And, and you you raise you raise good points. Um, and people are asking about this and, and trying to to know. Um, you know, the, the, there's a thing that, that that's there's an assumption that the universe is explainable, right? Some people assume mm, yes that the universe yes. has an explanation. There's a closed form formula someplace there's a thing that says here's the universe done right and 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 i i, I think douglas adams humor sort of says that if he ever did that the universe would change itself right <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but but yes the assumption the assumption that, that the universe has a infinitely precise complete definition is an assumption right we may never be able to know why the Big Bang process started, right? It, we may be able to establish that the Big Bang process started time itself and, and, and therefore asking what happened before the Big Bang is irrelevant. Or it may be that the universe is part of a multiverse and, and stuff, you don't know. Now, there's another bit as well. Um, you know, people, if they run the movie back far enough, it would imply that the universe was at some point zero had had the diverse and let's let's be careful right the universe could be infinite what what is changing is the horizon of our visual horizon the universe could be infinite right and 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 and, and so and that the big bang process could create an infinite universe so there's nothing for the universe to expand into it is infinite is one model and it always was. Yeah, and always is, right? Um, what what is what's there is that the Big Bang model established stuff which ended up becoming atoms and, and, and stars and all kinds of cool things like that. Um, literally cool, right? But it started off in a hard dense state. Now the question is, if you run it, if you use the mathematical line 
and assume that mass is how the universe um, works, you would run it back to the point where they called t equals zero, where or the temperature is infinite, the density is infinite, and you got the singularity. And I am reluctant to mm. uh, to to state that 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 um, these singularities, things, these, these points, are anything other than mathematical artifacts. You know, uh, Feynman kept like, like, like the. Like the, the North and South Pole are also singularities because, the, like, the, like you have the yeah. long the lines converge to an infinitely yeah. small point, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. And 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 you know, I'm, you know, Feynman reminding me the universe is under no obligation to follow your 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 hypothesis, right? You can come with all this math, but the universe doesn't have to pay attention to your math, right? Um, it's your job to try to model what the universe is actually doing. The universe doesn't have to pay attention to what it is you're doing. So, so the notion of, well, the mass says blah, 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 goes into an infinite point, singularity. Um, that may not be correct. Um, I suspect from a quantum mechanics point of view, once you get be, get shorter than Planck length, Planck times, Planck distances, that things get really weird and that you do not, the universe does not allow you to have infinite points. Infinite so, things. I, I also, and I think, by the way, there's been some really good arguments made that that um, you know that, that that some of the models put forward about singularities are are wrong. I, Kerr um, has made a, a big stir in, in the last few weeks. Yeah, um, <laughs> very, talking very about straightforward arguments. Yep. Um, I am not. I am not impressed by uh, Roger Penrose's um, uh, musings on cosmology <laughs> in the last decade or two, because not because he's a smart person, he's a very smart person, very active himself, but because he proposes things he knows are wrong. Why? Because we have evidence that shows it's not correct. Sorry. Right, a bunch of stuff, and so his 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 quote theorem about that singularities are in the middle of uh, black holes basically turn mass into a singular spot and infinite density of things is is appears to have a very significant flaw, and that's that that is not a proof. Of course, science doesn't really prove things. There is good arguments to suggest that's not the case, um, and that something else happens before. You get to that mathematical point. Again, math, the universe does not have to obey, obey your equations to do what it does. The universe does not ask you permission to do what it does. Your job is to try to model what it does and don't assume that your math is what the universe must follow. Uh, uh, any questions before we move on? Uh, uh, like I, I had some uh, questions about like uh, the like uh, the current topic is well perceived the Big Bang and I've I've heard about like speculated epochs before mm, the, yeah. before uh, before before the hot dense state you had like the Planck epoch mm -hmm. and the grand unification epoch uh, yes. speculated uh, and, epochs and 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 stay tuned for a BE one show which is in a month from from now because. That's when we're talking about the fraction of a the fraction of a second in the early part of the Big Bang process. We're going to be talking about those sort of things, those epochs, right? But mm -hmm. but there are predictions, and and we have alterations and accelerators and atomic physics and all kinds of nuclear high energy physics gives us insights into that stuff. It's one of the one of the fundamental reasons why you want to build accelerators and do things because you are creating conditions. That are similar to the early universe, right? And um, so we'll talk about that in, in, in definitely about in, in BE1. It's a it's a great topic. All right. All right. So the next topic we had on our to do list was what might have been the cause of the Big Bang. Well, well I, I, I know what some people say, but the Big Bang model. And very and, and models and and the the, the the physical theory of the Big Bang 
does not address this question. This is outside its 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 purview. But it's, it's, it's important to ask. Um, do, do, we have, do we have ideas like, like again, the, the main idea behind the Big Bang is basically that the, uh, the universe is expanding. Uh, well, uh, well, the universe so started. We can, so we can ask why the universe is expanding. Yeah. So, 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 so we, we have ideas beyond, so we do have ideas beyond saying God did it. Mm -hmm. Here again, the Big Bang model says the universe was in a hot, dim state mm -hmm. and has evolved oh, yeah. Yeah. from that point, and that the 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 universe we have today is a consequence of this Big Bang process, and the Big Bang is going on on right now, right? It's it's not that it happened back then; it's a process of now. And you say, well, what might have caused it to come about? And some people say, well, there's a there's a so we're talking about models that are not part of the Big Bang, kind of played off topic, but, it's, but let's let's entertain the question anyway. Um, one of them says that um, there was a there, there was a quantum fluctuation, right? um, and that that the Big Bang process started by a quantum blip. Um, the, the quantum mechanics typically does not allow you to say with infinite precision, infinite precise stuff. Here is an energy state at this point, at this place, at this time, right? You're not that to say I can I observe this particle. It is exactly here, and it's going this direction at this speed with this momentum. Quantum mechanics says you do not have an um, ability to, to to make that precise statement. In fact, it is not that you're you're not clever enough. It, you didn't try it, hard enough. It's not that you you didn't do it carefully enough. The universe does not have an answer. Yeah, it's fundamental to the structure of how reality physics works. Um, <laughs> the 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 um, and it, and exactly what it means um, that that you can't measure position and momentum both arbitrarily uh, accurately, and the fact that you can put a number on it. Uh, and say that the product of those uncertainties has to be larger than like h bar over two yeah. or something is is remarkable and it is it, it is something that is very natural from the math and leads to a huge host of questions about what it means and <laughs> the the concept of complementarity i i have a I have a book here actually um from Max Jammer about the uh, philosophical interpretations of quantum mechanics. And, and there's like a chapter four, the entirety of it or something is like about the, the principle of complementarity. Sure. It's and, fascinating. And quantum mechanics is very, un, very unintuitive. Um, probably the best and unfortunately part of the best ways to understand, try to understand quantum mechanics is to look at the math. Yes. Because it, it, the, the universe is not intuitive. What you think should be the case of, you know, you have a baseball flying by and you say, well, of course, I can do a really careful uh, snapshot and position and tell you exactly where that baseball is and how fast it's going and where it's going to go, right? And, 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 the, and the upshot of quantum mechanics is there is not an answer to that question, right? It, it, yes. There is a part of what is this momentum, they are not you're defined. Not have a an the universe doesn't. You, you, you're not going to get an answer, right? There, there's, there's not answers to every question. I know some people philosophically and, and spiritually want answers to things, but the universe is under no obligation to give you an answer to every question you come up with. Sorry. I think, I think it's, it's, it's like asking like what direction is up or down in the universe. Like there is no up or down in yeah. the universe, basically. Yeah. In, a lot of things, you know, in 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 general relativity and such relativity, when I talk, you know, teach you that stuff. One of the hard things to get across is that everyone's frame of reference is equally valid. Oh, there's no there's no master clock, there is no master grid of space, there's no origin, with no 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 no, and and we have baked into our brains so deep, it's hard to get rid of that stuff, and you keep finding when the students come back to saying. You know, your clock and my clock 
are both valid, right? The notion that 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 time is absolute and and space is absolute and there's a master grid and origin over no wrong, right? Um, even though mathematically you might try want to describe a, a grid with an origin, everyone has their own origin. Everyone has their own time. Everyone has their own clock, and it's real. It's not just this fake Star Trek stuff, right? It is. It is real. It's experimental. It is. It is, for example, why um, current in a wire generates a magnetic field uh, around it because it's relativistic effects. It's 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 beautifully measurable. Same thing with quantum mechanics. The notion that something is there, like an electron, is there, is is wrong because its electrons can be described as a point-sized particle. It can be described as a wave, and both are valid. In fact. It seems to do both at the same time. Um, it's 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 uh, the universe is 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 it surprising? Now, why is this relevant? Because some people have speculated the reason why the Big Bang process got started was a quantum mechanical blip. Because quantum mechanics doesn't allow you to say there is zero stuff here, right? There is there is there's nothing, right? Um, even empty space is full of stuff. The vacuum state is very interesting. Yes, it is very unintuitive. There is no, the, the, the notion of nothing, right? In physics, quantum mechanics says, well, wait a minute. What do you mean by nothing? Nothing would be zero energy. You can't have energy. You can't have absolute precise energy level. No, 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 no. Right? And in fact, you find, you can measure that there are these particles that kind of, in, in, uh, they, they, they like embezzle the energy, <laughs> create a pair, and and stick it back before someone does the accounting yeah. and find that someone had pulled money out of the till and stick it back in, right? It's yeah. it, it's it's it is it is bizarre. And so people say, well, that that vertical particle popping out, which we can actually measure, it's not just some wild ass concept. It's actually measurable, demonstrable, and observable. That may have been the cause of a big bang. I. Uh, I've also seen a different answer. Like again, uh, a, a video that I've seen on PBS Space Time. They, they again, they it goes back to the like uh, inflation is still a bit uh, iffy, of course. But mm -hmm. if you assume inflation, and we assume that uh, like inflation was driven by an an, an inflaton field, I, mm -hmm. I I'm 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 talking yes, from memory. Yes, you're, you're, you're and right. this yeah. and, the, uh, and basically what happened was this inflaton field has an energy which uh, cost. Uh, exponential expansion in, in the inflation basically but at some yeah. point you had a quantum uh, fluctuation that caused this inflaton field to collapse and that's th that collapse stopped inflation but but this but but this collapse of the inflaton field also generated all the uh, the elementary par particles and yeah. and create yeah. and, and that established the hot dense state okay. of the universe and we're going to visit that topic in BE1 and, and spades um, there. So we're not, <laughs> you're not done with the big, big process. Big, big process is going to be going on through this entire mm -hmm. show, but that's an important point that has to be, has to be considered. And that's been, you know, we have interesting measurements on that. Another, there's another thing that's sort of talked about that the universe is multi-dimensional and you have these things called brains that, that collide. When they collide, they create little big bang universes part of multiverse. Um, there's a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that, that uh, talks about the universe forking and doing stuff. It's there's a lot of models. Understand the Big Bang model and the Big Bang theories that come from that model do not address uh, how it, the cause. Uh, they they address the effect. The Big Bang model says again the universe was in a hot dense state and has evolved to the current state through this process. That's what the Big Bang model is. It doesn't say how it got there. It doesn't say what happened before. It may not even be valid to ask us before. Um, we don't know. Uh, but it's being actively investigated. It's not uh, being so, I, look, for that time, let's go to sure. the next topic we had on the thing, which was? Cyclic cosmology. So um, this is something that Penrose uh, particularly have been championing and it's the notion that um, the expansion of the universe 
stops and reverses itself and goes back in, or that the expansion of the universe rips and you get a new big bang coming out of it. That it is, the universe cycles through what he calls epochs, where we're in one of the epochs, right? And that um, there's a one way that the universe might go into a big rip, throw down into to oblivion, and popping out of that thing will be another little big bang process in another universe. Gets so started. what is an epic? Would be a cycle. The, according to Penrose, it's this cycle of the cyclic universe, right? That is the universe goes from the from the basic because if you if you just keep the universe expanding, mm -hmm. the temperature lowers and lowers, it becomes more and more uniform to the point where there's not enough stuff to do anything anymore. You basically get a dull uh, gray. Like, a, like, a, not, like a, not now now it will appear to be static because, because nothing happens. Yes. Nothing appears to happen anymore. <laughs> And, and 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 somewhere in that thing, then the you know, one way, so that's one model that says somewhere in that, that process, you get another thing that happens and another big bang process. The other way is to say that that the that the dark energy reverses itself and goes from from expansion to contraction and comes back in a big crunch and goes through another big bang. That's mm -hmm. another uh, mini worlds. Like I, think, I think like the first idea is basically saying like uh, according to quantum fluctuations that there's a very extremely extremely small likelihood that a new Big Bang will ha happen in the universe. Yes. But but of course, but when you are speaking about like an uh, infinite amount of times and in, in an infinite yes. space, basically it will it's, it's guaranteed to happen eventually in the very yes. distant future. Um, or that, that the notion, see, the notion of dark energy or that the expansion of the universe, accelerated universe, is going to always go on is an assumption, right? And some of the point on saying, hey, in B1, you're going to talk about the inflation epic um, and that that stopped and it kind of came back again. Who's to say that, that this thing that always goes forward, right? It may be that, that dark energy is going to put a cut off call a halt to the expansion of what the expansion of our visible universe right again mm -hmm. the universe may not be expanding into anything right it, it could be infinite right it's our it's our horizon visible horizon see that, that that given the amount of time that's been going on that's our expansion and it could be that that thing stops expanding and comes back to a big crunch and goes through another Bang process, and that's another way of, of talking about cyclic cosmology. Like, well, what, what, what do you personally think? Like, do you think uh, the universe will just, just stay in the in the heat death forever, or what do you what do you think? Personally? I think the data most favors the heat death, where the universe just continues to expand. Um, stars eventually uh, go out. Uh, things. Uh, wander into black holes, black holes evaporate, and you've got a basically a, 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 a basically a, a infinite whole void. sea of, of mm -hmm. photons whose energy isn't big enough to do anything other than say, yeah, there it is. Um, uh, it, you go uh, into like would, would the photons go for like like eventually they will lose, like they, they get the red shifted to infinity, yeah, and, <laughs> and they yeah. so so weak and doing things that that you know because at least will, you, you get really will, will they, will, you can will, will, you the, photo, will, will the photons disappear power. will the photons disappear basically or no like, they just get they just get weaker and weaker weaker their wavelength is is lower and lower and lower, and lower right that the stuff mm -hmm. gets spread out the energy density gets spread out the point because you know in high energy gammas you can get higher gammas and we can observe this and and things where you can get them to to interact and create an electron positron pair Right, e equals mc squared. You can take energy and get mad or other. But at some point, if the photons are so weak to not even do anything, right? The the matter has you know because one goes speculate even the proton has a life lifespan decays, right? And that the particles become um, and and that question is is that that matter wanders into black holes. Black holes evaporate. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Hawking probably did best. His work was to say that black holes are not black. They have a temperature and they slowly leak. 
And so the universe has kind of doomed the model that seems to be best corresponds to our current observation. There may be new observations that change it, but the current observation says that the, the stars are going to eventually stop popping around in existence. Things will be too diffuse to even create stars. Material is going to wander in, be sucked into um, black hole event horizons. Those black holes then decay over time. And we're talking about like 10 to the 100th power, one with 100 zeros years type of time in, in the future where the black holes have just evaporated. And when you have a bunch of weak photons that are too weak to do anything interesting, and the universe gets to be basically a dull ray stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we move on, any questions about this topic here? But we don't know. Active research, Big Bang model doesn't address this thing. These are people asking about the implications of the Big Bang model and could right. be going back and forth. All right. So now for the next topic. For the next topic, I'm guessing here that this is different from what the comic book universe says that multiverse <laughs> is. Yeah. Multiverse, right? Is our observable universe the only thing? Is it possible that there is a larger scale structure where big bang processes are starting and these things are, are, are too far apart for their, for, for their event horizons to interact? And so these are islands, separate islands that don't interact. If there's another universe out there, um, there's no evidence that we've ever interacted with it, right? If you never interacted with it, it might as well not exist from our standpoint. I know I make a joke of saying, this is my favorite universe. <laughs> um, it is, and given I have a, 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 a count of one, this is my favorite. Um, but I'm not saying that there isn't more. It's just I've never experienced them. And, and who knows? Maybe it'd be better. If I knew about another universe, that might be my favorite. But currently, this is my current favorite. I, I, I guess think... like one. Oh, so, so go, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say that I, I think that there can sometimes, I think that the word multiverse can mean different sort of things in different contexts. Um, and so in a cosmological sense also, um, it can mean something that is different or you know, it's sort of a spectrum. <laughs> um, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as people mean when they talk about like the quantum multiverse, which is a position that I sort of uh, hold to, but I would not describe it as what people sort of imagine as like a different, like, like a parallel universe where like you could go to or something. Although, I mean, it's sort of parallel in some sense, but they're all here right now, but they exist in like a way that, that doesn't, um, that by definition sort of wouldn't be detectable in the, the quantum multiverse. Yeah. What, what I mean. So like, if you flip a, if you do the, um, if you're doing the experiment where you, you send a single electron through uh, two slits and, and you watch them interfere with each other and then you measure, okay, it went through that slit. Then people are like, okay, well, it, the wave function collapsed or something. When really I think what's happening is, there is a, an entirely different branch of a much larger wave function than the one you're doing math with in your laboratory. And there's a, there's a many worlds in interpretation. Yes. Yeah. All, they're all sort of happening simultaneously. A cosmological multiverse, you could also explain, I think, from, from that idea, but they isn't necessarily the same thing. And I think like the idea that you could have different ways that the universe has realized has been realized yeah it is a uh, along those lines and i know that people have looked for um saying well maybe there's a big bang that happened nearby and what, that the two things have collided and we can see what we've never observed even the penrose would like to think we did we've never observed statistically that our so-called big bang is is interacting with another Big Bang, right? right. Um, we don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just speculation. Again, the Big Bang model and theories um, don't account for what else besides the Big Bang is there. It's so, beyond uh, so how how is this? How is the real multiverse different than what the movies and comics call the multiverse? Oh, I, I think I think science fiction is a great art. It's really has great imagination. 
it 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 comes up with really interesting concepts and sometimes people look at science fiction and and ask can i do science to validate or or, or refute that right so there's value in these this speculation um it may be that this is beyond the realm of physics to to decide um i don't know i'm not going to say no i'm going to say i don't understand the physics would allow a multi-universe to exist um and I don't understand quantum mechanics enough. I know enough about quantum mechanics and know I don't understand quantum mechanics to <laughs> detail that allow me to. Wait, wait, are you saying you don't know everything? Well, mm. in fact, that's the final sketch was, 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 was big of saying is that the more powerful thing you can do is to say, I don't know. Because if you. Well, know, I have I've, 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 I've two questions. Like, uh, not fine. Uh, uh, my my first question is that like uh, of course the uh, the in the many worlds in interpretation would suggest that the other universes are very similar to ours, but in different ideas would 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 they say that the the other universes are very different in terms of the fundamental physics? Like do they yeah. do they perhaps have different uh, constants perhaps, or, or is it is it just pure speculation at this point? Well, certainly, you know, one of the fundamental things about about cosmology is that the universe is consistent over space and time the, the, the way the universe works is consistent it just doesn't decide oh i'll do this tomorrow right there's a, there's a consistent process um and if that's the case the the another assumption is the constants are constant mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by constant well, like well the, speed, uh, the, speed, the speed of light, light would also be the same in other universes or could it be different? Or, well, I talk about yeah. the university, the speed of light is consistent. We um, check that. That's something that we check. And yeah. we have error bars on it, but it's something that we keep in the back of our mind because if somebody finds good, compelling evidence for a time-dependent speed of light... That would be really exciting. <laughs> it would be very exciting. Um, I, I've... It's um, the possibility that some of the... Um, crisis in cosmology um, might have at least some of its, you know, roots and maybe a time varying um, gravitational constant is one that I've heard kicking around just very like recently. And I, the other, the other thing is that the, 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 the era of, of recombination, um, the, the big bang flash, that the, that the physics around that may be not as precise as we think. And that there's errors in that time frame, which may account for the, I get I, I guess that's also the case that like the, the universe is al almost homogeneous, but not 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 perfectly, such that there are at different points in the universe may have cooled earlier than others. Yeah. Like a re re recombination would have happened slightly earlier in some places and slightly later in other places, right? Yes, and we will we will see that in BE1. We'll see actually pictures of that. And that's mm -hmm. that's gonna be really important because by the time we get to BE3, the structure of the universe, those little things are gonna be Things, right? Um, oh, but I also the, also the second question, and it's more like yeah. uh, I've I've also seen videos by uh, Sab Sabine Hasenfelder. I think you also mm -hmm. are familiar yes, with yes. her, I, and she and she and she lambasts the idea of multiverse as a religious idea. Well, I mean, she's uh, to be to be fair, you know, she's her her channel, which I highly recommend you subscribe to. Um, you know, she is she is questioning whether or not. That's that's science and, and and not science fiction or or, or or speculation, but I think there's something to be said for for that. Um, you can disprove I, the multiverse. I, I'm, not, I'm not a proponent that the multiverse actually exists. I'm waiting for something yeah. to be able to be testable. Right, things that are not testable, I find to be less interesting scientifically. Right. Um, if, if, if I can't make predictions and test those predictions, it's hard for me to get excited about that. Yeah. Like it's, it's, I think it's a fair, fair to say that the idea of a multiverse is like at this point beyond scientific inquiry, I would say. Yeah. I'm not to say it's impossible, right? But yeah. Yeah. I don't understand the physics that would allow it. Just like, you know, people say, can you go faster than C, um, uh, and and my response is I don't understand the physics that would allow the fundamentals of special relativity to be violated. I'm not saying it's impossible. I just don't understand the physics for that. Um, I'm not going to be so arrogant to say no, right? 
I'm not going to be so arrogant to say there's only one universe. <laughs> Just like people who said there's only one universe, it's the Milky Way. Stop asking questions. Like, no. <laughs> it's, it's important to ask those questions, but understand the difference between science and speculation. Great for science fiction. It also depends on what you mean. Um, it, like the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, if if you demonstrated that the um, a non unitary evolution of a, like of a quantum state, like for sure, yeah. that would violate the Schrödinger equation. And very rapidly, I think many most physicists, once they became convinced that yes, you can have non unitary evolution um, of a quantum state that they would be like, okay, well then no, then I no longer have any reason to believe in the multiverse. It's, it's a really, it's actually just a consequence of the fact that those branches of the wave function evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. And we have no evidence against things evolving according to the Schrodinger equation yes, yet. Yes. yes. So, and and it's saying, and it, but it's it's a it's a like quantum yes. mechanics is 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 difficult in part because it's non-intuitive. Yeah. Because but, the words that are used for analogies are really highly cringe, cringeable, right? Cringe. Yeah. 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 So if if I under if yeah. so if I understood correctly, like the the Copenhagen interpretation says that the uh, the wave function collapses, but the many mm -hmm. worlds interpretation says that each option is equally real, basically. Yeah. Each. Yeah. Nobody holds to the Copenhagen interpretation. Like actually, it's 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 just the it's the one that it's the nice way of saying shut up and calculate, so that the students will understand how bras and cats work together. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the balloon expanding balloon analogy of it, of, of it, something, but but. Yeah. But it is, you know, quantum mechanics, the, the, one of the difficulties is it's, it's non-intuitive and that you really need to pay attention to the math and, and the math is takes some effort to go forward. Um, you know, I, think it's more I think it's more intuitive than special relativity, personally. Because yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, I, um, I was fortunate as a kid um, to run into to Feynman, who um, I was actually at, at, at Berkeley and he sort of said, you know, I, I learn by teaching. You have not yet had, um, you know, full physics of stuff. Um, so I want to teach you relativity first so that you learn relativity before you go into education system where they give you Newtonian mechanics and you get your mind messed up, right? And so <laughs> I had, and everything was forced to come back and he would give me these little talks and he would give me problems. Um, and the problems, some of the problems he said are trivial and expect you to come with the answer. Some are difficult, I expect you to work on them. Some of them are unsolved and expect you to explain to me why they're hard. I'm not gonna tell you what is what, right? And so I had this, this crash course in special to relativity. And, and, and the way that Feynman presented it, it was obvious, right? To me, it was, it was special relativity when I teach it, folks, it's, it, it is, it's fairly straightforward once you get rid of, of Newtonian ideas about absolute stuff, right? And, and I can remember Feynman yelling, saying, there is no cock that's out of the universe. It's, it, everything is everything, blah, 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 blah. And finally, I got to the point where like, okay. And, and then the math works. And, it does. And, and it really is amazing stuff of, of the, the special and general relativity. Um, mm -hmm. And I did, I, I did like a, 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 I taught a course in uh, well, high school in Canada, right? And even showed people how to derive equals MC squared is not mysterious and work. It takes course. very little, actually. Yeah. You can get you can get there in, in like a page and a half. Yeah, and and, and, and demonstrate stuff. But but that was a, the process to try to give the students ideas because I think we should they should teach relativity first and then yeah. say a simplification of relativity will do this Newtonian mechanics because it's good enough for most things, right? Um yeah. but that's a, uh, so, that's a so so then so this may uh, this may be off this may be off topic, but uh, like uh, I, I've heard that the relativity uh, that the the mathematics of relativity is in conflict with the math of quantum mechanics. General relativity. Well, yeah, of general, well yeah. I think actually not it's a, the, the, the the special relativity um uh, Einstein dealt with flat space-time. Yeah. Space-time was not warped by by gravity. Uh, that works quite well with quantum mechanics. Yeah, and 
but the but the thing that happened so so then Feynman next thing was to say okay now that you understand relativity let me introduce you to quantum mechanics and he started teaching talking about quantum mechanics and and I said, I'm only 17. I'm, a, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an arrogant SOB. And I actually said to Feynman, when he was talking about quantum mechanics and the electron goes through both at the same time, I said to him, now you're just being silly. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, I understand. Feynman would, would make deliberate mistakes on the blackboard. And if I didn't catch it, he'd get mad. So well, I, just, I just did a bunch of math that's garbage. You didn't catch it. You're not paying attention. Let's start again. That's hilarious. Right. So, mm. so I, I said to Feynman that that, that he's been something about, about, you know, about quantum mechanics. And so Feynman very, very calmly said, well, why? And explained how, from a purely relative standpoint, this quantum mechanic stuff was rubbish. And he laughed and said, yes, that's very good. That's, that those are, those are valid objections from that standpoint, but who's to say, right? And so, in fact, when we went off to college, um, his thing is like, okay, you have you have uh, objection to quantum mechanics. I want you to do experiments. I want you to to design an experiment to refute quantum mechanics. Catch it. Yeah. Now, I spent a lot of time in college designing experiments to try to catch it. And guess what? I lost because uh, <laughs> because both relativity and quantum mechanics are some of the most well confirmed to amazing precisions um, in in yeah. molecular physics and. And yet, the two don't play nice at the extremes. One of the extremes is perhaps the early state of the Big Bang process. Another is around the edge of black holes, other things. The two, we don't have yeah, it. So, so, so ge general, general relativity is in conflict. At, at those extremes, yeah. yes. general yes. relativity is in conflict with quantum mechanics. And, and quantum mechanics is in, in, in conflict with general relativity, too. Let's let's the be mm -hmm. five. And, and, and so, um, uh, what it says is that, that our view of the universe is perhaps incomplete. And so people have been trying to take, to, 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 under, to explain gravity from a quantum field position. We've been yeah. able to do that. Like, like I, the, standard mo the standard model with the elementary particles, like it, it doesn't include like uh, the hypothetical gravitons, for example, right? Like it, it, there is no, it doesn't that's include. That's who you asked. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't, ask her, but, but yes. So anyway, but this is beyond the, we've got. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. so, sorry, sorry for, we can, we can sorry for side tracking the conversation. Yeah, we can get back we'll get to this. More this stuff in BE1. Yeah, we can get back to mm -hmm. this in the, in the Q&A, but we have two more talk, we have two more main topics to get through. Yeah, and and I, next, have, I have two audio things I want to play. Yeah, to, uh, our penultimate topic is what is cosmology? Well, I should have started been like the first one. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine in terms of of, of stuff in terms of when you're talking about about you know physical cosmology, right? It's a it's a it's you know it's a branch of cosmology that really is about you know the, the Understanding what the universe, branch of right? physics, the cosmos is is the universe, right? So it's it's the physics yeah. of the universe. Yeah, I, I've heard some people say the universe is in the cosmos, and there's there, there could be multiple universes in the cosmos, and the cosmos is the bigger thing. Ah. I've heard people say that. If the multiverse exists, it'd be part of yeah. cosmology. But if it doesn't exist, it's not part of cosmology. Cosmology is about the, the I, I would, model. Like, of the I would say. I would say it's, it's the study of the origins and history of the universe or multiverses, if, if, if multiverses are already. And structure. Right? right? The yeah. cosmology deals with how the universe came to being, um, what its structure is, what it, what it is now, mm -hmm. how it's evolving, and what will happen in the future. That's sort of what mm -hmm. cosmology yeah. kind of deals with. Yeah. I, I, I've asked this question. I think I asked this earlier, but uh, the, as someone who studies, you probably don't. You probably don't have the, uh, as much argument as they do with, with as biologists do with creationists. But do, do creationists argue about with you about the subject? I mean, uh, it used to be that 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 you know, creationists were more were madder at, at the biologists than than the astronomers, right? They didn't really <laughs> understand. What we were doing in astronomy, 
Um, and it was kind of nice because we kind of didn't have to deal with as many sort of nutcase stuff. Uh, but, but I'm sorry, but, but some of the people in that area are really nutcases in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, but it's a problem now that people are kind of realizing that if you want to have the universe be some number of thousand years old, old. (laughs) cosmology has, you have a lot of problems with cosmology as a result of that. But what's the next, what's our next topic? Maybe you should move on. And I have a, some, some audio story I want to have commentary uh, on. And the final topic of the night is... Is the universe infinite or finite? Um, answer is we don't know. Um, there are Big Bang model interpretations that suggest the Big Bang process created infinite space and, and time. Um, there are other... There's other topologies of the universe that are finite, right? You can have, it's like a ring, right? You can go around in a circle and don't reach the edge, right? You can have things that have a, a, a fixed finite size, but have no boundaries. Um, we know that our visible universe horizon is finite because the Big Bang process has been going on for roughly 13.8 billion years. So, the longest a photon could have traveled as a result of the Big Bang process and things that happen is 13.8 billion years. And, and that turns to about a, a distance around 68 billion light years, but that's that's kind of a horizon. And over time, that horizon expands. Um, mm-hmm. But that's kind of the, we don't know. Um, there is nothing in the Big Bang models that say it must be finite or it must be infinite. If they will ask, is the Big Bang expanding, expanding into what? An answer as well, you could have, in, in the infinite universe, it doesn't expand anything. It just gets bigger. Yeah. You double the number. Right. What do they double into? Numbers, Yeah. Right? It's not that number. Okay, you, yeah. okay, you meant, like, uh, previously you mentioned about uh, dark energy, like uh, most of the universe is, uh, or at least most of the uh, the energy total of the universe mm-hmm. is mostly dark energy. You have also dark something called dark matter and ordinary matter. And if, if I, like, I think also one of the notes that from Dahlia includes in uh, the, the document, uh, it's, it's, it mentions that, uh, like, if, if you have a, 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 a certain amount, if you, if you count up all of the ordinary matter, the dark matter and dark energy, it has just enough energy for the universe to remain nearly flat or, or yes, that, maybe, that maybe, maybe flat, perfectly I mean. flat. That, yes. that like, parallel line stays straight and it doesn't put yes. around. Yes. We don't see it warping into a to back to itself. We don't see or the back of our heads if we keep looking long enough. That that's it seems to be flat there. Um, so and, so and, and, and so in the universe, when we talk about energy because e equals n squared matter energy. We talk about universe as as energy. Um, today, about seventy two percent of the universe is involved in this this acceleration of the universe this what we call dark energy bad term for it but it's the stuff that's causing the greater space to expand 70 percent of the energy of the universe is dark energy um there's another 23 percent that is involved with what we call excess excess gravitational fields now people think those gravitational fields are a result of of matter but we can't see or detect that matter so call it dark matter so 23 percent is involved in this excess gravitational fields at so, least 4.6 percent for all the rest of the normal stuff so the, the all the particle zoo stuff we're doing high energy physics and the standard model and 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 you know protons and atoms and neutrinos and photons and all that sort of stuff black holes all that stuff was it's it's really only about 4.6 percent of the energy of the universe and we found that there is this 20% of excess gravitational field, which we think might be a result of mass or might be that gravity is different. Uh, and 70% is is accelerating the universe, which is we call dark energy. Uh, so th- this fi- th- would finite mean that the universe would, st- uh, there's a boundary to the universe that, that will stop, ex- make it, make it stop expanding. Or the universe curves in on itself. So maybe the space, it, right? It could be periodic. Like, oh, like on a ring, you you come back to your, your, your spot, obviously. It would take a long time, so by the time you come back to where you were, it's different, right? But 
but the geometry of space doesn't have to be infinite. It could be, it could be curved in on itself um, as an example. Like a, like a map in a, in a video game where if like asteroids, you know, the game asteroids. Oh, oh, back man, oh, back man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where so asteroids would be a two dimensional version of a finite universe without a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I would like to do two things, uh, uh, play, play a four minute audio. So we'll stop, um, by, by a really great astronomer called Phil, who goes by the name of, 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 of bad astronomer. And, and if anybody wants to listen to these uninterrupted, the links are down in the description below at the bottom of the description section. You can listen yeah. to them yeah. without so, our commentary. So so we're going to have about a four minute thing. We're going to stop and, and talk about some of the things there. But I like one of the way that Phil does. This will help reinforce things. So so without further ado, let's let's get it started. Very common misconception that the Big Bang was an explosion in space with everything rushing away from some point. But that's not what's really happening. Remember, I've talked about space being a thing in which matter and energy exist. Space can be warped or bent by mass, creating what we think of as gravity. When, By the way, that's what I just said. That's basic Einstein's general and special relativity theory, but mostly general relativity, right? That of, of matter and space being kind of intertwined, being warped. Talk about the universe expanding. We mean space itself is expanding. And when it does, it carries galaxies along with it. In a sense, it's... So, so again, if, if galaxies, if ignoring the fact that they might be orbiting each other, you know, the, 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 the center of mass of a cluster of galaxies is really kind of stained put, unless something is pushing it like another cluster, you know, like it's being attracted the way. But they're mostly staying put, and it's this grid of space that's expanding. All right, so we're not going to analogy. Having a rubber ruler, when you pull on it, it gets longer and the distance between the tick marks gets wider. When the ruler doubles in length, the tick marks that started out a millimeter apart are now two millimeters apart. But tick marks that were 10 centimeters apart are now 20 centimeters apart. In other words, the farther away a tick mark is, the faster it appears to move away. So, so this is the, this is the, the, the Hubble elementary expansion law, right? That says the farther out you go, the faster those things are generally receding away from you, ignoring uh, local it's, it's scale. It, it scales basically. Uh, yeah. Like at, 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 at 10 times greater distance, it's uh, the, the expansion rate is 10 times greater even. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, the, 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 we learn later that that scaling is not linear. But it's oh, really? the dark energy thing, but that's a different story. So but it's not constant over time, is what he means by not linear. Not that it, oh, not oh, that it, right. like, not that it, like, change. Yeah. No, yeah. It, 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 with distance, not, but with time, it 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 it, it is changing. Yeah, with yeah, the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's go going on. It's a part. In other words, the farther away a tick mark is, the faster it appears to move away. Sound familiar? That's just what galaxy redshifts are telling us. It also means that really the galaxies aren't actually doing any moving. It's that space between them is expanding. This may seem like a nitpicky semantic point, but it's physically true. The galaxies are, for all intents and purposes, standing still. The space in between them is where all the action is. And, and so that's where we talk about uh, the expansion of the universe and why, you know, the, 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 like the, the Earth Sun distance is not changing, why the most galaxies is expanding. In these local regions, gravity is strong enough to bind things together that they gotta stay put. You know, they might orbit each other. So I, I guess I guess it's also it's also true that uh, space with, within my own body is also expanding, but, but because the, the distance is, is very small, you don't notice you, get, you cannot notice the expansion well, rate. The, the banding, but, but, but I mean I would say in the distance, on the other one, I would say it differently that that within your body. The chemical bonds and structures are holding yeah, yeah. You together, right? Yes. And that yeah. and that the expansion of space is is not sufficient to cause your body to expand, right? Your your the, the, the bonding, the binding energies of, of stuff hold you together, just like the 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 gravitational forces uh, on the earth hold stuff to the earth. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's not earth people. And and that the distance of the earth sun system is 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 also gravitationally bound. 
do too. But, 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 I mean, but even but even if the uh, even if the atoms in my own body were, were not bound together, the expansion rate would still be very unnoticeable. Yeah, even, we were. Even, but but, yeah. but you you would, you would you would you would also be dead. Until yeah, yeah, right. yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> right. Yeah. The island of, of stuff hold together against um, against uh, the the current the current inflation. So is it saying the action is actually really between actually really between super clusters of galaxies, but yeah. I guess I guess we're lucky that the continents don't move as fast as the universe is expanding. Yeah. So 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 you're not gonna see and be able to see expansion at the local scale. It's 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 at the cosmological scales. And that's that's where he says where the action is. So let's continue on here. It's even weirder. This is true no matter where you are in the universe. From any galaxy, it looks like all the others are rushing away from you. Look back at that ruler. No matter what tick mark you start with, when the ruler stretches from that spot, it looks like the tick marks are all moving away from you. This is what Einstein's equations showed and what Lemaitre saw in them. Space is expanding. But that and, and so this is one of the one things about the, the misconceptions. That there isn't an origin of the Big Bang. Everything is expanding, maybe yes. expanding, even though there are local spots that, that other forces that, that keep it together. Right. So where do you get where do you get this rubber rule? Where, where do you get these rubber rulers at? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know. It would be obviously maybe the two you want to have in your channel in your store is rubber rulers that people can use to stretch. Normally, a rubber ruler is not very effective, but. but yeah, they, they they didn't have those at first stuff in elementary school. But yes, I think you should. I think you should find a store for rubber rulers and put it into your store. Yeah, if anybody out there wants to make me a, a talking time with Kathy rubber ruler, yeah, feel free to create one for me. Okay, we have a few for few more minutes of this thing, and then we're going to know. The Big Bang wasn't an explosion in yeah. some pre-existing space. It was the initial exploding expansion of space itself. The universe isn't expanding into anything because it's all there is. That's an important point. It, it, and, and, and people sometimes misconception about the Big Bang. The big expansion of space isn't standing into something. It is the something that's expanding. I know it sounds semantical, but but it's that's a very important point. So, so it the, it, it, it it's true. Are you so? Is it the case that a a um, a model of the universe where you know, maybe for another several radii compared to our observable universe, it's sort of the same, but then it does drop off to sort of zero uh, um, mass density. Is is that consistent at all? With, or, is, or is that contraindicated? It, 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 it is consistent, but but again, beyond a durable universe, we can't observe yeah. it, right? It is, it is, um, but, but, but we don't have any reason to think that beyond our visible horizon, is anything different? Yeah. Okay. So I, gu I guess a question that I could ask is like, like obviously we, we know that the universe, the space, is expanding, but we, of, of course we, we tend to think about space like uh, a, a nothing, basically. But it, it, this implies that space is a something. But but what what is being mm. produced that causes this to expand? Like, is there something? popping in that makes the space expand or like i don't know how i don't know what terms you would have to use to describe more space basically well uh, if the universe were infinite there's nothing to expand into it just gets bigger just like the number line is infinite and if you double the numbers you still have an infinite line right an infinite mm -hmm. universe that is expands is still infinite it doesn't expand anything if it's finite and calls in on itself it the uh, it, it could be that the ring, let's say if it's it's, 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 it's kind of like cylindrical, um, just gets bigger, it doesn't expand anything, it just gets bigger. And it's hard because it, it's, it's counterintuitive because you but think- it, But the, the, the amount of space, like, uh, I don't know if you, if, I don't know if it's the correct terminology to use, but the amount of, like, there's more space being produced, basically, yeah. or- yeah. I, I like to say that the graph paper, if you have graph paper, people are just adding more lines and stretching it, right? The yeah. dots on the graph paper yeah. where your universe expand, just like the dots on a balloon, get get bigger. Of course, of course, of course. When you stretch something, you don't you don't produce more stuff, basically, right? But uh, yeah. in, in 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 space, you are producing more space. Yeah. And 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 the, the the steady state model has been refuted. 
that was their excuse as well. There's matter being created spontaneously that keeps the universe there. But but we know now that's 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 been refuted by observation. So let's go back to what he's saying here. Three more three more minutes. Oh, the universe isn't expanding into anything because it's all there is. There's nothing outside the universe for it to expand into. This also means the universe has no center, no point of origin. Imagine the ruler is now a circle and the diameter is expanding. No tick mark is the actual center. Yet no matter where you are on the ruler, every tick mark appears to move away from you. So this would be an example of a topology that of a, of a finite universe that's closed in on itself as opposed to infinite, right? And we don't know, we don't have an experiment right now to, to suggest one or another. It appears to be flat and it appears to not favor a you know, it's curved in on itself. If it is, it's much bigger than our visible horizon. Like if the if the universe were to, to turn into itself, it would basically be a, a four-dimensional sphere, right? Like it's, it's sort of a yes. sort of a flat it's sort of a, a 2D surface on the sphere. You have a 3D yeah. surface on a 4D sphere almost. Yeah, that'd be an example. Yeah. Space time, um, depending on how dimensions you add to space, how many dimensions you add to, to time. Um, that dimensions of space time is, is really what you would be, what would be folding in on itself. But so these analogies about rulers and balloons and so forth are, are to give you sort of a, they're not real. They're just give you inclinations of what the math suggests, which may be correct or maybe incorrect because the, again, the universe doesn't have to ask your permission to do what it does <laughs> and your math may be wrong. Right. But, but yeah. here so far it's, it's pretty good. Let's go finish on this this thing before we're going to do one on one. Similar way, every spot in the universe appears like the center, which means none is. No place in the universe is more special than any place else. We're all in this together. It can... So, so, and that's a that's a very uh, Einsteinian relativistic thing that there's no special spot, right? So you're so you're saying the Earth is the center of everything. Earth is the everything. Everything reflects the earth roll from the earth is that is that what you're saying well that, that, but that, but that, but that it, if you were a different spot in the universe it's true it would be the same thing happening right and, it, yeah, exactly and everything is receding away from you everything is receding away from everything i guess it's like it's, it's like standing on planet earth and you see like oh i see the horizon is uh is surround like it's, it's surrounding me uh equally distant in all directions but no matter where you are on the surface of the earth you see the exact same thing. The horizon appears to be equally yes. distant around you, basically. Yeah. So last thing is just a few moments um, from a uh, thing from Dr. Tyson, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you will know. Um, he's having a conversation with uh, Chuck Nice, um, and they're talking about. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard heard of that guy. Is he is he someone important? Is he someone famous or important? <laughs> I mean, he's he's a co-host of of the um, Star Talk. Um, Star Talk is a is a is a show that Nidras Tyson does to, to 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 have interviews and explain things. Well, whoever this guy is, I hope I hope he does something important of his life. Yeah, Who, whoever he may be, whoever he may be. He he is a, he actually Chuck Tyson is a comic. Um, he provides comic relief, but he's also incredibly smart. Right, he tries to play the 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 the, the foil on there and make jokes. But he actually knows a lot of stuff. He's a really smart guy and, and quite quite impressive. So, so let me and and I just and and we'll talk about what what. Um, so, in this particular thing, um, you know, we just had a press. You know, we had press releases where someone says, "Oh, Big Bang, proven wrong, blah blah blah." Uh, you know, or or that the, the James Webb Telescope involves Big Bang, and 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 Neil is basically. Uh, putting that uh, in in perspective. So let's hear what, what Neil has to say. So, so here's the point. The tenets of the Big Bang, that the universe started out small, hot, dense, uh, where matter and energy were a primordial soup, where the forces of nature had merged, all of that is thoroughly supported by observations of this universe. And I'm going to say, this is not wild speculation, right? We have observations and hard data to back up the 
the, the model, which is why it, it, you can elevate it to, to a theory. Um, and, and we'll talk about this some more in BE1, but, but this Big Bang process is not like, oh, they, they're just speculating, right? Um, there is hard science evidence that, that, that backs up stuff. Let's continue. Thoroughly supported. Okay, now there are some things that, well, did this really cause that or might it be something that we don't know about yet? And who ordered up the dark matter? We don't know where that came from. And where's this expansion? We don't know where that came from, but we can describe it and we can measure it. Here's the point. If tomorrow you have a new idea about how the universe works, it's going to enclose everything we've been talking about up to that moment that has been experimentally and observationally verified. You could... So, so this is one of the you know some of the things that that Penrose kind of goes off on 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 tangents, right? We know we observe, we measure a bunch of stuff, right? And if you come up and say, "No, I think the universe came out of the nose of the great turtle," um, you know, like Terry Pratchett type things, um, uh, that uh, that would have to explain everything we know and observe, right? Um, it's more likely if we're going to refine the Big Bang model and have new theories, or even theories about um, the cause of the Big Bang process, or even maybe trying to explain multiverse. Over. You'd have to start with what we know now and observe now. It'll be expanding ref on the Big Bang model concept with refinements, not refutation and replacement. Let's go on just a few more. Put it in something deeper. Okay, you can say, well, I have an idea. Our universe is just one in a multiverse. Right. Fine, okay? But our universe would have started with a Big Bang, okay? And our universe would have expanded from a dense, hot, cool up state that has been cooling ever since. That's observed and that's real and that's not going away. Okay, so, so again, this is not idle speculation. This is based on hard data that has been built up over the years. That's my point. So so what you have are journalists trying to make clickbait. And if there's some little thing in the early universe that is still on the frontier, still being contested in the octagon, in the, in the, in the fight dome, and, and, and some new idea is emerging over another idea, people say, oh, Big Bang is in trouble. So I just go back to the drawing. But Big Bang is not in trouble. I'm just saying, it's not in trouble. It is a whole thing yeah. that could conceivably fit in a deeper, bigger idea. Right. But it's not going to be swapped out tomorrow. We're not going to find out tomorrow. Gee, uh, the, the, oh, the early universe was cold instead of hot. That is not going to happen. So, again, data, they're not. He's, he's you know, he, being definitive, I would say, <laughs> I don't yeah. know if would allow that to happen. Because the yeah. you'd have to explain the data, and explain why it was start off cold rather than hot, right? But that's a way of saying. So I want to just just add those two things together in a perspective to wrap up some of the stuff there. Um, I guess are there any questions from yeah. the, from the chat? Yeah, from the, if, our 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 lovely lovely panel here. Yeah. So if you have any questions for Landon or any of our guests. Put them in chat now or forever hold your peace until next until a month from now. Well, I, I had the one question saved up for now. Like uh, if you go if you go again back to the uh, to the moment when like be like before at the sort of moment all the, the hydrogen and helium was in a plasma, the uh, mm -hmm. electrons freely moved around and uh, photons were uh, uh, they like they, they bounced back and forth between electrons because the, the universe was opaque. But at some at some point yeah. It, 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 you have a recombination, the atoms become neutral, and then the photons are free to move. And, the, and that, the, those photons we see today as the cosmic microwave background radiation. Yeah. 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 And in fact, micro in fact yeah. those photons, we call the microwave background, they're, they were the last bounce off of plasma, right? As a plasma yes. was cooling in different and not all simultaneously because the universe was not a perfectly equal thing it had lumps mm -hmm. and 
spots, cool spots, but 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 that the, that that when the you know the the photons were bouncing around and in the last bounce of plasma before it went neutral, the photons just go fee off there, and we see them as this microwave glow. Yeah, it, it was qual. It, yeah, it was qualitatively actually a, a similar ish environment, I think, to the photosphere of the sun. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I think, yeah. like even in terms of density, I don't think it's like crazy different than that. Yeah. And, and it's, it's basically the, the temperature when when hydrogen and helium become a gas it, instead of a plasma. That also depends on on um, density and stuff. It's, oh, it's yeah, actually yeah, like yeah. not the ionization temperature. If you just look at like the Boltzmann factors, you actually need like a hundred thousand Kelvin. Um, but uh, it, that's because the statistical hmm. mechanics are more complicated. Yeah, than that. yeah. and and, uh, and that's the thing. So, so I, I remember, you know, in, in, I was in the audience when the um, yes, when when the um, cosmic macron data was presented, right? And we were all waiting for this thing, the first reveal, right? And I remember it was from sitting, Kobe. They were sitting in the audience, and they showed the graph, and they said, "Well, here is the black body curve." When you see this sort of statistical. Yeah. Boltzmann like thing is it's like mm -hmm. like a bell curve that's lumped on one side, right? Yeah, it's just a boring line. And so, so the line, and they said, and they said, here is the here is what the the uh, cosmic background measured on on intensity and frequency, and you saw the same curve, and and it was like, okay, black body. That was a that was a that was a good round of applause. And then they said, here are the error bars, and and, like, and then they didn't show anything. No. If you zoom down, the error bars are so small that they're with less than one pixel. Right? It was like it, it, it and that was when funding applause and and and, and yeah. this, this was this was the now definitive thing that this mm -hmm. background is black body, the temperature is there. Not only that, the 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 that that we're dealing with and we're dealing with the universe which the visible horizon was 1,100 times smaller. Mm -hmm. The frequency yeah. Yeah. was 1,100 times higher. The temperature was higher. In fact, the temperature it corresponds to when you when you turn it back is the ionization temperature. How how much it takes to take a boundary yeah. yeah. on and, and like at that yeah at that like if you go back at that moment when the, the uh, uh when re recombination happened the universe was still pretty hot like it, yeah. like it, it, instead of yeah. instead of a black instead of a black background the universe yeah. would have been bright orange yeah. in the in the background yeah. basically uh, uh, we're going to talk about this in be2 mm -hmm. not be1 the... we're about in mm -hmm. be2 because there's weird yeah. stuff that happens even earlier in the big bang process um because so, uh, yeah I, we, we my, my, my question my, my question was about the like uh, at the time the background radiation was like uh, bright orange, and over time it got red shifted towards the microwave yes. uh, spectrum. But my question was like, the, the, these photons ha have lost uh, energy during that time. And my thinking is, uh, like uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So where where did the energy go uh, during the, the, the red shift? Uh, no, but the frequency. That's my question. The that's frequency question. has the frequency of photons have have changed. Right, the energy density has is now over a larger volume because of the expansion of space. So the average density is is there, and, and so um, this this redshift is is not a loss of energy. It's it's mm -hmm. a, a stretching of so it's a consequence of the fact that the photons have to go at C unless they're interacting with stuff. Um, so so and and and. Because of that, because of, of the wavelength like expansion, you get a you get a change in energy per, per photon. So the density has has dropped, right? But, Remember, you start off with hot, dense stuff that was actually so interacting that it was relatively uniform, and it became lumpy. So ba so basically, uh, the energy of those photons transmitted to the energy of the space, or, or not, or not. Yeah. Like maybe I'm misunderstanding. Um, yeah. That well, that and also on these scales, on cosmological scales, it's not clear that um, conservation of mass energy holds in the same way yes. mm. as it does. Conservation of mass energy um, it 
it can be derived from um, a, a, an assumption about physics being invariant as time changes. Yes. And the, that doesn't seem to necessarily be the case on cosmological scales. So yeah, you don't actually right. necessarily expect conservation of energy. It's yeah, it's very right. weird. Yes. I, we have three questions from the from our viewers. The first sure. question from Jacob is it says are magnetars. <laughs> yes, they are. My They're favorite very stars. My favorite magnetars. stars. So magnetars are are stellar remnants um, of of highly magnetic uh, you know, stellar remnants, right? And we'll talk about this, I think, in, in BE3 when we're talking about how stars evolve. And and some of the things that the collapsed stars um, can basically concentrate the magnetic field. So you get enormously strong uh, magnetic fields, just, just unimaginably super strong magnetic fields. And weird stuff happens as a result of those very, 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 very intense magnetic fields. Like like the, 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 I, I believe the magnetic fields are so strong that even the magnetism alone would kill you, basically, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, you, yeah. 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 It, yeah. Like it's electrons true. stop noticing the nearby photo, like a proton because right. they're just getting ripped by Lorentz forces. Or something. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and the gradients are just, just, just wacky to the thing. And, yeah. and, and so, so, so when we talk about it in, in, in in um I think it's BE3, we talk about stellar evolution and supernovae and so forth. We're gonna get with you know, you think things are bizarre, wait until you get to the, some of that stuff. Um but good point. Uh, so what's the next question? Uh, can, oh, can, oh, 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 can, can, mag magnetars are also a type of neutron stars, right? Can, yes. uh, yeah, all right. Okay, let's so, sorry can, for the interruption. No, can Tina wants to know about the expansion. About expansion, um, she says you mentioned expansion wasn't linear. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. I'm not sure oh. how the, from the question though. Does that okay. mean expansion fits and bursts? So let's 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 go back to that to that 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 ruler, rubber ruler analogy, right? Um, if I am doubling the ruler every minute, that would be a linear expansion. If I'm accelerating. The stretching of the, of the ruler that's that's the acceleration of, of space that's is that and that push is is what we think our energy is involved in right so so not only so so hubble showed that the world is expanding right getting part of the way get go faster but but what we've learned from people on reese and the i think it's in 2011 Nobel Prize was awarded for accelerating the universe. That the, the expansion of the universe is getting faster, right? So it's expanding, but it's expanding faster. So that that rubber ruler is is expanding, but it's going faster and faster and faster, right? Um, and then about five billion years ago, gravity was enough to try to keep things together and lost, and and now dark energy got has got the other hand. So the universe is accelerating. It's getting it's getting the grid of space is getting bigger, faster. So I, I guess I guess you can uh, graph the uh, the expansion of the universe as an as an S curve. Like first, you the the the, the curve went uh, con concave down. That's just like at, that. uh, yeah, yes, like that. And then at five billion years, it went concave up. Yes. Con so yeah. so if you look at his his nice his, his nice little chart there, he's done. Very nice for us. Um, and you look at the line. At the very beginning, right? Maybe you can expand it. So if you look at the very beginning yes. of the line um, and you drew a slope, you would you would you would get to a date which is too. You get you well if you did the other way, you go from from today, go backwards from today. You would you would end up hitting the intercept at a different spot, right? Not so if you go from today, which is up on the line, and go yeah. down, you would end up. This with, is I put this is today. This is now. Right? And, and, and this is our idea, an assumption. We haven't measured this part, right? But we do measure the, that it's starting to curve up. Well, I, I would say, based on that data, we have 5 billion years of curving up a little bit. Okay, yeah. So I meant to put so, it here then. So, so we, if you draw the line, <laughs> you're going to intercept to an earlier date. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is where 
early on with the Big Bang Depends Powerful, where <laughs> we oh, okay. measured the, 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 the expansion of nearby stuff because that's that's kind of what we could do at that time. And yeah. we had an age of 10 to 11 billion years, which we knew was in trouble because we had things older than that. Now, because of that little, little S-curve thing there, yeah. now, in addition to that, yeah, so we're seeing, seeing the intercepts. So that's where yeah, we so had things... It's, 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 it's so it's being nonlinear there. And, and the other thing that happens is way down close to that origin, mm -hmm. other weird stuff happens, but we'll talk about that in BE1. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not uh, talking uh, about monetary inflation. I'm talking about real. I, and the final question that we have so far before we end is. No. Um, could we. Turn Venus into a black hole for science without messing up the solar system. Well, um, I don't know how you would blast Venus where you get the energy to, to do it. The, if it, went, if the if mass it, is Venus, the same, it right? turned into a spot that was, I think, on the order of of like a millimeter or less. Um, yeah, the gravitational field would be so intense that you'd have a black hole in horizon. Um, the rest of the solar system would keep going around, right? We wouldn't. Yeah, no, no. Black the mass would be the same, right? The mass would be the same. Yeah. It, just like say, if you took the sun and turned in, collapsed it into a black hole, we'd still orbit the sun to fly. Right? Um, I, I, I want to say a word in defense of Venus here. Okay. Yeah. Turning a planet into a black hole is messing up the solar system. Okay. Yeah. That, it's, that's messing up the solar system. Yeah. <laughs> it it messes up I mean, Venus, yeah. <laughs> black holes are not these cosmic background things. We wouldn't be sucked into the sun. Yes, um, the it, sun it would behave the gravitationally the same. Our models of solar evolution is that the sun doesn't have enough mass to turn into a black hole. It'll turn into a white dwarf, just a little cinder. Thing. But but big stars that turn in, that, that that form black holes, um, things that orbit beyond three times the event horizon radius can orbit just fine um, unless they're bumped in, knocked into it. That's a different story. Uh, so. We go on. Does any, does any, do, do any of you have any advertisements for stuff you're doing and then coming up? I am supposed to be appearing on Professor Park's PhD's show tomorrow morning. I think. Um, and you want to link that in the. You want to link, 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 I don't even. I don't even know if I. I don't even have a link for okay. it right now because I'm bad at life. And then I have a Bad Science Sunday tomorrow night with Maya. I can drop a link to that. Well, I can drop a link to the. You said you said that you said the part that have links. I think I think I made you a, 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 a. I think I made you a moderator last time you were on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I put it. I put the thing in the thing. Right. So, yeah, okay. we just hit we we just hit five hundred subscribers. So yay! Congratulations. Subscribe. Yep. By the way, go ahead. And yeah. Yeah. It, it, it costs you nothing. It yeah. gives him everything. So, yep. so yeah. Do it. subscribe, the thumb up, bell if you want to, and, and share, of course. Yeah. Uh, Landon, anything, anything coming up for you? Um, so you're talking about for me? Yeah, anything. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, on January 27th at 1330 Pacific, that's 1.30 p.m. Pacific, um, I'm on Chester's channel called Unnamed Tavern, which will be politics and, and things of that nature. On February 2nd, we have the Volcano Show, where we talk about um, the Cuba Volcano in Hawaii and volcanoes in general, what's happening. Um, that's going to be on uh, February 2nd at 13 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, I also uh, run a Discord server called Our Favorite Universe. Um, hopefully link, we'll link, link to that, link, the, the link to that in the description yeah. below, too. That, that link will work for, for seven days, starting on the 20th. Um, if you link and I see you join there, then I'll elevate you to a science fan. In that, in that thing, there's there, there, the, the, the primary thing is is the science channel of, of science articles that go up. Um, there's also think about cooking and eating. There's about history, about uh, medical stuff, disasters, and current news, and 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 so forth. So there's a bunch of, of things going on there that I would invite you to uh, to to check out. And of course, I'm involved with the International Obfuscated Sea Code Contest. Um, trying to get that stuff um, started or restarted as the Internet's oldest uh, contest uh, about, about programming in C. And finally, I'm, I'm working on with 
uh, people to troll, help to establish a telescope on the South Pole of the Moon, hopefully by Artemis 7 right. in the future. Hey, Ness, anything coming up for you? Uh, any appearance on uh, the channel coming up? I uh, personally on my own channel, I, I, I'm not active, but I'm more active on Jackson Reed's channel. Like I, I'm a video uh, editor of his, so my, my work goes mainly through his channel. So if you want to know more, go check out Jackson Reed. As for, uh, as for me, uh, if you want to, we will be continuing this mini series in a month's time, the third Saturday of February. So I can't remember the exact date of that, but third Saturday, so look it up. And, and, but if you want to, but for more recent history, this coming Thursday, We'll be talking about the reign of Julius Caesar. Huh. Yes. Interesting dude. Um, of course, I I I hold the Senate of Rome in high contempt. Um, they're one of the worst legislative bodies in history. And and uh, they're quite disgusting. And Julius Caesar and some of the other things that came about was because of the Senate of Rome, which was a bunch of people that I think um, deserve condemnation, not praise. Yeah. Same uh, with well, Julius Caesar. <laughs> yeah. they, they made, because they were such lazy asses, they made Julius Caesar a god and basically said, you yeah, do the thing yeah. and and because we don't have to do anything because we don't have to be responsible. So. Uh, and before we end it, do any of you have any catchphrases you said, like I said, at the end of your, sh your streams? Well, I want everyone to to again um enjoy wherever you know whether it's morning noon or night depending on your time zone and latitude and i hope you continue to enjoy our favorite universe i join my cult <laughs> i like and subscribe <laughs> yeah you all all this i'll stay before after we end it off stream but for the, for the rest of you never stop learning and enjoy the randomness We'll see you all next time. Yay. Bye. Bye. If you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And welcome once again to Talking Time with Caffeine. I am your host, Day 98. If you don't, if you don't know me by now, welcome to the podcast. Today, we, we are continuing our mini series of Before Earth. What was it like before our little collection of rocks clan together? Today to talk about part of talk like like about let's just say it was about, about a second or two of, of that process is my guest from the, from the left to the right bomb screen left to right introduce yourselves. Um, I am well. I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your times and latitude. I am uh, Landon Curtnoll, your astronomer guide to our favorite universe. Uh, hello, um, uh, my name is, or I, go, I go by the name of uh, Nestec 20, but uh, you can call me Ness for short. And I'm very interested in learning about the very first second of our universe that we inhabit. And I'm uh, Michael Vandergraaff. You can call me Vandy, or uh, I also go by Tapioca Weasel on YouTube. Uh, well, and I'm, I'm uh, reliably branded under that name, so you can find me that elsewhere as well. And that's uh, and that's I, our tacky weasel to us folks, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I only have the doctor bit on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'm a physicist, but I, I'm not a cosmologist. Uh, so I, I'm really, it's, it's awesome to be able to talk about this stuff and get some chance to learn some more. Awesome. All right. All right. Let's get this party started. Yeah. So before Earth One, um, if you haven't seen it already, uh, or if you're watching live, you should stay now. But but if you're if, if you haven't seen it, you should watch Before Earth Zero, where we talked about the Big Bang process. Uh, this particular show is going to concentrate on the first second of that Big Bang process. Now it's it's not clear whether it's the first second of the universe because it depends upon what happened to time um at at the at the start of the big bang process but that's another 
for that see the previous episode um but the very early universe the first second we're going to spend probably about two hours plus talking about one second um uh, this sort of shows that deeds um are, are more more efficient than 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 words um so time scales right we, in that first episode we talked about the big big process and and for those that are that are watching you're seeing the sort of the classic nasa image about the the universe moving forward to 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 the present and um at the very beginning is all scrunched up so if we go to slide three we, real, real we say, i do have a question real fast is that the enterprise or another spaceship <laughs> that is that is the that is the, i believe that is the uh, james is that is that the james no it doesn't look no, like no it's, 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 or, no it's or Cassini, the voyager. i think right is that the voyager i oh, asked voyager, voyager. This is a very old image, a very old image, but still a very famous image. Yeah, that may be Voyager. Uh, well, well, as I say, we can to, we can. I think it's W map. Oh yes, you're right. Yes, yes, that that would be right. It would that would make sense given this is W map data and stuff. I think it's W map uh, for for there the thing that the arrow present arrow points to. But as you see, if you took it in the linear time scale, um, you lose a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things happening at the beginning that's scrunched up. So in slide three. Um, if you sort of look at the first time scale, um, you see, and you try to stretch it, where well, you 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 find that even then, in linear scales, it doesn't really work uh, all that well. Um, you really want to start talking about um, a logarithmic scale in order to try to see some of the detail at the very beginning. Um, and if you go to, but even there, if you go to slide four, what you'll see is that 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 there's so much stuff that happened in the even the very first second of the Big Bang process that that you almost need like a log of the log uh, to, to to describe what's happening. Um, so we're going to be spending our time talking about this first second of the Big Bang process. Now, again, a, a very busy second. Yes, more than, I, more than I can get done in a second. That is that is true. It, it it a lot a lot of stuff happened during that 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 first second, which shaped uh the cosmos in 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 very wonderful ways it's why one of the reasons why it's my favorite universe because of the stage set here um any other things we talk about with with regards to this time scale things uh maybe maybe you can establish what the what the meaning of uh, the 10 to the power of minus 40 and, and such is basically each stick that you see on the scale is uh a, a factor a uh, one factor bigger than the previous scale so each like one tick is like ten one times. unit and then the next tick and then the next tick is 10 times longer and then the next tick is a hundred times longer and then the thousand it's a it's a power scale basically that's about how it works and, and even there it's it kind of compressed and 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 stuff so 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 basically saying that 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 a lot of stuff happened in this period of time and on the on the scale that you can see of the um, duration of the Big Bang process so far to date, this mm -hmm. is a really tiny bit of stuff because you know um, you know we're we're way at the edge now. As we move forward to to the next uh, BE show, we'll be we'll be we'll be heading down the the, the track. But, but for this first one, we have to spend time um, in the details because. As I say, the, the 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 fun is in the details. So, I guess the first thing we should talk about is is the Planck epoch. Um, Planck uh, is a very famous uh, physicist who had extraordinary insights into um, the world around us. Um, came up with some very 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 non intuitive things, and and to some extent the 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 revolution of quantum mechanics um it owes a lot to 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 planck um and uh, so he is a he has extraordinary editorial uh, impact on it and so the the use of, of these things you'll hear the planck length planck uh temperatures planck you know volume so forth um um are are well deserved uh nomenclatures back to 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 uh, max planck um, and there's also a famous institute, by the way, uh, the Planck Institute, which does lots of really great uh, research, uh, a lot of theory. 
I mean, Doctor, you're, you're, you're I, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to, to, to uh, visit that location. Um, but anyway, Fox I have not. In. Yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to visit uh, the Max Planck Institute, um, mm -hmm. but I've worked with um, I one of the people in our group uh, is from there. So, <laughs> yes. I, I believe also Max Planck was like one of the first, uh, like like a very famous scientist who recognized the contribution of, of Albert Einstein. Like when Albert Einstein was still like uh, obscure and he pu published his first papers on like uh, relativity, Max Planck was like the first, one of the first famous ones who recognized the importance of that, I believe. He was yes. like, was he was like this kid yeah. is going places someday. Yeah, yeah. yes. And, and, and go ahead. The thing I was going to say, the thing that... Um, uh, Einstein actually won the Nobel Prize for, uh, and he only he only received one was for explaining uh, the photoelectric effect in terms of um, f in terms of photons um, that where the energy is proportional uh, to their frequency and the conversion constant is Planck's constant, which yes. had just um, Planck published his paper deriving the black body law using the quantization of um, electromagnetic magnetic energy into photons as a mathematical tool, but he didn't appreciate um, the full sort of consequences of that. Yes. And Einstein elucidated those and uh, received the Nobel Prize for it uh, like a decade later or so. Yeah. And, and I think it's always... You know, he probably should have showered it with with, with Planck, but but by the other hand, to be yeah. fair to Planck, um, Planck was more interested in the physics than in the fame, in in many respects. And and furthermore, you know, at that time, you know, people were seeing things like you know, you, you have a gas, you you pump electricity through it, have it glow, and these emission lines. People want to know, well, why were these emission lines were there? Um, a, a body would would glow. Uh, and uh, like uh, something like a black body and what was the curve so forth um Planck established um a mathematical framework and a physical interpretation of it but it was but it was but it was so profound that i think you know that, that it took something like einstein to help interpret it so uh, so he's figure. so no one is planning to currently to make a a feature like movie about this guy then if he's not like be famous I, I, I think he deserves it. it. I think he deserves it. <laughs> so well, there was actually a few a few years ago there was actually like a a, a National Geographic series called uh, Genius, where like it, it follows it follows the story of Albert Einstein, but Max Planck was one major figure in that yeah. series as yeah. well. I mean, so Max Planck actually did win the Nobel Prize in 1918 for for this, and then Einstein won it three years later. Yep. So he did get, <laughs> he does get, did get, you know, credit. <laughs> That's true. That is, that is true. I say for, for that, it's, it's also, you know, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize Committee has, has its quirks. Um, and, and, and one of them was that, that probably if anyone deserved to have the Nobel Prize in physics um, twice, it would have been Einstein and Eddington. Once the Eddington experiment showed the, the the you know during a total eclipse that 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 the space was being warped um, around the sun, um, but but the committee sort of said, oh, he's he is he already has one. The other the other problem, and this is something that that, that Planck I think did for Einstein, which was was quite correct, was that there were people who um, because of Einstein's ethnicity dismissed. Mm -hmm his his statements and and even back then there, there was an unfortunate phrase called jude physique right where mm -hmm. people would say that's jewish physics as a as a way yeah. of dismissing what einstein was doing and planck you know stepped out and said no 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 no, no. there's this there's there's real stuff here there's important stuff here you pay attention to what's going on um there was one scientist in particular called the philip lennart like he it's also ironic, and it's also very ironic that he, Philip Lennart, was the one who discovered the photoelectric effect. But Albert Einstein explained why it is, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. And Philip Lennart didn't like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's also that the, 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 the committee has has a number of, of stuff like that. But that's a different mm -hmm. story. Um, uh, we could go on a minute. So, so Planck's uh, these Planck units. 
are are you know, an, an incredibly um, um, extreme. And so when we're talking about the Planck epic, we're talking about um, you know less than ten to the minus forty three seconds. Right? What do I mean by that? In terms of seconds, it's one divided by one with forty three zeros. It is it is an it is extraordinarily mm-hmm. tiny amount of time. Um, and we also could try to describe the universe. You know, so we talk about time intervals, how much time in the Big Bang process, you know, as, as a as a Planck interval. We're also talking about assuming that the that the universe, you know, um, it w- was compressing, or if you go back in time, you get smaller and smaller things. Back then, at the Planck epoch, the, the temperature would have been uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, dense and high temperature. So we're talking about temperatures of 10 to the 32nd Kelvin. That's one with 32 zeros Kelvin. Uh, that, that's a temperature that's just, that's just just mind-bogglingly for a physicist um, high. With energy, it's like... What, 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 go ahead. Yeah, it, what's, what's, the t- what's it in terms of Celsius or Fahrenheit? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It's, it's it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, the so, it, so it's, the it's entire that, concept of temperature stops to be sort of meaningful in any way, remotely resembling intuitions for temperature that we actually have. Really, yeah. all of this breaks down because you run into fundamental um, f- the fundamental breakdown of physics. Time intervals yes. shorter than the Planck time don't have a lot of meaning. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some respects, um, the, the, these Planck things are the are the point where you cannot distinguish. So, in 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 in, in, in looking at Planck distance, two two elements that are less than a Planck distance apart, you can't distinguish where they are. At that point, distances just fuzz together and you have no notion. Same thing with when you're talking about with with energies above 10 to the minus 19th giga electron volts, um, where where, where CERN is, is happy if they get to 150, this is one with 19 zeros. Energies that beyond those, those energies, it's just like, like just like off the chart, your 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 your, your energy meters just I, just pegged to the side. I, and- I do have I do have a question. Back to the temperature thing, is is that hotter or colder than our sun? Well, much <laughs> much much hotter. Yeah, it, it, way In way magnitudes. Way I you know, isn't isn't the core of our sun on the order of ten to the ten to the seventh? I think so. That sounds Kelvin. right. Yeah, ten million, ten million, yeah, like, ten like million the, the core, yeah, the, the core of the sun is closer to absolute zero than <laughs> the yeah. ten to the power yeah. of thirty-two. Yes, and, and that's and, and so one of the things that you think about, like with 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 obviously with, with with Planck time things, is that cause and effect get all muddled up, right? Yeah, normally you say, well, here's a here's a a thing that causes something. That produces an effect later on, right? You have you have a you have a point in time with a cause that that affects something later. When you get to Planck scales, because you can't really distinguish who came first in the same Planck amount of time, you cannot say this thing caused that thing. At that time causality breaks down, and the energies. Space is so um, uh, warped by these energies that space time, even from a relative point of view, breaks down. It's just it just becomes just just almost useless to talk about space time. Um, mm-hmm. And and I I, I go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go. Ahead. Uh, I, I I I like to think of, like in in these epochs. I like to think in terms of phase transitions. Like when if you like the most familiar phases that we are familiar with is like frozen water versus liquid water. And when and it, like if you uh, a fro like a, 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 a an ice crystal can only be understood in terms of its structure. But if you if you zoom in too close smaller than the ice crystal eventually you cannot describe the ice crystal crystal anymore and that's basically what happens here you you zoom in to a a, 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 a tiny uh length scale or time scale such that uh, even space time becomes undescribable 
yeah. at least so far as we know for, for yeah. now. Yeah. Now the mm -hmm. now the we, we presume the universe, the dural universe, that is the the universe that you could have perceived, and and, and that's a I had to put that in sort of air quotes, um, would be less than ten to the minus forty kind of thirty five meters uh, radius. That it, that not that the universe is that big, but that's the the scale which you, you could you could have observed. Um, but there's a problem there in, in that, that, for example, um, if you could have photons, um, if, if, some, if something were to emit something, whatever that something is, and something else absorbs it, within the same Planck tick, um, it, you can't say, well, that thing caused that thing. Right. You, for example, you'd have densities so big that you'd have these, you, what you'd be experiencing are these sort of um, um, tiny little black holes, these quantum black holes that are on the order of, of 10 nanograms that, they, that because they're so small, they evaporate um, almost instantaneously. But, but the problem in, in the Planck epoch is that you can't say, oh, the black hole formed here and then evaporated. That's a cause and effect, which, which because it's such a, in the same kind of plonk tick, you can't say uh, this, this, black, this, this black hole came into existence and then evaporated, right? The notion of this causing that breaks down. So, so negative 35, is that like a micrometer, a, a picometer? Mm -hmm. uh, it's way smaller. Uh, it's like we we have we have no I don't think we even have a prefix for for that. Yes, yeah, not yeah. that I like we we probably do because of how late yeah, it there is. Yeah. Um, oh, right, but right. but it's not one that I know. I mean, uh, yeah. the the smallest ones that we do that are like experimentally sort of tractable. Um, but it depends on what you mean. But um, like you can get all you can do you can observe electron dynamics that are happening at the atom second level. And that's about 10 to the negative, I think that's 10 to the negative 15. It might be 18. Yeah. I, 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 what, what's, what's this, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, there are more Planck lengths within an atom than there are, 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 like, there are, than there are atom lengths yes. within the observable universe. Yes. Yeah, and, that and, would make sense. And so if you yeah. talk about the thing of densities that are so high, and space is just a, a big foamy space time is a big foamy mess that that you could describe black holes evaporating before they form you can't state oh could you say well wait a minute wait a minute wouldn't a black hole have to form before it evaporates and the answer is well within the Planck scale things are are happening kind of on top of each other that it doesn't really make sense and causality breaks down you could cut about causality breaking down because you simply can't measure something smaller than a Planck interval. Mm -hmm. um, you can't measure temperatures below uh, a Planck energy. So they just, it just becomes, it really literally your, your reality uh, energy meter is just pegged to the side and, and it's just, everything is just big. And is there, is there any is there any is there any way to this uh, like uh, like our current understanding breaks down at the point? But is there any proposed models that uh, attempts to dis describe this? Yes. Um, now, what you'll hear a lot of this, we don't know. Um, this is a lot about science. We're talking about the frontiers of science, and there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Um, it doesn't say that we can't have good guesses, uh, but but what would nice be nice is if we had a potentially a quantum quantum mechanical description of space-time quantum mechanical description of gravity if we had that that would probably give us a much better insight into what might be happening at these at these plump scales yeah like, like even even today it's not just at the at this epoch even even Currently, we don't know what happens within this time scale yes. we, and size scale. We it's, we don't know what happens um, even several orders of magnitude larger. We know like a little bit more. We know a little bit more. But when you get all the way back to this first time, uh, 10 to the negative 43 seconds, uh, we really, it, there's, we, we have, there's no confidence in anything yes. before that. And everything actually there you can only say very sort of generalized things 
along the lines of things sort of breaking down and mm-hmm. becoming just all intertwined and no longer being the the statement that causality breaks down isn't um what do you do with that right yes it's very hard <laughs> yes but it's also it's also very strange because plonk plonk times are occurring all the time <laughs> like the right every single second there is like like again mo- there are more seconds within the age of the universe and there are plonk times within within one second and it occurs all the time and we still don't know what act- what happens within it time frame so so yeah uh, but you ask you know are there are there models about this mm-hmm. you know two models that i like there's the nothing state model which essentially says nothing is unstable and that is having nothing and this is a physical nothing not a philosophical nothing um that nothing is unstable and that instability led to a phase change into something that's a that's a nothing state there's a hartel hawking state which says that time gives way to space um so so that so that in the plonk epic and before there's only space and no time that that is that is during this first sort of plonk epic time comes into existence and and um you know it from a relative point of view you say that gravity is so um is so intense and space time is so screwed up you don't even have world lines to, to move along the lines because because there's there's no time to do that 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 basically even the notion of space time just breaks down catastrophically um mm-hmm. and again if you have if you have weird things like like black holes evaporating while they're forming um information just becomes useless and information in the quantum state so if we had a quantum description quantum field description of the gravitational interaction and space-time, we might give a more solid theoretical understanding. Yeah. But- and I think also the one, one of the main goals in physics or like physics uh, is like to to combine all the four fundamental interactions in, into one theory of everything, right? And yes. Basically, which, yeah. which, which may be a mistake because who says that reality is that kind to theoretical physics? <laughs> Uh, um, yeah. um, uh, you, you heard him, scientists. G- get on this, get get on this little epic right here. Get, get us some I, more data. We're trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think you know the notion of the fundamental interactions. Um, one of the problems in the, in the Planck scale is that fundamental interactions don't make sense because um, the, the the scale is 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 too small to to even have cause and effect. I mean, from from if if you're you people think about you know, you you're seeing if you're seeing a computer screen. And I put two dots on the screen that mathematically I could describe, but end up with the same pixel, right? And I say I, I, I plot a dot and I put a dot right next to that dot, but it's much smaller than the pixel on your screen. You can't distinguish those dots. It's just it's just a dot. That's the same kind of thing that happens with Planck time and Planck scales I, and Planck volumes. Mm-hmm. All the dots are just fuzzed together. Yeah. And it's not that you're not clever yeah, enough it, or you don't pay enough attention or have a final rule there is not an answer when you have two items that are within a plump distance of each other you cannot say which is in front and which is in back it the universe does yeah. not have an answer it's, it's, it's also like again to borrow back the analogy uh, at a small enough scale or a short enough scale you cannot distinguish frozen water from liquid water yeah. anymore like there yeah. is no yeah and, you, you need a minimum scale for that uh, so so the energies were so high that that subatomic particles can't form um and if yeah. they did that it, it would take time for cause and effect and you're not even in that sort of thing so there isn't there isn't enough yeah. time there isn't and, and the energies there's mm-hmm. no settling like like a field with 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 a, with a stuff finds a lower thing in a quantum field and, and and a particle becomes realized you don't even have time to even settle even though even even the energies right the notion of this is more energetic than that at, at Planck energies becomes meaningless. Yeah. And right. the, so what distinguishes sort of the Planck time? From, um, how did the Planck time end? What what made it like, what, what is the thing that changed um, to lead us into the next epoch, right? I think it, it mm-hmm. if my understanding is correct, it's, um, it's the sort of 
separation of gravity from the other yes. uh, fundamental as a, as a separate, yeah, yeah, right. yes. And so I think is this is this a point where we could move on to the ground unification yes. ethics, which uh, yes, which we've mm -hmm. we've we've had a tick, <laughs> we've had a we've had a a, a, a distant stuff, um, but but here things are equally as as that. So let's go to the, if you go to the, the the next beautiful slide that was made by Ness. Um, so remember that time interval, we talked about the Planck interval of 10 to the minus 43rd. Well, we're talking about 10 to the minus 43rd to 10 to the minus 36 seconds. Uh, real, real fast, is any, what, what if anything here is unifying the unifying, or is that just the, the term? Well, there's a really unified, everything's gravity. You have enough time and distance distinguishment where you can start talking about space time. So presumably gravitational interactions start becoming real, but 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 these the temperatures of stuff, interaction of stuff is so extreme that that you really don't have um mm -hmm. yeah. Stuff. I think oh, well, well, if I if I understood correctly, like before like in the previous epoch, the Planck epoch, like and uh, not nothing of everything becomes uh, undefined so so basically yeah, that, and that's how, oh sorry that's how the f interactions become the same basically because everything becomes undefined but now space time becomes more definable which makes it more distinguishable from the for the other three interactions maybe i'm wrong about that yeah uh, i think the other three interactions are still mushed together because of stuff being so uh, so come back to it now. This gravitation yeah. epic is its duration is about ten million Planck ticks of time. Um, so so we're now having we now can have cause and effect, but but the energies are like ten to the twenty ninth Kelvin. That's one with twenty nine zeros Kelvin. That is just beyond the charts of of energy. The energy is like like. 10, you know, um, uh, 10, I could be 10,000 trillion so the, billion electron volt stuff. I mean, so the universe is cooling down now. <laughs> well, and, and actually you have time to begin to cool. You have energies that you begin to distinguish. You have an observable universe that's 10 to the minus 30 meters. That's way, 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 way smaller than, 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 a, than a nuclear a proton. It's the observable universe, right? Um, yeah. And and understand that, that, that even at these, so you have if you have you've had a roughly around ten million Planck ticks, um, the speed of light is such that 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 for the universe, you know, everything gets gets harmonized. That is that if you had something which could like elevate its temperature because it did something, um, that that energy is dispersed over the entire observable universe. So everything is mm. nice and uniform. Everything is nice. Nothing can kind of stand out because everything is all mushed together at such high energies. And the reason it's cooling down, um, to, to remind people, the, the sort of thing that's happening fundamentally is the expansion of space time. It's not yes. cooling down by radiating its energy to a cold bath. Excellent. It's, Point. It's not doing that. It is not cooling against something else. It's just expanding thinning. <laughs> and thinning. Yes. And if when you take like if if you take um uh a, a compressed thing of air and you spray it out of a, a small little nozzle at high velocity, you have to you have to like crush it down and then it comes out of that nozzle and it expands and it gets much 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 colder immediately just as sort of a, as a consequence um of that and a similar kind of thing is happening um in the early universe yeah so so in some ways again everything is mushed together but they're distinguishable from a quantum Planck point of view um so at that point you can talk about space time and so the models say that the gravitational interactions has separate out but electromagnetism strong and weak nuclear are just all smashed together. Um, and so things like mass, and you know, when we talk about you know, particles, we talk about things, they talk about what's the mass of something, what's the charge of something, what's the flavor of something, what's the color of something. These are all kind of, of standard model things. They're, they, at this 
at this epic, it's meaningless. Um, it, it, it's yeah, it, and so you really can't. You know, for example, there's no weak nuclear because there's no nucleons or even strong nuclear to decay. There's no nucleons to even decay. So, so some of these forces are are just just it's it's meaningless from the point of view of of of, of photons or nuclear or weak nuclear or that sort of thing. Yes, I, I, maybe, maybe I can. Oh, sorry, sorry. If you want to uh, first say something, go, go ahead. I, I was gonna um, uh, ask uh, you guys to uh, rate an explain uh, a sort of way. I tried to. I was gonna have to try and describe what it means for the forces to be sort of smushed together because I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very confusing like concept. I, I, like, what do we mean by I, that? <laughs> Like I, I was actually, I was actually about to bring up and again, I can borrow the uh, Walter analogy. I, I like the phase transition analogy, but basically, it's in, like Walter exists like at normal temperature and pressure in the atmosphere it exists as a liquid because the interactions between water molecules is strong enough for them to be condensed compared to like uh, nitrogen gas. But at high enough temperatures, these these, these molecular interac interactions become meaningless, and they they all water and nitrogen exist as a gas at that point. So they are they become less distinguishable. And I think it's sort of the same in this instance, where at high enough temperatures, the interaction, the four, or in this case, the three interactions, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force become uh, meaningless and such that everything become, seems to be the same at, the, at this point. Maybe I'm wrong again. Yeah, but that, 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 that's how I think That's a good it. way, again, but of course we... We really don't know. We're we're in the solid yeah. area of, mm -hmm. of theoretical physics, and so people try to say, well, you know, we have we have a, a model of of we do have models of 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 this sort of uh, uh, of the of a electronuclear force, right? But yeah, but but those are they're they're not observable because we can't build things that can create these kind of temperatures, these kind of densities, um, these types of, of, of stuff at scale. We don't, we don't, we don't have that technology to do that yet. So we have to rely on, on, on theory. What, when, what time period do we get to that? I mean, we're going to get to that, uh, several towards the end when we get to the things where we can like, for example, when you get to CERN, where it can do like 150 GeV. Remember right now we're dealing with stuff of, Mm -hmm. on, on on we're we're seeing seeing a stuff that is on the order of ten thousand trillion GeV, and we can we're we're doing we think we're doing well just to get one hundred and fifty. <laughs> so 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 we're talking about energies that are much well beyond our ability. Also, it's it seems like in the current universe, um, it's well beyond the universe's ability to do that. I mean, even the most energetic cosmic rays are puny compared with these kind of energies uh, yes and there's sort of fun there there's a kind of a, a limit to how energetic a photon can be because if it's too energetic if you if you try and put too much energy it will spontaneously uh decay into yes. uh, a positron <laughs> and an electron pair that couldn't and and then those can go off and do their own thing and annihilate and you can it can sort of trickle down and eventually you end up with a lot of photons yeah. and other things but in the early universe when you had that electron positron pair for one thing the electron was bigger than the entire universe yeah so and, the concept yeah. of an electron doesn't make sense and so so in a quantum field thing where you talk about stuff coming out ex excitations of a field to say well, that's a particle um you have problems saying, well, you ask, well, okay, if, if you think you've got a particle there, tell us what the mass is. Well, you can't really describe it. Tell us what, what charge. charges. Uh, no. Um, can I do stuff with a standard model about, about, about its flavor or its so forth? Those things don't really matter. You know, and in fact, it's, 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 it's somewhat doubted whether or not you even have particles at this stage. Yeah, I, I was about to ask. Well, if they do, they're weird particles. Yeah, I was about to, yeah, I was about to ask about that. We, we had pictures of cork and stuff here. But it's it's not officially the quark epoch yet. So oh. are there even quarks here and or well, stuff here yet? Well, in that standard model that was put there, what you were talking about when we talk about there, there are properties that the standard model talks about, 
but those properties and those things like like the 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 the, the type of of the generation of matter or whether it's a uh, a fermion or a boson or whether or not it's it's a it's a lepton or you know or a quark you know all that sort of thing those things are are, are really not present here right. the, 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 the yeah, properties it's, it's, it's either yeah it's, it's either these particles didn't exist yet or these particles are indistinguishable from each other or or something else. <laughs> yeah, you. yeah, yeah. You, you're, you're, yeah. None of those particles in that, that ground vacation model are existing at this stage. And if if a particle did exist, um, you have trouble talking about its mass, or that has a charge, or it has a spin, or there has a you know a, a color from the quantum chromodynamics state, say towards things like that. It, it it these. So when you talk about the things being unified, we sort of say, well. Um, the physical stuff going on was kind of just one big blob and yeah. the, and the universe, the, the, the observable universe was small enough that, that everything, if anything got above something, it, it averaged out to the rest of the observable universe. The universe was so small that, that, that everything is, is, is interacting. So it's, it's kind of like a, a startup company, right? In a startup company, you have the founders, that's like the Planck era, and they hire a couple of employees. And, and during that hiring, every founder gets to talk to every employee. And every employee gets introduced. Everyone knows who everyone is, right? And, and in this early startup phase, everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone has to do multiple jobs because there's not enough people to do the tasks. And, and every decision gets harmonized across the company. Everyone knows what it is. At some stage when the, 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 the company grows big enough, that someone gets hired and you can't ask every employee to interview this person. And so some people all of a sudden say, well, who are you? Oh, I'm so-and-so, I got hired. Oh, I didn't know that, right? That's that's the phase transition from a startup to a, to a starting up um, is, is that sort of thing. And so the universe is that way. If, if there were things happening, particles happening, if the alien had particles at time, every part of the observable universe knew it, experienced it, interacted with it. So I'm, oh, so, I'm oh, well, one thing that if you got, to, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I, so one thing I'm curious about, um, that is how, how does, so one way of saying what you just said is that, um, the universe is very rapidly, uh, and in thermal equilibrium with itself, yeah. everything yes. is sort of moving yes. around and what charge that, equilibrium and mass equilibrium yeah. and so forth. It's all yeah. pretty uniform. Um, what is is the mechanism of that equal so at this point in time we have two we have two interactions we have gravity which is separated out and we have the electronuclear interaction are both of those interactions involved in that thermalization and energy tra um, information transfer uh, process or is all of the thermalization like gravitational waves and stuff doing it I, uh, if i had to or guess we, if i had to guess know? Because you know, space-time interaction is asserting itself, right? Space-time, we have enough. We now have enough Planck units and Planck things. You can start talking about world lines in in space. But from the point of view of other properties, everything gets blended. In. When 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 something has interaction, the entire universe knows it. I know that experiences it. If there was a if there was a particle to decay, the entire universe is able to to react to that but okay. well observable universe i should oh, say it's also, observable universe. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. That's, that's one of the things i was about to mention you need to establish the difference between the observable universe and the, the total universe yeah. yeah we don't know if the universe is, is infinite or not um yes exactly and from a point of view of 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 i uh, uh, of of causality remember it says c which people call the speed of light, but it really is the speed of causality, about 300 million meters per second. Um, it, the, the C is, is you know, for example, if you take this this epoch, which ends around, we think it ends around 10 to the minus 36 seconds. Light will travel, it's able to, photon will travel three times 10 to the 28 meters. But but the universe is, 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 much, is much smaller. The universe, is about 300 times smaller. The observable universe is about 300 times smaller. So, so even 
even at the end of this ground unification epoch, the universe is so small that photons can travel back and forth if there were photons um, um, 300 times across the observable universe during this period of time. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and hey, what, what do you mean with the, the photons? Well, electric and electrons and magnetism interactions and the forces are just all smashed together on top of each other. So it's kind of, it, it isn't, they, they're not operating distinctly. The best way to say is that the observable universe was unified and anything that happened in a plonk, a plonk um, tick was, was dispersed throughout the early universe and everything, everything was aware of everything happening. Well, you, but you, you still have to, you still have to obey the limit of causality, right? Yes. Like it, it, it something exactly. that happens in a plank tick still has to propagate outward. It doesn't just instant, like actually instantaneous. It's not a non-local interaction. Very good point. That, and yeah, and we have around 10 million plank ticks during this, this, this epic. So yeah. we have we have ticks to do that, and and um, but as I say, the, the 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 thing about the observable universe size is that is that we have we have in 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 there we have roughly um, we have in here we have roughly um, uh, how should I say it um, we have roughly about three hundred. Um, that, that is, that is um, causality can go across the Zerval universe 300 times in this epoch. So, so you could have causality because you have a Planck. Let's say, let's say, for example, in one Planck instance, uh, you have some weird particle and that weird particle decays in the next The electronucleon. Yes, um, <laughs> decays. Um, um, there are... During the same break, that that result of the decay can go back and forth across the uh, observable universe three hundred times, so that everyone can 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 equalize to that decay. If in fact you could talk about it being decay, um, that the big thing is that and because and because, and because, it, the, because the information is able to travel across the observable universe at this point, it becomes uh, meaningless to say where it happens. Yeah, because it's all all in the observable universe. Now, whether the universe is finite or infinite is a, is, a, is an open question. Oh no, or my or my mistake. Be, but you're, you're right. You're right. right. That. That, that, that is that is the that you might what you might say is that the, the universe at this stage is uniform because yes. causality can cause things to go across the observable universe many times in this epoch. Yeah, we there uh, very. Very few symmetries have been broken at this time. Uh, you do have gravity that has sort of separated out. You have an arrow of time, I suppose. Yes, um, yes. You, uh, the other forces, the other interactions are still not distinguishable in any sense. Uh, what about um, the matter-antimatter distribution? So that's a, that's another thing where, where, where um, at, at it's possible that that some decay um there's a this is called baryonogenesis right and and with conservation of baryon number um it's possible during this time that matter and antimatter um were, were not equivalent um because we could here here's a problem right and this universe today is dominated by matter if the antimatter gets created, it very quickly gets annihilated. Right? We are in a a matter dominated universe. So, for 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 those who don't know, can you explain what antimatter is? Uh, basically, if you look at the, the the chart right here with all the the, the particles, the antiparticle is the same except it has the opposite charge, right? Yes. yes. That's, 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 the, that's the only difference. That's the only difference. Yeah. And so an an, an anti op quark would have the the same charge, but in this in the opposite uh, yeah. di direction yeah. or uh, it, ma magnitude, opposite magnitude. Yeah. And it appears that the antimatter particles interact with space time just like matter particles. They have opposite charge, opposite spin. And and when 
In this universe, when matter and antimatter interact, you get energy. In fact, when, when energy, you know, the, you know, the e equals MC squared, everyone heard about where energy and mass are there in this universe. Now, when what we see is when energy turns into matter, we get half of it antimatter, half of it matter, right? Mm -hmm. when, 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 yeah. when E turns to M, we get half M, half anti-M. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, if that were to hold, the universe should be nothing but photons because all the matter and antimatter should annihilate each other, right? How come we have matter now? Mystery. What caused? We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. And, and so some people, some very credible theorists suggest that this beginning possible small axis of matter and antimatter occurred around this time when forces were all kind of smushed into one final interaction. And, and I say the final interactions were, were sort of, were sort of there. And the universe was all that something happened um during this era now this all happened later on too there's the big debate as to how as like, we yeah, know the, like the, the miss it that i mean the missing mass or or and or energy of the antimatter has to be like has to go somewhere or it could be converted to something else to prevent it from reacting with the normal matter basically right or, yeah and, mm -hmm. and you want to talk about your know, baryon number i mean I think we, I think we have a slide later for that to, okay, to okay. Uh, but, yeah. but, but I'm just mentioning because a lot of stuff here about what, what we get into, we, we're doing this timeline, but we're now in a situation where depending on what your model is, the, yeah. the, 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 the excess matter occurred during this time or occurred a little bit later and, and different models put it there. But the point is now today we have an excess matter. Um, there isn't a part of the, we, we it, it is, it is impossible that we've missed it. There isn't some half of the universe that's antimatter. And how do we know that? No, because yeah. if, if that were the case, the matter and antimatter would be interacting with each other and you have these, these energetic photons of annihilation of stuff going out. We don't see that. Yeah. I was going to say something and then I forgot it. <laughs> we're, we were talking oh. about matter, antimatter. We have an excess of matter. Um, yeah, this is something that uh, we, there are a lot of um, experiments uh, today that are, are trying to measure various phenomena where the the standard model, the, the standard model of physics does not have an explanation for this. It, it, all of its rules, when you go back, maintain that symmetry. So we're trying to look for violations of the standard model. Um, and one of the ways that we do this is with particle accelerators, trying to find new higher energy particles that are well explained by some sort of theory like supersymmetry or something like that. Um, or the uh, in grad school, I wasn't on this experiment, but what my advisor, uh, the other experiment that he was and is running was to measure the electric dipole moment of the electron to see if the electron has isn't perfectly round and, yeah. if, and it's got, a, it's got they, a slightly negative on one side and slightly positive on another side or, or yeah that. yeah yeah but, and they put the there are very 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 um stringent limits on that number and the closer and closer they can confine it near zero it it's able to rule out various um particle theories at higher energies for example um that might explain this so maybe we'll eventually measure something that is not zero and then we'll have a little clue yeah on a right. length scale <laughs> and that's this is back to the, the smushing of internal interactions if the electron has a, has a has a shape to it rather than just being a pure point if if you know, when you approach this way you get a little bit more you know negative interaction than positive interaction you know, for example um then it's quite possible during this grand unification epoch where you have Planck ticks, you have space time, that these electrons were kind of, if they, uh, things that could become electrons later on were, were uh, all smushed together. And it's possible that somewhere in that process, um, matter is favored over antimatter, right? Yeah, now, there, there, you can imagine a way that you would have a spontaneous 
um, alignment of these fields. If if the fields have a shape, yeah. then that gives you something that can yeah. ca cause some asymmetry in one little patch maybe um, versus another or in some other way. Yeah. Now, now we don't even have electrons really in this, yeah, this, we, this era, right? We don't even we, we don't even have the electroweak force at this time. <laughs> yeah, let alone electro electric magnetism. So, so um, what you have during this time is is exotic physics. At least you have Planck things, about ten million of them, where you can have causality and you have space time, but but. Um, at these extremes, it's possible that something in physics favors matter and time. Now, the favoring is really slight. I mean, the, the model suggests that if mm. that that mm -hmm. um, one out, you know, that, that the model suggests only a very, very, very slight uh, favoring thing. It's probably one out of one billion six hundred and fifty million parts was a little bit more matter than antimatter. We're talking about maybe one in you know, a little bit less than one in two, you know, two parts billion of where, where matter is favored. If if, if, if it was it, the human population, you would have one survivor. Yes. Roughly. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so the result is that if there, if there, if there are particles there, these particle antiparticle pairs are annihilating each other. And remember the, the universe is so small, these annihilations is, is is transmitted the, the result of those annihilations get transmitted across the observable universe and that's that's weird to think that 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 if you had a thing that that it would transmit across the observable universe that quickly but it was and but somewhere in that exotic physics perhaps the 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 matter and antimatter are not equivalent why do we think they're not equivalent well today we have matter where is the corresponding antimatter? Well, uh, we think that there was there was could it be could it be it could the uh, corresponding antimatter or the missing antimatter be converted into something else like dark matter or dark energy? Well, I, I'm just random guessing I, at this point. I, but 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 for antimatter to go away, it requires matter to interact with, mm. right? So so a, a, an example of stuff would be that as that far as might, we know, you but... might have you might have had. 1,630,000,000 parts antimatter and 1,630,000,000 and one parts matter. So, so the 1,630,000,000 parts of matter and antimatter annihilate each other and the one part is left over. That became matter in this current universe. The big, there's the, a the, the big mm -hmm. uh, thing, both, both experimentally and in, in 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 theory to try to say where why do we have matter mm -hmm. in this universe at all i don't know dr Hector, do you want to i because you've done some stuff in this general area haven't you or you work on well, i would say it, it it it's it's um the, the 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 effects seem to would only manifest at very high energy scales Yes. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons that pe we we talk about uh, experiments like um, at at CERN and whatnot um, as probing you know the physics of the Big Bang a little bit because you can observe, for example, the the um, smushing together of the electro of the uh, weak interaction and the um, electromagnetic interaction to some degree. Yeah, you you could start to like uh, approach that. Um, and get insights into it. We don't know why or what what interaction. If there was, if there's another one that we need to put into it, that is for some reason it doesn't have anything that we see anymore. Yeah. Um, so, and I think it's good. I think it's probably we yeah. want to then say, you know, if you think things are weird now, uh, wait until you get into the next thing, which is the inflationary epic. And um, I, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you ready um, to go on to that? I think, I think so. so. Oh, oh, I, think. oh look, I, I have one last question. Like uh, you, you mentioned that the, the charge and uh, and uh, mass are not relevant at, at this point. But is, is spin relevant? The, the spin of particles may or not, or also not relevant. Well, I'm not sure. I would say that the other things aren't relevant. They're not well defined. Yes, mm -hmm. at least not in the way that we define them now. The concept of 
angular momentum, I think, could have meaning. Uh, spin is not necessarily identical with that, but it might be. I, I, I don't think, I think, I think they weren't there. They were just didn't have really much meaning. Yeah, okay. Um, might be the way of saying it. The, the, the meaning we apply today, physics apply today, we talk about mass, you know, a Higgs field and something interact with his field or a charge or a flavor like those when you when, when you when you see the uh grand education epic and the in in the standard model the columns are flavors you know the the, the up down terms or the new the the, the electron muon tau flavors um those things are distinguishable today but back in this era those things really didn't have meaning the notion of what flavor was something mm. was didn't really have much in the way of meaning um what charge think, of something was was it didn't have the kind of meaning that we have today they might have had charge but we don't we don't understand the physics because they're all everything's kind of um uniformly blended i don't think you've already answered the question in the chat like do we really have particles well if the if the particles are there they are not distinguishable in in the, these terms that we are familiar with Yes. Yeah. If, if there were particles of excitations of the quantum field, they're unlike anything we experience today. Yep. Right. And so it because imagine you're sort of charge. Here's an example of a charge, right? Um, if you said, well, we have this this exotic particle back in the grand investigation epic, and it has a negative charge because something else had a positive charge, but but now because of propagation that charge gets gets transferred across the zero universe and the charge is neutralized. Um, so the so everything of, everything becomes neutral, basically. Kind of, sort of, except yeah. except the neutralization is also a, 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 a an interaction, which is which you, you, you can't take even exotic physics today and assume then during this epic that it's going the way you think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anything oh. else you want to point out? Oh no, we can. I think we I, uh, we have been for an hour and we are still right. at, at the third. third okay, so, so let's go into let's go into the places where where the universe gets even weirder. Um, now I want to mention because uh, you hear guys talk about we don't know, we don't we don't we don't know, we don't know. Um, you know, I I was taught that science values questions mm. more than answers. Right. Yes. You know, Feynman's comment was great. The great greatest physicists were the, those who asked the right questions to the right people at the right time. So, not so, that discovered something, not that came up with an answer. Those who asked the questions. Right. And and as I think it's part of Feynman's greatness was the questions he asked were really insightful mm -hmm, and yeah. caused all kinds of people to do all kinds of things. So there's science no, is about questions. Dogma gives you answers. So there's so you're answers. saying there's no holy book here saying what the, the think about here for this yes. part of the universe. And the fact we don't know is very powerful, right? If you want the, your your best defense against dogma is to say I don't know. And so it says yes, well here's truth. Well, well, sorry, that's not how science works. Science is about questions. And, and you're hearing us talk about questions. The forefront of research is trying to answer these questions. And sometimes we're successful in, but, but when we, if you do get an answer, it leads to a whole pile more questions. <laughs> yeah. And we're about to, the, the next epic is one of those things that we have a lot of questions about yeah. and not that many answers. <laughs> so we're talking about these questions. Yeah. Right? So we, we talk about, you know, we, we, we're mentioning hit about matter, antimatter, and matter, dominant universe. Um, we, you heard us talk about gratification of the fact that, that C could propagate across the zero universe 300 times. Everything was uniform. Well, if that were still the case today, the universe would, would be uniform, just a bunch of C of, 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 of photons, right? It, they, but the universe today is lumpy. Right, you're a lump <laughs> in 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 the cosmic thing of things. Um, the Earth has these things with voids and things and voids. How do we go come go from a really uniform 
smushed together with Planck epics and, and space time stuff. I would go from a uniform blob to distinct things. Uh, so at the end of this, according to this, the universe is now a millimeter long. I think that's the right scale, negative third. Yes. Yes, no, like 10 to the negative thir uh, third yeah. is the, yeah. uh, it's, it's a millimeter, like it's about yeah. the size of the, of the tip of a pencil, about yeah. that. So so, yeah. so if if this gravitational epic had, had continued, mm -hmm. then there would no one be able to, there wouldn't, you couldn't have concentration of something because it all equalizes. Um, Today, we have concentration. It's, it's like, it's like you, well, you're I, trying to make, you're trying to make um, uh, 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 tofu, and you start off with a uniform milk and you get something in there to have this stuff percolate out or 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 you have a uniform water vapor gas and now droplets are forming i, I, I may be of so i may be under a misunderstanding of uh what the inflation uh hypothesis is is for because it's my understanding that if if you just continued with with the expansion at the sort of rates that we saw it before um that the problem you run into is actually that the universe is not lumpy enough right yeah i think i thought i thought yeah. it was yeah. I, the, I, th I think it's actually the reverse problem because you're you have a lot of thermalization early on but then if it continues to expand sort of at that rate eventually you lose the ability to thermalize and you would not expect the one side of our observable universe to be um, in, well, yeah. in perfect okay. equilibrium with the other side. I mean, you have to distinguish between between uniformity and 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 consistency, right? Yes, when when the if the universe kept to expand, you'd have localizations of of, of stuff which can harmonize. So so you'd have lumps that would begin to distinguish themselves. That's a different thing than to say the universe is con continues to be bland, right? Because because eventually you get enough Planck epics and 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 space time expands enough that you're right. You can have a you can have that an area of the observable universe do something that another area doesn't see until much later. Yeah. Right. And it um but I, I but it doesn't look like that. It looks like we didn't enter in to that to to a, a an epoch like that um because it it looks like things did continue to sort of um spread around the universe yeah the, um the entire it's it, it continued to be uh uh how do you how, how did you in, uh, in, lo again? in local equilibrium with yeah yes it, it's it, it continued to be equilibrium yeah. across so yes. it continued to be thermalized everywhere yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I guess there's a difference between being thermalized and, and being, you know, cause the universe appears in some scales to be consistent, but there's lumps, right? And so you say, mm -hmm. well, why is it that we have, we have a galaxy here and we don't have a galaxy here? Why, why didn't we just have a uniform collection of lumps? And part of the answer is that you have chunks of the universe that that are that are that are they're evolving that 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 can't receive information from a distant yes. chunk y yes it, it's sort of it's it, it's Maybe, um no, no, like it's, the, it's another it's, uh, another symmetry breaking perhaps right like yes it, it becomes uh, unstable at this point because like uh, oh if at first you had uh, the same like the same magnitude of force pulling you from all directions, but then one direction becomes weaker and then you collapse, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we enter what was called the inflationary epoch. Um, and here we're going from minus 10 to 36 to minus 10 to the 32 um, seconds. So we go from, from um, what if it would be 10, 10 million Planck ticks to 100 billion Planck ticks. And the temperature is dropping from 10 to 28th Kelvin down to 10 to 22nd Kelvin. And energy is dropping from 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 19th. But yeah, the observable universe. So the universe is getting lazy, lazy, lazy now. It's going from 15 yeah, to but, 9. But, 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 but the observable lazy. universe, 
oh, wait, 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 wait. The zeroing universe, um, according to this Epstein epic, went from 10 to the minus 30th meters to 10 to the minus third meters. That is the universal universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the 27th power. During this, during this time, from, from, uh, from, from 10 million plump ticks to somewhere around 100 billion plump ticks, the universe expanded by a factor of one followed by 27 zeros. Um, and, 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 and this, this inflation, one of the things that, that happened during inflation, there's, there's, there's a number of things that, that, that come into play, but one of them has to do with, with monopoles, um, explaining about, you know, monopoles. Well, um, what we don't see in this universe are things that are, um, that are like a North pole. We always see a North Pole associated with a South Pole, right? Um, we don't magnetic, have these yeah, we're magnetic, magnetic, yeah, magnetic poles that are just naked North or naked South. There's always a North of something related to a South of something. Um, and and one of the applications had to do with what happened during this, during this inflation. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about. The US, there's some nice slides coming out here. The mm -hmm. but, but the notion of 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 the universe being flat by flat meaning that uh, parallel lines stay parallel. Um, the the you know the, the, the like that the up down left right are orthogonal. Uh, yeah, real fast. Yeah, to to, to get to, to say this in terms some people might understand. If you're this, if you're the size of a, of a plonk, now you can't walk anymore. You have to take a car or a plane that get across the universe now, even at millimeter. Yes. Long. And meanwhile, the thing you're going to has already evolved. Yeah. You don't know instantaneously what happens. Mm -hmm. Also, one thing I I saw is like one one possibility is that the temperature, like during the inflation epoch, the temperature actually went down to all the way to absolute zero. But after inflation ended, then you had like uh, something called reheating. The, the, the inflaton field collapsed or decayed into uh, radiation yeah. and particles. Yeah. And, that, and that established the hot Big Bang. The, yeah. Yes. I, I think that... Um... Inflation is a widely accepted um, idea, but I do not believe, I, I believe that it, there are a, a sizable, I think, minority that are not convinced of it. Well, I think by convinced of saying, there's, there's, there, there are people that say they want to see experimental evidence that, yeah. that yeah. suggests that inflation exists. And, and there's been some experiments conducted at the South Pole, um, someplace I'm very familiar with, and I've been to these instruments and talked with people there. And, and one of the things that they're trying to do is to measure the, the polarization of the photons that bounced off of the plasma, um, the last bounce off the plasma before the world universe went transparent. Now, this is something we're going to talk about in BE2. Um, but but in this particular situation, we're we're still in the first second. Um, we don't have that 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 process. But the but there are there are attempts to do that. The first attempt with bicep two um, had a problem that that the the measurements that they had suggested inflation, but they couldn't rule out that the measurements were due to to magnetic fields. And, 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 and charge of dust, charge yeah. charge of dust that, that interacted. So bicep three was done to, and, and that further along saying, yeah, um, we can't do the full distinguishment, but it does look like it's there. And so there's a current Keck bicep experiment, which they think will be able to rule out that it's dust and magnetic fields that they're measuring and say, no, the, 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 the this is, direct evidence of inflation. So we don't have that yet. Um, but there is, there is, so, so I think what people doubt about it is it's saying, well, you know, I, they feel much more comfortable if there was actual experimental mm -hmm. yeah. but, evidence of the result of inflation. 
I really, yeah. I, I think, I think we, if I, if I'm right about it, we need to observe like primordial gravitational waves to. That yes. would be another that. one. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that, that's that's what the um the the polarization um effects that bicep and those experiments are trying to look for. the The origin of that, I believe, comes from the gravitational waves. Ultimately, yeah. I think and, I don't know. And. And you know the thing about this stuff is that that you know there is there there are a number of things that that um, you deal with inflation where um, again you talk we talk about reheating stuff we talk about the 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 horizon problem the fact that the universe appears to be flat by, by again flat we don't geometrically right that 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 the, the up down left right forward backwards or nice and orthogonal yeah, flat, flat and stay. three dimensions flat and three yeah. dimensions yeah and yeah. The parallel lines stay parallel um the, the the universe back in the grand Vision epic the previous epic was definitely not flat it was so it's, it's always it's, it's also flat in four here. in four dimensions also flat in, in yeah. terms of space yeah and, space time and, mm -hmm. and and during that time we should we should have had uh, monopoles, these these na naked north and south pole things created, and we should be able to detect these like, leftover naked poles. We don't. I mean, there's been extensive searches for monopoles, and we haven't had any good signal that 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 suggests that that they're there. So what what happened? Why? Why is, why are the, the why are there no monopoles? Why is space flat now back when it was all twisted up? Why you know um, it, it the universe appears statistically be homogeneous and extratropic. Yeah, yeah. Today, right? But, yeah. but, but on on scales, on scales above on mm -hmm. scales above like uh, two hundred megaparsecs, the universe is is really quite uniform. Yeah. Um, now, again, again, I, again, I, to, to borrow the body and uh, water analogy again, it, it, at the molecular scale, you can see like, oh, individual water molecules, mm -hmm. perhaps like see some lumpiness yeah. in one area, but then uh, at our scale, water seems to be uniform liquid. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think, again, and this is, this is probably a confusion on my part, or confusing thing I said on my part, the lumpiness is at the smaller scale. Yeah, right? yeah. That 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 within those within those realms, you know, why is it you even have nucleons, let alone stars and 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 galaxies? Why do you have the lumps at that level? But 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 the but the overall universe appears to be, as I say, homogeneous iso isotropic. When, I think the, the yeah the right? presence of the presence of lumps fundamentally, I think, is a consequence, or seems to be a consequence of of quantum mechanics the you, yeah, it's, it's, you inherently yeah. have fluctuations in fields um that that are intrinsic to uh, these things the, they fall out of um the math starting with a lagrangian and sort of going through and doing the quantum field theory you get these sort of fluctuations yes and and so it's it sort of I think those are like the ultimate way of that. Yeah. But there's just there's something about the scale of those fluctuations at, at different length scales that is not compatible with our understanding of how the universe would have evolved without an inflationary epoch. Yes. An inflationary epoch makes everything fall into place. And in that sense, it is very well experimentally supported, yeah. but not in the sort of um, silver bullet way that the cosmic microwave background demonstrates th that a Big Bang happened in some yes. sense. <laughs> yes, and and that background again, we'll talk about in the next in the next yeah. show. I, it's it's, has, it's like has has lumps. Yeah. That 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 background has lumps. So, so, so there is at that scale, but, but it's like, you know, if you have molecules in a canister of gas, right, they're distributed throughout the thing, isotropic, you know, thermal equilibrium, the gas out the tip canister has enough time to dissipate any, any um, lumps 
and and temperatures, right? That's the thing. But but the situation is quite different if you did have inflation, because um, in the Big Bang model, only you know matter and radiation. That's the finest standard model. That two widely separated regions could not have equalized. Could not have um, equalized. They could not have. They were too far apart. They're too far apart to be able to to become um, isotropic and homogeneous. So even though there's lumps inside it, the two regions are too far apart for C to to, to cause them to equalize. Right. And, and so they can never come into cause, you know, contact to cause the, each other to be similar. The yeah. universe, the speed of light, you couldn't send signals because the universe got it today is, is too much. So, so yeah. we yeah. would have expected regions that had lumps in it to, to evolve quite radically different. And the result would be that we, we should look throughout the universe and see radically different conditions throughout the universe. And we don't. The universe appears to be, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. yes, there are variations, but statistically homogeneous and isotropic, according to what's called the cosmological principle. No, that, so, that's called the horizon, the horizon problem, right? Yes, yes. Yes, like yes, yes. So please, you were going to say something as well. Oh, no, I, I, I was uh, like, like, I was going to say, like, uh, about the problem with, uh, uh, you mentioned, or Weasel mentions that it's not like uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation where you can, you can literally see the glow of the Big Bang, basically. Like, there is no yeah. other op there's no other option to explain that. But with the horizon problem and the flatness problem and the magnetic pole problem, yeah, infla inflation would explain this, but there may be a different explanation. But inflation today, inflation is the best explanation yeah. for that. That's yeah. basically it. Yeah. I, I, I and understand you know, that, that, for example, we see when we measure temperature throughout the total universe, that on average is 2.73 Kelvin. Um, and, and, and so by that, we mean that the universe is, and that's, and that's pretty much, and there's a black body curve that is, that is pretty solid on that, on that line. This doesn't mean that there's, you can't have hot and cold stuff, statistically speaking out in that, and that on the curve, you have extremes, but on average, the universe appear to be a uniform temperature. If you didn't have inflation, as these regions lump into each other and move apart faster than light can travel, you we should have stuff that's really hot over here and super cold over here and stuff in the middle. We don't. We see it. We see things having statistically being being you know similar. Not identical, but similar. Within their cells, there's lumps and things, which is also important. But, but the horizon problem says you've got regions of the universe that 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 could not have caused the other region to be similar. And 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 you know, if you had you know the temperatures couldn't have, for example, transmitted across that fast. So so one of the things that happened, you know, there was a number of solutions. What are the ones that cosmology of you know, the inflation model um, is done by uh, uh, George Milletri. Uh, um, there's also an oscillatory universe that, that I think a Talman cometh with. Um, there's also a, another thing called Mixmaster. But inflation is one of the one of the um, models where there are there's experimental results that are in in keeping with with inflation but don't actually prove it was inflation um and so some of the some of the experiments going on like those at the south pole are are trying to see if they can come up with experimental results measurements that show that the inflation model is is the most likely model. There are other and, models, and give yeah. give more um, guidance onto the details of the inflation exactly. model. Because yes. one of the things, so inflation. My understanding is that inflation um, is it. So it it posits a, a new type of of quantum field, the inflaton field. Yes. Right? Is that does is does that come part and parcel with another fundamental interaction 
or like how does that work so, yeah i mean because 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 if you have this infoton field where you know the the the, the again like water it's like it's like more like say like, think of like like water in a super cooled state um where uh, that's the next right? uh, slide i think yeah the next yes yeah, so you go to go to the next slide yes i don't know you want to you want to talk about this no no you like no 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 you like to no, 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 you like to do the you like to do the water analogy mm -hmm. so so i'll let <laughs> yeah. you yeah it's like uh, again i'm not an expert on this but i uh, i've seen an, an episode on pbs space time and they explained this more in detail basically the infraton field has a potential energy you can see in the figure on the left where it sits at a high potential and that high potential drives inflation. But at this, st at this state, it, uh, it is at a local minimum. So it is, it is meta stable and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's kept at this metal stable position. And it resembles, as you said, as you mentioned before, it resembles water in a super cold state. It wants to freeze, but it's kept from freezing because it, it's in a meta, meta stable state. Yes. And 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 the, it requires uh, like in in the case of super cold water, it requires like a uh, a, per, a perturbation, either a, do, a dust grain or something that can act as a nucleation point for water to freeze into a uh, a, yep. more, a more lower st a more stable state than the previous yes. state. And, and, and in the same case for inflation, uh, in this case quantum tunneling could be the perturbation where the infraton field collapses into a true vacuum state yeah or freezing and, in into yeah, and, and, and back to the knowledge about about uniformity versus lumpiness right using that same analogy um you know you've got you've got a, a, a liquid water in a gas stage where where it begins to um form liquid lumps that 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 are in a super cooled state um, and we look across the universe and we find the universe full of, of water drops in a super cold state that haven't frozen. And the average temperature is pretty uniform across yet. Um, the spots on this side of the, the, the drops on this side of the gas chamber, um, don't have time to, 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 to send the heat for drops on that side. There's, there's no time for the drops to, to, to become similar in temperature, which for the record is very different. Yeah, sorry, yes. I think I cut out for a moment there. I was gonna say the 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 way you prepare super cooled water um is very much um not in in sort of that way. It yes, it has to be a gentle process where the effect slowly mm -hmm. diffuses out. And that can't have happened. <laughs> but so I I I wonder why why would this field collapsing into a vacuum state why would that also then have the effect of expanding space so dramatically it seems very yeah i mean but i don't know I because know. because one of the things is if you if you run if you say well this is sort of way it is, physics is the way it is now and you run it backwards you find that that they say well wait a minute we should have monopoles around um mm -hmm. the universe should not be so uniform Right, because that space should not be so uniform. Space time should not be so uniform. How would it get uniform if it couldn't like um, adjust itself into equilibrium? Yet it yet it lumped, right? It did lump, but in local scales, just like those drops can you know, have have water molecules that come together to form a super cool drop. It, it did lump at that scale, but but how did the drop on this side of the overall universe? equalizes something on that side of the universe when there's not enough time for mm -hmm. C to, to cross. And, and so the inflation was originally proposed as a way to, to, to fix this fundamental problem of the Big Bang. Big Bang by itself without inflation doesn't work. And experimental evidence say no, right? You need something like inflation or something similar for the physics to work. And, and so there's, there's some active experiments going on to try and see, try to measure real stuff in our cosmos and to see whether or not inflation is, is ruled out or not. And if it is not ruled out, it, it seems plausible, some of the parameters. Because the mechanism, the, the, the duration of inflation, this, this, this thing we've said, uh, 10 to minus third to 10 to the minus 
36 to 10 minus 30 second seconds. That that period of time is speculative in terms of how long mm -hmm. it took. Um, it, yeah, and I think also due to the the, the speculative nature of um, the details of inflation, I think should also um, you should consider that when you consider everything we've already talked about, because yes. everything we've already talked about is sort of behind this thing that one of the things it did was sort of blur a lot of stuff out. And so it's, it's, it, it, it precludes the same ability to have detailed understanding of what came before inflation sort of by the nature of the beast. We're trying to yeah. understand based on a very, very, very small sub subset of what we can see. And it's inflation's sort of, yeah. And, and there's a number of models about inflation that have different intervals, different amounts of, of universe expansion, um, how it, it, you know, whether it, it, it jumped up to high inflation, stayed that way and then dropped back down or had a more gentle curve up and down or, or so forth. The, 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 whether inflation was uniform across the inflation or epic. Um, these are things that are, that are, that are, that, they're trying to get experiments to try and and narrow down the, the the possibility. So at best, you could say there's the information we receive from experiments have are, are consistent with inflation, but but don't rule out alternatives. And they're trying to get better measurements and and more clear measurements to try to see whether or not inflation survives or gets kicked out in replacement of something else. There are other things. That, that, that are that are possible um but inflation appears to be the one that seems most plausible at this time we will know and i think i think you know i would say probably given experimental success that that by the end of this decade we will have uh, much more direct observations um showing that for gravitational waves of the early universe and this might mean by this, this is something to, be, to understand. Um, in the universe during this inflation time, you have sound waves, pressure waves going through the universe um, mm -hmm. that that we can see today. There were the, the, the universe was literally there was a sound in the universe with overtones, just like a musical instrument might be playing 440A, but has overtones, which is why a violin sounds different than a cello, sounds different than a piano. It's the overtones. Right. The universe had a resonance there that was set up early on, and that that resonance has 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 decayed, such that the the fundamental tone, fundamental length, of the the frequency of the universe right now is is best characterized as about B flat, but seventy one octaves below the standard piano B flat. Um, and 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 that's sort of like the fundamental resonance tone of the universe, which is part of this the notion of saying it's 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 in it's in this equilibrium, but there isn't enough time for everything to equalize when 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 stuff inflated so fast. Well, through what medium did this sound propagate through? I mean, well, it, I don't, so right? some of it some of it would have been direct matter matter coupling. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I matter at this point is still it's a little bit fuzzy, mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> but, but some of it some of it also then would have been um, a small fluctuation in in the mass density because it's so dense is going to have a direct imprint yeah. on space time. Yeah, in yeah. a way that you don't you don't get nowadays um, unless you're talking about the most extreme astrophysical yeah. systems. Um, but back then, everything was just kind of really that dense. Would be, that would be basically the uh, the cosmic uh, gravitational wave background radiation. Yes, yeah. and we'll see that. We'll see that when we when we get to, to start at BE2, I, you'll see some of that stuff happening. So, so was well, this... We're still, we're still in the first second. So, <laughs> so was this, yeah. mu was this mu music this 
was giving off was it a, like a platinum or is it like a one hit wonder it, it I, well that that depends on whether you have a cosmic <laughs> if you cyclic cosmology where you have bang bang cycles that it's that it's a uh, it's a, it's a it's a you know it's the current hit of the of this era if it's a one hit wonder we have one one big bang then then yes it's, it's there but but a lot of stuff and literally again sound is very important literal sound waves moving yeah. together and part of the thing as well you know quantum mechanics says you are not allowed to have everything be a nice perfect energy level right there's, there's always going to be fuzz and that some of the early earliest propagations of sound also were density waves going through there which creates gravitational fields you have now enough lots of planck optics to start having space time do its thing and and such you don't have stars yet you don't have even nucleons yet but 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 at the end of inflation or period by the way the other thing about inflation people have heard probably heard about dark energy and that the universe is is accelerating um some people ask well first of all this dark energy why is the universe accelerating because that standard model that we saw Back in grand unification epoch, that 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 that, that particle physicists are so proud of, of their accomplishments, does not account for dark energy. And about seventy percent of the universe is this dark energy thing. So it's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a big part of the universe. Yet the 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 problem, yeah, you know, the people say, well, could what happened during inflation be the same process that switched back on slowly that's causing the universe to accelerate is there is there any relation between dark energy in the current accelerating universe and the infoton field uh, we don't know it's a lot of stuff we, we can measure effects we know that the universe is accelerating we have an experimental data that suggests but does not prove inflation we know that the that the big bang model without something like inflation or an alternative falls apart so we need inflation or or an a, a equivalent thing to, to, to explain what's happening yet we don't have it but but inflation started some 10 million plunk ticks and stopped to 100 billion and we have the electro weak epic so it should go on to the next thing and, okay yeah yeah well this is relevant to the next thing so yeah yeah so so the next thing we have there in fact I, if you can switch onto that nice uh graphics that uh Ness, you know did um so now we're talking about 10 to the minus 30 second seconds down to to a picosecond and the temperature drops from 10 to 20 second kelvin down to 10 to the 15th energies drop from from I, 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 a billion billion electron volts down to 150 giga electron volts and the universe goes from from maybe a a a millimeter of observable size to about the distance between earth and the sun but an AU in size right and, and this is this is where this is the point where we have a, a, a lot of understanding like maybe it's, it's still above the energy levels for the large hadron collider but we still, we still i think we still understand this epoch pretty well in detail right or, or am i mistaken in that yeah i mean the our, our, the tail our end of it, we start to be able to measure effects yes. in that energy range yeah so 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 the the very end of the literary week epic is where we've been able to experimentally probe um so so you're right we go from a a insane amount of energy to energies that we can begin to create towards the very end of this epoch uh, so thinking of energy the, the, the thing is this like kinetic energy or some other type of energy that's happening right now that's an excellent question um it so the one of the um general things is it energy sort of takes different forms at different levels because when you actually start to have particles and stuff 
particles, when they're moving slowly, have a certain sort of amount of energy associated with, with their movement that scales differently um, than, than when they and their mass than when they're really, really fast moving. And the transition from a radiation dominated universe where even the massive particles are like moving so fast that they behave almost like radiation. Um, it, like that occurs. I don't know if that occurs over um, when exactly that occurs. I think it's much later than this. Yeah. Yeah. But because, because right now the only thing that can really form and these energies are, are the more exotic particles on the Saturn model, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the W and Z bosons, um, the Higgs bosons, things can, things that have rest mass can now have time to interact with the Higgs field so that mass becomes meaningful. And electromagnetism, um, and, and, and so above, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a symmetry that, that happens, symmetry breaking that, that happens. And, and so now in this case, we have, we have essentially a, a, um, how should I say that, 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 that this, that the electro weak is it, 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 correct me wrong. Isn't the, the electric electromagnetic and weak interactions remain unified, but strong becomes yes. interaction I becomes separate. That. I think that already happened before inflation, right? The, uh, the strong interaction broke yeah, off. I was going to ask about that. What, yeah, what what is the timing of that? Um, well, pre-inflation, you have the grand vacation epoch. Electric tensile strong and weak nuclear are are yeah. are, are are sort of become electronuclear. Somewhere between grand unification during inflation to somewhere in this current electroweak epoch, strong nuclear becomes more like what we experience today. Electromagnetism and weak nuclear are, interactions are still kind of smashed into a electroweak force, but strong nuclear begins there. And also you start to have real, you know, some of the first particles on our standard model the bosons, the W and Z bosons, and the Higgs bosons, um, showing up. Uh, Are you going to I, say I, something else? I don't know. No, no, so, sorry for interrupting. If uh, no, so, go ahead. So I, I have seen, I have seen that uh, the uh, like sometimes like uh, I've seen that according to some sources, the uh, the uh, strong force broke off right at the end of the grand unification epoch, and that in yes. like because because of that. Infl the inflationary epoch is sometimes included within the electro weak epoch. Correct. We yeah. don't know, and yeah. and there's variations in different models. And part of the notion of trying to understand if inflation occurred, if so, what parameters are doing exactly this? So, so what, what makes this so weak, and opposed to strong an electro strong epoch? Well. Um... So, so the the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force are two of the fundamental uh, interactions. And then along with the electromagnetic force, gravity has long since like split off to go and do its own thing. Um, and the the one that remains unified with the electromagnetic force is the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is the force that is described by gluons and is responsible for the binding and whatnot in the nucleus um, of an atom. And it, it talks about the relationship between quarks and gluons and, and all of that fun stuff. The uh, a weak force is one I understand much less well. It's responsible for like neutrinos and leptons. Yes. And, and uh, that's basically what we, it does. And and we, we don't have those. Is. We don't. We don't have those leptons yet, right? They, they, we're still. We're still too high of energy too early on. So, so things like electric charge don't really have much in the way of meaning. Um, and and mass is another thing. Particle rest mass doesn't have much meaning because because you you're, you're beginning to form. You, you have your Higgs Higgs mechanism just starting somewhere in this 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 epoch or maybe during inflation we're not we're not quite uh, sure 
I, if, if I'm not mistaken, like the, the, the bosons that mediate the weak force, like the W boson mm -hmm. and the Z, the, the Z boson, like, the, like those that mediate the weak force are very massive. And that's why the weak force is very short ranged. But yes. during this time when the rest mass is not yet uh, applicable, then the weak force becomes uh, the same, basically uh, yeah. indistinguishable from the ele electromagnetic force. Yes, and that 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 energy level, that critical energy level, the transition, has been measured at around one hundred fifty nine point five plus or minus one hundred one and a half giga electron volts, and and so those those bosons you talk about become significant, which is why the weak nuclear force kind of big, uh, weak nuclear interactions start to become significant, and yeah. and it's why in the quantum field we. We can you can start to say that yeah we have W and Z bosons and the Higgs mechanism beginning. Prior to that, um, you, rest mass didn't really have any effect. It, it, you might have had rest mass, but it, but it didn't do anything for you. Is that is that a fair way to say? Uh, it's, it, I think it's also again going back to my water analogy. You have uh, water molecules and nitrogen molecules, and they have different. Uh, masses but if you heat them uh yeah. hot enough then the, those differences become uh, irrel uh almost irrelevant because they, they behave the same way in the, in the gas phase for example yes yeah. yes um so shall we move on to the nep next epic the, the quark epic well because, um are, oh good we we're going to say something before we do that well so which do what particles at the end of uh like are coming into existence and be become decently well defined. Do you do you have quarks I, I, at this time? I, no, no. Okay. Do we have any any particles? I, we we, we have I, bosons. The the the, the W and Z well, bosons and here. Okay. Like if I'm not mistaken, if I'm mistaken, like the the main difference between the quarks and the leptons is that, that the quarks have color charge, right? And the leptons yeah. don't have color. And charge. we don't. And, and color isn't really a property that makes sense at this stage. Oh, we, like I thought that like the the strong forces are already separated, right? So well, it's towards the end, or somewhere towards the end. <laughs> um, pretty good at that critical energy. See, above no, that the, critical uh, energy, the, 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 that's the weak. electro weak. That's, that's, that's weak force. I, I meant the strong the strong force mediating the color charge. That that is all uh, has already separated uh, at the end of the towards the end. Yes, and but no, but no, 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 before before no. Oh, like, before. before before electroweak epoch, the, the yeah, it's the electroweak epoch. Force, so it's already separated out. Right? It's, it's, it's already separate. At this point, the strong force is already separate. Yeah, but 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 it's only towards the probably towards the end of this epoch that you even have the carriers, right? That the the, the, the mm. W and Z bosons okay. can can form. Oh, no, the glue epoch. one. The now, glue now, now, I'm, re I'm yeah. referring to the glue ones. Well, that's why we need to get to the next epoch, right? Because no, sorry, sorry, this about that. is yeah. this is. Let's let's go to the quark epic, where I, where we have we're going from a, a picosecond down to maybe two microseconds. All right, real, fast, real question. So, are quarks currently now the smallest thing we can observe? I don't know what you mean by small, and I don't know what you mean by observe. So, I mean, the the quarks I, I think are point particles to the extent that they don't have like a a spatial extent if you perform well, a position measurement but i think what you need to what you want to say is fundamental particles right um we believe that fundamental particles like electrons and and neutrinos and quarks and gluons are fundamental they don't decay to something I, less because they, I they don't because we used to think atoms were the smallest, then we found that atoms had parts, and now we. But, but small, small becomes problematic. I, yeah. I wouldn't call it small. You, you and I, I mean. Would say, I, no, 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 this is the big point, right? right? That size is not a thing, particularly from like an electron that may actually be point size. Um, what you talk about is something complex and compound like a proton dec can decay into stuff, you can split it into stuff. Whereas you don't, you're not going to take an electron and split it into sub-electron thingies. You're not going to take a quark and split it into yeah. sub-quark. That's what thingies. I meant, kind of. I just can't explain it. That's yeah. 
it's a situation where you have like, oh, what's the size of a quark? Uh, data not found. <laughs> yes, that's, yes. That's, that's the answer. <laughs> um, so, so in this quark epic, right? We've now gone, you know, and it did last from the first picosecond down to the about two uh, microseconds. The temperature drops from from a thousand trillion Kelvin down to about a trillion Kelvin. The energies go from 150 GeV to 150 MeV. Now we're in the now we're well into the um, you know particle physics stuff. Um, and what happens here is that you get um, you get electric breaking of the Higgs mechanism. Mass and electric charge become becomes quite you know become their own thing. Um, you know before the other thing as well is that 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 the W and Z photons are no longer being rapidly formed. In the previous epic, those W and Z bosons are being created at extraordinary rates. Um, now, stuff is lasting enough that those 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 bosons are decaying, and weak interactions start to become short range. Um, before this, energetic the collisions were so energetic to interject to to form quarks. Um, for, to allow quarks to form into mesons, so that, that's pairs of quarks, or baryons, three quarks. So you might have had quarks, but you couldn't have pairs of them to form a meson, or triples to form baryons. So, so what you get out of this thing is a is a quark. What you get is a quark gluon plasma. Um, we have a bunch of quarks and leptons being formed. The, the bosons are now uh, decaying. Um, and, and, and you also have possible gravitational wave background starting to cause baryons to, to exist before you didn't even have the ability to get this quark gluon plasma. Um, if if now, I understand the, if I answer correctly, like the, the weak nuclear force with the W and Z bosons, they mediate the uh, transit, like they mediate the transition from one particle to another particle, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and and before before yeah. uh, the, this era, the uh, the the weak interaction was uh, long range. So as a, a lot lots of particles were interchanging flavors, basically. But now, and that's why you didn't. Yeah, and you didn't have color. Color and flavor didn't really mean anything because everything was yeah. all sort yeah. of blurred. Mister Mr. Mr. Keller, yeah. But, yeah, but now because but now because. <laughs> Now, now because the weak interaction is now confined to a short range, now you can yeah. talk about yeah. flavors of, of particles. Yeah. Somewhere before the quark epic starts, the color, as in tender model color, was beige. Now we have quark gluon plasma, and we can begin to get pairs of quarks to form a meson and triples of quarks to form a baryon, like a pro and so forth. So, so that's and somewhere in here the balance of matter into matter had to like really get fixed the imbalance between the the set so we as well and and size wise the size now is big to us but small overall compared to the years as we know it today yes because we went from about the size of the solar system the observable universe out to about 10 to the 15th, uh, 10 to 15th meters. Right? I, 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 just, I, I know that in the, in the previous slide with the, the, the during the electro weak epoch, it went from uh, one millimeter to the size of the uh, orbit of the of uh, of Earth, one, one astronomical yeah. unit about that. So, so yeah. at, the, so at the, the start of the quark epoch, the universe was the size of Earth's orbit around the sun. And at the end of the quarks epoch, it's the size of the solar system. Um, and and or even a bit larger, right? To, to, yeah, to, I, 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 give, give or take. Give or take. Yeah. About the size yeah. of the solar system. Yeah. 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 Or, or as I said, it, it definitely not to the observable universe was not in a light year of, of thing, but it was sub light year, uh, um, multi solar system to solar system in size. Again, the parameters we're trying to nail down, but we have a much better now experimental evidence of what's happening in this time. So we now have quarks, we have leptons, we have antiparticles. Um, mm -hmm. At this stage, we should have, and so so also I guess the thing you might you might say 
is that um, the the uh, while well, things are still weird in this quark epoch, um, the the you begin to have properties showing up, and somewhere the 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 result is we have excess of of, of matter, right? Um, as to when that started and what has been an open question. But but at this point, at the end of this epoch, we do have a an imbalance of matter and antimatter. And we have energies now that we can we can probe, we can recreate things in this corp epic in particle accelerators and perform experiments to see what, what physics is like at these energies. Um, other comments? I was going to ask, um, other than, like, I have a hard time um, intuitively grasping what the symmetry breaking in this case is referring to and sort of how, it, it, is there any way to think of that in like a classical sort of way at all? <laughs> or is it all just way too um, fundamentally? Like maybe I can maybe I can bring up Please. the water molecule example again. Like yes. in the liquid water molecule, the, the symmetry is basically the, the orientation of the water molecule. So that like if you again so statistically, the orientation of the water molecule or, or the collection of water molecules in a liquid phase is no direct no particular direction. Like it, it, it all averages out. There's no particular orientation of all the water molecules. To combined in a liquid yeah. phase. But when the liquid freezes, then you get a one particular direction, and that's the symmetry breaking, basically. Yeah, but but yeah. like what what symmetry is being broken? Um, that I don't in know. The transition <laughs> here, <Yeah. laughs> like I understand that the symmetries. And so I even understand like symmetry breaking in phase transitions and stuff like that, which I guess this this is in a way. But this is a a, a continuous like. It's a symmetry breaking of of the interaction so, themselves, and so so I, so the phenomenon is is basically you get where where you've got a disordered but 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 a, a but a symmetrical state collapses into an ordered less symmetric state. So so example, it collapses is is in um if if you have something um. You know, symmetry breaking can distinguish you know two types of, of, of things from an explicit to a spontaneous event. Um, I mean, one way to think of it is that it 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 in lay I guess a layperson's term, the idea that a physical system in its lowest configuration is not the most symmetric configuration of the system. Hmm. Um, so you might have a a case where where um, where where it's 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 at a higher than the than the lowest energy state and it breaks into two distinct states and 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 the question is does it does it break equally or does it break asymmetrically and so charge um before before at higher energy scales you you have too much energy and there's too much um fluctuating and what not going along in the quantum fields to have charge like sort of um be a solution that that minimizes the energy basically and mm -hmm. then when you when you go below that energy though then it becomes more energetically ad advantageous for yeah, yeah. Uh, you to sort of settle into these two things and mm -hmm. those two things have other properties that it's why we call it charge yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, a, it's also the case with, with water like liquid water the intermolecular forces is uh, it's weak, uh, or at least the, the energies are high enough for the intermolecular forces to be broken up constantly. So you, you still have liquid phase, but not with the energy is high enough to prevent it from freezing. But at, at a certain point, the, the energy becomes low enough for this to be locked in place, basically. Yes. Yeah. So so um, what might happen? Help if you look at that. If you look at that that picture that's, mm -hmm. that's there right now, right? Um, the 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 if, if you if you come in to the center you've got symmetrical side but 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 that symmetry breaks as as you move down 
to one side or the other. You no longer have symmetrical, a symmetrical system. You've got to basically choose one or the other. Yeah. So that 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 graph shows you that. I mean, that that sort of a um, you know, it's, it's it's a it's a function which starts off coming down the center axis, and so everything's symmetrical. But at some point, it's got to break that symmetry and be one or the other. And and one or the other of what? Well, that could be one or the other. That 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 bifurcation um, can can be matter you know, of of and and it and it has to do with like quantum tunneling to one side or the other, right? If you got it, if you're, you, you can't just sit there and have everything be, be equal, you've got to have balance. Um, and so, um, so again, go ahead. Yeah, I, I so some, some particles, um, as far as we know, can be neutral. That's yes. because they don't. So it, it, it does it, I, it does that? I, I guess that's still a solution or something, yeah. or maybe neutral well, also didn't. Let's look it. at let's look at the the, the the next picture, the next slide, okay. right? Okay. And and here in the standard model particle of physics, right? Um, in yeah. in this situation, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I I found this image, and it's, it it seems to go into this uh, symmetry breaking in more detail, but I have no idea what it means, <laughs> right? Because because you have in, in this particular case you have a, a, a hypercharge that has balanced and, and the charge has to basically you, you, something that, that would be neutral has to all of a sudden now you have, cause you're having, um, um, the, these, these, these forces come into play, right? Where, where now, um, now you're going to get a charge. that's going to be one side or the other. And so your symmetry, the symmetry of, of, of a hypercharge, breaks and now has you now have a distinguished charge um and and in this particular case here as well um the things you'll find is that the the you know it's like the the um the spin zero higgs boson now breaks symmetry and you have it at, at, on one side or the other you no longer have everything being balanced, right? Things have to make, may, maybe you say in quantum mechanics, they have to make a choice in, in getting down to, and only you can transition would be to tunnel across the, tunnel across the barrier. It, which act, like what are the, there's two axes to that. It looks like the horizontal axis is energy based on that little figure, but I thought the yes. vertical axis was energy. <laughs> um horizontal energy now is in terms of 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 state right um and so you see that the the establishment the establishment of of the of the charge right um and the establishment of the the boson coupling actually gets established in the in the actual um particles so look at for example what happens with with the electron when it when it's when you have unbroken symmetry to broken symmetry now all of a sudden the, the electron has charge okay yeah right if you look at what happens to to what happens with 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 a quark right before when symmetry is unbroken um it's neutral charge after it, you have a one third, two thirds, minus one third, minus one two third, minus two thirds. So, do you do you have? I mean, I, I clearly it seems that we do have um, a a symmetry in the rate at which um, positive and negative charge is is created. Yeah, and 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 so this this is so you have a. A disordered symmetric collapses into an order not asymmetric, right? So, so this is why you get charges beginning to form. This is why at the end of this era, you can now talk about electromagnetism because before everything was symmetrical, right? Now it becomes asymmetrical. So you you have a 
you have a disordered symmetry of charge turning into collapsing into a lower state where it's ordered, but not symmetric. So you couldn't have had, you know, before, again, just go back to, go back to that, that, that nice chart, the electron above um, the thing doesn't have a charge and below does have a charge because before it had this charge was symmetrical after now it actually picks or picks or, or, or has a charge with negative one it's no longer uh, there's no longer symmetry that's for example in terms of, of, of charge um there's a whole bunch of things happening with these these force carriers as well that are that are occurring so so i'm i'm giving you probably the simplest example of, of, of charge symmetry um and some of these things like the parity violation and so forth that have been only confirmed start to, to be by, you know, the violations start to occur in the, in this, in this era. Um, uh, another way of saying, so, so this, this, um, the, the electroweak breaking up down is going to lead towards electromagnetism separating out from strong, weak, from the strong and weak sets. So, so those things will break, break up, break down. Um, before in the early part of the, the quark epic, um, you didn't really have charge, everything or color, for example, you know, the, the quark colors, um, you didn't have charge. You just sort of had neutral stuff. The symmetry breaking comes from this, this, as I said, comes from the, the, um, a disordered, but symmetric, symmetric, right? Everything being kind of beige in color now becomes distinct colors everything being sort of neutral in charges becomes distinct charges um that's that that's that's what we mean by the symmetry right your 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 things are are another way of saying is things are precipitating out charges begin to precipitate out color becomes precipitating out flavor becomes precipitates out to become distinct they're not just yeah. a symmetric beige average stuff yeah and it's, it's interesting to note that um, the fact that this is all happening and so things are sort of separating out um, rather soon in some sense after the, the force itself sort of separates out um, is in stark contrast to what's going on with gravity. Gravity yeah. doesn't start to separate stuff out until a lot later because it's a lot weaker. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, and it takes, it takes a lot of time yeah. and motion for stuff to happen. So... So you're still, you're still, the universe is slightly lumpy, but it, but it's, it's not, it's not going to be as, it's, it's, it's relatively unlumpy compared to with, with what's going to happen later. Yeah. So yes. do we move into the final stage of this Hadron epic? Uh, I may, maybe one final notice in, oh, the uh, image on the right is just a phase diagram representing the quark gluon plasma phase. That's, yes. that's all I'm saying. Yeah. And, yes. and, we can, and, and we can actually simulate those conditions with the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, as it's As well as, you know, Fermi yeah. Lab and Brookhaven and so mm -hmm. forth. These are now yes. well within the stuff to, to be able to create. And so these are things that are well uh, experimentally um, um, confirmed. Um, and, and we have a lot of information now about, about how the universe operates at these, at these scales, these temperatures. Sense. Yeah, so, we there are very there are very few um, surprises that are found uh, in studies of these interactions nowadays. Yeah. So <laughs> so we so we've gone from 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 two million two milliseconds. We're now into the oh, microseconds. I think micros. Micro I'm sorry, microseconds. Yeah. Sorry, microseconds. Probably probably um, to the hadron epoch, which lasts up to one second. Um, and, and really in this thing happening is that now the fundamental reactions, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak are behaving in a way that we kind of experience them now, right? Um, the temperature is still pretty energetic, right? We're, we're mm -hmm. talking about, um, you know, from a trillion Kelvin down to maybe 10 billion Kelvin. Um, much harder than like interior of the star, that sort of thing. 
but is we it, can create it, these kind of conditions. I don't know if it's hotter than like the interior of like neutron stars, though. I don't know what those length scales get to. Or uh, yeah, or, and 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 yeah, and in but, fact, some of the some of the things about what might be in a neutron star and down below the exotic matter has to do with un trying to understand what's happening at these kind of scales, right? You're yeah. in that realm where where you have stuff, but but it's cool enough now that you have mesons, that is two quark objects, and and um, and baryons, so like protons and neutrons, right? Um, and sort of the hadron neutron players are are, are, are are in an equilibrium. So if we go to the next go to the next set, um, you'll see th these are now the particles that start to form. Um, and and this is where we see like energy turning into part of antiparticle and the antiparticle annihilates of the particle to get energy back again. We start to see this this symmetry of matter antimatter yet we have a mm -hmm. dominant of matter um and we and the, the so the quarks and the gluons have actually formed nucleons these more complex structures but we don't call them fundamental because you can break them down into to to smaller stuff and we have the, you know the pions and mesons and those sorts of things that are that are that are there um but but the, now the fundamental interactions are in their sort of current we call them current form, although a bit extreme. Um, the universe is cooling down. You have energies from a million electron volts down to about 150 million <laughs> electron volts to about a million electron volts. Um, temperature is still quite exotically high, but but after all of the antimatter, matter, hadrons, and not at each other, um, we're left with one out of one billion six hundred and sixty. So it's 640 million um, matter, right? So, so somewhere in the past, we have a little bit more matter than antimatter. So that by the time the matter and antimatter annihilate each other to form a bunch of photons, um, there's a little bit left over. So the asymmetry now has meaning in this era. It, it occurred somewhere in the past. We don't quite know where. But now the universe is dominated by photons. Why? Because if you look at that previous, if you look at that that chart there, you see you know energy turned to matter, antimatter, mat, antimatter annihilates with matter to read photons. We have the, the 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 universe is now dominated by photons. We now actually have electric mag, electromagnetism. We actually have photons that do something. We also have neutrinos. They are weird particles, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, 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 it's, 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 yes. And, and, um, I have to say that, that, you know, the, the notion of the, the, the original thing, neutrino, I think, I think it was, it was actually was, um, Fermi, right? Didn't he Fermi come up and coin the name neutrino? Uh, neutral little one, right? Yeah. I, I thought it was Polly who came up with it. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Are you, I could have made, might, might well, be Polly. I I I, I I I I I'm I'm I I thought I thought Fermi had something to do with it, um, well, because I mean, it's because an Italian name. But maybe maybe well he, he probably gave him the data. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but 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 the the neutrinos were originally this. We had this problem. We, we, when we saw you see this that that interaction right, of 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 a of a of a of a collision or like or, or a decay of a particle. Um, you can see the stuff shooting out. You can look at you know, look at trajectory and momentum, yeah. and you find you found when you measured the. You might not be able to have, have detected the thing it decayed from, but the pieces that fly out, um, there there's some missing mass, mm -hmm. and there's also not only there's missing mass, but there's also missing momentum. Yeah, yeah, and so they the. The, an easy sort of solution to this problem is to be like, there's another particle there that we have not been able to detect yet. And <laughs> that's one of those predictions that like doesn't feel great if you don't have a way to detect it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it turns out that this neutrino does interact 
and yeah. but, but but very weakly. In fact, yeah. the typical thing that you say is if you had a a light year of lead, ten trillion kilometers thick of lead, um, a neutrino has a fifty percent chance of passing through it. Right, which is just absolutely nuts. And 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 right now, there's for example in the sun when you have fusion occur, um, <laughs> or that fusion process generates anti-neutrinos that stream out from the core of the sun and flow through you in a in a in a um, right way. I mean, isn't it something like um, every square centimeter of your body is there's about a hundred? Isn't it like I well. I don't know what the numbers are on that. It's, it's in millions, <laughs> millions per second of neutrinos that, that, that are flowing through you. And, yeah. and yet in your lifetime, maybe a couple will bump into something. Um, they mostly just fly through stuff. And, and it was thought initially that the neutrinos didn't have mass. Yeah. And they probably, you probably do get a couple throughout your life that do it because the way they detect them um, nowadays is with giant, they, they have a huge pool of water and when they do hit something, they emit particular flashes of light. And if you just look at that huge pool of water for several years, oh. you'll measure several thousand of them. Yeah. So when I was at the in the pool at a thing called ice cube, they have yeah. a, roughly a cubic kilometer of ice that starts from about one and a half kilometers below the surface to about two and a half kilometers below the surface. And and, and they look for neutrinos that come up through the earth. Mm, yeah. If it's if it's a if a light year lead has fifty percent chance of stopping it, the earth is like yeah, right. But but yeah. rarely one of those neutrinos will hit um, one of the usually the oxygen atom. Mm -hmm. Will have one of those your interactions, and the oxygen atom will get a kick, and the oxygen atom will start moving. And, and again, I'm going to be very careful faster than light propagates through water yeah oh it's okay you get like a cherenkov radiation event basically exactly it's like yeah. a sonic boom but with light yeah. mm. because it, the neutron gives it that much the neutrino gives that much of a kick that that it goes and and so the light will point the the, the, the recoil the sonic boom but an optical shrink of radiation will point back to where the neutrino came from. And so when you, if you go to this thing and you talk to people and you get to go to the control center, you can see the neutrinos coming through this, mm -hmm. these neutrino events coming through up through the bottom of the earth. They do it. They, they, they pay attention to stuff that comes up through the earth because plenty of stuff can happen high above. Right. Yeah. You can get other effects. So like, it, yeah. it's a, And I'm it's seeing a, from this, like this little nuclear, thing I'm watching looking at the at the radiation coming from the space and yeah. and so they want to eliminate stuff there and they want to have stuff that comes up they pay attention to stuff that comes up from the bottom of the earth through the earth because that rules out all the the normal particles so it, it's a, like it's the case that neutrinos have no color charge they don't uh they don't interact via the strong force. They also don't have a char electric charge, so they don't interact via the electromagnetism. So they only yeah. interact via the weak force. And since the weak force is very short range, that's why neutrinos generally don't interact very much. Yes, and so yeah. you, if you look, they do have spin. So if you went back to um, uh, slide number eight, let me just jump back there just quickly to slide number eight. Um, you see that standard model there? Um, it turns out that your leptons, um, these are fundamental particles, your, your electron, your muon, your tau, have corresponding neutrinos. There's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. Um, so you have sort of three families of, of, of particles, just like you have the quarks, you have the, the leptons on the other side. And... And those families um, have the corresponding neutrinos. And neutrinos have mass. They do have a tiny bit of mass, but they are also, but they have no charge. They have spin, but but they're effectively neutral. And and surprise to people was that neutrinos actually have mass. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the events I was privileged to experience was an event called Supernova 1987A, where a star in our neighboring galaxy, large mention of cloud, collapsed. 
and at a distance of 187,000 light years, the result of that collapse hit the Earth. Normally, in, a, in these neutrino particle detectors, Ice Cube wasn't operating at the time, you might get a couple of events per month. Yeah, that, yeah. But, but what happened was there were three neutrino detectors, and and one of them announced, and it was it was the back back when Usenet was there and, and called net.astro.research. They said we're shutting down. We had this this uh, our 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 detector had gone haywire because um, we <laughs> recorded about seventeen neutrino events in the course of a fraction of a second. Um, we got to work out the bugs. And another thing, another thing said, well, we're we're just about to announce that we're shutting down too because we had this spurious signal. And then someone says, well, you know, when did it happen? And and the third one said, da 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 time. Um, just by your curiosity, were the neutrinos going in a particular? Because actually, the Japanese one could tell. It said, you know, um, the the neutrinos seem to come within a couple degrees of this area of the sky. That that happens to be in the large mansion of the cloud. And then the guy named Sandalik was was in in South America, I believe in Chile. He was taking pictures of the tarantula nebula, beautiful nebula inside the large mansion of the cloud. And he was trying to do the, you know, the, the thing about tracking with the crosshairs of a faint star. It's, 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 it's very difficult to photograph because there's not much distinguishing stuff. And so he was trying to take photos of this thing, guiding the because you because you because you such it was such zoomed in magnification, you had to 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 watch the crosshairs. The crosshairs drifted off from a star; it bring it back. And the star was faint, and he's noticed saying, "You know, there's another star down the corner. Why don't I use my crosshair that? Because that's a much brighter star. Why am I working on trying to get the really faint star?" So he he switched over to to do that crosshairs, watching it, and then he noticed saying the star is getting brighter. And brighter. <laughs> and brighter yes. and he goes like wow this is actually getting really 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 bright for to to stuff i mean not visible but bright and it became really really bright to the point where you could actually see the thing and by the way at that time he announced there's supernova a star collapsing we'll talk about star collapses i believe in be three two episodes from now but he he said the star collapse while the neutrino people were saying Wow, um, we just saw a huge burst of neutrinos, which Japanese say came from the direction of the large magnetic cloud. And then someone said, "Well, you know, because Sandlick was looking at the thing and was starting to see when the star started brightening, he actually saw it beginning to brighten. We know when the when the photons started reaching us after traveling 187,000 years, and then the neutrinos." came around and that sort of said the neutrinos did not travel at the speed of light they traveled just slightly less than the speed of light right over 187,000 years they were off by a matter of a couple of hours that's 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 how close it was the neutrinos were traveling but not quite the speed of light they actually had mass I Moreover, the neutrinos that they had the neutrinos that they had started right, over the photons because yeah. neutrinos don't interact. They, they escaped the supernova earlier than the photons did. Yes. And, and so the result was that, that you know, um, roughly, um, you know, from, 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 you can imagine the shell of that explosion, one of the leading part of the shockwave was neutrinos. Right. A, a, a non-trivial percentage of the mass of that star turned into neutrinos. And after that shell, traveled 187,000 light years, 187,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. The, the, the density of neutrinos was still big enough that 100 million neutrinos per second passed per, per square centimeter, right? right? This huge burst, even after traveling and expanding 187,000 light years, it was detected. Right. And, and we'll get into more stuff about, about stars and their stuff, but, but this is sort of where the first thing of like that the neutrinos were really, uh, they have mass, they're weird. I and, thought that all all measurements of the, their speed were consistent with C. I, I thought that we've yeah. never actually measured a slowdown. 
No, it, it should have given given what we know about the the process of 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 a type two supernovae and when they they emit. Um, because one of the things that happens inside the supernovae about about explosion is explosion come from pressure of, of neutrinos. There's so many neutrinos get that get created inside the class core that their pressure, even though they're weak yeah, interacting, yeah. Uh, helps blow out the star and it's weird stuff. They're weird. Uh, real fast while we're waiting for questions to come in, you have a can you, can you give like a spoiler free sneak peek for B2? So yeah, B2, we're gonna have we're gonna talk about um, a number of things happening. We'll, we'll leave this one second behind. And we're gonna be talking about a number of, of things such as neutrinos, decoupling, we'll get much more weird neutrino stuff. We'll talk about leptons, ethic, and we'll talk about uh, big bang nucleosynthesis. So, so, so far we don't, we don't have atoms. Um, the universe will cool down to the point where we'll actually begin yeah. to have some atoms growing around. Do we have, do, do we, do, so do, far, do we have neutrons and protons yet or not even there yet? Oh, we, we do have neutrons. We, we have the hadr hadrons already, right? Like yes. the neutrons and protons we already have. They're just beginning like we, to form now. Yeah. Like right, right now, so far, we only have co cooled enough for the quarks to condense into the the, uh, the protons Nucleus. and neutrons. Yeah. And the mesons. You get those mesons there. In, yeah. in, in the next epic, they'll actually form atoms. They'll actually go neutral and we'll get a big flash and we'll have some some uh, uh, fun thing we we'll have some recombination and the dark ages so we'll talk about about uh, the consequence of atoms actually forming atoms actually fusing and then the universe going dark uh, we have at least two questions so far first okay. one is here by the way I, I'll, I'll mention in that thing we're going to talk about essentially we go, we'll go from the first second to about the first uh, greater than eighty thousand years. Okay. So yeah, we will end at the uh, the CMB, right? Yes. The, uh, yes. Yeah. All right. So so the next era will be the first three hundred eighty thousand, three hundred seventy thousand years right. or so. Same about ask your question about an Artemis program. Artemis. I, have, um, I haven't been following it closely, but uh, so, so Artemis. Going back Artemis is a return to the moon by NASA and with people who know what they're doing as opposed to people that think they know what they're doing. And we've had the first uh, Artemis one was the was essentially the, 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 a, the equivalent of the Apollo class rockets um, that in, in modern in, in, in modern rocketry and Artemis one had a robotic system where they essentially launched from the earth achieved or escaped, went to the moon, went beyond the moon, around the moon, and came back. Artemis II is going to be the same system, but going to put people on it board. And, and that'll fly around the moon. Um, it will, it's do, they'll do a little bit more observing of the moon's lunar surface. So it's like Apollo 8 was to the Apollo program. Um, and Artemis three will be the case where, where they'll go with people, go and actually enter into lunar orbit, land near the lunar south pole, leave some stuff behind and then take off. So so they'll have their first moonwalk since Apollo 17. So are you, are, are, are you two gonna be and, like, like the Neil Armstrong of this generation? And, and then Artemis four is gonna be the case where the where crew comes back again to lead off some more material to do a little bit of space building and, and leave. And Artemis Five is where the crew. There's enough stuff now at the South Lunar South Pole, where the crew can actually build a hap you know, enough to build a habitat and stay until Artemis Six comes or leaves them. So it'll be kind of like the International Space Station, but on the Moon. And so we think by Artemis Seven, they'll have a rotation period, which will be able to then put a telescope there on the South Pole. Uh, with a number of interesting properties, including be able to service stuff. So, are we, but RSS seven, are we going to have like the, the first moon baby yet, or not? We're not there yet. I think I think that the 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 plans and again these are these are varying. The plans by RSS 
five, six is where you start to have crew rotations, where you'll have, you know, three, they'll come down, they'll touch. They'll put some stuff and take off. Four will come down and touch and build up bits of things from three and four and take off. Five, they'll bring more stuff to the point where they should be able to build a habitat to where they can stay until element six comes and they exchange material, even though yeah. the, the, the station won't be fully functional until Artemis 7. Uh, how, how would they uh, uh, generate their own energy? Like uh, you have solar energy for like uh, two weeks, but then you have two weeks of darkness. Uh, not at the South Pole. At the South Pole, you get it. Oh, if right. you put it up high enough, it'll yeah. be there the whole that's, time. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's clever. Yeah. On, on the other hand, you know, the, 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 this is about that, the fact that the telescope they're going to want to put there will be in one of the places where you get shadows. Yeah. And 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 on the moon with essentially no atmosphere. Technically there is, but but, but essentially no atmosphere. Um you have the nice property of being out in space, not mm -hmm. being not, you know, so you can go from game for red to, to high ultraviolet. Um also when the sun sets, um it's a it's it's like an eclipse where you can now look very close to the surface of the sun. When the sun sets, it's gone. You get you get a hard darkness like you get with 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 totality and we can begin to probe the inner solar system um with 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 telescopes as well as the fact that that you've got unlike in space where it's wobbly and solar wind and particles bounce around you've got a stable platform you can do a lot more long-term so some people mm. talking about doing doing something like like deep space fields not like with hubble or web where it's tiny little bits of but actually large surveys where you can start to to do very deep as in long exposure of large sections of the sky you remember you know that the hubble deep field where they found just you know millions of galaxies in a small area those some of those things they'll be able to do that now with a survey telescope to talk about large sections of the sky being being exposed over a long period of time to get really deep into um, understanding the structure of the universe. Uh, and but we'll learn about the structure of the universe in BE4. Or BE3. And our current final question, and let's see come out, let's see what more comes out before we end, is to Landon. But I think Tabula might answer that, but if you want to do any more answering of it. Uh, well, I mean, I would, yeah, Landon went into it. Um, in, in, so I'll, I'll sort of reiterate what he said. Uh, they do occasionally hit stuff. And when they hit stuff, they deposit a whole bunch of energy into the thing that they hit. So if they hit an oxygen uh, nucleus or they hit an electron or something like that, um, that thing will suddenly have a lot of kinetic energy and it'll be moving really, really fast. And in water, it can move faster than the average, than the velocity of light in water. And that basically creates um, an, a like a sonic boom, but with with light, and it comes out with a, a sort of characteristic um, flash of light, and it, it it's like blasting a vortex through space. I, it's super cool. Yeah, but I, but <laughs> have I you think, ever seen I think a it nuclear reactor? Right? With, yeah, they glow blue. Blue glow. That's where a particle has been given. From a, from a from a fission mm -hmm. particle, it's been enough velocity that you get a sonic, an optical boom in water. Yeah, but in this situation, I don't think you would be able to see it uh, with your own eyes because it's it's still a very low rate. Or would you would yeah. you be able to see the blue flash? If it's yes, you might, you might. Yeah. Yes. Really? I mean, wow. Uh, now, if you if you have your eyes closed and you're seeing shrink off radiation. Um, You've got other problems. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for your life. Uh, you, you, yeah. Um, you're. It depends on exactly what light wavelength it is. I guess if it's if it's really really deep blue, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. But uh, your eye is an exceptionally good photon detector. Yeah. So, so I've 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 had at Reed Reactor up in Oregon. I stood up there. You, they turn off the lights in the reactor room. You're sitting. You're standing in the grating above the pool. And you turn on the reactor, and you get this nice, beautiful uh, glow, right? And and, and, yeah. and you can see it. it. It's 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 kind of like um, you know uh, the glow in the dark type of, of stuff, right? Yeah, glow in the dark watches. Um, uh, I think it's also the faint, like, but, but it's definitely detectable. Like I, I I think astronauts also experience like 
Like uh, Cherenko of radiation in the, like when they close yes. their eyes and try to sleep, and so sometimes they see flashes in their eyes. I think yes. is it is it related to this? That that is true. And in fact, when the sun has an outburst um, of of stuff, they will see more often those flashes because the particles turn through. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a so 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 those sort of things and and the, the those sort of you can actually see that glow. Um, you generally don't. You know, now in a reactor pool, you have enough water yeah, between you with the bottom yeah. that you're not going to be bothered by it. But the glow is there. I mean, the glow is the stuff. I wouldn't, you can't really, you wouldn't want to read a newspaper by by that glow, but it is um, it is there and it is a, a glowy bit. Um, on the other hand, you know, the other side of the coin is having having seen um, uh, Super 1987A when I, when I was reading Usenet News and I watched the announcement Sandy Lake about there's a supernovae, it's naked eye, it's in the southern hemisphere. Um, I called up my, I, I, in fact, I was, didn't even think of reading the article. I called up my friend that lives in Canberra and said, I'm coming to dinner. <laughs> and, 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 and just as easy, I, it, it, I have uh, in my employment contracts, um, Clause one says Lambda gets to go to all total solar eclipses. Clause two says I get to see all planetary transits of our star. Clause three says any supernova that, that achieves naked eye brightness, I get to go to. And I had, and, and, and to tell you the faith I had about thing, I had in my car, I kept my passport and I kept a little money. And this is back in the days where I basically, I saw the thing, I called up and said, hey, coming to dinner, um, fine. I, on the way out to the receptionist said, tell my boss clause three, he'll understand. <laughs> down to the airport. Um, and, and by the time I had somebody from Lick coming in and saying, Hey, could you, could you take this instrument? This instrument? I had a bunch of baggage of all this sort of carry on stuff of, 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 of detector equipment stuff. And, um, and I bought the next, I said, I want the next plane to plane to Australia. And it was a contest flight. I flew in there. I landed um, less than 19 hours after discovery. When sun set, I looked up at the Magellanic Cloud, which is a nice normal thing, and I saw a dot um, about the brightness of Polaris, where it had wow. been uniform before. And in fact, I had just several months before done an observing run where I looked, even was looking in the Magellanic Cloud and looking at the Tarantula Nebula, beautiful thing. And I watched that star change in brightness before my eyes and change in color. These, these light, light curves you talk about where they do these supernova measurements, I actually saw it actually happen, right? Change in brightness, change in temperature as the thing was expanding and watching this thing happen. Um, the most distant star that I've ever seen in my life, 107,000 light years away, that one star was bright enough that it became visible. And, and you know, you could tell the observatory all the telescopes were pointing in the same direction because everyone was getting as much data as possible. This was the first nearby, although it's, 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 it's too bad we haven't had one in our galaxy, but it's near enough that we could actually see it directly and we learn an incredible uh, amount of physics. Like, well, like, well, we well, was there, a, well, in was the, there a supernova in the, in the, like, uh, like in the, uh, like in the, 13th century, like I forgot the century, but there was like a supernova that was as bright. You, you, you could have seen this in the day sky even. Yeah, like the 10, 1054 supernovae was mm -hmm. there. We also had the Kepler one that was bright, but not, not the really good one, like the 1054 that formed the Crab Nebula. Uh, I wrote real fast, uh, right, wrapping this up. Um, do any of you have anything coming up on your challenge or other challenge that you, that you want to talk about? Uh, go ahead first to other people. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm mainly active on Jackson Wheat's channel, so you can check his channel out. I, uh, yeah, and I am, um, uh, the co host of Bad Science Sundays on his <coughs> channel, which is on Sunday evening. So, yeah, come check us out tomorrow at um, 9 30 Eastern. Yeah, good, yeah. good, good stuff. Check out his uh, stuff that 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 he does, and um, we have also um, coming up. There is the uh, there is the volcano show. I do something with Chesh where we look at um, what Madame Pele is doing, and I believe that's that is that's going to be um, 
uh, March 15th. Um, there's also, um, I do a, a show with uh, Dapper Dino um, and Chesh and Manya called the Unnamed Tavern, which is not a tavern. Uh, it's very important. Um, we do not operate a tavern. It's the Unnamed Tavern, which is not a tavern. And allegedly that's going to be happening um, uh, this week. I'm looking at the time. I'm embarrassing to try to see what the what the time is for Unnamed Tavern. I believe the Unnamed Tavern is out on February 24th at 15.30 uh, Pacific time. And the Volcano Show is on March. I think the next one's March 15th. Um, that's a Friday all at um, 13, 1 p.m. Pacific time. As for me, uh, next time the episodes will be less science, less science based and more entertainment based. And next on the last Wednesday of this month, I will be hosting my very first debate here on this channel. And it'll be much more interesting and epic than any creationist versus evolutionist or flat earth debate thing. We are debating what really matters here on this channel. Which is better, Digimon or Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a thing. That's an interesting thing. And then also in two weeks on Saturday, we we, we hosting the discussion on is physical media following the, the rise of digital media? What's 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 is better? Which is is it disappearing? Is this taking over? Is do you own this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's an but that's the thing. And then obviously in a month from now, Landon, these guys will be back talking yeah, what's, about what's what's the what's what's UT one, which is the first about three hundred eighty thousand years. It is it is scheduled to be on March sixteenth. At March sixteenth. And by the way, that beep 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 was actually uh, my detector detecting a cosmic ray shower where something hit the top of the atmosphere and I got a shower at a rate of about four 0.4 microsieverts per hour, basically a little burst of stuff. So while we were there, something happened in the cosmos that hit the Earth's atmosphere and went a shower, and uh, the thing went beep beep beep, saying particle shower, yay! I, I, <laughs> I, when we go off the air, we can discuss when our next planning thing will be. But until yep. then, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you all next time. Enjoy our favorite universe. Bye. Okay, welcome back. Not only talking time with caffeine, but welcome back to our mini series before Earth. As we take a look at what the universe was, before a little, a little, a little rock of, of dust has had to come together. But before we get to that, let's get to our guest today. Uh, introduce yourselves to whatever order you want to introduce yourselves. Well, I'm next to you, so I'll go. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Vandegraaff, also known as Dr. Tapioca Weasel. Um, I am a, an atomic physicist, but uh, we're talking about cosmology and stuff, so that's fantastic. Hey. <clears throat> uh, am Expert. I next or? Sure. Uh, I, I, I'll go next. Uh, hi, uh, I go by the name of Ness, and uh, I, well, I'm not a uh, an expert on uh, physics. I'm uh, more uh, focused on the uh, plant biology, but I am eager to learn about the history of the universe that we inhabit. And uh, I am uh, Landon Noll, a uh, astronomer and planetary scientist, uh, here to uh, talk about. Um, uh, before Earth number zero two, because if you might recall, before Earth zero, because a lot of good things origin at zero, um, was the was the Big Bang process, and before Earth one, we spent about two hours talking about the first second of the Big Bang process, and as Dapper Dino kind of pointed out, um, it might take us a while to uh, to reach. Uh, a, a a a point of uh, of of modern times if we keep going at that rate. In fact, I did a calculation, and it would take us would require us roughly somewhere around a hundred trillion years of show 
to reach present age, which by the time that happens, there's another, you know, nearly hundred trillion worth of stuff we'd have to keep going. So <laughs> instead we've decided to speed it up. Um, oh. And uh, well, hopefully our, our descendants will take, pick, up the, pick up the, pick up the podcast for us after, after we're gone. Absolutely. So, so we're going to spend probably about, um, uh, all of a couple hours talking about the first hundred million years, um, which a lot of stuff happened in the first hundred million years of the Big Bang process. We've already covered the first second, so uh, we'll, we'll start after that. It's, but it's, I don't it's, know. Yeah, it's not as jam packed as was before the first, not as jam packed anymore. Yeah, but a lot of stuff has happened, and, and I hope again the idea is that that you can get a notion of uh, the amazing history of our, our cosmology as well as as stuff we know and stuff we don't know which is a whole bunch of stuff and in the first in, in the previous episode we talked about going from uh zero seconds to one second but now we're going from one second to uh 100 yeah. million years yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh technically we probably started at the plonk at a plonk uh time tick but because uh, yeah. because it's it, it's problematic whether there was a zero or not. But that's a that's a mm -hmm. that was to see that go and and watch a PE zero instead. Um, uh, the yeah. the zero point is a hypothetical point where you reach the uh, the hypothetical um, uh, singularity, right? That that's that, that's that's where the zero comes from, originally speaking. Well, as I say, it, there's there's yeah. there's different models of how how that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as I say, that was a that was covered in there, and 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 so we're going to be starting with the uh, starting at after one second. Um, uh, real real fast, if anybody out there wants to support this support support us in the stream, and there's you can leave a tip right there in the chat chat section right there at the top of the chat. If you, you want to help 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 the channel and help all of us make make better content yeah. about the and, universe. And and I, I also say that that if you could consider hitting at some point the the like button. To support uh, this this channel too, um, that would be appreciated. That little uh, thumbs up can be can be quite helpful to his channel. Um, so, shall any other things we want to talk about before we get dive in uh, um, to the uh, first first second? Um, I was going to say uh, we want we probably want to review what the state of the universe is at t equals one second. So I guess, but I guess that's diving into it. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Well, okay. And in that sense, at, at the, the universe was uh, much hotter and much denser than it is now. Um, and things were much closer to each other than they were, they are now. Um, the, in, the temperature was roughly on the order of 10, 10 billion Kelvin. And energies were in the uh, mega electron volts. Um, the universe, the universe was probably around uh, 10 light years in radius. So that's around 100 uh, trillion kilometers. Um, and, and like just enough to reach the, uh, the most distant neighboring stars, right? Yeah. Well, actually, there weren't stars. Uh, then and I mean, I mean, to compare, like, compared to our uh, the current the current universe, like you, like the the closest stars in our neighborhood is like uh, Proxima Centauri, right? And that that is about how many light years is it, is it up? Three. Oh, uh, four, yeah. four, four, four fraction. Um, so mm -hmm. that's the radius. So, so um, the the, the original universe was was well. Now, now it's important to understand if you remember from when we had the period of constant inflation that. Um, the universe went through a rapid expansion, which is why we now have a, a universe which is 10 light years in radius after only one second. Um, yeah. And at this point, we don't even have the atoms yet, correct? That's correct. But um, something interesting happens around this, around this time, um, and that is something called neutrino decoupling. And to understand this well, the graph here and what neutrino coupling is, um, let's go and look briefly at the standard model. There's a nice uh, chart, I believe, um, if you advance there. Um, and, and here, this is the 
sort of the standard model of uh, particle physics. And you see that there are three um, sort of generations of matter fermions, electrons, muons, and taus. And they, they each of those, electron, muon, and tau, um, have a associated little neutral one, um, which is the name that I think was Fermi came up with the, the notion. Um, they, 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 they were seeing in nuclear reactions where all the energy didn't add up. There was, there was something missing. And people thought, well, there must be some neutral particle. But it turned out that the neutron was discovered around that time. And that neutron was actually um, fair, you know, fairly massive compared with the, with the slight missing mass. And uh, it, Pauli um, came up with a particular solution. Um, he called it the, a neutral particle, but because there already was a neutron, um, Fermi suggested in a conversation with Pauli that they call it the little neutral one or neutrino. So it's a nice Italian word, neutrino. Um, and neutrinos are weird particles. They, they, are, they are in this, in this zoo of, of, of particles that come around. Um, they're probably one of the stranger ones. I don't even want to comment on, on, on yeah. neutrinos before. I was going to say uh, neutrinos are like particles, but like they're, ba they're barely there at all. <laughs> You know, yes. <laughs> um, yes, they neutrinos, they barely interact with anything. Um, they do occasionally collide with stuff and interact via the, the weak force. But yeah, almost almost never uh, you a single neutrino has to pass through like a light year worth of solid lead before it has like a, a chance. A, a, Actually, a probability of hitting. I, I did the calculation. It's it's around three thousand light years of yeah of, of lead, and so three thousand light years is roughly three thousand yeah. times, or basically 30, 30 trillion kilometers of lead, solid lead. You'd have a 50, 50 chance of a neutrino hitting something. Um, it weakly interacts with matter. Is that because the ma the masses are very small, or or is it because of another a different reason? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it, it has it has no no charge. Um, that helps, right? Being neutral, and it also it, it's it's it really only interacts with with normal matter via the weak interaction process or gravitation. But but it's so light. Um, the the latest um, limit about how massive a neutrino is. It is that the, the 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 three flavors, right? The average of the three flavors, um, the the electron neutrino, tau neutrino, mu neutrino, um, is less than 0. 0.12 electron volts. So what does that mean? Well, an electron mass is is around five hundred and eleven thousand. So a um, a neutrino is about six orders of magnitude um, less massive than even an electron, which is a pretty small, um, pretty small in mass. So, yeah. it, and, that, and that's the upper bound, right? There's about a 95% confidence now of that thing. So if you say, well, what is that in terms of in, in, in more normal units? Um, if you're doing kilograms, it would be uh, uh, less than about two times 10 to the minus 34th kilogram, 37th kilogram, I'm sorry. Two times ten to the minus thirty-seven. So, so one over, you know, two over one with thirty-seven zeros kilograms. Um, they're pretty light. Uh, what's the, we're on the quark page? What's the difference between an up and a top and a down and a bottom? Uh, the quark, the quark. Mass think, yeah. and type. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly mass is one of the things. Um, and which family is in? So there are of the three families of fermion. Up down is in the same family as, as electron, electron neutron. They tend to be the least massive of stuff. So when you get to family two, they call it charm strange because physicists um, are sometimes creative in their names. Um, the muon, muon, and neutrino, um, the muon is, is, it decays and it decays into a lighter mass. Same thing, the charge and the 
charm and the strange quarks um, are more massive, right? If you look at the mass on that thing, um, where the up and down is, is 2.2 and 4.7 million electron volts, um, the strange is around 100 or 96 million and charm is around 1.28 billion. So, so you typically have things in, in two that are more massive decay into things that are one. Electron is stable. Muon is not. I think. Is what's it, the half life of muon? It's somewhere like, around. Uh, it's like a curi curious question. Like a, when, like more massive particles decay into like uh, less massive particles. Yes. Does that increase? Does, does that does that increase the entropy of uh, of it as well? Close. Two point two microseconds. Okay. Um. So so I mean it certainly will. Well, it's it's a lower state, so it's going into a, a a lower energy state. So the third the third generation of the top and the bottom uh, are massive quarks. They're on the order of around 173. Um, the top quark is like 173 uh, billion electron volts. Um, so it's a really it's a really you know, massive heavyweight thing. The bottom is around 2.2 billion electron volts. The the tau is uh, again tau is sort of electron so 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 the so the quarks are one side so if you think about if you look at this stuff the quark families are one set and and the leptons are another set so they're they're like if you i wouldn't call them mirrors but they're they're related yeah. and and things in 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 generation three decay into two and things in two decay into one and sometimes three go directly into one um depending on what's happening now if i if i if i remember correctly it's the the first family ups and downs that make up the neutrons and protons of atoms. Yes. 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 So those are the those are the uh, the more common things you you um, stuff is 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 the nucleons are made of up down. But 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 right now what we're happening is that in this first second the decoupling um, before the um, be, be, before this this era. That, that, that the universe was so hot and dense, essentially, that the that the neutrons were being essentially um, bouncing around and interacting with 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 battery. The so 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 right now, none, none of these have none of these have got married to stay together yet. They're all being well, their own single single. They're all being single and and bachelors. The the so the the quarks have the quarks have settled down to, to something like they uh exist yeah we don't have like um atoms and stuff yet yeah but because, but because like, remember the first for, 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 for the first 20 i've around 20 microseconds to the first second is when the quark started turning into grouping into these hadrons yeah so that's sort of happening and 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 then like kind of right after that uh, you have the neutrinos also um, they decouple and but like in a, in a sort of a, a different way they th the universe is finally cool and um, dilute enough that they stop running into everything yes I think that's what that's yeah what you, you call it thermal equilibrium and that's a good way to put it again because it's, it's the, they the thermal equilibrium kind of breaks and the neutrinos stop having significant interaction with bearing matter um part because um the universe is is not as dense as it was um and so uh these these things because they're not they they essentially are the first things that kind of flee um on their on their own i mean there were still were interactions but but because the universe had expanded so much and became thin enough the the neutrinos can actually get some distance yeah, because the the neutrinos have a, a a vanishingly small probability of actually interacting, colliding with um, other particles. That, but before this point, the universe was so dense that a neutrino could travel a very short distance and go through an absurdly high amount of mass. So that even though the probability is almost nothing. It's it's gonna hit something, but but in a, just a matter of a, yeah. a short distance. And, yeah, and so so think about you know that three thousand light years of lead, mm -hmm. that material being squished down to something where a neutrino in a fraction of a second hits something because it's so it becomes so dense. 
um, that's really the, the uh, I think a significant uh, thing. Now, now neutrinos are are typically created by various dec radioactive decays. So, for example, um, nuclei that 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 the beta decay of 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 an of an atom um, or you know, nu nuclei or hadrons um, will produce it. Also, nu nuclear various nuclear reactions like that take place in in the star when the star is fusing generates neutrinos. And also, you could get artificial things like nuclear reactors, nuclear weapons, and particle accelerators can generate neutrinos. Right. Um, they also get generated in supernovae, and we'll talk about that next uh, in next session. Uh, right. Also, talk something about the spin down of a neutron star. Um, these are things. Well, again, we'll talk about neutron stars next session. And then when cosmic rays um, strike things, and again, we'll talk right. about neutrinos throwing up there as well. And before we move on, what's the difference between a quark and a lepton? Uh, Air. Okay. They're fundamentally uh, sort of different classes of okay. particles. Uh, one, uh, quarks interact with each other um, via the strong force. Um, leptons also, I guess, like interact with quarks, um, but they go via the weak force. They're also... Uh, the, yeah. They have a certain essence to them that is also conserved. Mm -hmm. Like there's a thing called lepton number. Um, and it, it's a quantity that ends up being conserved that, that quarks like don't have, for example. That's I, I guess you can also see in the image right there, like if you look very closely at the, ba at the background, you see like these sh uh, shades that uh, encircle the gluon and the quarks. Like the denoting that the quarks interact via the, the strong force carrier, the gluon. Mm -hmm. And then you see another shadow that encircles the photon with the quarks and also the electron, muon, and tau, I believe. And then, yes. you, and then you see the, and you, and you also see the, the Z boson and the W boson uh, shadow encircling all particles. So you can see that. Uh, except you can for see the photon, the, yeah. right? Except, oh, except, yes. for, except for the. Hmm? Photon and the gluon. I guess. Yes. Which and is so and so um, they're funny again. They're they're finally different particles. Back, to, but, but we're we want to focus back on right now is going on is that the big thing is neutrinos. Um, mm -hmm. That the universe has become um, thin enough that neutrinos are are now not interacting with matter very much. Um, now that the neutrinos that they have. We have a lot of evidence of, of this from what's called the angular power spectrum. Um, I believe if you go to the next right. slide, um, the, the, this, 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 and we will look at this in a bit more when we come to looking at the cosmic background radiation. But there are sort of angular sizes that we see in the universe that um you know have these sort of resonances and and part of the evidence of of this big bang process comes from the the bumps that are beyond the first peak um also in in this particular uh situation you know that the, the the models for the big bang uh process had predicted that the temperature when um the temperature of of the neutrinos at this stage should be around 1.95 Kelvin, and the in 2015 they did they did a um, the claim detection of the background of neutrinos. So remember, neutrinos are now able to go to, to, to go far enough to be able to detect it. We can we can detect some of those early cosmic neutrinos today, and we their have, temperature we... is around. Um, reported about 1.96 Kelvin plus or minus 0 0.02. Um, so there's indirect, again, indirect evidence. Okay. There's indirect evidence from the phase changes of that cosmic background, that that curve you see. Um, I don't um, think we've ever directly measured any uh, C and B uh, neutrinos though. I think they're, they're, they're low enough energy. I think they're, they're, they might even be non-relativistic. The, the, sure. the, um, so, so the report came from a group in 2015 
that that claims that they have evidence for for that. So there are there at least are claims about that. Okay. That being those being the case, um, and um, 2015 was reported that 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 such shifts that there are shifts um, that have been detected in the cosmic micro background. These fluctuations correspond to neutrinos of almost exactly the same temperature as predicted by the by big main models. Okay. Yes. Yes. That sort of evidence certainly. Yes. yes. That is, so that's basically, really... it is it is a it is a very slight effect on the phase of the fluctuations. Is it's yeah. how they so they're not directly detected; they're indirect evidence. Okay, yeah. Cause... It's basically the, the the fingerprint of the neutrino of the neutrinos left on the CMB, basically. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and and so that's been that, in fact that was one of the that's one of the interesting triumphs about the the Big Bang. You know, model is this is this prediction that that is uh, appears to be um, uh, quite corresponding. So 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 neutrinos become escape decouple, right? They're no longer in thermal equilibrium. They're they're taken off. So let's go to the next. Go ahead. This is I, I just want to say that this is this is directly analogous to what is going to happen uh, later with photons. Yeah. Uh, the neutrinos that they stop bouncing into everything. And they just keep on going straight in whatever direction they were going when the universe became transparent to the neutrinos. Yes, because there were before the universe was dense enough that the weak interactions um, mean that their mean path was 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 not very not very oh, far. I mean, if we talked about, about that question. earlier before you, we, we talked about this earlier before you got here, but we can do mm -hmm. a quick review if you want. I uh, can go back for like one slide and quickly point out, point out the neutrinos on that, uh, like on, on the, uh, the, 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 st the standard particle, yeah, that, like, uh, the, I think uh, the neutrinos are on the bottom, right? The green ones Correct. on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. The, the, yeah, on the very bottom. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, yeah. um, let's move on to the lepton epic where we're now. We now are going to speed up. Um, we're going to talk about the first um, 10 seconds or so. And in this uh, electron epic, the temperature has dropped from around 10 billion Kelvin to only 1 billion Kelvin. And the energy levels typically are in from the mega electron volts down into the 100,000 uh, electron volts. So how hotter is this than our sun? Um, significantly hotter. I think it's on the order of around two. Which part? Two. Uh, it depends. Like I, th I think the core is like a trillion and, Kelvin, right? The core or not? Maybe I'm mistaken. Um, it's in in, in the isn't in the millions? Isn't mm. so? This is isn't this isn't this around three to four orders of magnitude hotter than st stellar cores? I so one thing, and, and another thing that here is that that um. The vast majority of hadrons and hadron hadrons annihilate each other at the at you know, at, at the end of the um, the, the hadron epoch, right? Because we were fake making these having these quarks come together, and we had you know like protons and antiprotons annihilating each other, um, and the leptons from that from that uh, model um, um, are are now in and anti leptons are now in thermal equilibrium. So so the Photo energy is still high enough to produce electron positron pairs. Um, so remember, E equals MD squared. You get energy that turns into mass. Mass comes back to energy. So high, you know, very energy, very energetic photons can can win if they are greater than two times five to eleven to electron volts can turn into a pair of of, of particles, electron and positron. Um, so the universe is actually uh, you know, still actually hot enough. To create, um, um, you know, create electron-positron pairs, and and um, also at this point starting to create um, uh, neutrons, I believe at this stage. So so there are actually a small number of electrons around to sort of neutralize the the universe, so that the, basically the, the universe is going into a a, a sort of a, a neutral charge, right? We're no longer having pockets of charge that sort of equilibrate out. 
and mm-hmm. and neutrinos have taken off and photons still are creating pairs of electron positrons you're no longer having you're no longer having um more massive particles being created and, and destroyed these are we're now still at the at the range where we can um generate uh, electron positron pairs landon question uh you seem to be uh implying that there prior to this point or there there might have been a point when there were like um areas that were not on average electrically neutral i would have expected on average the uh all of this to be electric um electrically neutral sort of throughout i don't you don't remember we had there is a there is an imbalance in matter antimatter, um, and so you're going yes. to have you're going to have you know for example an excess of protons, um, oh. and so you'll have a charge you know sort of an excess a little bit of excess positive charge, but um, the photons are going to be also there still is a small number of electrons around after these annihilations to sort of neutralize what the protons were doing. So was, was, did the universe have a net charge that like was positive and, and became neutral? Because yeah, because that, that small residue of electrons um, were needed to essentially neutralize. Uh, and that, that also was a, came as an important part of the neutrino decoupling process. Well, okay, um, that's interesting because I I was under the impression that charge was always conserved. I understand that the electrons weren't there, but that doesn't mean that. It, in my head, it, I sort of thought that it was a kind of a a charge sort of soup. <laughs> well, this is then you know, you're, you're you're right and being confused, and it is a, a a a point of confusion because in some ways both charge should be conserved and and you know of. Uh, and also the fact that the 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 hadron anti hadron yeah. should have been balanced, right? That's um, true. Yeah. <laughs> it, you, you, it, it, so 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 in a normal citrus universe, the charge would be conserved and matter into matter would be be created in equal amounts. Obviously, that isn't the case because we have an excess amount of of uh, of matter. Um, and we now also now have uh, a case where where now we have the universe going where we have a an excess of matter because the matter into matter what never was it about like one part in one point six billion wasn't it that yeah that's something that a part in a billion sounds yeah and and so we have there was a little bit for whatever reason uh, more matter than antimatter. And um, then we've got electron positron pairs, but we also have um, charge annihilation that's occurring where where the small residue of electrons um, uh, charge neutralize the universe. The fact that charge neutralizing says the universe wasn't charge neutral before. It's happening. That's happening now, and that's a that's a that's an important part of this neutrino decoupling that's occurring. That occurred on, at, at the first second. Okay. Um, also, also that you, you can also weird. notice that the uh, the universe right now went from like t- uh, ten light years in diameter to thirty three light years in diameter. Uh, roughly speaking, yeah. like I've there are different estimations I found, but I found those one of those estimations that points to this. Yeah, that yeah, and somewhere somewhere I like, in thirty three light years is probably a, a reasonable reasonable set. Mm-hmm. And again. If you if you look at that that wonderful graph of the uh, you did on the on the uh, on the uh, lepton epoch, right? You see that that the that uh, one of the things that starts happening is that the the uh, neutrons are starting to uh, begin to decay. Um, they'll begin to decay, but they're not fully decaying. They're beginning mm-hmm. to decay because there's a half life there. Um, but we'll get into that in just in, in the next. I, 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 I guess like be, before, like during the hadron epoch, you have like neutrons and and protons were interchanging with each other constantly. Like they were at equal ratios yeah. during the time. But after and, like when after the time interval one when we reach one second in the time interval, 
then the universe cooled enough such that this equilibrium was no longer uh, happening. So then neutrons kept decaying into protons. So yeah. yeah, and, and that's a big, yeah. and that that's an important point because the neutron proton ratio fell from one to one to, to one and six, right? That is, mm -hmm. that, yes. is, that is there, there were far more protons and neutrons, but they had electrons around to balance the, the, the protons in terms of charge wise. Mm -hmm. Like like when like when uh, neutrons decay, you also that, that also generates a, a an electron, right? When neutrons decay, yeah. Or not. Now now we don't have enough time for the the neutrons to have decayed. The the point is that that in this in this um, in this early universe, um, the the it, it really it's it's this it's this ratio of of uh, you know the energy is still high enough that photons can create these electron positron pairs hmm. and you know so 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 leptons that these leptons that like the electron stuff and anti-electrons positrons remain in sort of certain thermal equilibrium um but we're about to, to that's about to change and uh, and some of it has to do with 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 nuclear forming in the next set but but again the charge ratio the ratio of Neutron proton went from one to one to to, to about one to six. Um, things are beginning to neutralize uh, in in that in that session. So ready for next, uh, ready for next page. Sure. There. I I, I thought we for those who, who who may not know what these numbers mean. I thought we'd go over a few slides of what these number each of these numbers mean on the on these elements because they're mm -hmm. starting to form now. Yes, I mean you probably have seen in chemistry like H two O, where the two is in front of the in front of and below H. Um, in nuclear stuff, we use different corners. So as you can see in the um, upper left, if you see a number in the upper left, that refers to the atomic mass number. They uh, how many proton neutrons are in the atom. Um, if you see a one that's in the lower uh, uh, lower left, it's the number of protons. So um, helium is defined by having a nuclei with two protons. So helium will always have a two in its bottom bottom the, corner. But the top number can be different. Yeah, yeah generally, generally yeah. the the bottom number you don't see. I guess it's kind of redundant because the the element symbol. HE mm -hmm. in this case gives you that information. Yeah. Technically. But this gives it to you directly. <laughs> yes. Okay, I guess I guess it makes it also easier to see like, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, helium has two po uh, two protons. And some and uh, sometimes you get to an, an, an atom where you don't yeah. remember how many protons there are. Like yeah, uh, it, 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 it and that, yeah. that happens a lot. Like like mm -hmm. I work with, with strontium, um those the isotope of strontium that I work with most often is strontium 88. So ah, you put yeah. 88 in the top. Um, but there are other isotopes that have interesting properties. And eventually we're going like to work 90. on strontium 87. Yeah. Um, well, eight, 90 it sounds like <laughs> something for the nuclear people to work with. Not the <laughs> yes. Atomic people. But, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, but, but for the record, I do not know off the top of my head, actually, for sure. Um, how many uh, protons there are in strontium? Uh, but this is the thing for me. For the longest time, I thought every atom had the same number of neutrons and protons, but th they don't. Yeah, strontium like has an atomic number of thirty-eight. By the way, in case okay, you forgot. Okay. And, I totally uh, forgot. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. So, so in fact, um, you know, the normal thing, you know, like strontium has either the stable natural strontium is is either i think 84 86 87 or 88 yeah uh yes yes yeah, and we're, yeah we're not and we're not at molecules yet we're we're still still far away from them on uh, that's this correct point. yeah but, so just 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 but, give you a notion of all this all this obscure nomenclature but, this, but the number on the other side it means totally something totally different than the number on the first side yes yeah, yeah. And then, so so far we've we've talked about three of the four corners, and then in the 
upper um, right corner, that's when you start to get your like, uh, that's where you put information um, sometimes about some of the electron orbitals. But then you also just have a whole bunch of extra notation for that too. Yeah. But you might, if it's an ion, you you, you uh, put it there as well. You right? better run out. You better run out of corners. <laughs> That's the yeah. That's the that's kind of the problem uh, for there. So, so um, so now that we're actually talking about atoms, um, we I think it's time to move into the next era, which is this Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, a nice mouse word. Um, but but here, if we go into the next um, next statement, um, the 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 thing is that in this. Um, in, in this particular era here, um, I guess I guess well let's let's talk let's first try to talk about the photon epoch, um, uh, or or do you want to talk about the Big Bang? Um, I, I like uh, like I made this, this, the slides in mostly chronological order. So first we will start, we will start with the nucleosynthesis, and then we continue on with the rest of the photon yeah, okay. epoch. Yeah. So 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 in in the nucleosynthesis. Um, you know, uh, this is really occurring um, somewhere between the first 10 seconds and the first 20 minutes or so. And it is responsible for uh, building a lot of the current element mixes today. Um, so so in this in this process um, of the nucleosynthesis, right, so, so, so the temperatures have gone from around one, in Big Bang nucleosynthesis time, we're going from 10 seconds to about, let's say, 1,200 seconds, 20 minutes. Um, temperature drops from about a billion Kelvin to about 10 million Kelvin. And energies go from around 100 kilo electron volts to around 1 kilo electron volts. So a couple things happen. First of all, about the protons and neutrons begin to bind together, right? The universe is cool enough that protons and neutrons, atomic force, can, can, can start lumping them together. And so... By mass, um, we have formed about 74% hydrogen and about a little bit less than 26% uh, helium by mass, right? Um, there like was also... Like also like one thing we can also mention is that like, because the protons and neutrons are now able to bind, that stops the neutron decay. So now the, ra the ratio from 1 to 6 is... Uh, stuck basically yeah. well it's actually fortunate because because you know otherwise we, we would we were in the we were in the situation where we're getting now to the point where the the half-life of of neutrons would, mm -hmm. would would come into effect but when they're in when they are uh under the influence of the strong nuclear process um uh then 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 they 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 perform stable so 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 we have we form about 70 percent four percent hydrogen about 26 percent helium um we did form small amounts of deuterium and helium three we also formed rules trace amounts of but that trace amounts of helium three of hydrogen three there's there could be there's trace amounts of tritium that's hydrogen three yeah it's a hydrogen a proton with two neutrons so by 70 percent by mass were a single proton um about a hundredth of a percent had a proton and neutron stuck together, deuterium, and really trace amounts like one part in one ten, 10 billionth was a proton and two neutrons. But those tritium decay into helium three. There's also a little bit of, of beryllium that gets gets formed and it decays into lithium. So out of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, we have mostly hydrogen, a fair chunk of helium, and at a tiny bit, like one part in one ten billionth by mass of, of lithium. That's it. Um, anything else is so vanishingly small. I mean, yes, there might have been a carbon atom form here or there, but it's so so vanishingly rare and small that that it 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 really didn't. It really, you really can't detect it. Yeah. Um, so, so somebody in the live chat also asks about this, like the the isotopes of hydrogen has special names, like uh, like no, m most hydrogen only has one proton and no neutrons. I, I think that's called proteum. I think so, right? No, oh. um, or just oh. hydrogen. Uh, yeah, or, or, I didn't or just know hydrogen. what was the name for it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I mean, it's all, it, it, that, that, that's 
I mean, yeah. the, the Deuterium Tritium is kind of unfortunate. Yeah, they yeah. Have their own symbols because I think they just should use H two and H three, but but that's well, two yeah, H yeah. and yeah, right. So yeah, two, two, H. Two, yeah, Deuterium is two H and Tritium is three H. Yes. yes. So but, two H would be a, a neutron and a proton, and three H would be a, yes. a proton and two neutrons. Yeah. Yes. And, and so yeah. again, um. 74% by mass was just a single proton, a hundredth of a percent was a proton neutron, and one ten trillionth by mass was a proton and two neutrons, but that quickly decays into helium three. Um, so, so, uh, and then some of the, there's also some beryllium, beryllium seven actually gets created as well at this stage. Um, and that also decays into lithium. Um, so, so 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 do new so do neutrons uh decay into protons or do protons decay into neutrons more often? Protons do not protons on their own are stable. As far as we can tell, the lifetime of protons has a lower bound of something like 10 to the 34 years. Yes, yes. Um it's it's we have looked and we are still looking um to to see if if they will will decay but so far we have we have no compelling evidence that protons decay neutrons yeah. decay in the in with a half life free isolated neutrons decay with a half life of 10 minutes yeah into and they they decay into a proton an electron and an electron neutrino yeah and and that so so that um decay is if they're, they're not under the influence of the of the uh of the strong strong process um and, now and real fast, sorry real fast as fast because this is way in the future but this is this decay is how how geologists figure out how old rocks are nowadays from much larger atoms than these yeah not not these we're not yeah. we're not anywhere close to that like um, with, with, with large okay. atoms, you have uh, like the, the decay so, chains, and and with that you can do uh, like very precise and really, Yeah, it's really important to say that right now the universe is mostly hydrogen, a uh, you know, corner of helium, and then traces of lithium. That's that's it, right? Yeah. Um, the universe is around 300 light years in radius by the time we're at 1200 seconds, um, and the density is density of the universe now is around let's say um uh three tenths of percent of density of air at sea level so so if you look at the density of air at sea level on earth um the universe is about 0.3 percent of that density so so most of the um but most of the energy in the universe is actually in the form of of photons electromagnetic radiation right <coughs> The, the ratio of, uh, uh, and, and so um, at this point, the universe is actually very close to homogeneous. Uh, in, it says the observable universe at this point is 100 light years, only 100 light years. Is that still- The observable is, universe is about 300 light years. Is that, oh. is that still small, smaller than our, uh, what we think the size of our, our, of our own galaxy no, is? I, I'm, I not, so, yeah. I'm not going to answer that because I think that's, I I I, I just try to say, but I think that's misleading okay. to compare stuff then to stuff now. It's so uh, it's so different um, that, that 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 we're talking about right now the observable universe uh, being you know in, in in the order of of what's it 60, 70 billion light years at okay. this stage is only around three hundred. So it's much the universe is much more compact, but still compact enough. It's 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 thinner than 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 air at sea level, um, and but one of the things that happened is that when the when the um, the universe energy dropped down to around thirty kiloelectron volts, um, you no longer had much in the way of nucleosynthesis, right? You're not you're not generating these these you're not taking these hadrons and slamming into form atoms. So so the primordial abundances of the universe are now set. Also, we don't have, we've been using the names of uh, atoms to talk about this, but these are, th these are um, just the nuclei. Like there, yes. there's no electron that, not even like one, not um, yes. generally. Yes. 
Uh, I mean, there might be like one in the whole universe, but it, it would have a, a mean lifetime that would be vanishingly small and it would immediately yes. break away. The electrons, so the electrons are, are, are all... too hot. I think it's too yeah. hot for, for atoms to form, chemical atoms to form. And then yeah. we, have, had... we have a bunch of protons. We have a bunch of, of pairs of protons and neutrons that we call helium nuclei, alpha particles. We have uh, some a small amount of proton-neutron pairs that but, we call but nothing is atoms. Like... And so, we have a light amount of, of of lithium. So there's, but there's no official atom slash elements no. yet. This is nucleosynthesis. This is the synthesis of nucleons, not yeah. atoms. There's no we, chemistry. We already have the nuclei. There's no event. rocks. There's no uh, really, and and also stuff hasn't really decayed enough. I mean, certainly, for example, the, the case of of if there was trace amounts of a proton and two neutrons came together to form what we call a tritium nucleus, it quickly de it decays into, um, uh, it decayed into helium-3. Um, now, um, it eventually decayed into helium-3. So, so today, we see most of the helium today came from this era. Most of the helium that you can see in your helium balloons or whatever um, have, uh, most of the helium today, I should say, not in helium balloons, but because helium balloons come from Rapid decay in the Earth. Um, most of the helium today in the universe came from the zero. Um, it it is it is cool enough for for deuterium to survive. Here's another thing about stars, right? Um, is that that we're the universe is cool enough that a proton neutron can bind together strong force, but not hot enough for those for that those nucleons to smash together to form helium. We're not having fusion of atoms at this stage. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty important thing. Um, it's 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 cool enough for the survive, but not hot enough for the for the um, deuterium to fuse. I, I, so or, or, one, like one question: do, do, Like during this process of nucleosynthesis, was that a fusion or a different process? Of no, no. This is my this is my point. I'm, I'm trying to make. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah. is that at this stage, the universe is cool enough for a deuterium hydrogen uh, a proton neutron pair to survive mm -hmm. but that but the density which that would have been able to fuse into helium um would have created a a temperature which those nucleons weren't forming in the first place right you don't mm -hmm. have you don't you don't have fusion because the the, the universe is too yeah. cold right so yeah, so temper the temperature yeah. have dropped down below mm -hmm. um you know um around what around um the the, the temperatures have dropped around uh 10 was it 10 million kelvin so you're you were below the rate the thing where where mm -hmm. uh stuff happens yeah and, so, so, so the, past, the, the process that creates the helium here is different from how the sun creates helium basically yeah yeah all right yeah, and, and it's a combination of temperature and density. Uh, the center of the sun, um, I, I, the number I'm remembering for the center for the core of the sun is about five million Kelvin, mm -hmm. um, and but the density is much 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 higher. Yes, than it is at this time. So right. I think and and I actually th this is something that I'd like to learn more about, but. I think it's a little bit. It, it's not. It's not like they the uh, the these nuclei are like condensed out of a quark gluon um, like plasma soup, is it? No. Hey, well, they, you say that the the, 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 the the hadron epic was that was between the first twenty uh, microseconds to the second. That's where the final fundamental interactions began to form and that's where you started to have sets of three quarks forming hadrons so so the hadrons started coming together in the the, the early part of the first second this is a case where you've got hadrons in the form of protons and neutrons um slamming together and 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 being dense enough that the, that the strong nuclear interaction is starting to the lump them together. So, so, so that, yeah, so the, the, that the, the is, rocks. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was going to say that what what you just described, Landon, um, is I think 
technically a form of fusion. It's just that it's not stellar fusion. It's not it. it why is it not stellar? Why is it is the actual uh, process different? Um, like the no, if you were to draw like the Feynman diagram for it. Okay, in that sense, the answer is yes. It is. It is. This mm. you would have a similar Feynman diagram for it. Um, <coughs> what's, what's different is the is the is the heating up and redensification, and that's going to be occurring mm. when we start talking about structures and stars. In yeah. The next, in the next episode. Yeah, the thing that turns this off is that it gets too cold for that to continue happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, one last question I have on this slide is like we like we see uh, at the uh, atomic uh, weight of one and uh, a few of two and uh, a few of three and, and many of four and then also a few of uh, uh, seven. But we see we, we don't see any atomic number of five and six. Is that like there's a reason for why we don't see any atomic numbers of five and six? Yeah, stability. Mm -hmm. um, I think like helium five has a such a short half life that a photon can barely <laughs> cross its nucleus radius before it decays. I mean, it's like is it like like ten to the minus twenty second, minus twenty two seconds? I mean, it's got an absurdly fast um, uh, rate. That there was a, at one time there was debate of whether or not helium five even exists, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and you could that's a debate because like if something doesn't exist for long enough. If, if its lifetime is shorter than its energy, which is a concept that makes sense when it, it trust it does, um, then like it's not really even like a well-defined yeah. kind of particle. If, um, if you could never see it, right? Because uh, you couldn't get a photon to, to go yeah. across its nuclei or interact with it, did it really exist, right? Yeah. Uh, what, now, what you would have is sort of a, a resonant, a vaguely resonant condition of like arrangement that might be a little bit more stable than mm -hmm. just, you know. But but if you talk about helium, um, and you talk about helium uh you know isotopes um or other or other compounds, right? That 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 um again helium Helium three and helium four are are stable parts of 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 stable isotopes, right? But there is a um, but there but there are other isotopes. You can we've detected two helium to up to ten helium, right? So if we've detected a pair of protons together, up to a pair of protons with eight neutrons, and and those things have such a short half life. As to not be uh, much in you know around much, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's like two zeptoseconds and stuff. Where it's 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 it's, it's vanishingly small. So so you ask about the, where are the five and six and from the helium side of point of view, the the five and six are are just um, uh, they're now helium six I believe has a and I said a lifetime of around eight tenths of a second, half life. If I recall correctly, about eight tenths of a second. I do not know. Um, and so, um, so it's a, it is a also, but again, the time period we're talking about is between, you know, 10 seconds and 20 minutes. So, so, so helium five is decays almost instantaneously. Um, it decays, it basically kicks out a neutron. Um, and helium six decays into lithium six and and helium four, but that's that was so vanishingly small as to be sort of undetectable. Um, but but when you start getting into case of of, of I mean, you talk talk about isotopes of lithium on the other hand, um, uh, as if if I recall correctly, um, and again I'm going to go back to my my I'm, I'm trying to image my uh chart of the nuclides that's you know you know yeah chemists have the the the, the periodic table elements uh, uh nukes people have have the the the, the basically a a, a two-dimensional chart of isotopes um and helium or lithium does have isotopes but it is but the but here 
the, the main one that's being formed is, is uh, lithium seven coming from beryllium form. And beryllium remember is is uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. Beryllium is four, right? So you've got, you probably have helium things coming together, kicking out a neutron. Um, but that, that beryllium seven decays into lithium seven. Did I, did I get that right? I'm, I'm doing it from memory. Um, I don't know. Um, natural lithium, natural lithium is, is lithium six is certainly, uh, the most common, know, right? Um, I think uh, it's about, it's about, about seven and a half percent of natural lithium is lithium six. Oh, and lithium okay. seven is the, is, isn't the other one that's, that's, that's I, I've never, I, I, what I, I know more about a lithium's um, S wave scattering length than I know about its natural abundance. Mm -hmm. And li <laughs> lithium is the third element, right? In the, in the chart. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, and so people are, 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 are heating are, are yelling at us saying blah, blah, blah. But, but yes. Um, so I'm looking now at my, at my, my table. Uh, lithium six is stable. Lithium seven is stable. Um, and uh, the abundance uh, the abundance is around um, 90, 92.2% to 98.1%, depending on, on what you're talking about population or range, um, is lithium-7. So most of it is lithium-7, and and about 2% is lithium-6. Um, yeah. If you want a kind of big picture sense of why the like this is where it stops why it doesn't stop at why doesn't it stop at um carbon you know why does it stop at lithium basically the the, the sort of way i think about it is helium 4 is like crazy crazy stable it's yes it's it, it is a very favorable state to be in it is much more stable and much more likely to occur than any of the sort of combinations that are a little bit higher than that. You you have to sort of, you'd have to go up a, a, like an order of magnitude before you start to find anything else. And really nothing is quite as stable as alpha particles. Like they're, yes, they're, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now so that's a, yeah. kind of a reason. Now, I mentioned about I mentioned about saying that 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 beryllium seven decays into lithium seven. Uh, a little bit caveat that that, that that the half life of beryllium seven is around 52, 53 days, and it usually decays by electron capture. So if we're being strictly mm -hmm. honest, during this period of time, there is lithium seven, beryllium seven, being formed. It hasn't decayed yet. It'll decay shortly, um, and and it All typically right. decays by capturing electrons. We don't have atoms for it to even capture. Um, it'll probably it's probably grabbing occasional yeah. electron it finds around there. But but it at this stage we're only at, at twenty minutes. Um, uh, mo the, the beryllium seven that's formed um, is is going to be. Um, it's going to be decaying in 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 a, in a, in a couple of months. Um, the beryllium nine is stable, but but beryllium nine is too much energy to to to, to it's, it's too difficult for these hadrons to be during nucleosynthesis to slam together to form stable I, beryllium. It, I, it, like uh, during this time, it, it wasn't hot enough and dense enough for uh, that to happen. Yeah. Basically, yeah. correct. Correct. Yeah, that, yeah. That, can, that can only that can only happen in stars. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 beryllium. The other isotopes of beryllium have such a short half life that they're not, they're not sticking around, um, or they're mm -hmm. not forming. So, so in this era, for we're, we're talking strictly right now and sticking to the, to the you know twenty minutes, we have, we have, we have hydrogen in nuclei as protons. We have proton neutron. We have proton neutron neutron um, because if you're again being technical, that tritium nuclei hasn't decayed yet it will um the light the lifetime of the half-life of tritium though is uh on the order of a, a couple of years maybe like yeah, 12 years, years 12.7 years i actually i have a 
I have on my keychain a little piece of a little glowy thing. I can't even find it now. Uh -oh. Maybe it's oh, it. <laughs> but, but I, I have a I have a I have a vial of of tritium um, on my keychain because of the it's it's alpha decay. It's not getting through the little plastic that it's yeah. in. Yeah. And I've had it for about six years now, and I've noticed it's gotten substantially dimmer. Um, so you said you said alpha decay. Don't you mean beta oh, decay? It's a, it's a oh yeah. Beta so, uh, sorry, my bad. Yeah, I can't yeah. alpha decay. There's not enough there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so so again, in this first twenty minutes, we have protons. We have proton hydrogen. We have proton neutron. We have proton neutron neutron. They'll decay into helium, the three helium. Uh, we have three helium directly. We have four helium because that's a nice, nice cluster. You, you'll find these nucleons have these groups that likes to, to, to form. Just like in chemistry, you have these electron shells. Well, there's, there's, if yeah. you will, there's sort of the sort of nucleon shells, if you will, in, inside the nucleus. I, it, and it minim, it there is some beryllium seven, right? but the beryllium yeah. seven yeah. has, there is beryllium seven, but the beryllium seven has not decayed yet. It'll, it will, it will decay, beryllium will decay in around two months and form lithium seven. So, so the big thing that come from this, this epoch is that unlike what's going to be happening in stars and with life cycle of stars, which happens next episode, um, we have the, the, the masses today, most of the hydrogen you see today came from this era. Most of the helium today did not form in stars, but came during this big bang nucleosynthesis era between 10 seconds and oh. Although, the, as, you, as you mentioned before, the helium that we have here on Earth came f comes from decay from the from the crust, right? Yeah. 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 Although there is some primordial helium uh, on Earth. Anything else on All this page we need to talk about before we go to the next slide? Uh, like I, I like I use this image to uh, basically su summarize summarize three epochs. Like here on the left, you see the hadron epoch where the protons and neutron ratio is equal. And then we move on to the lepton epoch where the neutrons begin to decay into protons. So then you have the yeah. one to six ratio of proton to neutrons. And then during the photon epoch, during nucleosynthesis, then you have the formation of nuclei that stabilizes the, the neutrons. So now, now the ratio between protons and neutrons yeah. remain fixed, more, more yes. or less. Yeah. Yes. So shall we go to the yes. to the next fun epoch? So 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 um oh, I think we are still is... in the photon epoch, but we just continue on yes. in the in the photon yes. epoch, yes. Yes, we'll 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 continue. So we'll go back um because these are sort of over overlapping the effects. Um pardon us for going back to 10 seconds again. But in this in this um situation, the universe is dominated by radiation, right? By by photons. And and then this we've and we finally jumped a significantly amount of of, of time now. We've got well, we're, 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 no, we start we start with ten seconds, so we're still at yep. the ten seconds thing at the beginning of stuff. We'll we'll get to bit a bit. More I, I guess I guess I could have changed the time interval because from from ten seconds to twenty minutes that was nucleosynthesis, but now we have we yes. have moved past the twenty minutes mark. Basically. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about 20 minutes going on and forward. And here the temperature is too low to create electron positron pairs or other massive particle pairs. Um, the temperature is too high for electrons to actually bind to atoms. So we don't have atoms. We have nucleon. We have electrons uh, flowing around, right? Um, the, the universe is, is, is pretty much charge neutral, but, but we just have a soup of nucleons and electrons going the around plasma the, the, a pl a plasma the, the, yeah yeah mm -hmm. and 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 so there's no there's no atoms because it's too hot i mean the temperatures um the temperature starts off at around uh, a billion kelvin and will it isn't until you get around um starting at around you know the in in the ten thousand kelvin range that you're that you're no longer dominated by radiation right it, 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 it takes the big bang process about 47,000 years before the universe is not dominated by these energetic photons uh, around. It, so the, so you're saying that 
Oh, so what, what do we mean by that? When we, when we say that it's, it's photon dominated, what I understand that to mean is that, yes, you have electrons that are moving around. And yes, you have nucleons and, and nuclei that are, are moving around. Those things have energy because they're moving, but mostly because they also just kind of exist. Yeah. Um, also, also early on, there are photons that have energy to actually break apart uh, and, a deuterium nuclei, right? When, mm, when yeah. one of the one of the things why there's not much deuterium around is that at the time early on in this photon epoch, the, the photons would just basically smash and break apart the the um, the, the the deuterium. Um, I did not know that. And so uh, it's, it's what's called photo dissociate deuterium. Um, so, so that basically these, these atomic nuclei are formed quickly were separated back into proton neutrons. Right? This is why there's very little deuterium. And this is another way, reason why um, you don't have this situation, you don't have the photon load inside a, a core of a star. The star isn't shattering its deuterium into hydrogen and, and neutrons. Um, in, in, in a solar core in this area early on in the photon epic where, where again it's going to take around forty-seven thousand years before the universe expands and cools enough that 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 photons are not being destructive right once the thermal energy uh, drops around drops to around um you know 30 000, uh, uh 30 000 electron volts um nucleosynthesis basically comes to an end and the primal abundances are set um but 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 yes the, the big thing is that 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 by the by the 10 second mark there are fewer there are fewer uh hydrogen photons available to dissociate deuterium so deuterium starts to stick around more and more and more um and added heavy atoms form through a a a fusion like process um where you'll get the tritium helium three helium four and trace amounts of lithium and brilliant yeah. which decays into to lithium but but most of the energy that's around here is not in the the particles that are moving around and have mass it's it's mostly in the photons there's yes. way 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 more photons than there are um ma very massive good point. particles right yes very very good point um but but then something kind of wonderful happens towards the end of this epic. Although we want to do want to move on to the, I think one of my favorite parts of the of favorite times. Yeah. Well, I want to say so. so to lead into that, um, during the photon epic, even though like photons, which you know light is photons, um, are are sort of the thing. The universe is opaque. Those photons don't travel very far before they hit. Um, a free electron, or a, uh, scatter, a nuclear, yep. or they scatter off something, and the the electrons and um, protons that aren't paired up, they they interact very, very, very strongly with with um, photons, and so a a plasma will be much more opaque than it's a fog. Oh well, yeah, it's exactly, and the if you if you had been like transported back there uh, at the beginning of the photon epic, you'd get vaporized. At the end of it, um, you I mean you'd still end up d dead. But four thousand Kelvin, I can imagine a a building like a submarine or something that would make you last for a quarter of a second, and it would <laughs> look it would look um, hot. But at four thousand Kelvin, it's not going to look totally white. Yes. It's actually going to look uh, like it's, yellow. So, like, so, it, it, like uh, I think you, you can you can point at the sun. Like the sun itself is a uh, a ball of plasma. So you you cannot you can see the sun because the the space between the sun and you is uh, transparent, basically. But the sun but itself not. is not transparent. You cannot yeah. see through the sun. Yeah. Like if, even even if you have magic goggles that allows you to look. At the sun, you cannot see, you still cannot see through the sun. Yeah, basically, yeah. photons do not go through the sun. So, so yeah. if you ever seen a a, a a a basic plasma kiln, right? Um, very high temperature kilns. What you start seeing, you start losing the ability to even see objects. You just start to see this 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 glow. It looks like a a, a neon sign. Basically, you just get glow, right? 
and that's because again the, the the photons are being scattered off of charges and and so you get that like a fluorescent tube it's 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 it is fluorescing but um something happens after around 378,000 years so shall we go to the big bang flash okay um in here around 370,000 years something very special happens um the temperature drops to the point where protons can capture electrons and form neutral hydrogen atoms right here we got to start getting items. We don't have a bunch of, of, of subatomic particles. We start having atoms. Now they call it recombination because usually in, in, in normal things, we have a plasma that's condensing out and forming atoms. We call it recombination. It's really a misleading term, but but because essentially proton electrons hadn't been combined before. But um uh, it should, should have been called combination, not re. Yes. <laughs> well, that's why we call it uh, the, the common thing now. So it's called the Big Bang Flash, because what happened was that the, the universe went from this this glowing plasma fog to transparent. Um, the 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 uh, protons grab hold of electrons and form neutral hydrogen, and the the photons took off. And today when we observe the universe in the microwave, we see the leftover radiation, the, 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 basically the echo of, of the Big Bang process. It's one of the more triumphal things about the Big Bang models was that they predicted that we would see this cosmic micron, mi microwave background radiation. And it is it has been uh, redshifted to, from today's perspective, it's been redshifted around 1100 times. So, so it's been stretched out to the point where the where the photons appear as microwaves. But back then, they were um, they were hydrogen. Now, do you want to talk about about how yeah. hydrogen actually does this? Because there's a little bit of there's a little bit of tricky bits here. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So, um, hydrogen you you can compute the sort of temperature that you would need to have if you just had like a hydrogen. Um, atom on its own how hot would it have to be in order for its electron to um be removed from it that temperature is actually really like pretty darn high a lot higher um than you than the temperature of the universe uh when it when we had the flash and the reason for that is because there's actually a lot of like you have to look at the full sort of treatment of what's going on because you don't just have an isolated um hydrogen or or something like that's trying to be hydrogen it's in this photon bath with everything and for a long time any any um time you would have a, an electron that would go and pair up with with a proton and form an atom there would be a proton a, a photon very nearby that would just whack it and dissociate the two yeah and and and, and radiation is it's scattering around, by the way, I remember the term is called Thompson scattering. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Yes, You're basically, yes. it's basically just directly scattering off of um, the free charges. And and that's how everything is main being maintained in thermal equilibrium. Everything is basically the same temperature um, everywhere at this time. However, eventually you do... As things expand and get colder and colder, you eventually hit a point where you do actually have a pretty good chance of a um, of of an electron and a high, and a proton pairing up. And when you do that, that can that reduces the amount of free charges that are still available. And over a pretty short amount of time, I think on the order of uh, like a few thousand years, like it was more than 100 years, but it was less than 100,000 years. Yes. I think it was less than 10,000 years. Um, I think I, I think about a thousand years is maybe not a crazy sort of time frame um, for when basically all of all of the electrons and protons were free to when they were almost all paired up together. Yeah, yeah. After this, after this Big Bang flash, there was a, the neutral that basically the free electrons and protons 
were about only by a few parts uh, per 10,000 at this stage. It, they were, they were, yeah. they were, they were fairly rare, not, not impossible, but fairly rare. Most, most hydrogen atoms have been formed and there's only a small amount of, of naked protons and, and electrons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. According to my, you have to you have to go from from you have to go from like if if you have one in every ten thousand um, electrons is free, that is still a high enough rate. It, it's still opaque at that point. That number has to drop to a pretty. I, I think there was a graph actually. Yeah. I think that and might. It's a, a few parts in ten. And a few parts in ten thousand. So so it's more like you know that 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 the vapor you've got a water vapor that's been now condensed in droplets. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of water vapor still around, but yeah, mostly yeah. droplets, right? There's 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 a little bit of of free protons, electrons around, but most of it has condensed into um, neutral atoms. Why? Because the universe has cooled enough that that proton can grab hold electron and form an atom. I, I think there's a, there's a good analogy with humidity. Like uh, you, like uh, even like most air is still humid. At some point, but then when you reach a certain point of humidity, then you cannot see uh, very far, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, like you said, um, at this point, true atoms elements have formed. Now, of all three of the mm -hmm. uh, two or three of the uh, things, this is a while he before he is a while formed before. a bit earlier. Oh, it's uh, yeah. but 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 photons kept knocking them out. Uh, um, and, and so around this time, both hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, nuclear helium uh, formed enough that the photons aren't knocking out the electrons. Can, very much. can compounds or molecules form yet? No, or, or, no. Or I, I, no. I, I, did no. I did find that you, you have, you, you, like some point you can have helium hydride, basically helium with a charged hydrogen. And that, that was the not, oldest molecule basically. Yeah. Not, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not a, um, the density is such that you're not really having those kind of bonds get broken at the, at the mm -hmm. high temperatures around 4,000. Uh, they are transient. They are transient uh, compounds. Yeah. yeah. Now, now there is a thing about, uh, there's, a, there's a fine detail about how hydrogen actually, uh, mm -hmm. what happens, how it captures. Um, yeah. Because, and you want to talk about that, the ground state and that sort of thing? Uh, oh, you up. actually might. Uh, you, you explained it pretty well when we uh, were discussing it a couple weeks back. So, so the if you look at the ground, you know, so atoms have have these electron orbitals, right? And and the, the neutral hydrogen at the lowest ground state is is a proton with an electron in, in its first orbital. That that ground state um, is actually uh, forming that ground state directly is very inefficient. Um, usually what happens is that, 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 because again, the, the universe was, was hotter. Um, the, the, the proton would grab hold of an electron and be at one of the higher orbitals, higher, higher energy states. And then that would end up emitting photons to drop to the lower state. So a lot of the, there's some confusion about this, but, but, but the main pathway is that you get what's called the, from the 2P state by hitting, emitting a, a, uh, a, a layman alpha photon. Um, then those things would always always be always be reabsorbed by another hydrogen atom that's in the ground state. Um, the better way is to form the 2s state by emitting two photons. And that's slow. So so the fast way of stuff, the, the the photon that would come out would be absorbed by another hydrogen atom. It took the slower mode um, to which was was from the 2s by emitting two photons um to get to neutral there but again that's that's part of that 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 multi-year process you're talking about of it of it cooling down now it's important to understand it and do we have a picture of the um of the, of the microwave background i think, I think so um, yeah yes yeah, that's yes yeah so so like as, first... as, as, you mentioned, as you mentioned before uh when, when the the moment when the universe became mostly transparent the photons were free yeah. to travel, and, the, and yeah. those photons are the microwave background yeah. radiation. So, so yeah. the, first, the first image up there, Kobe, was a the first sort of satellite that they're so, now. Now, so, Pinton Wilson so, at Bell Labs had actually detected photons, uh, microwave photons, so uh, through is, their microwave detector at Bell Labs. So, 
early so, on in the uh, 60s and and Kobe was the first satellite launch to do a full scale sky map. So are these the map was 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 a bit more detailed and Planck was even more detailed. So the those three images you see there are are sort of transition from the we detected microwaves to we have a map but it's kind of it's kind of uh, crude to a much more detailed map. So is this one that each picture was taken 92 2003 2013 is that one that they were the pictures were taken? Uh, I think that's when they were published. Those were the the, the results of those missions are published. So uh, mm-hmm. again, you know, the first thing that and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for detecting microwaves. They were trying to that uh, the, the, the telephone company was trying to look at using microwaves to transmit voice signals over long distances and kept finding all this noise, this static hiss. And so these two bubble researchers try to figure out what's the source of this noise and could they do something about it? And they ended up discovering that essentially the the noise, this microwave noise, was all around in the sky. In fact, if you have an old analog TV set where you can turn the, the, the tutor and you turn it between stations, and you, see, if you remember seeing, or people have been seeing the old, the, the, when, when the TV would go off, the station would go off the air, you get that static fog, the static thing on, on the, on the tube. About um, several percent of those, of those little spots are actually photons from this Big Bang flash that you can still detect it in, in down in that microwave region. Kobe was the first um, spacecraft specially designed to map in detail the microwave. And, and those, those, those colors you see there are because the, the, the Big Bang flash did not happen at an instant. It turns out the universe was not perfectly uniform temperature. There were some parts of the universe that were just slightly hotter than others. And we and mean like a slightly part- colder. And we mean like a part in in a hundred thousand on the like sort of yes. roughly right on the, like on yes. the Kelvin scale. The yes. Kelvin. yes, 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 um, because we're using ab- and, absolutely. And, and so the difference between Kobe WMAP and Planck is 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 the telescope's angular resolution, right? Um, and and so what? Why was there were parts that were hotter and parts that were colder by a few parts per million? Um, the answer is because there were sound waves in the universe. The, the universe was not completely, perfectly uniform dense. There were sound waves moving through the early universe. And where they're compressing, it was slightly, just tiny, tiny bits hotter. So it meant it went neutral just a tiny, tiny bit later than other spots. The way to think about it is that, that the, that the uh, microwave coming from that spot, because it occurred earlier or later is slightly red shifted or blue shifted relative to the peak. Now, was this where the, all the people, all the, they killed all those birds trying to get, the, not the birds with the thing, they killed them all the birds to get the signal clear? No, they're not killing birds. They, they, they put up screens because oh. Benjamin Wilson thought that perhaps there was a uh, interaction with, with bird poop in the microwave. Yeah. Because Penzias and Wilson were not looking for this. They, they were trying to they, eliminate it so yeah, they could have night nice telephone signals communicating by microwave. There, there was a group that was that was looking was or was going to be looking for this. Penzias and Wilson were not. They concluded after sort of a year of trying to rule everything else out. They they were like, uh, that's when they they sort of realized um, the effect had been. Predicted, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't a thing I that know. a lot of people were looking yeah. for. And 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 so they perfected the microwave receivers, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Bell Labs was working on saying, "Well, gee, if, if we could use microwaves, these point-to-point communication, to transmit telephone signals, we don't have to string these copper wires. We could just mm-hmm. do point-to-point stuff." And and when they started building more efficient receivers, they found that that was all the static hum, static hiss. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, a stereo or your car stereo between us two, two, two radio stations, you get that, right? That's what they were getting. And so they come, hey, what's the source of this? Is there, could we have like a frequency to block it off? Is it because 
something is creating. And even they thought maybe the, the problem was that, that, that chemical reactions or things with bird poop were causing some of this, some of this uh, glow to occur. Um, and so part of the thing is that Bell Labs had, they were able to build really good tra microwave transmitters and receivers that are able to actually do this measurement and said, hey, look, this hiss we see, which is making it difficult to have nice, clear telephone communication through, through analog communication through microwaves, is coming from the sky. I said, oh boy, Big Bang Flash, predicted by the model and, and detected. And in fact, the, the, the frequency redshifted 1100 times corresponds exactly to this this business of these um decoupling again it is a it is a it's a it's a more complex process than just simply forming neutral hydrogen it, you, you the, the hydrogen formed with electrons at higher orbitals yeah and the main thing was the 2s became you know went down by emitting two photons and those at a much slower process and those photons are the ones we that turn into the microwave background because the 2p stuff Lemon alpha gets but kept getting absorbed by another atom. Vandelia. Um, yep. Put me up. So here I have uh, a nice little hydrogen atom, and apparently my my screen is reversed, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I didn't know that, so you can't. Re that says ground. Hydrogen has its ground state, and then you go up, and it has uh, its excited states, and then it has more excited states, and eventually. The excited states just merge, and and then up here the electron is just free. Yeah. And if if the electron is here, for example, it's very it takes very little energy. It only takes that That's, much energy. He's according to the second line above ground. I, I, yeah, uh, the, the tapio one. Real fast, tapioca. Uh, go into settings, go to video and mirror oh. camera. Yeah. And for those listening, he has. He was pointing to there was a ground state at the bottom. And yeah. And there's a line uh, apparently about a third way up. And there's another, there's a third line that's that's up even higher for those that are listening and not seeing. Yes. So, yes. So if the atom is on the third line, it's at the, the uh, which is 2S? The, yeah. So, the, well, the, the 2S is, I think, right here, right? It's, it's sort of like a degenerate one. So okay. you have it. And you but you you need some energy the process from going from this state to the ground state is very inefficient yes and it requires um releasing two photons at the same um time and just the probable probability of that happening is is very 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 low so generally things don't really decay that much which means the electrons are always up here and it only takes this much energy for them to get booted off and become and stay as free electrons that's why it it really depended on when it got cold enough that they could finally drop yeah. down here and once they drop down there there aren't photons really around that are going to excite them back up because going from here to here is just as inefficient as going from here to here, except you need to get hit by two photons from different directions. Whereas yeah. when you're going down, you can just emit those photons. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and so the 2P two, two state dropping yeah. is, the problem is that that photon would get absorbed by another neutral hydrogen atom and kick it back up again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so there's been some confusion about about the temperature. Those those have different temperatures at different times, um, but that's a that's a, a bit of sort of chemistry because I notice I know that there's some folks who who prefer dogma over science um, get confused about this transition thing. But yeah, so they, because they look ahead. at it and they hear that the ionization temperature of a hydrogen is a hundred thousand Kelvin or something like that. Um, but it, but we didn't have recombination until like 4,000 Kelvin. It's yeah. because it's not that simple. You, you actually have to look at how does it, how do you actually get the electrons down into that energy level? Yes. And that process, um, depends on things like the fact that there is a particular transition, yeah. which is 
mostly forbidden. You, you so, it's, 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 it's like a, it's like a, it's, like a, it's like a chemical reaction where you have to go up uphill to the transition state, and then and then and then after that point, it's downhill basically. Yeah. Uh, you, mentioned do you mentioned dogma. Does creationists talk about this time period at all? Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, there's some there's some people that, that that are confused, but 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 um, I would I would refer to like channels like Dapper Dino and so forth that could talk about some of the he sometimes covered some of the um creation confusion. Uh, um, but back to here with with this notion of 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 the Big Bang flash and effectively hydrogen going neutral, but not instantaneously and having lumps. Um, the, the angular size of those lumps is part of that power spectrum. And that's another thing that, that, the, that the Big Bang model predicted. The grainness of the Planck, for example, um, image is, is, is masses very well the model of how the universe would essentially condense, if you will. The fog goes to clarity um in that, in that sense um and but i also say you know from from the uh i was in the audience american and study audience in 1992 um when the kobe uh, results were announced right and people were waiting you know the, 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 what happens and 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 this if you see in this graph right here you see that curve that sort of lopsided bell mm -hmm. curve um that's a that's a basic that is a that's essentially is is a showing you sort of the 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 black body distribution of the of the frequencies. When something is a certain temperature, it glows at a certain frequency, but it's but it's not a single line; it's a spread. And and this yeah, is so showing it's, it's, you some some, uh, some photons of a longer wavelength, some of a shorter wavelength, but there is like a, a maximum where most photons are at this are at a particular wavelength. The, yes. The, yeah, yes. The top and the, the maximum top. peak corresponds to the temperature. In fact, it's called <laughs> the black body curve. Yeah. And and so the, the question was what would the when they measured the micro background, what would it be like? And so the guy throws up saying here is the you know, predicted temperature at 2.73 degrees Kelvin and drew that drew a, yeah, and put up a prop Plot that has that sort of it was black but, but but like that red line and they said and they said here is the um what kobe measured and you didn't see anything and they said and here are the error bars added to it you didn't see anything and he said the reason why you're not seeing something it's not a slight defect i have to zoom way in because the error bars are so tiny that they are less than a pixel at which point, Don is standing applause, standing ovation, because essentially it was one of the big triumphs of, of Big Bang process, which was that the, the thermal temperature of the thing and the peak was predicted with the redshift. We, we, we know now from this from these transition things what the temperature is for the, for the inefficient uh, ground state, 2S ground state. We know what that temperature is, we know what the frequency is, and then you shift that down 1100 and it matched exactly what this curve was and it was it mm -hmm. was extraordinarily close to essentially a a black body curve the universe was a really nice black body and and it's now today it's cooled down not to the several thousand kelvin but 2.73 kelvin and the microwave curve follows that curve uh in a very very great detail yeah, it's it's, a, it's also one thing you can mention is that like to but today, when you look at the night sky, the universe, the, the backdrop of the universe is black because, because you, 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 your eyes cannot see uh, microwaves. Yeah. But if you if you were to travel back in time during the time when, like right after recombination, the universe was like about four thousand Kelvin, which yeah. meant that which, which meant that the universe was not was not black. It was like a deep orange. Well, you see, yeah. you see that square yeah. up there. Yes. That's the color that you would have seen. It is, yes, the sky would have been that color because the glow of stuff. Of, these, of course, you would, these, of course you, 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 like you would have bur been burned to a crisp at four thousand Kelvin, but uh, it's yeah. still, yeah, <laughs> it would have been yeah, bright but, orange. But yeah. not yeah. instantly, though, right? Like yeah. you can imagine building something that would let you like survive a, a little bit. I mean, you don't have anywhere to put the heat, so eventually you're screwed. But, yeah. <laughs> but it, yes. these are the like 
we use higher temperatures in manufacturing certain things, not that often. That's still pretty hot, but yeah. um, like really, really high temperature, like arc welding and stuff, I think easily is much hotter than yeah. this. Mm -hmm. So, so the big thing is that, 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 so back to the Planck epic, um, in the loveliness of that thing. And again, we're talking about extraordinarily fine changes in, in temperature, getting on order by one part in hundred thousand, um, that the lumps there are extraordinarily important. And we're going to talk about them in the E3. Um, but, but that picture you see in Planck is the oldest picture you can ever see in this universe, right? That, that is, that is, that is the, that's the, that's where, where photons stop the, the path of photons stop anything, anything before that the universe was this transparent plasma glow and you couldn't see things. You couldn't see structure when, when it went neutral through that process, that took a couple of years. Um, around 378,000 years, when it went neutral and the Big Bang flash that occurred throughout the universe, then we have the first um, sort of, we can see, you could you can actually see the first the first stuff, right? That, that's, that's important um, to, to kind of kind of realize is we're really talking at, at, at what you can actually see at this stage. Right. Are we ready for the final slide? Sure. Any more things on this thing you need to talk about? Anybody have questions for this slide real fast before we go on? I would, I would say that this is probably one of the big triumphs of, of cosmology um, and one of the things, one of the strongest um, uh, evidences of the Big Bang process was there. It was something which was the Big Bang process predicted we should find. We found it. Now we found it. We found it exactly where we expected it. And we found it at, at extremely close to the to the frequency temperature that we expected. And, uh, and um, you know, congratulations uh, to the Bell Lab scientists for first detecting it and then to these wonderful people of Kobe, WMAP, and Planck, because a lot of what we're going to talk about in the next thing comes from the incredible science that these three missions did. I, I got to make, make a joke real fast now. M move over, follow Rome. Move over, follow the Bronze Age. This is the Dark Age. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, and I, I will, I will point out. Uh, you know, Dapper taught me that that the term Dark Age from history is not favored by modern historians. They prefer the term Early Middle Ages. Um, and you want to get, if you want to get Dapper's um, feathers heckled up, um, start talking about Dark Ages. Um, however, we're not talking about we're not talking about this era in history. We're talking about a true dark age in the universe. What do you mean by dark age? Well, at it's this dark. stage, once the photons are, are freed, we have this big bang flash. There isn't really anything else in the universe that's glowing, that's causing, creating new photons. Um, the photons were bouncing around inside the plasma. Hydrogen went neutral, photons went wee, and nothing. Big, black, dark, nothing it, it it took a few um probably hundred thousand years to go into that state because you need to expand so that th those photons yep. stop being um visible light but yep. that would happen that that would happen yep. uh, like a, after uh, it, it's, it's a, like in, in my notes it says like after three million years the uh, cmb redshifted to uh, outside the visible range yes. basically yes yeah. would have been infrared but, 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 and then... uh, yeah, sliding so, down. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so when the universe was three million years old, then then the universe was basically black at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. And at two million years, if you had looked, it would have looked a very, very dim, deep red, for example. Yes. Yes. So it yeah. was a sort of transition, but by by three million, that's not quite a factor of ten um, older, which means a factor of ten. I think in expansion yeah. and roughly a factor of 10 in redshift. Yeah. Um, so, and, and in terms of era, you know, we're now in the stage where we're dominated by matter, right? That mm -hmm. started around 47,000 years after the big bang process started 47,000 years and runs till about 9.8 billion years. Um, 
So we've, but but in this cosmic dark age, started around 370,000 years after and lasted somewhere in the 100 million-ish, 150 million ish and we're not quite sure yet. It's one of the things that the, that the James Webb Telescope is investigating. The red shift goes from 1100 to 20. Temperatures go from about 4,000 Kelvin to around 60 Kelvin. So it goes from being being uh, excruciatingly hot to downright frigid. Um, uh, and 60, Kel 60 Kelvin is uh, like far, far below freezing. Like it's, 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 yes. it's colder than any, any place on Earth. Yeah. Yes, yes. So the closest I've ever been at, at the, near the South Pole was 210 Kelvin. Um, 60 is, is downright uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and and um, understand that, that one of the things that happens during this dark age is it is possible for liquid water to form. Hold on. I have to flex for a moment. You guys think that 60 Kelvin is, is cold? Man, well, you guys well, gotta come hang out at an ultra maybe cold. Not. You, gotta, um, yeah. you gotta come hang out with an ultra cold atomic physicist. <laughs> and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, we, I can, I can. Yeah, but you gotta put some skin in the game, right? Yeah. How, what, what skin do you have at micro Kelvin, right? I, I, I'm not. <laughs> that, yeah, that, I, that's true. That's true. Uh, but yeah, I can I can show you a nice glowing ball of of atoms I, I, that are chilling. I, I, nice. Like I I can pour you a cup of cold drink that is far lower than sixty Kelvin, my friend. <laughs> yes. So so back to say so so again around this time the density waves begin imprinting polarization signals on on there. So even though the the the, the photons are going around, there's 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 some polarization signals being imprinted on it. Another thing that happens is that, that because we've gone temperatures from, from around 4,000 Kelvin down to 60 Kelvin, there is a period of time where the universe was, let's say, between 373 and 273 Kelvin, which is what? You know, you can, you can get, you can actually get water molecules forming at this stage. Um, if, you have, if you have oxygen. If you had oxygen, right? But <laughs> you don't because we lack something. There's nothing glowing at this stage. Um, so so if there was, but again, we don't think there's any oxygen forming because we don't think we don't think stars have have turned on yet. In fact, the definition of, of the dark ages is before stars form. Yeah. And I was Go gonna say this is an area where I think we actually start to know a lot less in a certain sense, um, than maybe we did about what we've mostly talked about in this episode, yes. at yeah. least in terms of like relative to what you might expect us to know. Yes. Because like here, the universe is turning into an environment that it, it's a di it's a dilute um, neutral gas at this point. But we don't the exactly how those first stars formed is still very much a um yeah. the details of that are not clear yeah and so when we start on on when we when we start h3 um uh, uh before three we're talking about stars galaxies and large scale structures uh, we're going to be talking about some of this thing about when did the dark age of the universe end and how did it end, and and so, but understand that 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 speckled thing that you saw with Planck, uh, W map Kobe, that is the beginning of the structures of the early universe. We begin to see in that the the structures there, and we'll talk a bit more about how they're going to form stuff, because in BE three we're going to talk about these structures. And then in the E4, we're going to talk about how those structures form planetary systems. Because remember, it's before Earth. We got to get to Earth. So stay tuned. Uh, oh, 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 well, like one, one thing to mention, perhaps, is like uh, in the notes that I have here, is that the uh, you know, at this stage in the cosmic dark ages, you have two sources of photons, the CMB, and also the uh, uh, 21 centimeter radio waves by neutral hydrogen and and that will be very important when we discuss the uh, mm -hmm. the form the the, uh, the next the next stage when yeah. the first stars appeared yes 
So I think we've come to the end of the um, of this uh, era in the universe. Of the, we're now we've left the universe in the dark, and we've left you in the dark, uh, quite literally. And uh, we will see what happens um, in BE3. Uh, does anybody in the chat have any questions for uh, for the, our, for us before you before we uh, do our sign offs or anything? Speak now. now or forever hold your peace. Any questions? Any comments? Chat. You know, as they're saying, it's yeah that 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 uh, the Big Bang Flash is 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 certainly. Um, quite a triumph and and i congratulate those people involved in that process nowadays microwaves is is, is kind of uh pretty much uh a, a commonplace i mean you got you probably have one you probably have a, a trans microwave transmitter in your uh in your uh, kitchen um but back then it was big pretty big tech yeah it's 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 once you get higher frequency than microwaves that it starts to get really difficult, yeah. like millimeter waves. That's a sort of a black hole of technology. Yes. <laughs> it's very yes. hard <laughs> until, until you get up yes. back into like the mid IR basically. Um, if, if, if you're, if you're watching this live, if you could, or even afterwards, if, if you happen to like what you're seeing and click that like button, that thumbs up button, um, it helps this channel. I, I'd say, uh, Go subscribe to these guys too. I don't think they actually have official channels. And 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 we have a you know, there is a there is a um a I have a a a Discord channel uh that I can put an invite out. You want that Discord channel creates holds lots of stuff about science news and cooking and medical stuff right. and new stuff. Um while, while we're waiting for any questions to come up, you guys want to plug anything coming up coming up on your uh, that you're gonna be on. I will be uh, tomorrow. I will be having another episode of Bad Science Sunday, and uh, that I think I think we might be doing Roger again. I'm not sure, Mister Mister Ro Mister Rogers. No, Mud Fossil, the Mud Fossil dude. Oh, but but yeah, excellent. excellent. Um. Others? Well, I, I'm mainly on the Jackson Weeds channel. So if you want to check out this channel, then I am OK. Yeah. Well, coming up April 4th, 2024, for those that are in North America, we have a total solar eclipse where the moon covers the sun. Uh, the path goes through Mexico, through Texas, and on up into the coast. Um, it is a pretty good time. Um, the moon will cover the sun around four minutes plus. Um, and the nice thing about total solar eclipse is that when the moon completely covers the sun for those four minutes plus, you can look directly at it without filters, telescopes, and you see the corona as it is. Um, it is, it be is careful. probably one of them. No, it, it's you, don't have to be you, you can, you can look at it directly. Right. There's no problem with looking at total solar eclipse directly. Yeah, but and, you, have, uh, you have to be careful uh, minding the time because at one point the, the, it's, the moon it's will. It's really obvious yeah, when the sun yeah. rises and yeah, sets. It, it is, I, in I, fact, it is probably one of the most dramatic things you will probably see in your life. I, it, it, You've never I think, seen a total solar eclipse. It's dead obvious when it starts and when it stops. It, it, I. It, it is probably I, I can't think of anything else that I, I would put higher than it as the most amazing single thing I've ever seen with my eyes. I, I was able to see it in Wyoming in, in 2017 oh, I and near the Tetons myself. Yeah, it, it was yeah. Okay. it was totally worth the like six hour drive and everything that I did to do it. I wish I wish I could afford to get on a plane and, and yeah. go to like somewhere where it was going to be uh but i'm i'm going to miss yeah. this one but it's yeah. it's worth a trip people yeah, <laughs> even but the diamond the, ring where there, we have a second or two of the sun setting or, or rising you're not going to destroy your eyes but but Having, but be careful but be careful guys i i so something that I, I was watching it i totally blocked time on this my doctor appointment 
So, and so, so I've, you know, I've, and I've, I've seen 18 total solar eclipses. I have almost 50 minutes of totality now in my, my belt. Um, and, and each total solar eclipse is different. So the, so what you saw in 2017 was spectacular, but yeah. the sun is a very dynamic thing and it's doing yeah. it. now the sun is at this solar maximum where it's got all kinds of sunspots and flares. There's a comet up also that we might be able to see, although I wouldn't waste time looking at comet because you can see it. You're going to make me buy a plane ticket. Don't do that. And, Stop and, talking. and, and the other thing is, is to see the helium flash. So, so I have a thing where, where I go between um, just straight and, and I got a polarizer to see how the polarized, because when you, because the magnetic field of the sun causes the, the corona to, to shift. And so you have two polarizing things. You can see it back and forth. You can see the sun going boop, 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 because of all the, all this stuff. Uh, and then when you put the spectrum, the gray spectrum, you can see the helium flash, right? Because you're seeing now um, and, and, and at, um, in the chronosphere, very high temperature. And you can also see other higher, uh, higher energy state material in the corona. The, 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 the spectrum, you can actually see that happen. In fact, the first detection of helium. The reason why helium is called helium is because they noticed um, the sun had this weird glowy stuff that that they chemists had never detected before, and they called it helium after the Greek thing after the sun. That's why I, helium is called helium? It's and in fact and you can sun. see that when when the corona is there, you can see this. It really is a strong the the the, 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 the onset of the spectrum shift is quite dramatic. To, Boom, right? Um, and then the, 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 and if there's eruptions, you can actually see in real time stuff coming up behind the sun, coming up and launching in space and coming back down and so forth. It is, it is uh, worth it. We only have one question. It's what do you all think of, up? I can't pronounce I it. Apophos, I guess. Oh, they, oh, they, I think it's referring to the, ast the asteroid, uh, Apophis. That is, uh, that is like a, uh, 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 probably a media hype, like it's just like some people predict it will uh, smash into Earth, but probably not. Um, I yeah. wasn't even aware of this. <laughs> and, it, and it has about it's it's an object that's probably uh, I think the the diameter is around three hundred seventy meters, something like that order, if I recall correctly. Um, and it has only about a two point seven percent chance of hitting the Earth. Um, so it's another way to think about that is it has a, uh, you know, a 97.3% chance of missing. It's pretty good. It's pretty likely to miss. Um, but in, uh, April 13th, 2029 is it's close approach. Um, it may be something that is close enough. Um, it won't hit us. You'll be able to see, you might be able to see it as a, as a, as a, as a disc rather than just a dot. Right, so, um, so, so no, uh, you could turn repeat rerun. The, yeah, no, apparently uh, they, they did follow up that like observations that constrained yeah. the orbit more and it should. Yeah. The, it's, the it's, initial it's, paper, it's, I guess was like 2.7% chance, which is concerning, <laughs> yeah. but I know said, yeah, it's now around, I actually right. It's probably now, much they've got a much better refining now, it's, now it's i think negligible basically okay i i i stand corrected on that i um, mean um, yeah, that's right it was the initial thing i'm thinking about the initial yeah thing. um so back to say so, so the eclipse is happening um uh there there are a couple of other items um in in there we have another on april 12th um on chesha's channel debate hub um at 13 1 p.m pacific uh, we're going to do another update on the Kilauea volcano um, and whether it's erupting or not. We have predictions that it won't be erupting, but Madame Pele does her own thing. So so that'll be the case. And um, there's also, um, we have a Before Earth show uh, on April 20th, BE3, um, where the Dark Ages will end and stuff will happen. Um, stay tuned for what that is 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 definitely like. Yeah, the the Hollywood episode because we're getting, we're finally getting to see the stars. Yes, yes, excellent. And um, there is also unnamed tavern on March thirtieth. Um, uh, the thing with with Dapper and Chesh and Monty and myself talk about things political. Um, that'll be on March thirtieth. 
at 15.30, uh, 3.30 p.m. Pacific on Cheshire I If you want to say your catchphrases, say your closing catchphrases, say them now if you have any. I don't have any. I I hope you have a wonderful time, and I hope you continue to enjoy our favorite universe. All right. Never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you in a month. Bye. Bye. Hear an echo. <laughs> ah, if you just do it, turn out okay. Okay, I hear, hear an, an echo. echo. Oh, I think it's that. Uh, just that. do it. Yeah, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Can you can you mute Landon? Can you oh, mute? I think it's that. Just do it. Yeah, okay. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I think it's feedback from Landon. Yeah. Mm, sorry about. Uh, uh, once again, just do it. Turn it okay. Even if someone's playing the background music. Oopsie. So how are you all doing today? I'm doing well. Doing okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Although I do have some, I do have like, a, I don't know what it is, but my throat is a bit affected by something. And that's why oh, my voice is a bit uh, uh, rough today. But so I'm doing mostly, mostly uh, fine. Yeah. So you two celebrating the holidays at all? No, I'm actually out right now. Oh. I need to go and get some afterward. But it's probably going to be very busy. Yeah, holidays usually are. Yeah, we, we don't have any stores here. It just got legalized a few months ago, so they're still building stuff. Yep. Oh, yes. How about you, Landon? You celebrate the holidays today? Uh, well, there's always holidays to celebrate uh, and uh, other fun things that uh, are happening in our favorite universe. So, sure. Yeah. Landon celebrated the Landon had to celebrate that holiday 420 later today. <laughs> well, there's a number of things that happened today in history. So. But hey. good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. But today we're going to talk about, latitude. Today we're going to talk about a little bit earlier than most most history stuff teaches. Way earlier. Yes. yes. Although although this time we are we're speeding up the show even more. Uh, instead of talking about a hundred million years, we're actually talking about several billion years this time. Yep. So uh, I hope for but anyway, I hope folks are doing well. But if you don't remember what we talked about last time, here's a recap for y'all. Yes. Okay. And so in if you remember in BE zero, we talked about the Big Bang process. And BE one, we talked about really the first second of the Big Bang process. And BE two we talked about, we covered the first sort of hundred million years and we entered what was, what is known as the dark ages. Um, this is not the misnomered term that sometimes people yeah. apply to history of civilization, but in rather a true age of the universe. When we left off, the universe went uh, dark. There wasn't really anything creating new electromagnetic radiation to speak of. I mean, there was, but not much. And well, one thing to note is that like we had, like previously we had to use a logarithmic time scale because like the, the events that occurred in the first few seconds were on a scale so small. You, we, we had to use a logarithmic scale to blow yeah. them up basically but now now we are moving to a time period when things were moving a bit slowly so now we can use a linear time yeah. scale. and so you see that be3 there 
on this slide is is rather short, but if you go to the next slide, what? hint, hint. There we go. We now have a much um, better thing, and so we are actually in ages where where um, we have uh, some reasonable amounts of direct observation, and we certainly have, um, although certainly our mysteries there. Um, one of the things that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, that's the JWST, is doing is giving us um, a lot more information about this uh, early, the early part of this uh, scale. Um, and like I said, uh, BE1 and BE2 only covered less than 1% of the history of the Big Bang process. Yeah, so the we're sort of so we're starting today. Also, um, we're starting around 100 million years. We're kind of starting, uh, I guess, when the Dark Ages ended. And right, uh, but what what happened sort of next, during next the Dark Ages? Well, um, certainly the universe continued to expand. Uh, can you know, the visual? Part of the universe continued to expand. Um, the temperature continued to drop, and um, and and things began um, in this process. Now, how long it occurred is is something that is not well understood. But um, there was some period of time before the first stars actually began to. Um, began to uh, emit light. Um, so we went from the Big Bang flash, which occurred around 378,000 years after the Big Bang process started. Um, that's when the photons, when it, when the universe cooled to the point where you no longer had plasma, uh, those, those, those free protons grabbed free electrons and formed neutral hydrogen. And so the cosmic background radiation that we we see are the photons that were, were in the early radiation dominant universe going free um but but at that stage we didn't have um presumably material that was dense enough to actually form form stars now as to when the first stars uh form in their nature is something which is an under active research um, we do know that at this stage um at 100 million years the universe is also raw, roughly neutral. That is, most of the most um, of the protons and electrons um, found, you know, found each other, and the gas was was, was roughly neutral in charge. Um, so I think I think also one one thing to uh, uh, note is that during the, the the dark ages from the Big Bang flash, uh, when the, uh, the universe was still even after the Big Bang flash, the universe was pretty hot, 4,000 Kelvin, give or, mm -hmm. give or take. <clears throat> and then it cooled to, to around 60 Kelvin after uh, uh, 100 million years or so. And, and, and 60 Kelvin, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much it is in uh, Fahrenheit, but it's, it's like minus, um, minus, minus, a bunch. 200, uh, minus yeah. 210 degrees Celsius, right? Yeah. About uh, yeah. yeah. But certainly the density of the universe went, went way down as 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 the mm -hmm. visible universe expanded yeah oh. and, and, it, and, it, and it, back then when, when the universe was four, was four thousand like right after the big bang flash uh, it was four thousand degrees so the universe was still like a, a very uh, bright orange but then as it cooled down uh, the universe became uh very dark well, mm -hmm. as it is as it is today the, the background is just black yeah. I mean, in, in this particular situation, the um, the universe, visual universe, expanded by a factor of fifty five mm -hmm. over yeah. over this period of, of uh, that period of one hundred million years. Mm -hmm. So we're starting at the stage where um, it is it is hypothesized that um, there were no you know there's nothing there's no active stellar fusion going on. Um, there were no stars and um, and we can, and but again, I think maybe going to the next. Oh, uh, like one, one last sorry, one last thing to note here is that, like, uh, as you say, that there was no active star fusion during this time, but we do have one important source of photons, and that is the uh, 
21 centimeter radio waves emitted by neutral hydrogen. And that will yeah. become very important later. Yeah. So yeah. was that was that a good station to listen to back then? That those radio next. waves? Was that was that, was that an AM or FM station? <laughs> next slide. Uh, so so we're gonna be the next part of probably a very important point. Um, we'll talk about other things in this thing, but one of the things that occurred in this in this uh, time period, we'd say 200 million years to a billion years, um, it could be actually even earlier than 200 million years, and really it depends upon the first stars. It's called reionization, where the first stars that switched on um, sent out you know, very energetic uh, light, you know, ultraviolet light, which which reionized, stripped electrons from 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 their uh, protons or, or their nuclei and yeah. reionized um, the universe. Uh, why, why is it called reionization? It's a, <laughs> bit of a, a, soft, a bit of a softball question, but I think it's also to, important to clarify why we, why we call it reionization. Because yeah. in well, because the earlier, next slide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because in the early universe, everything was ionized before, but now it, it's becoming, like during the dark ages, it was... Uh, neutral, but now it becomes re-ionized again. Yeah. And, and slides, yeah. And so um, in this period of time of, of the second ionization, if you will, of the universe, um, where where this first star is going, the, this this process, um, we continue to cool. Um, we go from 60 Kelvin down to 19 Kelvin. Um, and, and and the redshift continues to con continues to expand um, in, in this particular situation. I mean, so, so the universe is, is going to go, um, is going to go from, from redshift of 60, of uh, six, I mean, from 20 to six. So the universe is going to expand by almost three and a third of uh, visual, excuse me, the visual universe is going to expand by almost three and a third. Um, and so we visible universe is going to go from about 300, 600 million light years, about 1.6, um, billion light years. Yeah, um, so still, yeah. still pretty tiny compared to the universe today. Like it, it went from 0.7% of the current size. And then uh, it, uh, after uh, 1 billion years, it is uh, 2% of the current size of the observable universe. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. still, it's still only 1 billion years old, or 9 billion years old. It's still a baby. The universe is still a baby yeah. right yeah. now. Um, yes. Well, but, but, but the radionization occurred probably before then. In fact, it may have occurred as early as 150 million years um, after this area. This is one of the things, the active areas that James Webb Space Telescope is is yeah. trying to give us some some insight on um, of these Re first these first stars. Mm -hmm. Reionization Re has like a, an interval. Whether it's a, a point where it first started and then a point yeah. where it's uh, pretty much completed because the, the whole universe, as you can see in the image on the top right, the, the universe re-ionized in bubbles, basically bubbles that surround uh, the first stars yeah. and the first galaxies. That's yeah, how it, it was re-ionized. It, yeah. it was a process. Um, and again, it was an instantaneous um, when, you know, it, it took the, the, the light, particularly the ultraviolet light from from the first stars, it took the speed of light for that thing to begin to ionize the, the material um, beyond the stars. And so it, it's, it's a process that occurred over a particular period of time. Now, if you look at you know, the size of the original universe when, when, when we were around 100 million years in, we were somewhere around um, 600 million light years across visible, visualized. So, that means that that the first stars light would take the first stars at least 600 million years to go across that process. So it wasn't an instantaneous thing, but the the cosmic dawn is probably a better way of, of talk saying than reionization. The reionization sounds like you know the universe went instantaneously ionized again. It really was the beginning of the cosmic dawn, um, and and such that is. Um, that is there. By the way, there's there's a rustling and and. Alpha Vandalia, you you we can hear rustling from your so, mic. Sorry, sorry. Question uh, about about reionization. So um, it it reionization happened as a consequence of 
uh, light being emitted from the first stars. Mm -hmm. So it's the end of the Dark Ages, and that light reionizes things. What are the consequences of of that from um, the perspective of how the universe is evolving? Do you now have um, a more or less opaque um, universe? Does it does it cause uh, shock waves or bunching up um, or or sort of density perturbations? Does it make it easier or harder for matter to accrete, or is it is there any uh, influence of that at all? Do we do we have any idea? Well, we have we have some, you know, there, there's active area research, but certainly, as you said, um, the, the stars when they when they switch on, when they ignite, when they when they flash, um, will push matter out, um, and and so those were the very beginnings of of the shock waves that were not induced uh, as sound waves in the very early universe, right? Before the dominant sound structures, the dominant motion of matter came from the early universe and and, it's, and and you know for that you know go back to like uh, our, our be one episode for some of those types of things so yes they're they begin to have motion large-scale motion obviously the collapse of the stars was also motion um and 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 if, if we're if we're lucky we'll be able to see gas clouds in the process of collapsing and heating up even before the first stars show up. Um, but that's a, it's, it's, we'll get to later when we talk about galactic formation. Um, so yes, another thing that, that happens, of course, is when you have ionization, now um, some things become more opaque um, than others. And so there's, there's, there's some difficulty in, 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 you know, photons no longer are, are now hitting plasma and are not, um, yeah, giving and us a clear. Is that what's happening in this picture? It'd be no peck and stuff. And although, although the universe is also expanding and cooling, so the other process is it's thinning mm -hmm. out, right? Yeah, it, but it's it's it, it's not as opaque as it was before the Big Bang flash. Certainly, yes. certainly. That's yes. a matter of density. Yeah. So, yeah, as a as a general rule that people should keep in mind, plasmas uh, tend to be more opaque than neutral. Uh, gases um because yeah. they are they are free charges and a photon can hit a free charge and scatter off of it and bounce and yeah and so actually vandelia i think um in a certain sense it might make more sense to to imagine that you get this flash and then as it reionizes it turns this sort of area around the star um into a plasma and that actually might make it more would would make it I think more opaque, but the universe doesn't become opaque again at a macro level because it's expanded so much and it has started clumping um, down into things. So it's it, yeah. it's extremely dilute. And, and we're we're, not, we're talking about not not a temperature induced plasma um, mm -hmm. from the universe being hot. Um, we're talking about plasma because there's ionizing radiation that's stripping electrons off of what it was otherwise would be neutral um, atoms. But but the opaqueness, I mean, the stars are not transparent because they're plasma, right? They're 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 yeah. you can't see through them in 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 normal light um, for, for that for that reason. So oh, so, so right, we started right now, the cosmic it, dawn. Sorry, right? there's a cosmic dawn is 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 starting um, from the first stars. Um, but also the first stars are, um, are, are somewhat unusual, pro perhaps not the type of stars. They have some usual properties, but but in addition, we're talking about the you talk about the motion. Because the question was asked about the the, the motion of, of of material in the bubbles. Um, the other thing that's likely to happen is that some of these first stars formed became ex were, were were extremely massive, and 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 exploded in, in supernovae so some of the shock waves that came out were probably less due to the stars switching on and more impacted by massive stars dying we'll talk about them a little bit i'm sorry you were saying 
Oh, who was it? Um, yes, you, yeah. You, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I for uh, like I was thinking about like to, well, right now today, most of the universe is, is uh, re uh, re ironized. So pretty much any alone uh, uh, atom in the in the in the in the vacuum of space is uh, an an ion basically, almost always, except for like things like inside uh, grains of dust, perhaps, right? I, well, mo well, molecular clouds certainly have lots of of, of neutral atoms. But oh, there are, oh, really? But there are plenty of there are plenty of ions out there being mm -hmm. created by by stellar processes. All right. All right. Are molecules even a thing yet, or are we still on the are we still atomics? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but it's 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 only when the heavier elements were made. Like I maybe you see, right now you you do have. Uh, a hydrogen gas, right? H two, perhaps. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, yeah. remember that 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 the Big Bang process, nuclear synthesis, Big Bang, gave us about seventy four percent hydrogen, about twenty five percent helium, and a small fraction of what became lithium after it after it decayed. Um, that was essentially. And there might have been traces of other things, but that was essentially essentially it. Um, and and in this reign in the cosmic dawn when the stars first turned on that's all again all we had um so those first stars were were hydrogen a little bit of, you know some helium and traces of lithium um when the first stars went went um supernovae then we started getting seeding more material so if you talk about um chemical bonds you're just if you're just talking about the, the, the area where we just had mostly hydrogen and helium there wasn't really anything useful because helium doesn't really play well chemistry wise with other material um you could get neutral hydrogen so you get h2 uh but it wasn't until those uh, a little bit after the the cosmic dawn when the very first stars that were massive went supernovae that you started getting heavier elements scattered in the, in the clouds but we should probably go to the next the next excellent slide i just did Okay, so um, the the uh, what is known as the song of hydrogen. It's a it is uh, when when you're when it's nearby um, at around fourteen twenty megahertz. Um, so is that is twenty one centimeter uh, band? I'm sorry. So is that country rock, jazz, blues? What it's kind of, it's kind of a hum, uh, if you will. <laughs> it's, it's a glow. It's it's AM for sure. And and it's also a case where where um, you know for what is it's an area of the spectrum that's reserved for astronomy because this is a fairly important thing um, until of course they parted parted showing that 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 Doppler shift is there but but for something which is which is co moving with you um, that has uh, hydrogen um, uh, you will get this problem of, of as you see of, of the of the you can get situations where the um, electron that's that's orbiting the proton and hydrogen will can flip and the flip results in this 21 centimeter wavelength or 1420 um, uh, megahertz mm. yes and it's also like they they both when it flips it can emit or absorb uh, this uh, photon at this particular wavelength yes yeah so and so that's one thing I found is that like when the first stars ignited and it started to, to heat up the surrounding uh, hydrogen gas, that's when the, the hydrogen atoms began to absorb more of this 21 centimeter photons than it emits. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, this, this, would be, this could be detected as a dip in the CMB spectrum. Yeah. Why and is it a why why does it go that way? Why is it a, a dip? I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I found it. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things is that if 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 the if the hydrogen is absorbing these photons, doing the reverse, right? We think about things, but but, but if, if the absorption of a, of a photon causes a flip, um, then essentially the, the the resulting energy is absorbing the the microwave. What was what was then. Um, 21 centimeter. When when the universe was dominated, had had lots of 21 centimeter photons. 
um, those can be absorbed by hydrogen. So when radar astronomers look out at, you know, look out in the universe, one of the things they look for is this song of hydrogen Doppler shifted. And it, and it can come in, in, in several forms. It can come in emission of clouds where, where the where electrons flipping, or it can come in absorption of clouds absorbing that radiation. Because it, it's a it's a it's a it's a symmetric process. Okay. Um, and probably the next could go on to the next one here. So if we look at this stuff now, obviously it's, it's Doppler shifted. So it's not no longer 21 centimeters. It really is the song of hydrogen in, in, in its, its form. Because remember that in this process of reionization, um, we have a redshift going from 20 to 6, meaning that the, the photons that we're looking at um, have been expanded by a factor of 20 to about a factor of 6 um, in, this, in this process. So in this graph here, what we see is um, the, the, the frequency of things. And you can see how it, it changes in brightness. Now, remember, remember the redshift as you're going from, um, from, from left to right is going, it's showing from um, 160 down to, to about 6. And you can see where in the dark ages, um, things began to form and then you get the cosmic dawn. In this case, it looks like it's around um, with redshift around 150 million years. If you see the, the, the top, um, you, you go from 10 million years to about 1 billion years. So around somewhere around 150 million years or so, the, the, um, the first stars form, yeah. things began to heat up, things began to ionize. You have radiation that is that is that is that is causing the the, the electrons to flip yeah, around. It might, it might also begin like begin uh, when the curve starts to dip downwards around like about one hundred yeah. million years. Yes. Yeah. Also. That and again, this is general, right? We're talking about general. It's not instantaneous. Um, there's a gradual process of there now. Now this particular graph uh, and, and these researchers have an interpretation about galaxy versus star formation. But but just from from the data, we know that um, we have a we have a dip in brightness as the uh, the first stars start forming. And then as the as those at the light from those first stars start going out, it begins reionization reionizing you get a you get an increase in brightness um, before it kind of ends as things thin out. And that's that's the red uh, the red part of the top graph when when the uh, the you have an increase in the amount of uh, 21 centimeter photons so that that has been red shifted of course since then yeah. you can you can clearly see an increase and that and, that, and that's when yes the the, the gas become yeah. reionized yeah and it's, a very, it's on, a very intuitive figure yeah, yeah. And, and I say on this on this chart the thing that 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 uh, Richard and Liam um, add as speculation is the word first galaxy is form. Um, that's speculative. Um, what we do know is during the dark ages when when the when the universe went basically you know quiet electromagnetic wise in terms of new radiation being emitted, at some point um, we began to get um, heating um, and we began, began to get some of the first stars forming and the light from the first stars starts impacting larger and larger volumes of space. Again, it's not an instantaneous thing; it's it's a it's a process. And and so, um, before the first stars actually ignite, you know, in, mm. with fusion, they were collapsing, and so there was a heating going on, um, and, and leading up to that. The question yeah. of, of what and how is 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 an active area of research, but but we do know that stuff started heating. And then the first stars started, the light from the first stars started shining and ionizing things. And presumably those from the first stars went supernova. So they had other bangs going on. So we don't, we don't have a very clear idea about the timeline of, of galaxy um, formation. Um, yes. It, that, that's something that's definitely still an active area of research. And uh, the sort of, you know, which came first, the star or the galaxy, um, maybe an ill-post question. Um, 
we have things that are, are collapsing, though. I, I mean, at some point, obviously, we have stars. Were the first things that collapsed, um, do, do we think that those those first things that sort of collapsed became stars? Or is there a possibility that some of it may have collapsed directly into a black hole and mm. then accretion around the black hole could have started some ionization? Yeah, and, I've seen I've seen that too, yeah. And, and those are, those are all, all areas of, of, of active research. Um, you know, these are processes that are there. You know, I suspect the answer is going to be a, 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 a synthesis of, 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 of of galactic formation, galactic cluster formation, um, yeah, black I hole uh, formation, neutron star formation, and, and stars which gone. There's a whole process of things there. But as far as what's dominating here, um, we don't know. What we do know is that after the Dark Ages, the universe began to heat up in chunks, not as a whole. Uh, remember, as a whole, the universe is, is, is cooling down, but chunks began to heat up. So, so when we talk about heating begins, what, what Pritchard and Leo should have said was there are local areas of, of, of heat developing, not that the universe was heating up. The universe is still cooling down um, from about 20 Kelvin down to about 6 Kelvin, but there were local localized areas of densification and localized areas of, of heating before stars and galaxies and dwarf galaxies and black holes and neutron stars and other things are forming in some combination of, of yeah. stuff. Yeah, for the longest time, I always wondered, you know how the in the center of our galaxy is a, at least it proposed to be a black hole? It is, there is, there is, a, there is a black hole in, in the, it's near the center of our galaxy. <laughs> I, I, always, I always wondered if that black hole was it's the remnant of the, one of the very f first stars. We don't know. I mean, it, it, it but but um, uh, there are processes, and part of it is it, part of the things you're getting from LIGO is trying to investigate um, in mm -hmm. the, the, the sizes of black holes. But but we're getting a little bit off the off the track here. I, um, I, I think it's also the, the issue is also that like uh, stars have a uh, very uh, distinct uh, signal effect on on the yeah. the photons, but, but of course. Yeah. Whether something is a galaxy or not, that we, when you talk about that, it's you, you cannot really see it in the photons. You have to uh, use something like the uh, JWS uh, telescope to actually see the, uh, the formation of the first galaxies, right? So you, that's, the yeah. only, that's the only way to observe whether galaxies were there or, or not. Yeah. I mean, um, in terms of the difficulty of, of observing this era is in part because things have so redshifted, right? That the frequencies have been shifted down from a factor, you see a factor of, of 40 to 20 and so forth. Um, that means that, it's, that a visible, if you have a star begin to shine and its visible light has been stretched way down into the um, infrared and, and even in the microwave, um, mm -hmm. And, and, and depending on how far you stretch, how far you're stretching the, the photons. Also, the fact that it is so far away, it's going to be dim. Also, the fact that there's so much stuff. If you look about things far away, there's so much stuff between here and there that stuff gets absorbed. And so the result is it's difficult to observe in the area. You have to be, you have to have, uh, for example, telescopes that are very cold because even the thermal temperature of the telescope itself will shine and, and 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 blind you in the yeah. areas of, of frequencies you want to look at. That, that, um, that's why all the, the JSW, uh, or the James Webb State Space Telescope is always facing away from the sun. <laughs> yeah. and, and again, yeah. I don't mean to have uh, to, to disrespect to Pritchard and, and, and Leo in, in this diagram. Um, I would have, I would not have written first galaxies form. I would not have because uh, because that's that's an assumption um i would have said and i said localized heating of or regions of of you know, localized regions began to he heat right not that the universe begins is, is heating up the universe is definitely cooling down um the reionization process um starts somewhere in the redshift of 20 to 15 um 
presumably it's because stars are doing this. And so somewhere between uh, 150 million years and 250 million years, the realization gets quite widespread. Um, the realization ends, or I would say realization process ends because the universe is now expanded in um, quite a bit. Um, and so it's no longer, you no longer have a, a dominant realization process. I mean, from the, the point where realization begins to end, the universe, the visible universe doubles in size and temperature drops. Um, but localized areas begin to, um, begin to, to, to heat up. And in fact, you also have in this process, um, supernovae is occurring, um, somewhere around if, if, if the, if the realization is beginning just beyond 20, maybe at 18, um, there's also between 18 and 15 supernovae occurring and they're going to do another bit of, 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 of thing to the, to the surrounding gas. I, I would guess that, 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 that the supernovae uh, causes the, the, the curve to uh, bend upward again. Like for like you see that the, the heating begins, that is when the curve da goes down. And perhaps when you have like a very violent energetic things to occur, that, that, that got, maybe I'm speculating right now, of course, but no, maybe that, 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 that's why well, it goes, goes upwards. Yeah. Well, well, I think what they're saying is, I think what they, they should have said was, uh, heating of, of, of localized density, you know, um, pockets, um, there, whether those things are, are, are dwarf galaxies, whether they're protostars is, is, is to be determined, but there's localized heating of a certain regions that begin. And that tends to, to diminish the, the brightness of the song of hydrogen. And again, um, it's not 21 centimeters. It's 21 centimeters multiplied by the redshift. So, yes. so the actual frequency you're going to see is 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 there. So, um, uh, in that sense, when you look out, you know, the radio astronomers have to look at a, a wide range of, of frequencies from you know from from you know, 2.1 meters down to 21 centimeters would go from one to a hundred um, in that. Russell, is that right? Uh, 2.1 yes. 2 .1 meters is 10 times 21 centimeters. Um, yes, I, I, so I, I, I did, I incorrect. I should say 21, 21 meters would be a thousand times. Um, so 2.1 meters would be, no, 21 meters is full 21 centimeters would be, 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 be right. Wait, centimeters are the worst. Everywhere else, we're really good about only doing with, uh, the yeah. every yeah. third okay. power of <laughs> oh. 10, but with centimeters, yes. it's, it's two. <laughs> yeah, so, so 0. 0.21 meters, the 0. 0.21 meter song of hydrogen um, at 2.1 meters would be 10 on the scale, and at 21 meters would be 100 on the scale. So you're going from about 21 meters down to about um, one meter, yeah. right? And so those are the wavelengths in radio telescopes you have to look at or, 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 or microwave. Yeah at, 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 yeah, at redshift to 20, uh, 21 centimeters would become 4.2 meters. Yeah. I yes. believe, how, yeah. How far down do our radio telescopes uh, go? I can go quite, they can go quite low. Um, the problem is how effective can you be? Um, as, as you get long, longer wavelengths, you need to have different types of dishes. I mean, the, the, the dish versus frequency size is, is, is important, but there's different technologies to pick up very low wavelength uh, material. The problem is the earth is quite noisy in low frequency stuff as well. Um, so the question becomes how effective are you at listening? So let's, let's move on to the next one. I think would be All the. Right. The Lyman. The Lyman Alpha Forest. And so who wants to talk about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the to understand what the Lyman Alpha Forest is, um, I think it y you want to um, know what the Lyman transition is. And so, in in hydrogen, in atomic uh, neutral hydrogen, um, the transition from the ground state of that atom to the first excited state is character is called a Lyman alpha transition and 
it is characterized by an energy of approximately 13.6 um, times 75% electron volts, um, according to the like Balmer series. And what, what that means is that if, if you have um, uh, an atom that then decays from the excited state down to its ground state, it will release a photon. And that photon that it releases will have a wavelength of 121 nanometers. 0. 0.75. 0. 0.5. Oh, no, 0. 0.57. 0. 0.57. 0. 0.57, yes. Right, right. Um, yeah. And this is this is a, a very difficult um, thing to, like, sort of detect and use. Um, it's, it's not a convenient part of the spectrum. No. But it's also, it's a high enough energy photon that uh, it, it will, it can ionize um, a lot of things generally. Um, and for instance, it has well more than enough energy to knock another um, electron off of, you know, another right. thing that isn't already in its ground state. So you get a lot of these, these photons being emitted because hydrogen when you make it go, um, when its its electrons go up and down, every time the electron falls down, it's going to emit some of these. So they emit in this very particular sort of wavelength, and then as that light travels out, the universe is is expanding, and the light gets redshifted as it goes. Now, now as I say, this if if this is happening nearby, there's no redshift. We're dealing with things that are in the ultraviolet, right? You would yes. not be able to visibly see this. Um, but as it redshift, it, 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 it goes down. And in fact, what you can see, if you, what, what this is talking about in, in that figure, you see the, the, the person, um, they are observing, probably not looking with eyeballs, but observing some energetic event um, far away. And... And which produces the, a lot of photons of all sorts of different frequencies. Yeah, yeah. Like even, even, ga even gamma, even gamma radiation. Yeah, yeah. Some of these might be, uh, you know, we're talking about here the Lyman alpha emissions of, let's say, gas ring around an energetic event. Um, they'll start off as ultraviolet, and as they, as the universe, as as, as you get expansion in the universe, um, the wavelengths drop. They drop from ultraviolet down into the violet visible and and on into the red and beyond so what they're what this diagram is showing is that there's these there's these clouds of stuff that can reabsorb those yeah. hydrogen, new, new, new alpha hydrogen. Photons, yeah and the result is that you see dips in the in, in the spectrum where, where those gases are absorbing you might be able to, you're not seeing the actual gas you're seeing the effect of the gas absorbing those those yeah. those photons and the result, I, I really, when you look at the spectrum, you'll mm -hmm. see these dips, and the dips correspond to gas clouds between you and the other object. And yeah. I believe oh, only neutral hydrogen does this. Like if you have if you have uh, ionized gas, it won't have this effect on the spectrum. But when the light passes through uh, neutral pockets of hydrogen, that's when you get these dips. Yeah, yes. I mean other gases can do this, but but yes, it's 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 primarily a neutral hydrogen. Um, that is that is that's giving you this 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 particular uh, material yeah um, and and the material also is going to be relatively cold so it itself is not really glowing much in in this 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 area at all um but it gives you when you when you look at let's say a distant quasar and there is surrounding that quasar um hydrogen which is kind of your uh, where the where the you have the 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 the, the decay of yeah. a, a excited state down to ground state, um, you could begin to trace gas clouds between you and the quasar by looking at dips in the absorption from the yeah, and those stuff. dips will correspond to, for example, when when that light, which was originally emitted at 121 um, nanometers that light will redshift. And when it gets three, t four times more redshifted, suddenly it is now resonant with a different transition in, in hydrogen and it gets absorbed. So you're not seeing the light be absorbed. Um, in, in, in that case, what I just described, it's, a, it's a originally emitted as 
uh, 121 nanometers, then later it will be absorbed by different sort of transitions. You can also have um, light that is generated by a very hot source that maybe it starts out at 50 nanometers. And it just goes through hydrogen because it's not at the right wavelength to be absorbed by it. And then eventually it, it's going through, it's living its life and passing through the universe. And at some point it redshifts and it's on resonance with yep. the with this um, line. Let's and if go to it the next, happens, next page, the next slide, by the way. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this. Yes. And if it if it happens to pass through um a cloud of hydrogen at that time, you'll see this dip. And then it finishes passing through the, that cloud and it keeps going on. And then some of the other light moves on resonance and it, it allows you to map out along your line of sight where these clouds of matter were. Because first you get a dip here and then you get a dip here, which means that there was a chunk of light that when it went through that first cloud was absorbed. And then later, a hundred million years later, it went through the second cloud, different light gets absorbed by the same effect yeah. though, because of the redshift. Yeah. So in this, this thing, we're seeing wavelength um, um, going from left to right. And the forest, the term forest is all those little spikes. It's a, people describe it as a forest of little, little you know, spikes or dips, um, depending on which side you're, you're going on. Yeah. And all of these things, um, it, it's it's all it all requires the fact that um, you're only going to get absorption when the energy of the photon is matched precisely with the energy difference between energy levels in whatever atom you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, but it's a, it's a very important way that that astronomers can map um, the material which is not necessarily even visible as a star. Um, um, and it's a very important part of studying our, our cosmos. So I think we could go on to the next uh, next item, uh, which do, do is we, uh, 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 stellar uh, evolution. Uh, what do you say, that? I like, a, I, I like, a, uh, no, no, yeah. no, never mind. I, I was just, just maybe uh, thinking about uh, something about the previous slide, but we, we, can, move, we can move on. Yeah. 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 So um, we're going to talk about stellar evolution. Like, let's go on to the next slide as well. Um, so the Stelliferous era. Yeah, I mean, and and stars um, formed um, after the Dark Ages, and the Dark Ages are ending when those first stars begin to form. Um, some of those stars last a short amount of time. Some can last extraordinarily long amount of time. And the era is going to be, you know, quite quite long. Well, well there'll be, well, there are certainly stars forming now. Um, the the some of the life of those stars is it varies very much on on material. So let's go go to the next one as well in terms of what are stars. Um, our sun is a star, really, and and in fact, sometimes when people talk about the nearest star. Um, so many times forget the sun. Um, now that that notion of the sun being a star was actually a radical idea. Giordano Bruno, who was burned uh, at the stake for heresy, one of the heresies that Giordano Bruno suggested was that our sun and these dots in the sky called stars are the same thing. He actually yeah. was one I, of the first people to to I, publish. Um, dramatically a, I, a, a statement of that effect. Yeah, I don't know if we have a troll or something in the chat. We have a, apparently we have a traceness in chat, I think. Oh, it's fine. If they want to if they want to if they want to uh uh do, do that sort of thing, I I would unless they're not unless they're spamming, um let them not yet. learn. Um I wouldn't call them a troll unless they're I, a if troll I meant I don't know if they're a fake a fake creationist or a real one. Um, that's sometimes hard to tell. Um, some 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 creationists are really grifters. Others have a, a true belief in creations. You don't know. 
Um, so yeah, let let the person I, unless they're, uh, unless they're spamming, I would I would I would suggest letting them be. But I believe I believe in the in the time maybe not in the time of Bruno, but but before then we like we we thought of the like the fixed stars as stars and anything that that moved across the sky were wandering stars like like uh, the moon, yes. the, the the sun, and also the planets. Yeah, like they were and called so those they were called of light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but. This Good. But the um, it people have been measuring ve with with astonishing, impressive precision where the stars um, have been in the sky for thousands of years, and it turns out that we we have um, records from um, around two thousand years ago of exactly where Polaris was, for instance, and Polaris was not called the North Star back then because it wasn't up there. Um, so actually, everything in the sky moves on yeah, some but, time scale, but uh, for different for for, for, for different reasons. reasons. For different um, reasons, the motion of Polaris is not due to actually like it moving. It's due to the Earth's tilt uh, changing over um, twenty six thousand year yeah. cycle. Yeah, yeah. But but let's go back to stars, right? Um, yeah. So, so, so stars um, come in all types of shapes and sizes and colors. Um, this is what this diagram is, is showing you. Um, mm. You will you, see you, you in the see center, the if, you, if you look at <laughs> very carefully in the center, you'll see the sun, which is sort of average star of average size. Now, what this is really focusing on is some oh, of no. the bigger stars um, that are, that are um, around. Um, and uh, there, there are... Um, but you see, these are sort of supposed to be sort of uh, scaled stars. Some of my some of my favorite stars um, are some of the larger ones. Um, as, as there's ex, there's an uh, expression by an Australian referring to stars as tubby tubby stars, and we can see some of the tubby tubby stars, the big the big ones there. Um, certainly, uh, my favorites are Eta Carina um, A and B um, is one of the one of the items there. Um, Antares is another favorite uh, star of mine. It has a very different style of stuff, um, and uh, variables such as Polaris um, are also there. So there are lots of really interesting stars in this process um, that, are, that are showing. So we probably could go to the next one. Right. So what are stars? Gravitationally bound blobs of matter. The, whose temperature and pressure is enough to sustain fusion. Um, now there are there are things like you know um, uh, planets, which include exoplanets, that are not massive enough to to have pressures to cause fusion. But there are but somewhere between planets and stars are this boundary line of what they call brown dwarfs, where there might be some fusion going <coughs> on in the core, but it's kind of smoldering. It's kind of like a, a smoldering ember. Um, and that's... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I... Oh, there he is. I, you you uh, got cut off for a second. So, so you, yeah. You, you, were, you were explaining brown dwarfs. So re-explain brown dwarfs. Okay, so, 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 so... When when objects get to about thir fifth, 13 to about 80 times the mass of Jupiter, um, they may have enough internal temperature and pressure to sustain fusion. Um, it may not be very active fusion. It may be more smoldering like an ember. But bound dwarfs are the low mass, the lower mass boundary between when it's a planet and when it began to be a star. Going on to um, beyond... Things that we know we Question. beyond about eighty times Jupiter's mass is uh, are, are things where fusion is a dominant process. Question: Have we do we have any um, observations directly of brown dwarfs? Yes, and they're they're they're, they're, <coughs> they're, they're, they're certainly M class stars and and so forth, um, um, and L class stars uh, are certainly there. Yes, we do have um, observations. They tend to be. As, as we've developed infrared telescopes and infrared technology, we have a much better um, sense of it. Uh, but, but yes, we definitely have direct observations of these low mass stars. 
So next. Oh, I think also one thing to note is that uh, the like uh, it, it says that this, the fusion is what prevents further gravitational collapse. So when you when the star it contracts to the gravity, eventually. Let's go on the next. Yeah, the next uh, black, black yeah, thing. Yeah. Yes. Eventually, because uh, eventually fusion becomes uh, enough to to uh, uh, like uh, balance the force of gravity. Yes. Yes. So, and so. Um, the surface of the star is where the event goes from translucent to transparent. Um, so inside the surface of the star, you know, the plasma creates this translucency, but um, the, the internal core where fusion is going on um, pushes outward, whereas gravity wants to crush it inwards. And so as you get farther away from the center of mass, the gravitational interaction gets weaker and weaker. At some point, it gets weak enough that essentially material can escape by radiation pressure. Um, and that's considered sort of the boundary of, of the star. Now, stars with more mass have more fuel and more fuel causes the, the star to sort of change its behavior. Um, so those brown dwarfs have relatively little mass from a point of view of, of being a fuser and they will then um, sort of smolder for a very, 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 very long time. Whereas stars have lots of mass, have lots of, of pressure and, and have a very different fate. Let's go on to the next one. All right. So as I say that the size, um, is is there the, the brown dwarf is probably starts around 13 times the mass of jupiter so um the planet jupiter is not sufficient to turn into a star and 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 you'd have to take you have to find another 12 jupiters and pile it in and even then you'd have difficulty in getting fusion to start so jupiter is not a failed star it just never got to the point even close to becoming a star um uh, but at some point as you add, add more mass you get to a point of average stars like our sun. But what's going on inside the core that's causing it to, to um, counterbalance the gravitational collapse? Let's go on to the next one. All right. All right. So we're fast. I think it's talking about already. What the, how did the, all these hydrogens or heliums all tend to get together, tend to get together? To form the star um by gravitational collapse um and shockwaves yeah you need to have you need to have some density perturbation in order for um it to to collapse if if you have a just perfectly uniform um like universe of with mass there's no like local area that's denser than any other that then like attracts more stuff um and so that's what how shock waves really really yeah. really speed things up because suddenly they create a a pressure wave and you you now have over dense areas that can become more and more over dense mm -hmm. and more and more and they heat up and they also radiate some of that heat away which is why they don't just you know go down and then like bounce and then eventually eventually you get enough and gravity is squishing it hard enough that you will start to get nuclear reactions like we've like we can see in this uh image here yeah so um yes so this hydrogen to helium fusion is the common is one of the common processes that we see in cores of stars um most stars are 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 dominated by this hydrogen helium fusion process and it really is kind of in, in several stages um, um remember the primordial hydrogen um came from the big bang nucleosynthesis refer back to be one and that first second um uh, or beyond the first second when you got nucleons forming so b2 um what happens is a sort of several stage process. Um, first of all, two hydrogen nuclei um, fuse together and form um, 
deuterium. Um, they'll kick out an electron. They'll kick out an antineutrino. Um, I believe it's an antineutrino that that that, that gets gets its form there. If I may. Uh, if well, I, I think it. it would kick out a positron, right? Because it has positron. To kick, yeah. Well, so right. then okay. it probably is a regular neutrino if it's a positron. Um, that's right. It's going from from positive no, it's going from positive to neutral. It's going to but, be losing. A positive, positive charge. Yeah, which means by, it's kicking out a positron. By kicking out a positron, yes. Uh, it's, it's, also, it's also kicking out a neutrino, the, the V. The V is a neutrino, yes, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, it also has it also has gamma as well. Um, yes. And that's that's and, been the second step for the creation of uh, helium. Well, uh, well, there's there's gamma. You'll, you'll have gamma, it in the first step too. Yeah, the first step as well. Um, and and in the the process the next one is, is deuterium and hydrogen um forming um to form helium three is in now, this slide or just now no this, this is in this one in this one here we're still, we're still here um i should point out that there are also um um some now now in an in in, in earthbound stuff um like i said it's fusion reactors we tend to use um uh of trying to fuse helium and tritium, um, stars have a have a different density uh, and containment thing than let's say fusion reactors, and so they can perform some of these more difficult uh, transitions, of which um, we see here. So so you'll get deuterium and helium fusing to form helium three, and helium three can fuse together to form helium four with more hydrogen. Of course, there's gamma coming off of there as well as 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 when you have a transition. Um, whenever you have a transition of a of a uh, a neutron proton proton neutron type of thing, then you'll get um, you'll get also some neutrinos being kicked out as well. <clears throat> and this in this process is called the proton proton chain, like a particular type of fusion re uh, chain reaction, right? Yes. That's, uh, yes. And I, I found I found this that it, it this is the most dominant type of fusion that occurs in uh, fairly low mass stars, like 1.5 and lower times the the, yeah. the mass of the sun, basically. Now, now there's yeah. there's always this kind of fusion going on in even higher mass stars, but they tend to be dominated by more energetic stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there's another there's another process. Um, that goes on go to the next slide right um and this should have should have said cno cycle rather than hte fusion um and has to do with um a a process of a circular process of of carbon nitrogen carbon nitrogen oxygen nitrogen cycle right and and hydrogen is being is being fed in and you get gamma rays and um, other and neutrinos and other um, particles going positrons being kicked out um, in this process. Uh, it was something that 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 uh, while it's not as dominant as the the, the hydrogen helium fusion um, that goes on the core of the sun is going on in the core of the sun. Now, the very first stars that didn't have carbon much carbon nitrogen oxygen weren't doing this. Um, this is a, so this catalytic cycle um, occurs in more um, mature stars. Uh, it's, it's it's the like I found is that the, the, the previous reaction, the proton proton chain, they they are they, this is more energetic at lower temperature compared to the uh, the uh, CNO cycle. But when you increase the temperature even further, eventually the CNO cycle becomes more energetic than the proton-proton chain. Well, in some ways, you have in a more energetic stars, you actually have abundance of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in there. It, the, this CNO cycle is going on in our sun as as well. Um, it's just not as dominant. All right, next. All uh, right. I have a question about this really quick. Okay. Uh, how how um, how prevalent is uh, the the theft of catalytic converters in stars? <laughs> well, uh, catalytic converters. Well, I should say stars tend to be very 
light in their amount of platinum that they have. Uh. Um, also, people who might try to recycle, faking recycling platinum inside stars by trying to cut the platinum out, find it very difficult to go inside stars and, and, and come back out. Okay. Yeah, can the circle get bigger or is that the, this a established circle? This is a, this is a fairly established dominant. Oh, oh, I, I did I did find I did find that there are like different versions well, of the CNO cycle. Like some cycles use the flor fluorine as well. Some cycles. We, yeah. we, 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 I don't know if we have the other. Well, we'll see other cycles going on. Mm -hmm, yeah. But this is a dominant CNO cycle, and it's called CNO cycle because it's carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. Um, next. All right. So while stars have um, fusion going in their cores, um, the stuff that's not part of it, the, there's a, most of the volume of a, of a normal star is not, not a, 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 a fusion core, but has a, a material around it. And it depends upon the type of mass of stars as to what's happening. So in the middle one, the yellow one here, with masses around the mass of our sun, um, you have essentially um, radiative stuff coming out of the core, hot radiative core, and and there's an outer envelope which is being, being heated and undergoing convection. So so the the hotter material rises to the surface and the um, cool material sinks down into these convection cells. So on the car sun, you have um, internal fusing radiative zone surrounded by convection in low mass stars like brown dwarfs and and things that there tend to be around half also uh, also red dwarfs so as well i think right the, red the, dwarfs too. the 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 stars itself are primarily convection there's not much going on in their cores so low mass brown dwarf stars have very little fusion going on inside, sort of smoldering, and the dominant volume of those stars are convection. But something odd happens when you go the other way, when you get about one and a half times the mass of the star. Um, what's happening is that you all of a sudden invert, and instead you have convection around the fusing core and radiation from that convection going out even further. Um, uh, it's, it's a, it's an odd process, but, but, but very massive stars are almost entirely convection in their volume. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found, I found uh, some answers that the site, the CNO cycle, because in uh, larger stars, the CNO, the CNO cycle is very energetic and that, and that causes a very steep energy gradient. And because of the steep energy gradient, you have convection because of well, the, the, steam energy gradient. the CNO cycle is is a fixed amount of energy as 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 atoms go through the cycle mm -hmm. the issue is in a star how much material is undergoing cno um cycles in yeah. in star massive stars that have more more, more you know, larger nuclei particularly plenty of carbon the the cno cycle will be much more dominant um, where the stars have exhausted most of their hydrogen in their core, they're not going to be very energetic in the hydrogen fusion. It'll be a shell around the outside. So the, the CNO cycle is a fixed amount of energy. The question is what's going on in the star. So let's go back to the, um, let's go to the next one. All right. Um, so, um, we'll talk about main sequence stars, but, but, but the, um, um, astronomers have these classes of stars and and um, you see in this chart going from top to bottom O B A M F G M and um, um, L is even and there's other things L is even colder beyond that that that's that but you see the temperature goes from very high plus 30,000 Celsius down to much more uh, mundane stuff in fact in the brown dwarfs, we have we have we have um, we've detected brown dwarfs whose surface temperature is around 300 Kelvin, relatively mundane temperatures, right? They can go from 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 um, um, high to low. Um, 
the stars that are higher temperature tend to be bluer, that their, their light is sort of, um, is, is dominated in the blue end of the spectrum. Whereas um, low mass stars tend to be red to infrared. Now the size as well will change, right? Because higher temperature stars are a result of more energetic processes going on, usually in the core. And so they'll be bigger as well. And the, the sun is a G a G class star, right? Uh, yes, G. a G. Um, 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 and, and, and there's sort of an acronym for memorizing the classification. Um, usually it's something like, um, I'll be a fine gal or girl kiss. Am I, oh, yeah. the next one is lips. Uh, blah, blah, and it goes on. It's, it gets a little bit silly for the, 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 <laughs> the, the mm. things, but. Oh, why, why do cooler, uh, stars have more absorption lines? Do, do they contain more, more of the heavier elements because I, of that or, or, I don't think so. Uh, so I'm going to speculate here, uh, Landon, and, and mm -hmm. I want to see if this sounds crazy. I think it's not about uh, metallicity, basically, um, would be another way of saying what you just said, Ness. I think it's about the stability of molecules themselves mm -hmm. in the photosphere of the star. Ah. For very, very, very hot stars, like, like Sirius, um, the the light that you're seeing is coming from a, a surface that is just so, so hot that m molecules just aren't going to um, exist. And a lot of these absorption lines, probably most um, are, are molecular absorption lines. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. And, and in fact, so when you talk about many molecules, they're referring to the uh, existence of molecules and other, you know, higher order compounds. Um, surrounding the star um that that are able to or why because either it's low enough temperature that those molecules can form be stable um or there's additional material around that is being um excited so we see the existence of those molecules as, as well but but you know you go from very high temperature very energetic um things where the where the ultraviolet light you know, it's, it's been it's been blue shifted to purple sh way up into the violet and ultraviolet so any kind of molecules nearby would 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 be effectively destroyed broken apart by the radiation from the star down to stars that are very weak and are just smoldering for which complex molecules and dust can can settle in close um next uh, we're going to the next one Oh, there was a question in the chat um, that uh, I wanted to. So uh, Katina asks, is it consensus that all stars start out with the same um, elemental composition? No. No. All and stars start off with their clouds, and their clouds can have various composition. And in fact, over time, those clouds that they're formed from have have had material, they've been sort of, the snow has been dirty, dusted. Yeah. The the time when that would have been the most true would have been for the very first population of stars called the population three stars. Because before that, there, there wasn't any of the mechanisms that we're going to be talking about um, for creating the heavier elements. So basically they all started with the, the same cards. They started out with 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and then very trace amounts of other light, light um, elements. Lithium and, and so, yeah, yeah. But yeah. As, as those stars died and sort of seeded and, and provided some heavier elements for some of the other stars, then the second generation of stars called the population two stars, excellent naming convention, 10 out of 10, um, those would start and have, um, more heavier elements that might have some calcium or something in it, uh, potentially, but it doesn't really, it, it's not really a big, um, driver as I understand it, at least, uh, of, of how the star itself, uh, evolves. Mm. Oh, this is actually a question I have also with, like, regarding the CNO cycle, you need to have carbon, 
uh, to like to, to start the cycle. But when you have the first, like the population three stars without any heavier elements to start with, did they were they unable to start the CNO cycle at the beginning, basically, because they, they didn't have the uh, the carbon to start the CNO cycle at the time. I don't know if it, I don't know if it affects the the way they behaved because they lacked any carbon to uh, catalyze this CNO cycle. That seems plausible. Um, I imagine that is an area of active research. <laughs> like I, I would imagine, I would imagine that the the, the population, like when the population three stars start to fuse helium into carbon, then then the carbon, the CNO cycle would start immediately, basically, or, or almost immediately. I would imagine. I would imagine that. Yeah. Uh, real fast. I don't forget to it later on. What is the difference between a population three, two, and one star? Yeah. Um, so, the so the yeah, they started off by saying the population of stars we see like our sun was seen as the first population, a population one. It's, it's unfortunate numbering. And so the stars that that were were part of the process that 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 was the generation before were population two, and there's and and in population three or their generation before that now that generation is not like you have in biology of parents grandparents and so forth um it's more about the era of star formation so yeah star the stars that produce. form this time are published in one yeah what that but, makes more sense the other way around is, is, is this yeah, I, I know but 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 it's 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 the numbering that i talk about um and even you know uh, the population, because it's not true to say generations of stars. They're not biological. I, I think it's a, I think the, the 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 metallicity was first described and then it was later found to be oh they are like the, the population one stars are a bit older compared to the population two two stars, perhaps. Maybe the maybe the the, the naming convention was realized before or was established before it was realized that population one stars are younger than population two stars, perhaps. Yeah, it, it's called that because you had a population that was understood and then they noticed these lower yeah. metallicity stars and mm -hmm. they were like, this doesn't fall into the first category. I guess we need a second category. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's they, literally another, another population, population, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that they didn't really realize at the time about the metallicity of stuff, that it, it was, was, a, was a function of the of the you know, evolution of the cosmos. It was just seen as, as, as the other population. And then the speculation of even another population, and then it became a timeline. And people said, well, by that time, the number is stuck. So, and it is a case that, 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 that astronomy sometimes has nomenclature that we later on regret, but that's the way it goes. I mean, also about, about, about this, that, that, I think, think we need to move on on, on this diagram, yeah. the Hertzsprung yeah, uh, Russell the, 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 diagram. Yeah, so let's so, 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 <coughs> good stars, okay? Um, so, who wants to talk about this? Uh, well, I, I like I, I made this slide, so I, I think I can. Like, it's the, yeah. the her, like you can see the, the main sequence star, the main sequence on the, the, the diagram is called the, if, if I pronounce it correctly, the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. It basically shows the, the all the stars on a plot uh, compared to the color on the uh, the x-axis. I think on the left it is hotter, and on the right it's uh, colder. And if you go from top to bottom, it it gets brighter. The, the 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 bottom stars are very dim, and the top the top stars are very bright. It's a very very convenient way of pl plotting different stars based on their uh, luminosity and temperature. And you can see the main sequence stars are basically the the, uh, the the stage of when the stars are the youngest, when they are fusing hydrogen and helium uh, at their, uh, the, 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 their uh, uh, juvenile or uh, adolescent stage. Almost. And our star is still on that stage yeah. right now? Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Our, our star is still mainly fusing helium. Oh, uh, sorry, mainly fusing hydrogen into helium today. Yes, and you can see at the at the bottom right there are red dwarfs. Yeah, and they will fuse uh, uh, hydrogen into helium over trillions of years, 
until they become white dwarfs. And then as you go, as you move up a bit on the main sequence, uh, uh, between uh, solar masses of uh, 0.6 to uh, 10 solar masses, uh, the those stars will eventually enter the red giant phase. And you can see the red giants a bit uh, on above the main sequence on the diagram. Yeah. Those, those are yeah. red giants. Yeah. The, the main yeah. sequence is that is the the main sort of diagonal wiggly yes. line. Mm -hmm. um, the there are other things on here, other uh, clusters that are not the main sequence. The main sequence is where a star lives. It's like most First of its thing. life. Yeah. yeah. First, also, also the first stage. I think yeah. Yeah, yeah, you also had most of its life. Yes, exactly. I, yeah. un, unless you talk, unless you are talking about very massive stars, then then it's a very it's a, it's a very short life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so just as you're describing what's what, what's showing on this diagram, um, so from left to right we have the spectral class, and that means that the things on the left are the higher surface temperature. Um, stars that also have that tend to be bluer in in their spectrum versus mm -hmm. the other side that tend to be redder, right? And you see on the bottom there's a thing called color B minus V, right? You basically you take the um, brightness of the star in let's say a blue spectral line, compare it to the let's say the the visual spectral line, and the difference is is if it's if it's negative towards negative, it tends to be blue, or if it's, if it's more positive, it tends to be um, more red. Um, so so first is the spectral class going from one side to the other. The other thing is luminosity. And this we're talking about the absolute, how 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 much light is a star putting out? Now, how many photons? How many to, photons, yeah. Yes. To do this, you need to know how bright the star appears and how far away the star is. Um, so when it began to plot the, the color of the star with the x-axis to the estimated luminosity, the y-axis, it began to show things that are happening. Um, and, and I want to say historically, um, this came, you know, what was called the um, Russell diagram. They start off with the Henry Draper catalog, which was whose data came from the, the work of an of a amazing astronomer, Antonio Murray, um, who um, was a very well-deserved um, 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 uh, Canon Award recipient for her, her work. She did a, a lot of fundamental cataloging and measuring of, of many stars back before the eras of computers um, and, and did some amazing work whose whose data was cataloged by a DARPA, who then um, was converted into this HR diagram. And so I do want to recognize um, Antonia's work um, for giving us a really fundamental, a lot of what we're talking about, the foundations came from her hard work at, 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 at up in observatories doing very, very detailed work. Um, give us lots of data about stars. I think one, one last thing to mention is the, uh, the the white dwarfs at the bottom. Those are the remnants of uh, low to mid-sized stars. Like after yeah. they have become red giants, the remnants will become white yeah. dwarfs. And, so and so you probably want to go to the next, yeah. the next, yeah. next yeah. slide. I'll help yeah. on that. All, All right. right. Yes. Talking about... <laughs> So in terms of, of, of where they start off in the main sequence and they tend to turn off that spot, it happens to depend upon um, you know, mass of the star as well as their age. And so you see the, you'll see in that, the diagram where the life of the star um, tends to veer off to the, to the edge, right? And, and why is that? Well, um, we'll, as we'll see when stars go through phases, I mean, pretty massive stars go through phases where they balloon up. Um, the, while there's a lot of energetic stuff going on in the core, the star expands quite a bit. So its surface area is much larger. 
And so yes. it tends to cool, appears to be cooler because you have more, the same amount of energy in a larger um, surface area. Yeah, so they, they, they become brighter, but also cooler. So they, they move uh, uh, to the top, to the top right, basically. They move uh, upward and to the left on the diagram, right? Yes. And that's, yes. also shown, that's also shown in the, in the diagrams right. here, yeah. Yeah, because remember what, what, what the x-axis is, is, is color or temperature, and the y-axis is luminosity. So when you see, for example, the, like the, the one star, what our sun will do, it will, as it goes into its, its giant phase, will, will up, the surface area will cool down, but it'll become brighter because it's more energetic. Remember again, the star, what's in a star is, is a balance between gravity crushing it and the action in the core pushing out. Yes. I can also see like in, in the, uh, on the left, you see like uh, a star clusters. And I believe that, that every star in the same cluster is roughly the same age. And you can actually see that uh, as the cluster of stars become older, the more massive stars uh, exit the main sequence stage earlier than the lower yes. mass stars. Correct. And, 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 that, and that's why you see the, uh, the curve in the, in the, in the diagram. The, young, the, young, all the younger clusters are, are all on the main sequence. And then as the, as the uh, cluster of stars become older, then the, the more massive stars uh, become the giants. Yes. The, uh, and yes. In other words, saying it that, that, that where a star sits in this diagram um, is also a function of how they're formed and then how they go through their how they evolve. Um, now, certain things like the Pleiades, open clusters, those stars are formed roughly at the same time. So they'll have similar, um, uh, 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 usually similar things. Um, uh, clusters like Omega Centauri are, globular clusters are a bit more complex. In fact, some of them we believe may actually have been cores of dwarf galaxies. And so they're gonna have a much richer set of, of, of things. So um, I would I would hesitate to talk about about globular clusters. We thought for a while that globular clusters must be around the same age, um, but but we started seeing in there um, things where they had you know, lots of of red dwarfs and brown dwarfs, but it also had we we surprised that they had black holes and neutron stars in there as well. The um, uh, globular clusters are are, are are fun objects that are much more complex than just All right. piles of stars. Next one. Yes. Okay, so we do have the notion of um, there, it, when stars get more massive in their core, um, you can start converting helium into, into carbon. Um, this is one of the processes. Now, our sun doesn't do this um, Particularly well. In fact, it, it, it probably doesn't. It, it, if, it, if it happens, it happens very seldom. Um, but but what when happens you're, very seldom? When you're, what? What happens very seldom? Um, that you'll have helium fusing, right? Stars that are in the phase that our sun is currently in don't really aren't really yeah. fus fusing much helium. But I, but as a star, as the as the core gets more energetic, why? Because um, when the star starts running out of much, most of the hydrogen to fuse, gravity begins to win, crushes the star down, increases the temperature and pressure in the core, such that helium can start fusing into, into yeah. uh, beryllium and carbon. And, and that will happen uh, in the sun, uh, when, when the sun is already a red giant. And I believe we will cover that in the, in, in the next yeah. slides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but this is another process that goes on there. So next one. All right. So this is a good diagram talking about mm. what what happens as stars go through their cycles. And this is the fate of medium stars, as our, like our sun is also a medium mass star. This, 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 this will happen to our star eventually. Yeah. And so, and so, this is sort of showing that they start off somewhere in the main sequence and stars like our sun tend to be kind of in the middle 
uh, with, with average velocity, average temperature, but at some point when they run out of most of the hydrogen in the core to fuse, gravity takes over, the star, you know, gravity crushes the star, the pressure and temperature in the core increases, helium begins to fuse, uh, much more energetic, the resulting is that the, the pressure pushes the, the envelope of the star out, um, so the star actually swells up because even, and, and this will make the star appear to be cooler um, because you have much more surface area around, even though it's also going to be brighter as well. Um, and so that this goes into the red giant branch. Um, but eventually that star like our sun will fuse, do their helium fusion and 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 then um but but if if they have enough mass such as this goes up to about 10 times the mass of the star um they'll actually begin to fuse helium and going into these other other processes so kind of go back and forth depending on how much mass the star has so let's go to the next one probably is all right So here shows you the evolution of a, of a, of stars again, medium mass. So they're not brown dwarf smoldering things. They're not red dwarf kind of smoldering things. They're normal stars that go through, um, to, to massive stars. So this larger diagram is probably more on the closer to the 10 mass solar mass stars than the one solar mass stars where it goes through a red drive phase, helium begins to fuse it goes into another phase where you get you get even more um carbon um in in the core but yeah. then it it's essentially that it runs out of of ability to crush the the carbon the carbon not really engaging much in the, in the fusion process other than the cno cycle and so but when it goes when, when stars go through phases where they start from hydrogen to to um to, to suffer helium fusing to other stuff. Every time they go through a phase transition, there, there's a there's a, a much more energetic reaction that sends out a shock wave and it tends to blow material off the edge. Um, and and so the the term planetary nebula um, came from back when we didn't really know what stars were, and people with poor telescopes looked at these nebulae and said they kind of look like planets. So they're sort of planetary like nebula, but they're not planets, um, but the name stuck. Um, what you see on the left, um, the star in the center, the very faint star in the center of that blue disc is the star that caused the shell of material to be ejected, right? It went through a phase and it created this, this nebula, this, this sort of, they tend to be rings of, of stuff, um, so-called ring nebulas, I think is a better term. But they'll they'll eventually run out of things to do in their core. They will cool down to white dwarfs, and you see the dashed light, or they basically tend to, um, you know, they get very hot um, from the fact that they've blown off all the material. You just had sort of the smoldering core, quite hot, and the, and the core radiates uh, out into space um, and cools down. And I think the re the reason why uh, stars like our sun becomes a red giant is because of the like when when the helium is produced, it becomes an an, an, an inert core that is unable to fuse at, at first. So, so in order in order for uh, fusion to continue, the the core of the sun uh, has to or, or first I think the, the inert helium core is unable to withstand the pressure. So the star uh, pushes pushes downwards by gravity. And that increases the temperature of the outside of the core, and th and that allows uh, hydrogen to continue fusing, fusing as a shell surrounding the inert helium core. But yeah. eventually, and eventually, the the helium core itself becomes fu fusible into carbon. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. I I think um, just to like um, emphasize the the sort of core thing that heh, pun that's happening here. Um, is when the fusion dips below a certain amount, you no longer have enough energy being produced to push the outer layers of the star out. 
and they will um, contract. And that increases the pressure and increases the heat until fusion, a new type of fusion can start again. So it's always this balance. And when the star changes between fusing one type of material to another, at first it can't fuse that new type of material, but the that means that the, the star starts to contract and that that's why it sub, it becomes capable of fusing um, the inert helium, which it previously was unable to. And that happens throughout like that process is kind of the process that determines how a star yeah. lives and 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 dies yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go on to the next one the next slide yeah. um and uh, and here with this next thing the next uh, uh page um i want to basically talk about um the difference between nova this is uh, and 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 a certain type of supernovae so here we're talking about um the end cycle of medium mass stars, they're the so-called white dwarf. This is after they have they have gone through their how many stages of fusion, and the result is you get a smoldering ember, which which is is dense. Um, it's a it's a collection of atoms that are that are they're really packed together, not neutrons, but but atoms, um, and called and under very degenerate conditions. When a uh, when a when a white dwarf is in a um, a binary pair relationship, and and a lot of stars are not single stars like our sun, but have pairs of stars or, or clusters of stars. Um, it's often the case that that the two stars don't necessarily go through their phases at the same time. Um, they they might have slightly different times, so you might have a a, a pair of stars where the one star has gone through its phase, it's it, it's gone, it's ejected its shells, it's gone through its flashes, it turns into this basically this this dense white white dwarf. Now the other companion, a little bit later on, um, goes through its giant phase, but now it's got this 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 white dwarf next to it, and material that's that's been pushed out by the star falls into it on the surface of the white dwarf. Now, in in um, that that what is that material from the from the primary star? That is the later the star that went through its giant phase later. Um, it's hydrogen. So hydrogen tends to build up on the surface of the white dwarf, and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. The pressure gets bigger, 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 and at some point it begins to fuse, and this, you get a a a a rapid burning. You know, this fusing of 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 hydrogen at the at at the piled up on the surface of the star. I remember at, at to a thickness where you'll get an explosive ejection, right? And it'll cause nova nova to occur. And and there are stars that go all go have sort of somewhat periodic um, uh, ejections where they've got their companion feeding the material at a certain rate. It piles up to a certain depth, begins to fuse at the bottom, goes bang, and pushes out. There's a different thing that happens, however, um, because when it dumps the material and goes bang, some of the material stays behind. And so when it fills up again, it has a little bit less, uh, takes takes a little bit less time. Eventually, there's enough mass that sticks on the white dwarf that it becomes what goes, it goes beyond what's called the Chandrasekhar limit, where the mass of the white dwarf exceeds about 1.44 times the mass of our sun, at which point, there is an enormous thing goes on. You get a runaway thermal nuclear event, and it gets called a, a type one A supernovae. And the so, yeah, I, I was just going to say that the the phenomenon where where as a as a white dwarf approaches the Chandrasekhar limit, it's it's really fascinating because when you when you work out the math, you you um, the the where the one point four four solar mass comes from is when you do the math you have a relationship between the mass of the white dwarf and the size of the white dwarf. Yes. And as you increase the mass, the size gets smaller. Yes. And, and because there's more stuff to crush the atoms even closer. Exactly. <laughs> and, and um, the, the 1.44 thing is basically when in a simplified version of the math, because obviously you're transitioning to 
the thing that kills it um is is the the size of the star like it, it keeps on getting um heavier and heavier and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then it just it, it, it hits zero it hits zero size and that yeah. happens at around 1.44 and um that so I, because it, it just can't hold it anymore and then it goes and it has a what's called a type 1a supernova I, and because because type 1a supernova by definition occur in this way they always occur with at the exact same sort of point physically they occur when a white dwarf becomes this heavy which means that all type 1a supernova are very very similar to each other yes uh, and now now there are actually slight differences yeah. um and and one of the things that my good uh stronger friend uh, alex Filipico did was to help determine when when they spot these type of supernovae the speed at which it goes up in brightness and drops back down is is a is a is a function of of conditions in the star the reason why so while you might say if if that if, if we call these type of supernovae the cosmic 100 white, white bulbs some white bulbs might go in the in the um some light bulbs might be in the 90 watts some might be about 110 watts there's a slight variation mm. and and the speed at which it with the, with, with which the supernova rises and falls is a function of whether it's it's closer to the 90 watts or the 110 watts i'm speaking metaphorically um and so what what uh Filipenko and his team did was to measure um look at supernovae that were close enough they can get good distances watch the brightness curve and basically calibrate the calibration of stuff. so so while the type of supernovae are the the proverbial 100 watt light bulb there's slight variations and the variations can come from how fast the star was really spinning and other material that's in it that can can vary the wattage slightly as well as dimming and stuff and so they were able to rule out the dimming by by looking at um, spectral lines in order to look at the light curve to basically give it a much more precise thing. That was that was the key puzzle piece that allowed people like Adam Reese to discover that supernovae weren't as bright as they expected to be because the universe is accelerating. Um, I also I want to mention as well the 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 person um, Chandra Shekhar. Um, I, um, I Chandra drew a Shekhar. thing to describe what you just said, Landon. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that, that be thing. Uh, oh, yes, please. Uh, yeah. So I, Tapio Weasel is bringing out the Bible. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in a Type One A supernova, um, you've got it, the the supernova starts at some time, and as time progresses, it gets it gets brighter and then it gets dimmer. And what Landon was just describing, I I had sort of previously said that all Type One A supernova are very 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 similar. And Landon was just describing the way in which they can be different. So this one, for instance, that grows faster and then decays, I, I'm i assuming. Yes. I don't actually yes. know if it's the yes. same. Yes, that, that, that's um, right. That's right. This would be a 110 watt uh, like yeah. supernova, whereas yeah. this one would be a 90 watt. But the relationship between these is a very sort of precise, you can, you can correct for that, basically, and you can sort of um then replot all of these things with a normalized sort of unit of time maybe you choose a time unit that is related to something and then all of those curves will when plotted um you, you can basically figure out even despite this difference exactly how high the peak is because if it goes up like this even if it's very dim, you know because they measured it. Phil Penko measured it. Yeah, yeah. That they all do the same thing. Yes. Or that they all they all fa yeah. follow a a certain um, functional form, but exactly. the precise coefficients can be slightly different. And so this, 
this right here and the ability to make all of those sort of line up on the same curve um, is why they are so phenomenal as yes. standard candles. Yeah, and 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 it, it, that additional precision allowed them to essentially determine the universal accelerating, which is an obvious thing. I want to mention also, it, it is important to also mention Chandra Shekhar, an extraordinary uh, physicist um, uh, who had his mathematical treatment of stellar evolution um, was really quite fundamental. Um, so the China Shekhar limit and formation of black holes and supernovae and so forth are all um, named for the mathematics that he found he, he, he put in place. Um, I, I, I had a chance to talk to somebody who was, Shekhar lived uh, between 1910 and 1955, actually uh, spoke with my colleagues who was with Chandra Shekhar when he was doing the math to try to figure out what happens to the star, just as he was saying about the, the more massive the the white dwarf, the smaller it was, and realizing if it keeps getting smaller and smaller, something's going to happen. And so he um, got somebody to go to the live to the, the university library when it was closed to get various books to get the tables about about physics of, 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 of degenerate matter and realized that the, that the star white dwarf falls off a cliff at a mass that he calculated 1.44 times, um, the mass of our sun. Um, again, uh, Cambridge mathematician, uh, physicist, um, who, who, who's, who's has extraordinary, uh, 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 uh contributions to astronomy. So thank you, Chandra Shekhar. There is a X-ray telescope called the Chandra Shekhar Telescope, aptly named because the telescope tends to um, observe things that Chandra Shekhar helped gave us um, uh, a, a, some some solid mathematical data. Um, should yeah. I mention the next thing here is a fun thing happening about this Nova that's going to come? We expect it to come. Our next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Next slide is I think okay. is that. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a recent news I, I noticed a few days ago that one star is uh, is bound to become a nova. Oh, uh, one one previous no, slide. No, Sorry. no, no, no. Go back. Uh, no, there we go. Yeah, that yes, that. Uh, it hit accidentally. It's a T, -T Corona Borealis. I think it's pr pronounced. Yes, it's the star. Yes. yes. It, it is it is in the constellation kind of borealis and it's a, it's sort of like a it's a, it's a it's visible in the primary from the northern hemisphere um so it's a nice sort of sea ring of stars that looks kind of nice um but there is an object in that region not on the ring but off the ring which has undergone nova in the past it's it's, it's a again one of those things where this is an artist's conception where the companion star is feeding material on top of it and it feeds at about the same little rate. So at some point it will undergo this, this Nova flash and we're actually waiting to, um, to watch it happen uh, because we can gather some really useful data of what happens with, with, with Novi. Um, no one, so we're anticipating this happening um, given the history of stuff. It should happen sometime this year. Um, it has gone, it kind of, and it happens before, before it goes, we think we see that it kind of has a dip in brightness and it'll go up bright enough. It actually might be bright enough that you could see it, um, certainly in binoculars, um, and, and likely if you're in a dark sky, even, even visibly. Um, uh, it, it, it will appear, it will appear as a new star, basically, just, just like a, yeah. maybe not, maybe not so, something out of the ordinary, but it's just like, hey, hey I, I didn't, I did not notice that star before. Well, like a, and, like, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and so it won't be you, you to see it, you probably, although this is probably, um, you probably need to go into a, a dark sky uh, without the moon um, shouting yeah. Um, yeah. to see it. But if you do, it'll probably be one of the most distant stars that you've ever seen, unless you are fortunate enough to see 1978, which is a supernovae. Um, so it's worth, it's worth um, um, 
looking at if if you if you happen to to, to watch it. And again, we will be looking at it from a number of instruments. Actually, they're waiting for the announcement that hey, it's taking off in brightness, and and telescopes will sit there and watch the whole curve in great detail. Is 1987A um, is 1987A the furthest star you've ever seen? Yes, uh, it's 187,000 light years away, approximately. Um, and the nice thing about that, I was um, I was on the ground in uh, Stromlo, Mount Stromlo Observatory in the Australian Capital Territory, um, about 19 hours after it was discovered. Uh, I had always had a clause with my um, employers that says that I get to go anywhere in the world whenever there's a supernova that reaches naked eye brilliance, right? And I would tell people, like if I were best man at a person's wedding, I said, I've got this pocket detector that goes off, I'm leaving you um, and heading off because these are extraordinary events. And I was fortunate enough to watch that supernova actually change the brightness. So that brightness curve that you drew, I actually watched a star do that. I watched it change in color and change in brightness before my eyes hit the peak and go down. It was. It was. Uh, how it, long? How long does it do that to to reach the peak and become dip down again? Um, how long? How long does the curve last? Yeah, well, I guess the peak was about two and a half days, uh, two days or so for that thing. Um, and of course, the, the, the tail is very long, right? Um, I was able to see in a modest sized telescope the supernovae uh, about um, two years after the event. Uh, but the rise is actually in a matter of, of hours, days to hours, depending upon circumstances. So next. Yes, right. next slide. Next slide. So, um, really massive stars, well beyond 10 solar masses. Um, go through a number of cycles. We mentioned the, the helium to you know, hydrogen to helium to carbon. Um, but, but if there's enough mass, the carbon will begin to undergo a chain. And, and here we see the, 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 the carbon going up to, to, um, you know, going through the, the, the process, um, and, 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 and usually what's happening is essentially you're having um, helium nuclei become the dominant thing that fuses. So rather than, let's say, carbon fusing with itself, um, you have helium nuclei slamming into carbon atoms that build up to form um, neon and then eventually it gets to, to, um, to, to oxygen, to silicon, and then to, to iron. Um, and so this process of of what's happening in these stars is as as it goes through the phase transition. So so uh, whatever's happening, let's say for example, the, the the carbon in the core gets to be exhausted, most exhausted. The gravity begins to win the tug of war and 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 starts to crush the star. The pressure temperature in the core increases, and now you get neon in action. And then you can get silicon, and then you can get into iron, and, and on, on down the line. But it doesn't continue forever. No. And that, 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 that's what the, the middle figure is for. You can see that, oh, on the left, you see uh, lighter elements being fused, releases energy. But up to a certain point, the opposite happens. When you start to, fu to try to fuse uh, iron, for, for example, or nickel, when you mm -hmm. attempt to fuse that, it doesn't release energy anymore. Yeah. And I say, well, why is that? Well, um, uh, atoms like oxygen have, uh, nuclear oxygen have eight protons. If I remember my, is that right? Oxygen is? Yes. Is eight. Um, and, and it will, um, so, so when it has much more, many more positive charges, it's much more repulsive. And it takes more energy to get something close enough to the atom where they fuse. Um, so the time you get to iron, which um, is around 26 protons, if I recall correctly. Yes. Um, 
You have you have to do a lot of work to get anything that's other than a neutral particle close enough to the nuclei for it to fuse. Now, I should point out, we're not talking about fusion like it's a bunch of billiard balls with that are sticky. Um, what you really have to do is to get the nuclei close enough together that quantum mechanics takes over and and they fuse and and yeah. What's ultimately right. happening, um, to, not to belabor the point too much, but what's ultimately happening is that uh, according to quantum mechanics, you have a bunch of um, particles and they're all interacting with different energies and there are different states that will be stable. And if you get it close enough, then suddenly it's more stable if it, suddenly, if it, if it just goes together. Um, but it, it's that's quantum it's, tunneling and all of that stuff. Um, yeah. it's, it's also like a, a fight between the electromagnetic force and the strong nuclear force. Like if, if two yes. nuclei yeah. are far exactly. apart from each other, the electromagnetic force uh, forces them apart from each other. But yeah. if you manage to get them close enough, the strong yeah. nuclear force might be able to bind them yeah. permanently. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, that's pretty good. I, I like to refer to them as interactions, where where. Sorry about that. Yeah. Some, some, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, you know, nuclei that has 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 positive charges um, that are far apart. The electromagnetic in, interaction want to push them away. If they get close enough, um, they can actually quantum tunnel, and the strong nuclear force says, "Let's let's 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 let's, let's merge." And so I also. On, on the, on the graph here, the blue section where energy released is where fusion of nuclei is exothermic, right? Remember from chemistry, exothermic gives off stuff, right? Gives off heat, gives off energy, right? The 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 left side energy, um, it, the other side is a case where if you do if you force fusion, it is endothermic; it'll absorb. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, you I, end I, up, if you if you fuse two bits of iron, you end up you it you have to add heat to it. You don't get heat out. So that, I, I've heard that iron and nickel are like the uh, the, the the most stable elements. Yes. Like they have they they have the uh, how do you call it? They they have the the most. Uh, the highest binding energy per nucleon, basically, right? Yeah, to some extent. And and so so if 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 fusing hydrogen is the dynamite, the nitroglycerin chemical reaction, um, when you get beyond um, iron, you get things like reactions like you know um, uh, ice and salt, where it absorbs, it takes energy, it, it's it's into it, 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 and so remember, stars are the balance between the action going in the core pushing out and gravity coming in, when. When, when, when you get to the point of, of iron and nickel, the fusion reactions are now no longer giving off energy, they're absorbing energy. And the result is that as the star begins to fuse those heavier elements, it no longer has outward pressure and the star collapses. And in fact, it collapses rapidly. These, these stars that begin to fuse um, iron and heavy elements, they're some of the largest stars you probably can see. They're very, very large stars um, in terms of radius. But when they collapse, they collapse rapidly. They they end up collapsing on a matter of seconds, right? The 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 the, the set there. But you're someone's going to say something. Is that why they those those almost can only form in explosions or novas? It's why they're only formed efficiently. Then uh, okay. the, you, you could still form them, yeah. um, but uh, we'll get to that other a things later. Are happening. <laughs> yeah. A little bit later on those other cycles. So let's go to the next page. Um, we'll get to that spot. I just want to point out the phase of these massive stars. Um, the more massive the star, the shorter its life. So a star the, like the, our the top, sun yeah the top or right, uh, right uh, table yeah is, is a star like our sun will last on order of 10 billion years if you if you talk about a a red dwarf to brown dwarf that they a tenth of the mass it'll last instead of 10 billion years it'll last uh, trillions of years 
Whereas, for example, a star that's about three times the mass of our sun, instead of lasting 10 billion years, will only last maybe a third of a billion years. By the time you get to something like 60 times the mass of the star, you're around the 3 million years. So you've, you've cut the life of the star dramatically. Um, it's like, even though they are like t 10 times more massive, they, they uh, fuse up stuff a thousand or maybe even more times yes. as fast <laughs> yes yeah um another thing to say is that that the the rate at which it goes through those stages is at exponential rate so here we have a fate of a let's say 25 mass solar mass star so they have it has enough mass to go through all of its stuff into into getting iron as core and you see that maybe the hydrogen phase might last um Remember, these stars are a uh, 25 million mass. It has a, has a lifetime of only maybe let's say seven um, seven million years. Right? The helium hydrogen phase lasts for seven million years. The helium phase lasts for seven hundred thousand years. The carbon oxygen lasts for about six hundred years. The oxygen to silicon six months, half a year. Silicon to iron one day, and the collapse of the of the star happens in a fraction of a second uh, I, i've i've also i've also seen that like like when a very massive star like exhausts one previous element it becomes a super uh, a, a giant it becomes bigger and then it, when, it, when it starts to fuse a new element then it contracts again and then like each time it uh, transitions to a new element it oscillates basically from a super giant to a uh uh, yeah. or smaller uh, do we have uh, do we have any st uh, known star that is known to oscillate like that to become super giant and then back again and then uh, or maybe you, I mean, yeah we, we certainly watch stars go through this phase these phases and of course the, the supernova is probably the the massive stars is probably the last most dramatic of those phases we've seen stars undergo phase transitions um um, and again, it's believed that things like the, the star Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, depending on your pronunciation, um, is a star that's going through unstable period where it is potentially transitioning to the next phase. Um, and, and so we see stars go through, when they, when they go through that transition, like let's say um, they go from carbon to oxygen to the oxygen to silicon phase, um, it's not, it, 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 it goes, it, as it approaches it, it, it gets the unstable, right? That, that, that the star begins to collapse because there's not enough action in the core, heats up, it, it, it pushes back a bit, goes back and forth, but eventually it goes ka -chunk. And, and the core goes down, but the energy, the energy of coming from the core goes way up. So the star brightens and pushes its outer envelopes out much further. Um, so I, the, go ahead. Uh, so we we have still have plenty of time before our star transfers into a helium carbon fusion star. Yeah, given given where we think it is, um, it has about six billion years, five and a half billion years, five and a half to six billion years. So it's it's got a while before, and it gets it's kind of going to go to the helium fusing shell. It doesn't have enough mass to get into the carbon fusing shell. Uh, also, we, 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 do, we actually do, will run uh, into problems uh, sooner, like in, in half a billion years, the sun will become, like it, it won't become a red giant proper, but it will, it will still be a lot warmer or hotter than it is right now in half a billion years. Yeah. And it, it might become too hot to sustain compl complex life at least in yes. a half a billion years. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now these massive stars, the cores actually become rather small compared to the size of the star so in this <coughs> case we have a star whose 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 core that's that's in the um the central spot is is just starting to 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 get to iron um that core region might have around a ten thousand kilometer um diameter where the outer region of that core is still hydrogen fusing then helium the carbon the neon and oxygen silicon probably iron but that 10,000 kilometer core is inside a star that's 1.6 billion kilometers in size. All the rest of that stuff you see, that supergiant, is the outer envelopes of the star that is mostly, probably mostly hydrogen with, with helium and carbon oxygen fusing it, but mostly hydrogen. Um, but the action is 
a tiny part in the center of the of the of the of the Kassar. Is the is it, is, is it, how much of the mass is in that core? Is it is it also a very small amount of the mass? Is most of the mass in the envelope? Hmm. Um there's a fair amount of mass in the core, but not all the mass is there. And I'm trying to remember the ratio. Is that coming to mind? Sorry. Yeah, Someone will... it's, it's probably it's probably a lot more than the ratio between the, the volume, right? Compared Correct. to the, the volume. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Necessarily. Yes. The, the, but... the, core, the core is much denser than the outer uh non fusing shell yeah my, my intuition would be that uh the vast majority of the mass would be in the envelope but if if i could believe that i am wrong about that <laughs> yeah I, I i won't i won't speculate someone else who look watching this thing can leave a note saying you forgot da da da, da right i'm sorry there's lots of stuff to remember this sort of thing um let's go to the next one okay so massive stars that that start off in a nebula collapses you get a, a star on the main sequence but this is a big tubby tubby star that goes through giant super giant phase it finally ends in what we call as type 2 supernovae and depending on how big it is you could get form a weird thing called, called a neutron star or even weirder thing called a black hole um, with a lot of stuff being pushed out and again, these these supernovae are quite um, uh, are quite spectacular events. Um, what we see on the on the on the on the um, the, the right hand edge is a picture of the Crab Nebula. This was a star that went type a type two supernovae in 1054. Um, it was a star that um, was seen um, basically this guest star that showed up. And a number of civilizations around the world watched this star. This star actually was bright enough that people could see the star in the daytime. Um, and it was visible for, I think, almost a, 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 a year or two, is that, if I call yeah. it correctly? I've seen, I've seen it too, that it was visible. Maybe not visible during the daytime for a full two years, but the, it, it was, yeah. the, 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 the supernova was observed for two years, yeah. I believe, yeah. And so how close, how close to us was it? Oh, what's the difference? Is, is, isn't a crab nebula on the order like a thousand light years? I'm, I'm, I'm um, I have no idea. Um, uh, the, it, the, it's in it's in our galaxy at least. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to uh, observe. Yeah, it was it was <laughs> in our, our galaxy, and and it's um, the the distance uh, estimates around sixty five hundred light years. 6,500 light years. Sixty five sixty five hundred. 6,500 times 10 trillion kilometers. Uh, like how, um, how frequent are uh, the, this type of supernova uh, in, in our galaxy? Like uh, once every thousand years or once every 10,000 years? We, we believe the rate on the Milky Way is about once per century, but maybe a little bit more frequent. Do you, do you remember? Oh, that's, I mean, that's, actually, that's, that's actually a lot more frequent than I, 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 I first thought. Yeah, that thought. sounds pretty frequent because, because supernova outshine yeah. outshine their own galaxy and, right? and now now the thing is that, that that in our galaxy we can have supernovae going off on the other side yeah we have supernovae going off behind uh dust clouds that we don't see right ah, um, right. typical visible supernovae to the earth happens at an average rate of about one three four centuries but we only see a little bit of stuff there's a lot of of the the central part of our Milky Way, where most of the stuff is, that's hid by molecular clouds that absorb light. Um, so you talk about yeah, so seeing yeah, something. It, it, yeah. in, in a typical, when we look at, at galaxies out there, um, on average, it's uh, I think it's around uh, once per century. But there are there are galaxies that are much more active than other galaxies. So don't take that as that hard and fast rule. Um, what it does say is if you're if you're if you want to watch us catch a supernovae and stare at a galaxy, you, you might not want to do that. You might want to actually stare at lots of galaxies. In fact, what um, what Alex Tolofinko and his uh, a student team did with the Kassman telescope was to build a robotic telescope that would go and take pictures of, of, of galaxies. And the software began to look for dots that then the 
undergraduate students would look at. And if the doc looked super noisy like they go back and look at it again and look at it again and again and build the brightness curve and say, ah, supernovae, right? So they were the first sort of supernovae detection factory that for a number of years were the were the record for you know seeing. And so they they had rates of like a hundred per year, um, what they thought was doing pretty good. Now there's much, much more efficient telescopes that can check find supernovae at a quite a quite a good rate um, okay so on, on the on the left side the universe recycles it, universe recycles itself well we'll talk about this in be4 okay um uh, what's happening with the ejection uh, stuff also like one one last question before we move on to the next slide uh, is the crab nebula a neutron star or a black hole do we know that the, there's, it's a neutron star um all right and 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 how do we i mean, know that well i've actually seen the neutron star um one of my very first observations was to take the fremont peak pointing meter telescope and i put a basically a a a fan blade um that was oscillating around 30 um 30 times a second um a shutter right a rotating shutter and i put it in front of the um the, the beam where that central spot is I could sort of point at the spot. I can I can tell you where the spot is, but it's hard to see in that mesh. There's a dot that's actually the the, the neutron star. And when you when you when you when you um, scan at a rate, rate of three times a second, the star's blink rate about thirty one times a second it begins to strobe like like the wagon wheel oh, effect. And that's so amazing. you drift across. You have this rotating shutter, and all of a sudden you see the star going in and out, in and out, in phase out of phase. Um, yeah, so you can find the, the neutron star that way. It was the can first you, visible sighting of a neutron star done that way. Do you, is is it possible to view um, the reflection off of the nearby clouds in the nebula strobing like that as well? At all? Well, the most of the most of the glow of the nebula is not due to light coming off the neutron star. There's very mm -hmm. little. It yeah. is it is it is electrons being accelerated. Yeah. You know, if you think about the neutron star has this massive magnetic field that's spinning yeah. around 31 <laughs> rates a second. That magnetic field acts like waves, and those waves catch free electrons, and they surf the wave just like surfers on a, a wave coming to shore, mm. um, and accelerate. And accelerate to the point where they go faster than light travels in the medium, and you get wow. of radiation, as well as as at the near the edge, right? And the other things where they're sliding into nuclei and causing them to transition. And so, also accelerating charges um, emit light. Yes. Like just so it, on their own, uh, yeah. so, so, I believe it's So, so, so yeah. that blue glow you see right there in the image on the right, that's Cherenkov radiation, ba basically. No, only yeah. in the so, center. You, you have to only use, in the center. You have oh, to see things center. like, if you look at things like, like um, the region, is because it's dominated by other stuff. The, the, the blue glow there is mostly that, I say that, that I say the Bentham radiation and other things, other effects. Um, but Chandra Shekhar telescope looking down towards the center will find the region in which things are being accelerated um, um, quite nicely. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, spot. And that was the first time that we visibly detected a, a neutron star spinning at a nice rate. So let's go on to the next. So um, type A supernovae. Um, so the question, and if you know the answer, don't don't give it out um, to the chat is, which is which of the following would be brighter? Okay, we have two things. One, we have a type A, type two supernovae that's occurring at the distance of the Earth's sun, about 150 million kilometers. <laughs> okay. The other is a detonation of a one megaton nuclear bomb Press to your eyeball. Which is going to deliver more energy to retina? The 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 type one a supernova at a distance of Earth Sun, or the one megaton bomb right next to your eyeball? Well, I think both of them would fry it, would melt it. Is it? So 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 um, I guess for for the chat, if you're listening, type one if you think the supernova is brighter. Type two, if you think the one megaton nuclear bomb will be brighter. Type three, if you think they're about equal. So one, type A supernovae, type two supernovae at one sun distance. Two is megaton bomb next to your eyeball. 
three would be about the same. They got ones and threes of uh, survivability. And um, let's talk about the fact that 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 your it's the energy delivered to your retina, not that you might be able to think much about. <laughs> <laughs> you won't survive. <laughs> Either way. Don't yeah. do this at home, kids. Yes, yes. Don't do this in your backyard or even do this in your solar system. This is not a... So, okay, we got a couple things. Let's go to the next slide and give you the answer. So the answer is that the type A supernova is over a billion times more energetic. E even at that distance. Even, even at, at a distance, distance of 150 million kilometers, your retina would receive over a billion times more energy than a one megaton thermonuclear device pressed against your eyeball. It is, it is just insane the amount of energy these supernovas um, put out. Um, is that, that's total energy? So that's integrated on, over the duration of the supernova? Um, uh, this is peak energy. Oh, okay. So it's power is yeah. Because I was thinking, I was thinking, uh, if it's if it's a billion times, but it's spread over a week, then the yeah. the bomb would win in the split second. <laughs> and, and we're, 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 we're talking about the flash, right? But yeah, the yeah. Flash is going to occur, um, and you'll see a blinding flash of light, uh, mostly gamma. Um, you'll also get a non-trivial radiation dose of neutrinos. Yeah, I was um, going to ask, like, could you? Would you? Would you be able to feel them? Yes, you get a lethal dose of neutrino radiation. Well, um, but but you also you know, the problem is you get other things happening too. Yeah, it, well, uh, that, that, that's well, scary. Like when, when you when you hear lethal dose of neutrino <laughs> radiation, that's that's a scary. Uh, you have other place. problems at that point. Yes. <laughs> well, for the second for the second one, wouldn't the the bomb poke your eye out so you could you'd be blind anyways? Um, I mean, yes, but 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 you're dead both ways. Um, you're just... It's just that uh, in both cases you're turning into um, you're turning biology into physics, yes. and in one case you're turning it into exceptionally uh, exotic physics, <laughs> as opposed to just normal exotic yeah. physics. Really like, I, I have a question. I have a question. Sure. Would the would the Earth remain uh, a sphere, or would the Earth itself be blown to bits, basically? Blown to bits. If, if, right. Blown now, to bits. The supernova. Oh. The supernova. Sun won't go supernova. It doesn't have the mass to even. Only gets to the, to the helium phase. It doesn't have the mass to get all the way to to um, the fusing. Oh. I guess iron. the only difference that that I'm aware of is fusion. for the bomb one, it would happen to you right away, and the nova one it would happen to you in like. Well, eight minutes, give or take. Yeah. Well, yeah, but once it started happening, it would still happen instantly. <laughs> yeah, I I like to say that 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 both happen now. Yeah. Um, I I I do I use it more of a general general relativity thing. Um, when you see the flash, it's happening to you now. Yeah. Or now, because remember, no one has an absolute clock. There's no absolute frame of reference. When you see a super goes off, it's happening now. You're now. Okay. Even though, for example, even though the type, of super, uh, type 2 supernova that occurred in 1987A in large dimension like uh, uh, dwarf galaxy cloud, um, it took 187,000 years for the, for the light signal to propagate. It happened, when it happened, was 1987. That's our now. Okay. Um, um, that to say, oh, it happened 107,000 years ago. No, if you were next to the star, yes. But for us, it happened in 1987. That's it. All right. Like, I, oh, I don't have enough of I, I had the question about the Earth being blown to bits, but uh, this is just a minor question. I, I, I we can move on. Just, just, oh. to, just to, uh, hopefully sure. we won't be, uh, hopefully we won't go over time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so summary, um, you have these molecular clouds, clouds of gas doing its, 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 its normal stuff hanging around. Um, you typically have some kind of shock wave 
combination with a bit of more density that caused him to collapse to form a star that, uh, that enters the main sequence. And depending on its mass, it could be a brown dwarf that just smolders for trillions of years, a Loma star that can do like 10 billion years, that might go to a, a red giant phase to form a white dwarf that could, if it has a companion, do its 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 nova thing until it gets to go supernovae or or just just a normal um white dwarf that blows off its its rings forms a white dwarf and then eventually the remnant which is a black dwarf basically a white dwarf that we can't see but those don't exist yet yeah they're they're any any white dwarfs that are around are still hot and smoldering they have not had a chance to cool um, massive hey, star. Is, is it just is it just the residual heat that keeps them warm? Like yeah. only that. Only that. Well, I, there's probably a little bit of things going on, but but mostly it's 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 heat loss, glowing. Right. Um, massive stars go through phases. They will eventually do. Uh, when 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 you get to the point of iron in the core, it's game over. The thing collapses in a fraction of a second, and you get a supernovae. And depending on the type of supernovae and the mass, you either get a neutron star or a black hole. I, I can or see, I can see or, on the... Also, there's another... There's. This is not a complete diagram. Yeah. yeah. There, are, there are exceptions to the rules, which are very interesting. And if we put all the exceptions in, this diagram would get so busy that... Mm -hmm. it, yeah. So, there are other things that can happen. There, there, there is... Um, my understanding is there is a type of supernova, um, a, a pair instability collapse, oh, I yes, think, that's or something, <laughs> where... Um, it just annihilates itself. Like yes. you don't even have a remnant at the end. Yeah, I, yes. I, I actually included a slide on that. On that, yes, they later. Yeah. I believe. Um, uh, so, guys, I see. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we can but this is on. the main thing, right? At, at, at the birth of a star, depending on its mass, it has a fate of of just a a smoldering or normal star that goes through dwarf phases that may or may not go no for supernova, depending on a companion, or massive stars that go bang. And depending on the bang, it usually forms a black hole or a neutron star, depending. That'll form a, a nice X-ray emission thing or a pulsar, right? Let's go to the next one here. Yeah. All right. So again, same figure, yeah. Some summary of the cycles of stars, um, and we'll talk about in BE four the cycling process to, to where where death of stars help form new stars. The circle of life. No I, got, I also, we can also perhaps mention right now that as more cycles happen, the star forming cloud, the nebula, become more enriched in the uh, metals. And, yeah. the, and thus the stars born, born from those nebula yeah. are higher metallicity. And, and they also get, get the nebula gets to be blown out, the bubbles more. And so it, 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 it's interesting. So let's go to the next one. Okay. So, um, it is not correct to say that all the heavy elements are formed in the death of stars. I mean, um, uh, Sagan's we're all made of star stuff is, is a nice poetic thing, pro pro prosaic expression, but there are things that happen that are not fully dependent upon supernovae. Uh, certainly, you have processes in the supernovae that, that form the elements here, but perhaps do you want to go to the next one? Is there any comments on this? Uh, this is a very this is a very detailed sl slide. So, like, if you, if you want to skip the, this, then I'm I'm fine with it. Yeah, but there's, there's there's a lot of interesting things for nuclear physics. Um, yeah, yeah. And I would look at this and uh, suggest you look at this in, in more detail uh, what happens. But 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 if you talk about the the from the from the periodic table um remember that bang bang fusion that was we discussed that i believe in be2 if i'm all correct if i remember correctly um had hydrogen and helium with traces of lithium that's the blue um we do have dying mass stars that stars that don't go supernovae can give you some lithium, you know, carbon, and nitrogen. Most of the beryllium actually comes from cosmic rays, but that's a different story for a different, different, different show. Um, the 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 green 
is, and the blue are the results of, of massive stars going supernovae or white dwarfs going bang, right? And you could see that up to about Krypton Rubidium, um, it's coming from original primordial material, um, low mass, dying low mass stars, um, and uh, supernovae. But once you get well up into starting like with element 44, um, um, particularly things like platinum, gold, uh, some of those uh, fun, fun materials, um, they result in, come from merging neutron stars. Um, one of the things, and we'll talk a bit more about deaths of stars in BE4, but one of the things that, that can happen is when two neutron stars bind each other, if you will, and, and, and collide, spiral down and collide, um, weird things happen, really weird things happen. And, and in fact, um, let's go on to the next slide. Real fast, isn't there more elements in 92? Yes, but but okay. but these are these most of those elements beyond ninety two have such short half life that okay. that you won't really yeah. detect them out in the universe. They're uh, not. Yeah, uh, they're not naturally occurring. Is yeah. I think the. I, I have also I have also a question about the like the yellow is dying low mass stars like our sun basically and our yeah. sun is unable to fuse uh, heavier elements or elements heavier than like oxygen and, and carbon. Yeah. But why yeah. do why does dying low mass stars produce like uh, these heavier elements like uh, mercury, for example? Like, how, how does it happen? Um, well, one of the things that can happen in those stars is there's some fusion going on, and the result of the process of, of of helium and nuclear mergers can have some material being formed in mm. lower mass stars now. Low mass probably is a little bit of a misnomer here. What we're really talking about is lower mass stars than simply ones that, that explode. So you can get stars that say that, that, that maybe don't go supernovae. They're under the supernovae limit, let's say. Um, yeah, but it's still, it's still, mass it's still range, produce... But they will have fusion going on, particularly mm -hmm. as, they're, um, as, they, um, as, as they go through the end of life. There's some fusion that goes on. Um, right. form some material it's possible Wait. yeah all right anything in our comments i mentioned by the way on that and that thing that, that those those gray star gray elements were elements that are short 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 half lives that we don't detect them this is really talking about stuff we can detect on cosmos so when neutron stars collide they do really weird things um um, one of the things that, that, that we did with our Chetri cluster was we realized that the shape that it's incorrect to, to say that neutron stars are these two billiard ball spheres that, that smash together. Mm -hmm. They end up deforming uh, against each other and having tails. So um, if you if you look at this artist conception, um, which was a came from data, simulation data, you see that there are two blobs with these tails that look like sort of a, a quirk neck squash tails, little, little edges on it. So you see that, that, that kind of like commas, but I think of, think of them as more of, of a squash, you know, the bulb like of squash. A dapple almost, neck. a dapple maybe. Yes, yeah. and, and so the squash tails um, are, are a result of the fact that space-time is very twisted around this around these things. <laughs> and the result is that um, when the star, when the actual neutron stars merge, excuse me, <clears throat> when the neutron stars merge, those tails, the, the tail of the squash, snap off and recoil and spray out. Um, well, well, maybe about 70% of the mass of the neutron stars merges, about 30% of the, of the mass recoils and gets flung outward. Um, now, what, what does it mean by that? You have a tremendous amount of neutrons being flung out at, at relative velocities. 
Um, neutrons by themselves, um, without the benefit of, 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 of weird dynamics, without the benefit of, of, of nuclear reactions, will decay. Um, the other thing they'll do is they'll slam into nuclei because they're going at relative physics speeds and will boost the, the, um, the basically the, the, they'll, they'll hit nuclei and, and, and cause chain reactions to, to take them all the way up through uranium and beyond, right? Um, so if we, if, if you go, um, so when, when, when this stuff sprays out, stuff gets radiated by neutrons, Neutrons will decay. We'll see that as well in, in evidence of stuff. When when and one of the things that we we're gold, gold standard we're looking for is is a neutron star collision where we can visibly see the result of the decay of the neutrons. So I think it, even the isn't there half life of a neutron around so six hundred seconds, around ten minutes? Is that it's uh, it, uh or yeah, it's like ten minutes? Yeah. Um, but, but before the 10 minutes, it has plenty of time to slam into other material. What are the material? Well, um, clouds around the, 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 the event, right? And stuff gets radiated and it's boosted up. Now it will produce very heavy elements, but, but elements that are, that are more massive than uranium, um, had more protons decay very quickly. So yes. Um, in this neutron star collision, you'll have everything up through 118 and beyond being created, but those things last so are so short that they decay almost instantaneously. Um, move on to the next one. All right. So the simulations of uh, merging neutron stars, a lot of weird things happen with the result of of the magnetic fields and the mass. Right, a lot of mass gets ejected but most of it forms. In this particular case, we have a black hole forming and black hole forming does weird stuff to the space time, um, but the magnetic field does weird stuff as, as, as well. And the result is a very, very sort of twisted thing. And, and these, these mergers, right? You see two neutron stars, their diameters are in the order of maybe, this was showing a, a 18 kilometer diameter, um, no, the the diameters are around 27 kilometers of the neutron stars separated by 18 kilometers. So they're about ready to collide within a matter of milliseconds. They collide this case, forming a black hole and really twisted, weird, um, thing. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, let's go to the next one here. Okay. In particular, um, this is showing the magnetic fields and the mass getting really twisted. The space time gets really warped. And I want to show you a simulation that we have, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Right. I'm going to share the screen and grab this stuff. I'll show you. One second. Um, okay. Um, so what we're seeing is, is, a, is a simulation. These are, there are two um, neutron stars that are about to merge. In this simulation, we are seeing two things. We're seeing the distribution of mass. Um, this is going to be on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we'll see magnetic fields. So we have this, this arbitrary unit scale of, of the of the um, of the mass on this side and this side of magnetic field. So when we start the rotation, we see that, for example, as they they pass in, we're seeing the we're seeing the the effect of the Magnetic field being twisted as well as material. Right? Magnetic field's got getting messed up. Because remember, these neutron stars have, have currents around them with enormous magnetic fields. These are pulsars. And so as they start spiraling down, again, this is we're already we're at a stage here. Um, I'm gonna go back here. We're at a stage around, for example, around eight milliseconds. So they've gone, they're they're in a the process of getting emerged, and you, you see. Remember, this side here is the mass. This is the magnetic field. Now, magnetic field is just all twisted and wonky. Um, uh, enormous magnetic fields going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So is there um, a reason why the mag middle magnetic field side looks smaller than the, the mass side on, on, the, on the picture? It's, it's, it's the region, the effect region that we're looking at versus density, right? Um, okay. In this particular case, it's the it's the crooked squash tail that snapped off and recoiled 
and it's being flung out into space. Um, if you will, the recoil, um, the centrifugal force is flinging out material. So this here represents neutronium being flung out into space at relativ relativistic speeds. Um, it hasn't gotten as fast as the distortion of the magnetic field on this side. And so if you watch this happening a little bit more, um, spinning around, the magnetic field gets to be, you start to see, but you do see um, tails of result of the magnetic field. This is, this material here, we're seeing the magnetic field effect is, is the neutrons being injected um, and beginning to decay. Uh, well, actually not being in a decay, but, but, but colliding with stuff to create charge uh, things where the, where the magnetic field is getting messed up. Even though it's neutrons, it is, it is affecting other material in the center, plus the original magnetic field of the neutron stars are being quite distorted. So this is another case of that recoil. You have magnetic recoil as well as material recoil going on. And so now as they got, get closer, the recoil gets more violent. The material is rushing out. Um, and 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 being injected quite a bit um and eventually as it as it goes it'll now we get to, now you get the formation of a black hole um other stuff starts going in and you get really weird stuff three-dimensional structure is actually quite beautiful we're sort of looking at the spot where the black hole is formed and material has just just been flung out quite a bit and this happens this is this is only like the first 16 milliseconds of this event. So it's very important why because this is this is going to be we're going to talk about one of the you know in the periodic table of elements neutron star collisions turn out to be quite important. Yes, supernovae can occur. Um, you can do some of the stuff. Uh, low mass uh, lower mass stars can also form this stuff. But we've realized that neutron star collisions are actually much more common than we expect. Well, how do we know that? Well, one of the things that's happening is that um, gravitational wave detectors like LIGO um, are beginning to find, beginning to sense neutron stars colliding. Um, apparently, neutron stars are, are uh, much more common than, than we originally thought and they're able to find each other or they're formed in areas where they can be able to find each other and merge um to form um or maybe uh, a lot of, or maybe a lot of them were binary stars right before it's, before it's they became stars. that's that's a possibility um also globular clusters where there's lots of stars they can sink toward the center and then find each other and then go and go and merge um well it's technically possible for neutron stars to form a neutron star um usually their mass is such that they'll form a black hole. So, uh, what's going to what, what can happen? Can the same thing happen if a neutron star collides with a black hole? Or maybe it's not, not Yes. Like yes. Um, now, our first simulations took neutron stars to form a neutron star because when a black hole region forms, space gets really weird. You get a lot of divisions by zeros. Um, it's, simulation, it's, it's a simulation nightmare. Um, and in fact, for a while, a long time, it was very difficult even to, to try to simulate neutron star black hole or black hole black hole collisions. Now we've got we've got miracle methods to try to simulate that stuff, but it's weird, right? This is this this twisted magnetic space and magnetic field lines and, and, and space time curvature. I mean, between these two objects, the the space is you're being pulled one or the other so violently that that you don't know where up or down is. Um, um, and the gravitational waves that come out of it are actually quite extraordinary. Yeah, defining a grid to do your simulation on uh, is problematic because the grid is warping. Yes, yes, it is. And and you have to do very careful math. You have to be very careful because one of the things that you that that the reason why they have the, the things have at least being developed the, the squash tail is that these neutron stars, as they spiral down into each other, start to approach a significant percentage of the speed of light. And the neutron star is reacting to where it senses the other neutron star, not where it is. Um, the relativity says that, that effects of, of gravitational um, effects travel at the speed of light. 
So, so one neutron star senses where the other one was from its reference, but it's actually at a different spot. It's sensing the other spot and it ends up space time gets to be so distorted that that grid, that nice grid of space you think in Euclidean, you get thrown out of the window because it just becomes quite twisted and quite uh, complex. Mm. Which I probably move on to just dimension okay. uh, population two stars and population three stars. Who wants to go on this one? Uh, here I mentioned yeah, the, the different populations, like population one stars and population two stars have a, re a relatively high <clears throat> metallicity. Uh, but population three stars are uh, have been, been born from pure uh, hydrogen and helium, so they have zero metallicity. And as you mentioned before, uh, Tapio Weasel, that uh, the, the, the metallicity is basically a term for anything heavier than helium, right? Oh. Well, actually, or lithium, because it's or lithium. I mean, it is. I, um, which is funny, because lithium is a genuine, honest to god metal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, 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 so, so, um, uh, uh, as I say, Feynman, um, you know, uh, told me that this that this notion of physicists calling everything or astronomers calling everything above helium, lithium as a metal. Is kind of a um, a probably as a result of some uh, astronomer being forced to take chemistry, not liking it, and just saying, "Ah, oh, they're all metals. <laughs> they're all heavier stuff, right?" It 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 is not metal in the classical chemical sense. Yeah, um, metals like oxygen, and so metallicity really the you would say might say is is non primordial nuclei. But that's a mouthful. So he, he his speculation because I asked him why astronomers can you know call something like um, you know oxygen metal um, is that well probably some astronomer who didn't like chemistry mm -hmm. just said out. <laughs> uh, it's an unfortunate name, but it's stuck. Like like we we don't uh, like uh, at at least uh, we don't see any nearby population three stars. So no, uh, the the only ones we could theoretically observe is from very far away. But when, when we look back into the early universe, yes. yeah. so it's probably the case that these population three stars were all all very massive and they died. Uh, long ago, basically, that, that, that's the idea of why there are no population three stars around us in our own yes, galaxy, yes, for example. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and by the way, I, I I mean no disrespect to chemistry. Chemistry is a is a is an important, enormous branch of of, of science. Um, mm. On the case of, of the population three stars, um, these stars started off with basically effectively three quarter hydrogen one quarter helium with traces of lithium. Their fusion process, for example, they start off fusing. They have nothing to do a C and O cycle, even if they're massive, right? Because there's no C in or O to do there. Um, their cores start off um, just turning hydrogen into helium. Um, so their aging process is likely to be very different. Also, the population three stars probably occurred in much denser regions, yeah, so yes. they could become more massive. It's a speculation. So there's a there's a the speculation. Um, there's a limit, Eddington limit, um, where beyond about 200, a normal star in a normal space around 250 solar masses gets to be so energetic, so brilliant, so um, violent that it tears itself apart, right? If, if you manage to get 500 solar masses in a normal spot packed together, the star would blow itself apart before it even really did much, right? Um, yeah, however, I, 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 I have included that in the, in the bottom uh, right, that uh, like very, very massive stars between 130 to 250 times the mass of the sun will uh, uh, produce uh, photons energetic enough to undergo pair production that you you mentioned before uh tapio weasel about uh a star undergoing pair instability and th th this is it yeah 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 
This now, is, this happens because um, for gamma rays of sufficiently high enough energy, uh, they can spontaneously turn into an electron positron pair, which is nuts. Yeah, I mean you have and, to add that, 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 that the photon has to be two times five hundred eleven kiloton electron volts. Yep. <laughs> in 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 depth, and 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 they can for them to create that e equals m squared matter antimatter, which then allows each other and does weird things. But um, the, the, the point is that very massive stars, whether they're population three or population two or population one, are weird. Um, they're, they're not common uh, out in the universe, but they are weird. And things like Eta Carina um, are just on very unusual objects to study. Um, there's a number of things about supermassive stars we don't quite understand. Um, and I wish that Eta Carina would hurry up and go supernovae because we'll learn a bunch of stuff from it. So come yeah. on, you know, start, it, it, kick the bucket, give us a and, nice... And, and, that, and that would be called, <laughs> a, be called a hypernova, right? It's like when, when a or, star like this... And other weird stuff. I know one of the things that that that, that um, Philip Pico's team is doing now that, 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 that the accelerated universe is well established is they are looking at supernovae that are unusual, right? They, they only focused on the typical type 1a supernovae that were characteristic, but there are other supernovae that are unusual and they're not paying attention because there's unusual physics going on there. Um, I guess the other thing to say about population three stars is because they don't have much in the way of hairy elements, they have to generate their own and, and the processes are slightly, might be slightly different in terms of how they do the transitions. And this is one of the things that Webb I hope we can give us insight into yeah. what they're doing. Uh, There's also one thing of uh, two things I can also mention is that I've seen a PBS Space Time episode that mentions that because in the early universe there was a lack of metals, which meant that the uh, the molecular clouds cooled slower due to the lack of yes. metals, yes. and that also means that the gas clouds did that fragment into smaller sizes. So that, that's why we had very massive stars, probably in the early universe. Very yes. massive. And, and so that era of reionization or the cosmic dawn, as I like to call it, um, probably was punctuated by super massive stars, well beyond the, the limits of normal massive stars of today, that went supernovae quite quickly and spread um, lots of, of, of material around, as well as enough to create black holes and neutron stars, and then and those and the neutron stars can can collide and do other things like there. So it was a pretty chaotic time. Um, the conditions of the universe were slightly different than they are now in terms of temperature and density. So um, some of those we think that some of the population three stars could have become more massive and still stick around. Um, you know, the, the, the pair production supernovae that probably occurred even more frequently in the early universe, um, still ionized radiation and still going on. By the way, those beeps are the, I have a, this is part of an experiment. We're monitoring radiation from the sun. The radiation is putting out, sun is putting out bursts of radiation, normal sunspot stuff. Um, and we're getting cosmic showers as a result of particles reaching the earth. Cool. Pops. Right, so those, those beeps those beeps are when when the um, background radiation uh, exceeds a point four uh, microsieverts per hour. So it says this no one has observed is observing the, the population three stars right currently or um there are candidates only by the, with the eye, of your own eyes. There are candidates for population three stars and the James Webb. Um, uh, stuff is being studied, um, but but this is something that needs to be need to start independent confirmation. Um, uh, so uh, their their population three stars are something that that web is trying to detect, and we certainly have a couple of candidates, but but not a enough of a of a distribution to give us useful data. Yeah. I've also seen it when you have a stellar mass of over 250 solar masses, it the, the whole star could collapse into a into a black hole without even producing a supernova. 
and I've seen some, and uh, maybe not, maybe the very uncertain, but the, 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 these are, are uh, proposed to have been the seeds of supermassive black holes. Maybe we can go into that later. Uh, that's that, that's that's debatable. Um, yeah, that's debatable. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the other thing about about, about supermassive stars is as they approach fusion, right? You've got a blob of material that's 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 falling in from gravity. Um, the speed at which the, the speed at which you have hot material that collapses and, 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 and at some point you get some fusion going on. So you say there's a star starting while it's still collapsing and you can get a massive enough blob that's rushing, that's pulling the material fast enough that whether it forms a star or not, it's kind of a, an academic debate. Um, it'll just collapse to, to do the thing. So. Um, and also there's the possibility of primordial black holes doing stuff, but that's a different, that's beyond the uh, scope of this talk. So we should mention, however, galaxies. So massive stars, bunch of questions because they are, tend to be rare, um, uh, but, but we hope to learn more. We should mention something about galaxies. Um, one thing I should say is that you might remember when we talk about the Big Bang flash and we looked at the cosmic micro background, um, we talked about harmonics of sound waves going through the early universe. And we mentioned at the time of the Big Bang flash, 378,000 years after in, 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 the big, in the Big Bang process, um, that the, the primordial tone the fundamental node, fundamental sound going through the universe had a wavelength of around 500,000 light years across. These rings were about 500,000 light years across. Um, today, these rings are around 550 million light years across. And today, when we look at clusters of clusters of galaxies and their and their distribution, we find bubbles of 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 Clusters of clusters of galaxies in whose bubble size is around 550 million light years across. That is, at the at the largest scale, the universe has has sort of bubble shells of clusters of clusters of galaxies surrounding not much stuff in the center. Those 550 million light year across bubbles, on average started at 500,000 light years across as sound waves in the early universe. Um, today, that that note has been stretched by 1,100 times. Um, and so the fundamental, um, wow, the sun's really putting out lots of bursts. Um, the, 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 the fundamental um, tone of the universe is, is B flat, but 71 octaves below the normal keyboard B flat. Um, it's very long way to it, but, 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 but we do see the early shock waves in the early universe are responsible for formation of clusters of clusters called superclusters surrounding, uh, voids, not much stuff. The, the process of which galaxies form and galaxies form into clusters and clusters form into superclusters is is not fully understood. We have some models. And one of the things that the way Jade was supposed to help us with. So shall we go to the next one? Uh, okay. Uh, no. I, I've seen like many si simulations of like the early universe and you see these like uh, the, 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 the super cluster, the tendrils forming in those yeah. simulations. Yeah. Yes. So we're talking about an era of kind of 300 million years 400 million years is when the galaxies begin to form, we think. Um, it's possible that the galaxies form and then stars from, from the forming galaxies or the way around. Um, but the, the, the point is that galaxies form early in the universe. We think that galaxies might be a slightly later phase than star formation, but we're not sure. Uh, is is there a possibility that uh, the, the, the structure of so, some structure of the of galaxies could have been established before the first stars ignited? 
Well, one of the things that, that we're hoping the web might show us is what we call um, dark galaxies, cold dark galaxies. That is, it'd be nice to see a very massive cloud of material in the process of collapsing to form potentially a core of a galaxy. Um, if galaxies form first, then we should see gas clouds condensing and out of that condensation, little pockets of stars form. The other possibility is that stars, particularly the, the more weird population three stars, um, go supernovae and their shock waves collapse to form galaxies. It's also possible that they form stars. So, so it's, 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 it's to be determined. What we're seeing from the James Webb, and this was actually data they're talking to a, 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 a web, a person who uses the web about a week ago, is that there are lots of really small dwarf galaxies that are early on in the universe. Um, and those galaxies undergo periods of star bursts and quiet. They're, that is, they don't just get a galaxy and then st stars form. They go through periods where the stars appear to be, galaxies appear to be active and forming stars to, to stars that um, uh, will be, um, um, uh, where, where it goes back down into to stars. That, that, that is, the star, the galaxy comes into uh, star formation bursts and then quiets down and bursts and quiets down, bursts and quiets down. Um, they, the thing we're it, seeing it, is... It very, oscillates. It yeah. oscillates between two, sta two states. It's not just that it goes pedal in the middle and turns on, right? Um, well, well, certainly galaxies today don't form stars at the rate that they did be before. It appears that the, that the, that the, that the galaxy goes undergo periods of bursts, sometimes because they're merging, but sometimes because of physics. So let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, you know, back in the days, galaxies were seen as just clouds of stuff. It wasn't until people like Hubble that could actually see individual stars in the nearby galaxies, like Andromeda, that we realized that there are islands of of Stars. We really thought they were just cute little, they're called nebulae, right? Clouds of stuff. We now realize that they actually are piles of stars. And and Hubble was, was classifying nebulae, these, these fuzzy blobs, and he has basically several types of, of classifications we see here. Um, um, I guess oh, the no, previous no. one, you, you skipped one, by the way. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. I'm going to have to be going in a little bit. Okay. We're very near the end. Yeah. <laughs> so let's I was, go to the next one. Okay. Is, is you have to give it the monkey way. There certainly are galaxies that are active. Um, oftentimes because perhaps they get the massive black hole is feeding, going through their feeding frenzy. Mm -hmm. Next one. But I, I, about, about one, like a, one, a few, few slides ago, there was like one image that showed that the, that the population two stars are concentrated in globular clusters and in the center of the Milky Way, while population one stars are in the arms of galaxies of yeah. the Milky Way. So it, are, so, are gl globular clusters like remnants of uh, mergers or something like that? They, they may be the result of cores of, of galaxies that have been merged. Um, two kind of models of galaxy formation towards the end one of them is a top down where where basically a a um they a large gas cloud collapses and it forms a, a a galaxy um the there's things about you know that, that that so the clumps attract gravitationally and and the um it it can't um it can't, um, the gas is not gravitation stable, so it ends up um, forming a bulge in the center and spreads out as, as a disk. Whereas the other way around, the bottom up, is that galaxies form by merging. You get small galaxies that merge together to form big galaxies. Um, so either, either, either gas clouds form, collapse to form galaxies, or small galaxies merge to form big galaxies. 
or, or you can have a combination of both, right? Like I, I, I think mergers are almost inevitable. So at least, so, at least sometimes, like like Andromeda yeah. will uh, merge with our galaxy eventually, right? Yeah. So and, yeah. and 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 big big galaxies like the Milky Way absorb small galaxies. In fact, we detected a number of small galaxies, dwarf galaxies, that have merged with 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 uh, the Milky Way, and and in mapping our, our galaxy. The galaxy formation model, um, let's go flip the next one. And this is the bottom up where, where galaxies merge to form big galaxies, as well as the gas plotting to form small galaxies. So the next one. There are certainly one of the things is that what pro, what what stops the process of contraction, right? Why would a big gas cloud just collapse and form a giant massive black hole? Well, they actually might, but um, perhaps radiation pressure from from stars forming keeps it from collapsing too fast. Perhaps the active the black hole active nuclei pushes stuff out. Perhaps the the dark matter, whatever that is, the excess gravity on the outside pulls it out. Um, but the theories of current galaxy formation are are not successful in predicting this rotation speed and size of galaxies right when we when we look at the theoretical models they don't match reality so we know we're in trouble um and and um the the so the land the cdm model needs refinement because it underestimates the number of thin galaxies in the universe it um it, they predict a large number of mergers, more than we see. And if mergers are, are stuff, the, 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 the problem is the mergers sometimes destroy the galaxies. Sometimes the result is the, the galaxy is, is, not, is not a nice thin spiral, but an elliptical blob. Um, and we don't see that with the, with the, with the distribution. But do, but do, do like a, uh, elliptical galaxies eventually become uh, spiral galaxies over time still or or do they the, remain the, the, the tendency for that to happen so if we just if we just um i guess this is just some some graphs talking about the mergers um this next one whether deaths of stars collapse or 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 other material collapses to, to, to form more massive um uh, black holes is a question Open question. Um, next slide. Um, again, I, I, I found some I found some papers discussing the role of supermassive black holes, like whether we have primordial black holes or whether we have direct collapse black holes, yeah, uh, or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very it, this is a very uncertain area in our in the more recent yeah. history of the universe. In yeah. part, partly because we were able to detect earlier galaxies, galaxies that, are, that are formed earlier in the universe um, and, and also have a much, we also have much these giant surveys to begin to collect lots of data. Um, so going back on redshift, going up in that graph is, is farther back. Um, next one is essentially, again, the notion of, of how um, things like the web or the, a, new, um, a new thing called LISA, which was be a gravitational wave detector in space might help us understand uh, black hole formation and mergers and galactic formation. That like a primordial moment. black holes. Like, yeah, the, like yeah. the, were those the seeds of supermassive black holes? Or an open, were, these, open were the seeds of, of galaxies? Did they help cause star formation? We don't know. Yeah. Um, and but there is, there, is like a, there is an interesting relationship final. between super, supermassive black holes and galaxies. Like there's a, a linear relationship yeah. between the supermassive black hole and the mass of the supermassive black hole and also the mass of the galaxy as the whole as okay. a whole so so, so, yeah, so near yeah, the end of there um one more thing the web shows that early galaxies um you know might have been more spheroid or they might have been and they were all um, small right a yes. smaller as well yeah. they tend to be dwarf but we're seeing bigger and bigger we are seeing more developed spirals early on in the universe it kind of puzzle us so finally we're going to end this this show talking about the the era of dark energy um up until now 
up until the now of, of 6.8, 9.8 billion years uh, in the process, um, what's dominating is gravity, right? And if we go to the the next spot here, we talk about the fact that that the we're, we're entering into a dark energy era where gravity is no longer the dominant force, dark energy is, the universe is accelerating and weird things happen. Um, we're not quite sure, but we know that around four to five billion years ago, um, the universe turned a corner. It was, the rate of expansion was kind of slowing down, but, but now dark energy is taking over and has overcome gravity when it slows stuff down and is accelerating it back up. Yeah, you can see in the in the image on the left, you can see the uh, the the log scale of the age of the universe and the and log scale of the size of the universe. And you can see that oh, it's linear. Like for for for, for every uh, uh, ten to the power of one uh, log age, you have uh, ten to the power of uh, zero point five on uh, about about that increase in size but eventually as you hit the dark energy era where when dark energy becomes the, do the dominate then you the curve shoots upwards the the uh, in these yeah. the ex the universe begins to accelerate the uh, yeah. uh, expansion but, but we have to be careful however because we don't mm, understand dark energy we just see it yeah an effect we don't know if dark energy will continue to do what it does or it will perhaps even reverse. We don't know. Um, if you don't know what dark energy is, you can't say it will expand forever, accelerate forever. Um, it looks like it now, but that's because we really don't understand what dark energy is, uh, other than its effect. It's a, it's it's its existence is well well established by multiple means, multiple observations. The fate of the universe and what it will do, which is not part of BE is is unknown so um sorry for the length of time um uh, stars typically spend billions of years doing what we did in, in a matter of a couple hours <laughs> right, well fast well fast if i if i see questions in chat ask them now or forever hold your peace yeah and, the, and for, the, before you have to before you have to go uh if you have to go right now uh tapioca uh you have anything you want to advertise uh, I will be appearing uh, tomorrow on uh, Bad Science Sunday. Um, I did a relevant show um, on Skeptic Haven this past Thursday, which people might find interesting. We talked a lot about dark matter. So. Um, yes, and 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 the 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 was it? Were were you on the? It's it's mass or it's modified gravity things or... i i personally think it's more likely to be mass but i um i, I think it's it's an open question still it definitely behave like it definitely you can map it and to me that intuitively that seems more like a property of yeah. something that would, would but I... but it could be a field I, I suspect I, I suspect that like the, the, the controversy between mass and mount would also apply to the the early formation of galaxies, perhaps also. Well, the, well, the, dark mond matter. is just one version of modified gravity. I don't I, right. I'm not I'm not a big fan of mond, but there might be other uh like t uh vector no. tensor um versions of gravity apparently mm -hmm. are but, yeah, do, do, do these do, do these different models predict differences in like galaxy formation or well like they, how... they tend to run into problems of reality um, yeah and they tend, and, and, and CMB, as they fail <laughs> yeah they none of them explain none of them explain uh the cmb well the main criticism people have against par um a particle theory of dark matter is that we haven't found the particle yet which i just don't think it's a very good argument against it yeah and we have um, our first question Yes. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, science is very good about it, um, holding on to old names that aren't mm -hmm. very good. So, Planet. Yes. Planet I, what, was, what was the question? Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, the question is, do you think dark energy will get renamed when it gets better understood? From um, uh, Given the history of astronomy, if, if we call planetary nebula, planetary nebula to this day, 
yeah. I doubt that that dark matter would be the stuff. Um, it's always important to say what dark matter is, is excess gravitational fields yes. caused by what? Yes. Uh, excess of what? Excess of what current gravitational models would predict, right? Our current Agre understanding of gravity, we have on average about six times more gravitational interactions than we we can account for with mass. Mm -hmm. Why? I, I, if, Either because 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 there's mass that we don't we haven't detected, so-called dark mass, or because the equations of gravitational things are not correct, or combination of both, or something else. We don't. Uh, if if we learn more about early galaxy formation, perhaps it could, it could also give us more information to uh, come up with a accurate model of gravity. Perhaps right? I, I think the, I think the early galaxy formation will help confuse us more. Yeah, and I think it will help us toss out even more models. Um, the, the 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 dark matter or the excess gravitational fields are very important in galaxy formations and galaxy cluster formations and galaxy supercluster formations. Um, and, and if you want your simulation to produce a universe that's vaguely like today, starting early on, you need to add both the effects of dark matter, excess fields and normal matter. Right. If you if you do one and not the other, you get a universe that doesn't look like anything today. So they're pretty they're both mm -hmm. important. What it is, who knows? Good question though. Uh, well, well, you Len, anything coming up? You want to advertise? Um, yes, on the April twenty seventh at uh, sixteen thirty uh, Pacific time, we have a unnamed tavern, which is not a tavern mini show. Um, and that's on April 27th um, on Chess's channel, also on Chess's channel and in, in, in their, their debate hub. On May 3rd at 13, 1 p.m. Pacific time is a volcano show where we're going to update on what the Kilo Volcano is doing and a little other volcano stuff. Oh, there, there is actually uh, two more questions in the live chat. I, I don't know if you want to uh, uh, sure. answer these. Sure. Oh, like Al Tucker asks, does Mont really have or hold any water? That's what is one question. <sighs> it's so it's too much to get into. <laughs> I, I know. I think the answer is that at one point it looked it, it, it looked quite hopeful, but one of the problems that some Mons run into is binary stars, pairs of stars that are far apart, um, it, wide, so-called wide binaries. They're not behaving like Mond or some Mons do. You have to be careful because some people, you can cook a theory yeah. that match the curve and say, look, I'm right, and be wrong, right? It, it's very, yeah, it's... It, it's a lot. Um, now, now the, the, the part of the problem that particle physics has is that the the standard model of physics is very successful with stuff we know about mm -hmm. but Too successful it, it 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 one does not account for the the the, the gravitational uh, uh, um, effect although gravitation gravity may not be a quantum thing so that that may be okay um two it doesn't count for um it doesn't show obvious what a dark matter particle might be and three it has nothing to say about um, dark energy which is about 69 percent of the universe so the standard model accounts for about four percent of the universe and does very well and I'm, I'm not i'm not dis disrespecting it. it's just that it would sure be nice if they found in cern uh or if one of these other detectors underground are looking for dark matter particles, it'd be really nice if they say, see, there's dark matter stuff. But, yeah. but the problem is the mass that you might say is a dark matter particle has to be stealth, right? Astronomers have never seen dark mass that absorbs light, reflects light, 
or transmits light. Yep. It says that that mass has no temperature, it's not glowing in any, any black body radiation, and astronomers are very good at finding very subtle, faint sources of light or dips in light curves. We, we've never seen dark, so-called dark matter mass do anything to light on any frequency from the no, gamma waves no. to, to, to radio waves. It's complete, it appears to be completely stealth. We, we haven't seen it do anything non-gravitational. Yes. Does it, or don't, does it uh, uh, like uh, get absorbed by black holes? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. No, black holes, I mean, black holes, things that come out of black holes are, one, the gravitational effect, two, mm -hmm. charge, three, spin, and four, Hawking radiation. Um, but, 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 um, you know, from the point of view of, of gravitational mass, right, there's not enough black holes to count for dark matter. So -called. Oh, no, I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that black holes is dark matter. I, I was just wondering whether dark matter can get absorbed by, I'm black sorry, holes. I'm getting a phone call. So I actually do have to like go. Well, well, uh, as I say, uh, your, your question we'll talk to you about the uh, next meeting yep. and chat yeah later. we'll yeah. do see yeah. you guys um right. are you are you saying you're saying before like i i was i was maybe like uh, wondering whether black holes are able to absorb uh, dark matter like it can absorb normal matter well if dark matter is stuff stuff can fall into go beyond the event horizon of black hole if if dark matter is a result of gravitational fields being different than the normal inverse square stuff and general relativity, um, then no. If, if it, if, so, so if dark matter is stuff, stuff can go into a black hole event horizon. If dark oh, matter is is a is a misunderstanding of gravitational effect, then the answer is no. It's it's. Yeah, that, that, could, that could perhaps form a hypothesis to like we can op if we are able we can observe black holes very closely and perhaps we can see like oh it increased in mass but there well, is no fortunately we can't there. observe black right. holes closely right so. right <laughs> exactly unfortunately uh, yeah yeah so we have a we have a b4 the final show uh which is coming at, 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 at on may 18th is right yes um, i i will uh, i will talk about this one second all right Coming up on my channel real fast, uh, in one week, me and my friends we, we, will be reviewing uh, the Saul Trill, the Saul movie series. So if if you have a weak stomach like I do, don't watch that episode. Uh, in two weeks, we, we'll be review. Me and my my new friend will be reviewing the the Ornithian dinosaurs the, slash bird hip dinosaurs. And their fun family tree, and in four weeks we will be having the the, the grand finale of B of, of the Before Earth series, our solar system to the Earth. Earth is here, and that's our finale. So, oh, Landon says he lost connection. Oh, oh. He, he's back. Okay, back, back, back in. Big finale of when the Earth finally gets here. And four weeks from now. Yeah. So B4, we're going to cover a little bit more about supernovae effects and neutron parameter effects and gas clouds forming. We're going to talk about how four and we'll talk about the formation of our solar system in terms of worlds. and finally what happened to formations of planets and what happened to Earth Moon. Ending with about the Earth being really bad. years old. Yeah, we, you're a little rebocky right now, but we'll... Yeah, I, I think the connection is really bad. Sorry. Uh, uh, well, yeah, anyways, it's, we'll it's, talk about that. The connection from... <laughs> yeah. And we'll talk about all this in, in chat, but hope you all have a good time. Never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. We'll see you in next week. Bye. Bye. Just do it. I'll turn out okay. And welcome to our penultimate episode of Before Earth, because I think on 
it looks we're still confirm I'm, I'm confirming this right now. On June twenty second, we'll be having a follow up Q and A, follow up Q and A for our finale. I think so. Sure. We're gonna have a follow up Q and A. Yes, we'll have, we'll have a follow up show. Well, that'll be the after, yeah. the after after show. <laughs> yes, but but while we're waiting for the slice, the finished. Oh, yes, it's done. The upload is finished. Oh, perfect right, right. timing. You're good. All right. So why don't we introduce everybody? Uh, from the top, right? Or First time, first serve. Well, I'm on top. Uh, all right. I I am... Uh, I can... Sorry. I am uh, Michael Vandergraaff, also known as Dr. Tapioca Weasel. Uh, I'm a physicist. But uh, I'm not an astrophysicist. So, yeah, great to be here. And uh, I go by the name of Neslik, but you can call me Nes for short. And uh, I'm not an astrophysicist or a physicist at all. I'm more of a, bi more of a biologist, but I'm very interested in learning uh, stuff about the universe and uh, cosmogony and such. So eager to learn about this. And uh, my name is, I'm Landon Knoll. I uh, wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone and latitude from your astronomer guide uh, to our uh, favorite universe. And we have uh, uh, a fun uh, show today, uh, BE4. Um, there'll be a BE after show thing um, later. I think we've, we've, we've set that date. Um, or have we? June 22nd. I think it was June 22nd. Yeah, because because uh, uh, Vandy is uh, unavailable on the fifteenth. That is correct. So, um, so uh, what? That's June twenty seventh, right? Second, twenty second. All right, mm -hmm. excellent. Um, and that's going to be it. Uh, all right. So um, let's let's act, but let's get started on this. So we we have the E four, and we will. And so we'll go over uh, saying, I need, uh, I need to get present that. Am I doing the present presenting? Oh, uh, I, th I think you're all the way at slide uh, two, two right now. You need to move down all the way down to be four. How do I do? I only have button clicks. Yep, that's, uh, that's how you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Going over to a uh, hundred slides. Uh, oh, oh dear. <laughs> This is why we usually start doing this ahead of time. That's interesting. It takes longer to load. There we go. Yeah, it takes longer to load than, than for hadrons to form in the area. Well, also, it, 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 <laughs> it was rendering on YouTube. I can see it rendering on YouTube, even though for me it like needed a split second, so I didn't see the slides. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's what it's what it is. It's what it is. What can what can you say? Um, nice right. technology. Anyway, so in this episode, the star of our series is finally going to arrive at the end. Yes, literally, our star, our sun, and our moon. Um, about so we're we've because it be and if we look at where we where we are or we have been in the in the show, um, we're in BE four. So. Now, if you remember, BE zero was the uh, that was talking about the Big Bang process. BE one um, in this nice logarithmic scale um, showed you um, all of the various exotic things that occurred, and roughly the 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 roughly the first second or so of the um, of the universe, and then BE two ran through um, the 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 photon epochs and so forth, moving up to the first hundred million years. And then BE3 had some more interesting things where, where we have moved on to um, galaxies and stars and their star evolution. Um, now, today, if we go into, come on, click. Um, um, so this is where we are now. From a linear standpoint, um, we are looking at this last section of of things when uh, interesting stuff happens such as the formation of the earth 
and our solar system. Um, so we're going to have this show today. We'll have a after show, uh, as, as mentioned, scheduled um, on the, remember again, it's on June 22nd. Yes. At the same time. And this will be a time for us to do, we'll just do an extremely brief recap of the uh, history of, of the cosmos and then um, sit back for your questions. So um, if you can't make it there, please leave your questions in the comments below, down, down, that, down there, and uh, we'll get to them. Otherwise, if you happen to be able to join us live at that time, you can ask additional questions about our wonderful universe. So let's move forward. All right. Did it click? Come on. Click again. Let's do one more line. Okay, there it is. Okay. So we'd like to review, first of all, about um, supernovae. And um, in particular, we want to mention, we want to mention that um, on render. So if you remember, we discussed the, the how, you know, the life cycles of stars and we indicated that they end up in, um, typically end up in one of several ways. They can be, uh, stars run out of fuel and collapse, um, and form a, a, a white dwarf with enough mass. They get higher and higher temperatures where the internal the core causes where's going to happen and and for those stars that um, manage to start to fuse iron because that fusion process is is um takes in energy it's endothermic or then exothermic gives off energy um you get a runaway collapse and you get um resulting of either a uh, a supernova that typically produces typically produces um, either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, those supernovae also eject lots of stuff into space and the shock waves hit things and the shade hitting of those things that they hit do interesting stuff. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Other comments? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, the other thing we want to mention is, uh, neutron stars. And you might remember that neutron stars are important, particularly when they collapse. So neutron stars, remember, can be one of the things that can happen when massive stars collapse, running out of fuel at the end of their lifetime. And when neutron stars collide, um, they do lots of things besides uh, uh, generating um, lots of uh, lots of, of you know gamma ray yeah. jets and so forth. Go ahead. I, I think we, one thing we forgot to mention before is like bi binary star systems. Like I believe many, in fact, in fact mo aren't most stars part of a binary system? Most, right? Uh, yes, I'm they're sure. they're they're and and they can uh, those things can um, uh, binary stars have a particular uh, pathway that's different from there. The the I guess the important thing to remember is that. However, the supernova happens, the shock waves produce, um, you know, uh, 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 induce gas clouds to begin to collapse when they hit them. Mm -hmm. In the case of, of, of neutron stars, it doesn't matter how it gets there, the shock wave causes the, the star to form because we're on star formation. In the case of the other thing, however, is that their neutron stars have an have additional process that's, that's I think is, is, is rather important to consider. And that, um, in addition to them creating very energetic um, um, jets, they will also um, um, generate lots of the heavier elements. Um, and because most of what happens, most of the heavier elements um, in the periodic table actually come from come from a combination of either supernovae or uh, neutron star collisions. So if you look at the, in this, this typical periodic table, um, you're seeing that the neutron stars are the things in orange that are, are generating lots of heavy elements. 
Um, there are also um, dying low mass stars as well that can generate certain things. But, but the, the point is that, that a lot of material that gets sent out in these supernova shock waves out of the universe um, are come from combinations of the supernova itself and neutron star collisions. I can see that the, like most of your silver and gold is from neutron star collision. It's yes. pretty amazing to pretty amazing to uh, realize that like the, the gold, like if you have a gold on your uh, ring finger or something like that, that stuff literally came from that yeah. event. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, so those those neutron stars, which are the result of previous older stars collapsing, but but not forming black holes when they collide can generate lots of neutrons uh, the recoil ends up spewing out lots of neutrons radiates things um, through um, this process and produces lots of material in the um, in the uh, in, that we see in the periodic table today yeah. so so combination of supernovae and neutron stars send out shockwaves and send out lots of material that's more than just a primordial hydrogen helium with traces of lithium anything before else was make something before we go on um, I, I just it's not entirely related i guess to the question of the nucleosynthesis um but can you have a collision with neutron stars that between two neutron stars that produces another neutron star not a black hole like how likely is that it's, it is it is possible um depending on where the neutron stars within the, the rates of stuff and depending on how they collide mm. um how you know there's also a matter, matter of their spin and rate of collision how much material goes into the into the um the the the, the accessor body that could result in enough a mass of dense enough to form a black hole or it could form a, a neutron star mm, okay and this is this is a pretty uh, active area of research i think like i remember when when i was very young um it the general sense that i got at least um was that it, it wasn't neutron star collisions. It was pretty much mostly just uh, supernova. And we've really learned and been kind of surprised in the past decades to see how often neutron stars really collide. Yes, and and it was a it was a problem because people were on on your on your nuclear physicists were saying, you know, these these supernovae are are pretty fantastic events, but their ability to create lots of things like platinum gold is somewhat limited mm. and you would have had to have exotic supernovae collapses um uh, lots of them to produce some of these other other materials there and and it wasn't until we said well you know there's actually turns out to be there's actually lots of neutron stars and neutron stars collide more often than you might otherwise would think and that when they collide they spray out lots of neutronium that is you know, neutron stuff and and that neutronium in, in addition to forming atoms of various of various sizes radiates things and and um, transmutes them resulting in lots of material in the uh, periodic table um coming from neutron stars themselves and is this our entire our full set of elemental periodic table is there, is, is there more on here that this is sort of the what, what's this is this particular yeah. table stops at uranium in part because things beyond uranium have half-lives that are so short that right. they don't really figure in cosmology so yes you know you can get high heavier isotopes and no doubt those are created but they decay so fast that they don't really they're not really part of the um and it, the, in this context so fast can also mean uh two million years would yes. count as very it would, it would count as the blink of an eye even though it's yes. uh very long for for us we don't necessarily mean like microseconds or a few minutes uh just not not billions of years basically yeah and uranium um 
all of the elements heavier than uh, bismuth or lead. Um, yes. I think they even found that even even bismuth is actually very lightly radioactive. They all they all decay at some rate, but uh, it could be billions of years long. Uh, uranium two thirty eight has a half life in the billions, yes. I believe. Yes. Um, so it means that the uranium that's found in Earth was not had to have been formed in some number of billion years ago. Obviously, it can be it can go through various half lives, um, but you could have a neutron star collision creating uranium, you know, even as much as like nine ten billion years ago, and and simply there's less uranium from that collision than than uh, uh, today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but but if you have a uh, material even something like you know like uh, plutonium that has plutonium 242 it has i think a 24,200 year half-life um that is so small uh, short of a time frame compared to cosmology um, that it's really difficult to transfer plutonium that plutonium will have decayed um and as you said everything lead and below has stable have stable isotopes Except some for of those <laughs> things that are reactive will decay and so um if you're generating uranium and transuranic stuff in a neutron star collision it will end up decaying and turning into um you know these these you know, in, into um lighter material or, or stuff down the periodic table um including stable stuff uh, maybe a, a bit off-topic question. What is going on with element 43 and 61? Yeah. Um, those things are, those things are, um, those particular elements are so radioactive that um, they, they don't have a stable element. <laughs> don't have a stable element at all. And um, so, so if they're created, and no doubt they will be within um supernovae and neutron star collision stuff um their material is so so vain and in fact i think it was a case of of um is it is it was it te43 that um that that you know, the estimate is in on on earth or maybe only like two or three atoms uh i don't think it's that rare um because right. it, it doesn't, it doesn't it decay, it? right? If something decays into it, it decays fast. Oh, you mean at, 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 at any, any one time, time, at any one second, there are only two or three atoms on, on the whole Earth that, that, oh. that, that go, that, that transition through this element when they decay, go through, through a decay chain, basically? Um, because the, 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 um, the isotopes I thought were um for for this we're, we're quite quite one of them has a 4.2 million year half-life okay uh, so obviously i'm wrong there yeah 97 okay. so there should be i think there are uh it okay it's, it's 0 0.003 parts per trillion on earth um a, okay, a kilogram so a, a kilogram of uranium contains an estimated one nanogram or about 10 trillion atoms of technetium so yeah it it does exist okay uh, I, I, was, even, I was i, I said it corrected but it it's it's uh at a low enough sort of thing that it's uh still clearly radioactive its most stable element is has a half-life of 4.2 million years, which is, you wouldn't want to eat something like that. <laughs> you don't want to eat uranium either, but for all I know, um, I don't actually know if it's the radioactivity or the heavy metal poisoning that gets you. Not I, thought, I, I believe it's the heavy metal poisoning, mostly not, with uranium, yeah. Not, yeah maybe, I, not without ketchup at least. <laughs> and maybe there was think about like, like Francine or one of those things that, that there there are I know those those two elements, um 43 and 61, I think were one of the last of the holes in the periodic table that was discovered. Um, mm -hmm. um they certainly mentally if um thought they should exist. 
and they were searched. They're not naturally, naturally occurring and are you know, result of radioactive decay. So um, scratch that bit about, about a couple atoms. There's a, there's another, there is another, um, um, there, there's something as, a, as another thing. Um, hold on a second. I'm just kidding. I have, I have, I, there is some storm that I've got to, to a solar to, storm. No, it is a, it's a twist storm that I've got to, I've got to, um, somebody made a, made a point of, 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 there's several people that are keep pinging on, on there. So I apologize for all those pings. Um, I really shouldn't be presenting here. I should be doing other things, <laughs> but okay. Um, let's move, let's move on. Any other questions, comments? No. no. Um, I have. Um, Maybe click on alert. the screen first. I have to. I have to. I have to hide alerts. I was getting oh. floods of alerts from this thing, so I was unable to Ooh. click on it. Um, sorry. All right, back to here. So let's talk about uh, planetary system formation and nebular hypothesis. Who wants to? Yeah, I I, fo I found this when I was to ma making some slides, and I found that like one of the first people who proposed uh, uh, like uh, one of the uh, hypotheses that we, we even accept today about the uh, formation of the of our solar system and also. Uh, Exoplanetary systems, in the, by extension, was proposed by Immanuel Kant. Okay. Yeah, and he proposed that, uh, like they, they knew about nebula, but he was the first one to connect the, uh, uh, the, the connect that, that, that our solar system was probably formed from those nebula that, that they could observe, and that would explain. Uh, Basically, the, the the collapse. Like we will explain, we will go to that in the later slides. But when a nebula collapses, it collapses such that uh, every single planet in, within that system will uh, orbit in the same direction around the star. Basically, of course, we will we will do it in the next slides. And uh, as the slide as the slide says here today, this is the most widely even today the most widely accepted explanation for planetary system formation. And it's some pretty neat uh, pictures about a planetary nebula, the Orion Nebula, one of the most beautiful yes. nebula in the, now, in, now, in the night sky. Now, in these nebulas, unlike previous nebulas, and our current nebulas now, there are more heavier elements, not just hydrogen and helium. There, we, at this point, right. we, we have, uh, have the higher elements now in our nebulas. And they are they are uh, the, m still mostly the primordial hydrogen and helium sprinkled with a bit of uh, death uh, stardust yeah. basically yeah the vast uh, still the majority of it is going to be hydrogen uh, and helium uh, because that's sort of the nature yeah of, uh, nine it says ninety nine percent plus yeah. I, I don't know, like, it, it, like how how much of the of the nebula is proposed of uh, original hydrogen helium? Like, I, I probably when when a star goes supernova, I would still guess that that, that that stuff also still contains a lot of helium and hydrogen still, right? When a star, yeah, goes. I mean, most of the hydrogen and helium, um, I I think is original, I in the universe, mm -hmm. I. Yes. I um, it, it, it was uh, never part of, it was, like most was still never part of a star basically yes or, yeah. Or, or yeah or a bigger atom uh because when you when you get the heavier elements that decay they do put off um alpha uh particles which are are helium nuclei um so maybe there is a actually a, a sizable chunk but i think it i think it's mostly a rounding error yeah um i will I got a, another message from from a colleague who's screaming at me saying, you know, that that my my miss my misstatement about elements forty three and sixty one, 
Um, the element 61, however, they say it is quite rare on Earth. Um, they're estimated only about 500 grams in Earth's mm. crust at any one time. Um, yeah. Fairly. So they're not, they're essentially, you're not going to find them naturally. And again, if they get produced, they will, de they will decay um, relatively quickly, depending upon whether, whether you're a patient or you're, um, or you're on a cosmological scale. Yeah. So, so, so move on. Yeah. Yes. No, real fast. Who is this guy? Emmanuel oh, Kant, Emmanuel famous Kahn. physicist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's the he famous philosopher. A philosopher too. Uh, yeah, he was also a philosopher. Like no, back, he back wasn't then. a physicist, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, like back then, back then, uh, the difference between a scientist and a philosopher were uh, less distinct as today. <laughs> well, it was also a term called you know called so they 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 used used terms like natural philosophy mm -hmm. uh, back in those days. Um, yeah. But so, um, go on. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the um, uh, you've got these big gas clouds, and one of the things that I, I remember I took an astrophysics class in uh, undergrad, and the rotation rate if if you have like a a giant molecular cloud and that extends uh, like a couple of light years or something maybe the actual rotation rate they're very 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 slow they're literally like out at some distance if i'm remembering correctly which i could be not um they're rotating at like the tangential velocity is on the order of centimeters per second yes it's incredibly tiny like an entire rotation would take mo like many billions of years they don't in it's sort of in that sense yeah. Of course, of course, millions like of, uh, millions it, of it's, years, it, it, millions of years, they, they slowly rotate, mm -hmm. but I think it is on a millions of year scale. Yeah, well, because then when they collapse, you get the uh, the ballerina effect, right? And they, it it yes. it goes much faster and faster and faster because uh, a small, a very small rotation rate when you have an extremely large body um, or cloud uh, will ha it still has an enormous amount of angular momentum because it's just got a, this enormously long lever arm. And so basically any amount of rotation is going to necessarily result in rapidly rotating smaller yeah, yes. objects. And yeah. it's also like, it's also important to know that, that we, like in the cloud, you have different particles moving in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Like some particle may move in this direction or some particle or, or gas, dust, cloud, dust particle, whatever may move in another direction. But the point is that if you add up the the uh, momentum of each of these particles, the angle, the, the, the sum of angular momentum is not zero. Like if the, sure. it, it, ha it has to be like in, in order for it to be per, it, uh, there is no such thing as a perfection. Any non-zero angular momentum, as you said yourself, any non-zero angular momentum means that the you have a, you, when it coll collapses, it will be, uh, it will amplify that uh, spin basically, and and eventually produce a accretion disk because the like uh, per things perpendicular to the angular momentum cancel each other out. They will fall into the star, but things that rotate with the angular momentum don't cancel each other out. So they will keep orbiting around. Uh, yes, the, the star, and that's so how you, and that's how you disk. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good point because because the collapse is not simply it just piles in to form a black hole and everything's gone, right? It you, you get a star formation, but you also have material that has enough angular momentum that doesn't spiral down into where the star is going to form, and this is where your planetary system is going to form. And remember also, the reason why this thing is is collapsing in the first place is off. Because some other supernovae or event has sent a shockwave through the, the gas cloud, and that shockwave has collapsed, has, has has pushed material together and began a a, a justification, right? A lump. Does, does, does it also? I would imagine that it also changed the angular momentum of the gas cloud itself too. Well, it's imparting a force, so it will yeah. it will have a yeah. Like the, the, does the, the, does the, uh, the, 
the magnitude of angular momentum also affect the solar system formation like if it, obviously if the angular momentum just happens to be perfectly zero which is almost like i don't think it's ever the case then everything would collapse into the star basically but of course if you have faster angular momentum maybe you have more planets i I'm, i'm not sure um i don't i don't know that i don't know that there is a a a well understood connection between the amount of sort of angular momentum in the um in the giant molecular cloud uh that collapses and the number of planets generally giant molecular clouds like form they form multiple um stars yeah. i think yes yes that's correct yeah um, like the uh the beautiful picture that we saw of the orion nebula uh, I mean, it's also, I mean, it's a giant cloud of stuff and, and, you know, parts of that are going to be, can collapse and form things, um, there, like, like that whole thing isn't necessarily, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but locally it's all going to be sort of turbulent. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you'll inside there, there are num there are many stars mm -hmm. that are, um, that are in process of have formed and our process of, 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 of forming, you know, because the, 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 and, and giving a scale of stuff, um, you know, it, it is a fairly, it's a fairly large, um, a large objects. And, um, you know, the, 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 the radius of the, of the main Orion nebula is about, um, uh, 12 light years across. Um, uh, for for the dense material, that's it's not the not the you're 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 seeing in you're seeing in there um, uh, it's it's the dense bright part which is the nebula. The rest are are stringing out that's a little bit farther away from from it, um, and and so there is but there certainly are a lot of of protostars being being generated down inside the core of uh, the right nebula as it's as they're um, taking birth indeed so but when, when they start collapsing though um it it's interesting because the the they don't initially the cloud is supported sort of in hydrostatic equilibrium the pressure uh just of, of the gas supports it from collapse but when you compress it to like a um a little bit more you perturb it just enough then it the gravitational force is stronger than the pressure and it it collapses and it collapses almost almost in like a free fall fashion if i recall yes. it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, no, it's a snowball effect it, it, it starts to contact more gravity gets gets stronger and and and, uh, and the gravity gets stronger faster than the uh the yeah. temperature uh, temperature will like in trying to inflate it back it cannot it yeah. cannot stop it from collapsing yeah. basically yeah and, yeah and it's also radiating yeah, yeah. oh, oh uh, one thing we can also mention like i want uh can you go back one slide uh for a few of just for a few seconds previous slide. yes like in the last in the last sentence i uh put there that uh, the like uh, it, th this collapse explains why everything in the in the solar system's orbits in the same direction. But it also explains why mostly most planets are also rotating with the same angular momentum, except that there are a few exceptions. Like I think Venus, uh, Venus uh, rotates uh, very slowly in the opposite direction, basically, probably due to a collision during the formation. Yeah. 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 And so this process here, you know, certainly um, Kant um, in his 1755 publication hypothesized this might be happening um, and gave some 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 vague guess things as to why it's possible. But but as um, we began to better understand um, formation of of nebula and star formation, and then had you know better observations than what was available in the in the mid 1700s um we now have you know, that, that 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 process has now elevated up um and and we are now reasonably certain about planetary system formation because we have lots of uh, examples of it 
So it has elevated stuff. So so um, let's move on to talking about the um, the planetary system formation, right? Uh, so these I, are a few a few examples of observed uh, protoplanetary disks. Yeah, where where it was just a concept. Now we actually have observational things backing up yeah. this process. And there are many, many more. Like I, I found like uh, like uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of Im images out there. And these are the two yeah. that I found pretty yeah. cl clearly. Like in, in the left, uh, this is the same nebula that you previously saw, the Orion, the Orion nebula. nebula. Yes, yes. Yeah. And and there you'll see those nodules, those knots that are um, in process of forming um, planetary systems. And as you mentioned, the angular momentum of things, you know, things that, are, that, that, that have an, enough angular velocity that they don't collapse into the star is where the, the where planetary disks can form. Yeah. And again, it is what yeah. it is that is, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's sort of a, a disk of loose material that's only going to go for a further, further process. And on the right, you can even see like a rings on, on the planetary disk. This, this yeah. probably means that there is like a, 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 a forming planet within those dark bands that are gobbling up the uh, material, probably. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, that's exactly what it means. Okay, move on to the next one here. Um, so as I say, the... the Formations of, of, of planetary systems is is wide and, and, and quite wide and quite varied. I think probably the thing that's happened in maybe the last half century of planetary science is we've gone from a, a notion that perhaps planet, planets are rare to now knowing that planets are quite common. And in fact, given the mapping of, of planetary systems within, let's say, the first thousand light years or so, which is typically um, sort of that, that pushes the limit in terms of being able to easily detect a planet. Um, we, based upon that volume of stars, we know now that stars um, greatly great outnumber planets, um, given assuming that that this volume that we're in is, is typical. Um, we know that our galaxy of around 200 billion stars contains at least one trillion planets. There's at least five, at least five planets for every star. Um, not that every star has planets, but that's that's the that's a population ratio. Yeah. And it's also and it's also uh, uh, notable to mention that the most common planet, I think yeah, that's one slide later actually that you also show okay, but, the most the most common planet that we find are super Earths rocky planets that are like larger than our own planet but, but of course that, that doesn't mean that they are habitable probably well, most are probably not not happy well, that's, that's yeah. not quite okay we're jumping ahead and let's let's that, that's not yeah. quite correct but but oh but, all right but but, all right. but we'll, we'll we'll get there so so the point is that 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 this table shows um a thing for for some of the some of the um represent graphical representation of some of the planetary systems that that is mission called kepler found that they came in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, distances from their parent stars, and of what of what we've detected. And again, the key thing is what we detect. Um, let's if we if we move on to talking about um, talking about about uh, what we detect. Um, the the this this next graph. Come on. There it is. Yeah, um, that's the graph. Yes. Shows you what we've detected. The problem is that um, it's very difficult to detect um, small, low mass planets. Oh yeah, there may there may be a bias there. Like uh, we, we we're probably missing a a, la a large fraction of smaller planets. So maybe smaller planets are a lot more common than we think. Yeah, and so, and so, while there are simulations that suggest that's the case, um, it is it is it's prob probable that um, um, uh, d rocky dwarf planets and icy dwarf planets are probably the, the most common object out there. Um, but but you know the the simulations and observations tend to agree. 
but it's it's likely that as we get better detection, we will find that the terrestrial planets um, will come up in proportion to the super Earths, and then the the sub the dwarf planets will come up in proportion to Earth planets. Um, but that's that is that remains to be seen. Any other comments? Um, this this graph here, exoplanet size in Earth radius is Neptune only four times bigger than Earth. It is relatively compact. Nef Neptune is actually, um, although it's more massive than Uranus, it is it is uh, it is a fairly compact size. Um, I didn't realize they were that. Small. I mean, it, it Neptune's uh, Neptune's radius. Uh, you're talking about the equatorial radius is about three point eight to three point nine, about three point nine Earths. Wow. But its mass is around 17.2 Earths. So it's a lot more massive. Um, we might be getting to this later in the slides, I forget. But is there a reason, are we talking about reason why the more gassy planets are on the outside and the, and the rocky yeah, yeah. planets are on the inside? We, we will get to that, yes. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the next thing here. And we're going to talk about the formation of our solar system, which if remember started with a lot of it started with a lot of, of, of hydrogen um, and a fair amount of helium and some lithium present. Come on, move forward. Um, so that that's that's you know material the gas out there, but then some heavier elements came from supernovae and neutron star collisions. That that got impugned into the gas cloud, and due to gravity, they collected the matter that 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 wasn't in the in the sun was collected in a pebble-sized and boulder-sized chunks. So you got you know local gravitational accretion. We're talking about material that didn't go into the star as enough angle momentum to stay out of the star. Um, yes, and then those small boulders um, accrete. To form planetesimals of a few kilometers in size, um, as as they essentially you know create these sort of rolling dust bodies, gathering up material in their in orbital zone, and over over some period of time, um, probably in these several hundred thousand years, those planetesimals run into each other, collapse, and deform into sort of spherical spherical sized objects, which are the the planets starting off with dwarf planets and accreting up um, from there. And this, this this image is a very good image to show uh, uh, all of the planets and also many of the moons and dwarf planets. Like Ceres is very tiny there, <laughs> and, yes. and you can also see that the Earth is about yeah one fourth the size of the ga gas yes. the ice giants. Yeah. But Jupiter's yeah. are, are, Jupiter and Saturn are, are obviously much bigger. But of course, this image shows you how they compare in terms of size. But if you, but later we will see how their orbits compare to each other. Yes. Yeah. What, is that, what is that little planet size thing between Jupiter and Saturn? Oh, those, those are the moons. Those are the uh, moons. Like yeah. like and, so, and, so, yeah, yes. yeah. and so, one of the things in particular you talked about. You know, our our solar system um, contains this might shock people over a hundred and ten uh, planets as defined in the geophysical model. You might say one hundred and ten. Did you I make a mistake? Know. An answer is no. Um, did 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 not make a mistake. The geophysical definition. Of a, of a planet includes a, an object large enough to deform itself into a spheroid that's not orbiting a fuser like a star. And and in some cases, some natural satellites of a planet we call moons. But some of those larger, larger, some of those larger moons are big enough to also be fit the geophysical definition of a planet. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the effectively if you say in our solar system 
round things, circle round things that 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 are that are um, you know uh, not fusing elements, right? So so again, geophysical definition: they're large enough to deform to form into a steroid, and, and they're not fusing it's, elements. It's internal, like a, yeah, it's internal gravity is strong enough to compress it to down into a sphere. Yeah, but they are not fusing elements. Let me be, be clear: they're not. They're not a fuser. They're not fusing elements to form a star, um, you know, like like a, like a, like a fuser does, right? So so they're large enough to deform themselves in the steroid, not fusing elements, um, and and, um, and 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 orbiting with within a and within within our solar system, um, you have an object like Ceres, which which was called minor planet is now called a dwarf planet. Um, because it's round enough to have to form to basically be in a ball shape. And um, Ceres, sort of, Ceres is in the middle of the asteroid belt. Yeah, it, Ceres is is one of the the, the dwarf planets in the asteroid belt. Um, mm -hmm. So Pluto is a dwarf planet, and it, it orbits out out mostly beyond Neptune, although it crosses a little bit inside it at times, um, and as well as Charon, as well as our moon. Um, is a dwarf planet of uh, uh, Io, Ganymede, Callisto, those those things. Now the small rocky bits around, um, you know, that that those the Phobos and Deimos, those two sort of captured, believed to be captured asteroids orbiting Mars, are not um, dwarf planets. They're they they are not big enough to have warped themselves into a steroid. So yeah, they, they, they look like asteroids, like a, they are, they have like elongated shapes. They look like the classical asteroid, yeah. So again, if it's big enough to form itself in a steroid and it's not fusing elements, then it's not a fuser. Um, it can meet the physical geophysical definition. So people want to ask, you know, is 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 Pluto a planet? The answer is yes, Pluto is a planet. What type of planet is a dwarf planet? And you say, Well, I thought I heard IU, blah blah blah. No. The people the the, the, the people that, that planetary science has come up with this definition and the definition is not based on where it is, but what it is. And so Pluto is a dwarf planet. What do you mean dwarf planet? It's, dwarf is a type of planet. And I, I also found the NASA definition very convoluted. Like according to that definition, it, it, like uh, Jupiter is currently a, a planet, but if you uh throw it out of the solar system it no longer becomes a planet anymore because it, it doesn't have an orbit anymore but nothing that, that, about jupiter changes yeah it's, it's very weird <laughs> so that that's why the geophysical definition is is as adopted by planetary sciences um talk about uh properties of planets so if a planet is ejected from its planetary of its, its, its of its solar system it's then it becomes what's called a rogue planet right Mm -hmm. So these are modifiers, right? That just like dwarf stars yeah. are, are stars, and and dwarf galaxies are galaxies, dwarf planets are planets. Pluto is I, a dwarf planet. Ceres is a dwarf it, it, planet. It moon, it our moon is a dwarf planet. Um, Io mm -hmm. is a dwarf planet. That's 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 and and when you start adding up all of those all those 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 objects, you end up with something like you know over 110 um, objects. In our solar system, that qualifies as a dwarf planet. Okay, moving on. Where does right. the wandering planet come from? I thought it was wandering stars, but that stars were called wandering. Planets. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the the original uh, term for planet. It was like uh, how do you call it? Uh, Aster Asteroid planet. Uh, like I don't, yes. I don't know what the original phrase was in Latin, but or, mm -hmm. or Greek. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, it, it the phrase meant wandering star, and then the the word wandering was basically planet, and then we kept the word wanderer as as a name for the for those yeah. objects. Was that yeah. that that was back when we thought we were the center of the universe? Yeah, yeah. Like like we looked we looked in the sky and we saw stars. And the stars that did didn't move, they were fixed stars, and the stars that did move were wandering stars, and those are the planets. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um this thing is for so against that again that these these objects within solar systems orbit at at different different rates. 
different different distances. Um, there's there's you know Kepler's law of motion talking about the relationship between the um, the the speed at which it goes around the parent body and its distance. Right. There's there's a nice um, Kepler relationship. This talks about some of the larger planets there. Obviously, it misses a lot of the dwarf planets um, because if you if you put in all the dwarf planets, this light gets quite busy. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it shows the uh, it, shows, it shows the scale scale of the orbits to the proportional. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the the sun and his birth uh, things um, that 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 uh, I mean, you want to talk about this the the birth the birth cluster. Oh yeah, yes. Like uh, again, another beautiful example of a. Uh, of a nebula, or in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's often be called a stellar nursery because it's a very, very active place where new stars form the pillars of creation. And look at another beautiful image that we get from, I believe it's another Hubble image, right? That one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, mm -hmm. there's a massive star that's not in the frame, but above the frame, um, whose radiation pressure is, is stripping away the, the gas material. Um, gas material is already collapsed down into in other places into these little nodules, these 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 protoplanetary um, and protostar systems, and they are in the process of of, of accreting and 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 material is falling into the to the center um, to the process of beginning to create a star, as well as the material that's that's orbiting around that center is in the process of forming those planetesimals. Yeah. Also, one thing that this slide uh, wants to convey is that our uh, there is like we find the uh, decay products of uh, I believe aluminium twenty six and iron sixty, and these decay products are uh, or these elements are very rare and they are only produced by uh, stars that go supernova, and they are and they, they decay very quickly. So what this suggests is that. Our star, like our solar system, was born in a stellar nursery that contained hundreds or thousands of other stars in the same stellar nursery. And the, re and the reason why we think this is because uh, supernova are fairly rare, like one in a few hundred go supernova. So in order for the odd, for the odds to add up, is that we our solar system had to also have been present within the same yeah. environment as the, as the supernova as well. So is there any particular reason why we named the plants after the Roman gods? We it's, didn't. The people who worshipped those gods did. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. traditions. So back, say, with, with the business of the, um, you're talking about of, of, of stars, the, the stellar nurseries, kind of come in, in, in various shapes and sizes and depending on the shape and size and the shock waves that hit it, um, you can have, you know, uh, the nursery coming completely um, developed in, in forming stars or you can get stars forming, let's say, on the edge of a nebula. And those stars in turn, the, the, the birth of the stars can create further shock waves. So I mentioned that supernovae are are important in the beginning collapse of gas clouds. Another process that once stars start forming in a nebula is other stars. So in this particular object here, the object that's, that's sitting there um, on the left, the pillars of creation, there's a much more massive star above whose light pressure is causing further collapse of that, of that gas cloud. Um, so, an additional factor that that comes into play is is stars their birth you know the, the, the but basically when the stars sort of quote switch on they push out the radiation pushes out um in addition causing further collapse of around it that can form um um other planetary systems and other uh, stellar systems yeah i think that the picture on the right there um showed that, that like makes it uh very clear that tail there is it, it's sort of like the the star is almost acting like a comet yeah 
like it's the same effect that creates a comet's tail. Uh, and yeah, it's it's really cool. What are these other things? Um, are are these all other just like stars, presumably? Um, there are, I, I, I think I so. Yeah. I don't know where yeah. that picture was was. I'm not familiar with that particular um, object area, right. but but those are probably proto oh. stars. That's um, the same. That's HL Tari. That's the same. Um, so I think I think the one of these stars might be um, the the disk that you showed earlier. Yeah, okay. I think it's the same. The same. It's the same object, but a diff different image. Yes. Yeah. This is also another interesting uh, thing that I found. Uh, so it has been suggested that the, the collapse, like uh, as you mentioned before, that uh, uh, neighboring stars, when they form or or die, like when they when they die into supernovae, or or if they when they uh, are born, they push out against the surrounding gas. So it has been suggested that the, that the collapse of our uh, solar system has been triggered by one of those shock waves, yeah, either, either yeah. a shock wave of a supernova or the wind produced by the birth of another star. Or a combination and, of the two. Or a combination yeah. of those, yeah. Yeah, and also neutron star collisions also have mm -hmm. have, yes. have a factor on that. There are other things. Um, you can have active galactic nuclei with a, with a massive black hole that's that's active, sending out jets. So, so those are also you know, some of the processes that can form for cause cause collapse. Come on, next. Um, so the also oh, in, in the previous slide you saw. Oh, sorry about that. In the previous slide you see this uh, the totem, which uh, is uh, basically the uh, the uh, a god from the Aztec. Uh, Tribe that uh, that uh, is is the is the mother of uh, of the sun basically. In this and and the, and the hypothesis yeah. that our yeah and the hypothesis that our our solar system collapsed due to a uh, shock wave or something from another star it, it refers to that to that uh, hypothesis the the name of that uh, deity yes. Um. So our like in our solar system, um, we we were certainly affected by a neutron star merger um, that why because again if you look at the periodic table of elements and you look at what we find on earth and elsewhere in our solar system we find a lot of material that was actually um, you know rocking material and other elements that that are that came from a neut neutron star merger or mergers can be more certainly more than one it's almost like a like a domino effect type thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, next. Uh, this um, is, yeah. This is another uh, uh, like uh, as mentioned before. Like our sun was probably a uh, one of many sisters, hundreds or thousands within the forming within the same. Uh, stellar nursery but uh, si since our formation we have drifted apart and we don't know which star is our, our, our sisters because they drifted in different directions and they orbit the galaxy so within the the so our sun almost certainly formed in a stellar nursery um, of multiple multiple stars uh, since there are, are the sun has formed we have probably traveled around. We've we've gone, we've orbited the the galaxy probably at least twenty times, if not more. And uh, what we know is that that if there are, you know, if, if we could find other stars that are that that came from that same gas cloud that our sun formed in. Um, we're likely to find similar element materials, right? The elements that, that got stuck into there from the point of view of supernovae and neutron star collisions, they probably have a similar element mix. They certainly would have a similar age to our sun. And if things progress like they do, they might have similar interesting planets. So this notion of finding the, the siblings of our sun has been a, a thing going on for quite some time. 
um, for or quite an interest, but it became um, somewhat practical to start to search for it through to a mission called Gaia, which was a, a European Space Agency mapping that tends to map about 1% of luminous objects in, in our galaxy, get a notion of how our galaxy is actually forming by measuring very accurately position and velocity of stars in our yeah. galaxy to try and, and, and as well as classifying lots of objects. Um, there'll be other, other surveys, like for example, um, other telescope surveys that will try to classify and find si stars of similar ages with similar isotope mixes that might also be yeah. the siblings yeah. of our sun. So, so like a, almost like a DNA test to see which ones are our are, are, are brothers and sisters stars. Yeah, in some ways. Um, so, so moving on again, um, you tend to have a distribution of material when when the star switches on when 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 fusion begins in earnest in the in the center mass, um, uh, the the radiation pressure pushes material out. Now, those that material that's gravitationally bound forms a star, but things beyond the star get pushed out. Basically, it pops. It feels it's almost like it pops a bubble in the planetary in in the planetary disk um, of of the lighter gases. So the hydrogen helium gets pushed out far and then beyond that the the star's ability to heat stuff um uh diminishes and so you get what's called a frost line so you have sort of the you have an intral central region um that's been that's been evacuated around the star and the frost line now, in the case of our planetary system jupiter is that bubble right that, that, that if you think about the sun switching on the pressure pushing out material um, and it was able to more effectively push out hydrogen helium. The bubble it popped, the edge of that bubble became Jupiter. And, and that's why Jupiter is so left massive. Inside in the, that's left inside is, is more of the, the heavier materials that form the rocky planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, by the time when, when, when Jupiter formed at the edge of the bubble, right, um, its mass was sufficient that it began to accrete and pull in material from the asteroid belt. And as a result, the asteroid belt was only able to form one planet, Ceres, the dwarf planet, and the rest were just too small to be able to accrete to form anything, anything of, of any particular size. So Jupiter kind of rip, ripped off um, the material that could have been forming a planet at the asteroid belt. It even did effectively stealing a lot of material from um, from Mars, so that Mars is also rather anemic in its in its uh, density and mass. And, and uh, I believe, and I believe Jupiter also uh, causes the uh, the astro asteroid belt to not be able to co coalesce into one object, right? So that, that's what it, it keeps the asteroid dispersed from each other. Well, there's not enough material to be able to accrete. It was it oh. was too too thin to be able to do. And do the accretion, but even you know, even the case of of Ju of of, Mar of Mars, excuse me, Mars is only about one tenth the mass of the Earth, um, and and it's it's so it's a fairly light as far as rocky planets go. Um, in, in, in terms of in density, fact, how de how dense is it? I mean, compared to it's, Earth, it's it's it's. Its density is. I think that the the density set is. I forget compared to Earth. Um, what is the mean density is around four grams, three point nine grams, if I recall, per cubic centimeter, as opposed to Earth's. Um, that so so the mass of the of Mars is about one tenth the Earth. Oh. Its radius is about 0.5, about a little over half the size radius for the Earth. So it's got a lot more volume. It's got it's got fifteen percent of the of the fifteen percent of the Earth's volume and ten percent of the mass. Right. Is that this? Is that the same reason why the Kuiper Belt didn't, didn't coalesce together? I mean, again, it's a matter of there. You didn't have a you did not have a dominant object that began vacuum up the the. Uh, the planetesimals. Uh, if you 
And if you if you have a large enough object in the vicinity, then everything will co eventually uh, collapse no. into that object, basically. Yeah. yeah. Remember so, again that matter collected began in the early part of a planetary uh, a stellar system um, starts collecting sort of pebble sized, bowl sized chunks. And those chunks accrete to form planetesimals a few kilometers in size. And those planetesimals then uh, begin to collide and coalesce to I, over a period of several hundred thousand years to be, get enough mass to form an object. Right. And so when they, when, when you have an area that's relatively thin, um, your pebbles aren't going to be able to accrete very fast. Um, and, and even the planetesimals are not, are thin enough that they're not going to coalesce to form a planet. I, okay. How, how, what's the difference between how, how do, do they, I don't say, I don't say decide, but you know, that's a, that's a bad word for it, but to, to either, you know, accrete together or to just to orbit each other. Uh, I think we will go into the uh, later slides that well. Yeah, we will right. go into that. Okay. All right, next. Uh, this is uh, like more details about the frost lines. Actually, you have, you have several frost lines. Like you have, you have one line where uh, rocks can uh, exist. And then beyond the one, you have, you have the snow line where uh, ice can form, and then further out, you've also a uh, a ca carbon monoxide line where, uh, like, even more volatiles like ammonium and such can yes. uh, condense. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see this thing here for our system, um, we had material where that 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 snow line is is way out in the Kuiper belt, but the 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 the, the we have a a particular um, a a accumulation line a little beyond the asteroid belt of some of the lighter material, but but again, Jupiter then kept forming and ripped off and sucked in material from that mm -hmm. that wasn't able to accrete very very effectively. And it also explains like the, the a dichotomy that we observe among the asteroids. Like we asteroids are mainly two different types, the NC types and the CC types. The NC types are non-chondritic and the CC types are chondritic meteorites. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chondritic basically means they contain more carbonaceous and are, they are also often a lot more wetter and the non-carbonaceous yeah. are more drier materials. And yeah. You can also see in, in, among the uh, non Carbonaceous meteorites. You have also different. You also see differentiation. Some are uh, iron, like uh, very highly rich in iron, and some are very deplete in iron. And these indicate that they were once part of a a planetoid where some material, so like the iron, was sinking down inwards, and the, but then later on. These planetoids were ripped apart, and that's why some you of these to, objects, yeah. however, yeah. Are, are are primordial, right? So, so not yes. every not every um, not every body out there is there. Now, a lot of of of, of meteorites and and meteors that, that reach the Earth are are you know there's a bunch of them that gets formed when asteroids collide and shatter and pieces fly off. Um, but there's a number of them also that are primordial that are essentially the original those original yes chunks that never got into a a planetesimal or planetesimals collide and pieces of them fly off and form those small chunks again yeah the the, 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 pristine, the pristine meteor meteorites are probably the chondritic ones they're the, also among the oldest objects basically yes you can also see in, in the image on the right top yeah in the previous yeah. slide on the right top yeah yeah all right so next Oh, this is on slides uh, showing like, some of the mechanisms of accretion. Like first, you start with the uh, dust grains that stick together basically by uh, uh, electric uh, molecular forces like Van der Waals forces or maybe uh, uh, ele ele electrostatic forces that will clump the, uh, small grains together. And I think we also observed, like there's one famous video of people in the ISS, they put basically sugar, I think, sugar or coffee mix in a in a bag, a plastic mm -hmm. bag, and they shaked it. They shake the bag, and then when they stopped, 
you saw these grains of sugar and coffee grains uh, sticking together, basically, on the ISS. Sure. Yeah. And that also is uh, going to be affected by um, them being in a, I, I think, generally speaking, a fairly thin gas at best. Uh, mm -hmm. Dust grains behave differently under vacuum compared to... Yeah, also, yes. Okay. And, uh, Oh, I, I, well, sorry, sorry. But, but uh, there's a, one, one more slide in the one more thing to put, note in the previous slide. Sorry about that. Like uh, uh, those first those uh, molecular forces get you up to about one millimeter of grains, but then to concentrate them enough, you 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 need to you need to concentrate these. You need to concentrate those things enough for them to collapse <coughs> even further into uh, mountain-sized objects, and that is uh, and that is the next slide. So sorry, yeah, this is the next slide that will go into that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, okay. we're on the next slide. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I, I, I think we also covered this before, but beyond the snow line, you have um, a lot more material, basically, right, to accrete around. So yeah, but it, it, I think mm -hmm. it's specifically saying that it's it's literally like collecting like frost. And also, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, when an atom actually hits it, it'll stick because it'll freeze, and that that is that is because I know. There is a question. Um, it's it's not entirely well understood, is my understanding. Um, how you go from sort of boulder sized things to sort of the, at some point it becomes difficult because the uh, collisions yes. are are have a tendency to destroy everything. But yes, before you just figure out. <laughs> Like, do but we know this would this would help explain that to me at least? Do we know how how massive or mass uh, it has to be before it starts going to the to a more spear shaped form? It depends upon the material, right? If if you have a fairly iron rich material that's very dense, its ability to deform is very different than if you have um uh gas yes. uh, right. yeah certainly, yeah certainly yeah i was go gonna ahead. say go, for turning spherical uh, they got i mean they have to be like decently chunky i think so is, uh yes yeah. yeah. the, 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 sorry if, if you want to say something like uh, mo, no, go, a go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead all right. This basically explains why the gas uh, gas giants are so big. Like each, like I've seen uh, one source that says <laughs> that each planet probably started out as a rocky core, but in the outer, uh, beyond the, the snow line, where you have a lot more gas and a lot more ice to accrete, they grow a lot faster. And when these uh, these rocky cores become about twenty times Earth masses then they have enough gravity to capture the hydrogen and helium basically and that's and that's all like at, at first this capture is a bit slow but when that but when they captured enough of this hydrogen and helium then they become more massive enough such that it becomes a snowball effect where they basically the, when the accretion becomes so fast that they will reach their current size in a few thousand years or so. Or so. Sure. Yeah. It also helps the fact that, that a lot of material in a in a uh, proto star proto planetary system um, is is hydrogen helium, right? Um, mm -hmm. Remember that when you know when the star the fuser starts switches on. And, and 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 the radiation better pushes out is going to be more effectively pushing out the hydrogen helium the lighter elements and the and the edge at which it be able to push out where the, that 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 pressure where, where it slows down is where you'll get a gas giant forming that gas giant has lots of mass available to it and so it's there although you'll see in this thing gas giants do have um, cores 
Um, and in the case of, of, of Jupiter, it's even more complex because the, some of the core is is weird stuff like metallic hydrogen and other things. But but there is yeah. rocky stuff in the in in the center of of, of these gas giants as well. Um, they just have rolls of vacuum up the most of the mass in a in a in a solar system which is hydrogen and helium. But yeah, you can so, see so, down there, there's yeah. metallic hydrogen and other weird stuff, and there's liquid helium down there and other weird things happening. Yeah, and I, and I believe metallic hydrogen is probably the reason why Jupiter and Saturn have like very powerful magnetic fields. It right. and out, as well as as well as the weird things happening with with uh, superfluid under high pressure helium and other things like that. Going mm -hmm. on. Let's That's move on to the next one. Uh, one last thing is that the the ice giants like Uranus and Neptune they captured uh like they basically lost the race to become giant basically but they captured uh, uh they become they have they are left with a, a disproportional amount of the other ices like ammonia and methane so they have a, a, sli a slightly different composition compared to saturn and, and jupiter and that's the final note on this slide yeah all right oh, this is basically the uh, slide that answers your question about like how do objects uh become uh like become more massive basically right uh they, they, they start to they start to migrate and accrete uh, more material as they move through the to the dust and then and that causes them to migrate around like i found this image or, the, or these images on a website run by uh Armitage. sean raymond i, I believe oh. sean raymond <laughs> okay uh yeah, this is this is um, so planets like Neptune and Uranus, um, I they probably didn't form quite as far out as as they are now uh, spotted. So they oh, had yeah. to sort of uh, migrate, and the planetary migration um, it it's a very it's a it's a very sort of rich topic, and it can actually go in a lot of different ways. Yeah, so let's move on to this one here. Talk about planetary migration. Yeah, so the basically the the core story of how planetary migration is happening is it's all about the exchange of angular momentum. Um, you have a a a body that is um, uh, interacting gravitationally with the dust and the gas all around it, and mm -hmm. as it as those and the, the thing about it is that all of that is in a Keplerian orbit and it's differential, which is why the the stuff that's going inside sort of passes it and gets slowed down and the planet ends up going faster um and it, it that can that can make it go inward or outward both the sort of type one migration which is what it happens when the planet is sort of a, a small perturbation on the disc that happens gen generally inward but it depends on the sort of density profile of of these disks yes yes when it and at that point the planet isn't really able to carve out a big gap like we we saw in the previous slide that you just sort of saw a little it was a little bit um brighter but it wasn't making a big like donut that we see in okay, those... can we go, can I go back go back one slide to, to, just to see those uh, those images yeah we can we can uh, ex we can explain the different types of migration the better that way yeah yes. so in type one um it generally it, it'll it's going to go in and it's it's but it's not able to clear out there's not a big clear donut um the mm -hmm. the darker areas are where it's less dense and the bright areas are where it's more dense and but as it as it gets larger um it transitions to type two mi migration and then it's really clearing all of that out and it's sort of like how how close and how far the um planet is from those those bands of gas that sort of define those edges yeah. and it's sending all of these spiral density waves out um this is a very similar type of physics to what uh causes certain types of um spiral density waves in in galaxies and you'll have multiple of these planets interacting with each other which eventually is going to um cause us also just like just straight up gra gravitational scattering um, off of each other. And in the transition from when it just 
from when it can't carve out a deep gap to when it is able to carve out a deep gap, deep gap, that's when it really accretes a lot of stuff. And it can actually migrate on the order of just like a thousand or 10,000 years. It can migrate dramatically, dramatically uh, and have the orbits change. Yeah. Let's move two slides ahead to this oh, also one here. Uh, Let's go to this one here. But in, in the previous slide, there's also the, the tag. I, I don't know if you want to cover the tag model or do you want to skip the tag model in the previous slide? I, I'm not familiar with it. So. Okay, can you go back one slide? Uh, I, uh, oh, no, 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 uh, that, 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 this one, yes. Uh, although the, the text is a bit warped, I apologize for that, but I found the, uh, the grand tag model which proposes that uh, Jupiter formed uh, uh, early, like early, uh, around uh, uh, 3.5 3 or Earth orbit away, and it migrated inwards. As you, as you said before, that type 1 migration is most often inwards. Mm -hmm. But when Saturn later catches up to Jupiter, then, they, then Jupiter and Saturn start to interact in such a way that both start to migrate outwards to the current position. And this is called the TAC model, where first... The, the giants went inward slightly, and then later they moved outward to the current position. All right. And this is the nice model, the nice model, not the nice, not the nice model, the nice <laughs> model. Or the nephew, no nephew model. Yeah. So yes, and that sort of talked about the fact that 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 Neptune and and Uranus switch places uh, given. Yeah. Yeah, like I believe, I believe this model was first proposed to explain the what's called the late heavy bombardment, like uh, about four billion years ago, like um, uh, half a billion years after the Earth formed, there was a late heavy bombar bombardment where a lot of impacts were happening on Earth, and this model was proposed to explain that event. But now, I think I believe now we think that this event was unrelated to the late heavy bombardment. I believe so. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're going to switch over and move over and talk about the what might have been the early Earth because Earth is one of those one of those uh, rocky uh, temples that that formed. And um, okay, we use this as a thing. So, so remember that, that there's a number of rocky planetesimals created within Earth's orbital zone. Early Earth was 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 probably largely in a molten state due to the heat generated from all those collisions, right? The, the, the merge is there. There's lots of, of, of heat that gets formed from the things hitting together. Um, and after most of the planetesimals in Earth's zone migrated, merged from Earth, Earth began to cool. A crust began to form. Um, and there are sort of final rounds of collisions that form larger craters. And cooling released large quantities of gas because things outgassing um and water that was trapped into the cooling rock right so, so it began to to create out there and then early super volcanoes further released that into gas and water vapor into the atmosphere that was gravitationally bound became you get you got it began to get a, a fairly thin atmosphere Aussie bodies continued to impact the earth stuff from outside that are migrating inward um, and, uh, so, so some of the water and, and the open question of how much, uh, was delivered to earth, um, from icy bodies farther out comets. Some of the water obviously formed in where earth formed, right? So earth had some water in it. Some other water was delivered to it. Um, and so the combination of the water delivering earth and the water that formed earth is what earth has today. Um, it, the, the oh, Earth continues to cool and the oceans begin to form. Mm -hmm. This is so, very, very, very early Earth. So this is what the geologists call the the Hadrian period, Hadrian period or eon. Oh, this is even before the Hadean. Like the Hadean was after the moon forming impact. This is, this is just before, like now we are still okay. before the moon forming impact. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so we're going to go over to here. Um, let me move on to this thing where, mm -hmm. um, so early on in earth, so in this early earth thing, the earth was impacted by a very large uh, planet called Thea. Um, 
the estimate of the mass is around 6,100 kilometers in diameter. It's about the mass, and it had it, it, about the mass of Mars. Um, the collision vaporized a lot of Earth and Theia. The, the energy of the collision caused a lot of the material to vaporize. Um, debris was ejected into space, but was still gravity bound because it wasn't going fast enough to basically achieve the Cape velocity and keep going. Debris accreted uh, to, to form. Certainly, the, a lot of material fell back into Earth, but some of it also began to accrete out in, in, at the next zone. Just like just like uh, planetary disks form, you had sort of disk a zone form around this this sort of molten Earth, um, and that's where the uh, moon began to form. Debate about whether it was a few million years or just a few years of, of forming the moon is is still being debated. There's different models that suggest one or the other. And Thea was the last object in our in our way till we get we are we are the dominant form in our orbit path. <laughs> I got like um, do, do we know whether Thea came from we, outside we, or inside? We don't know whether Thea was a planetesimal that that was late accreting or it was something that had elliptical orbits due to some because you know one plausible model is that when Jupiter and Saturn were doing their dance and and help causing Uranus and Neptune to shift. Um, there likely was some body out there that got tossed inward. Um, yeah, to, we also have to explain, I think, um, the the backwards rotation of, of Venus, for example. Because yes. in this entire process, um, generally speaking, there's a tendency to just keep sort of rotating in the same way. And yes. uh, as we mentioned, Venus actually does rotate Slightly the opposite, and I believe also uh, Uranus also has a very tilted axis, like on, almost on its side, basically, which is probably also due mm. to an impact event as well. Yeah, you, like you, in order for in order to change your angular momentum, you have to exchange it somehow, and impacts are the main mechanisms that's to do that. And I believe also the. Like in the beginning, uh, we, we can also discuss it later on. Is when the after the moon forming impact, the Earth rotated very fast, like about uh, one, one rotation. Yeah, but we're, we're getting we're getting hurt. Yeah. Henry yes. ahead of ourselves. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah. So yeah. so. Um, hold on a second. I'm getting I'm getting audio noise here. And I don't know where the audio stuff is coming from. Okay, did you did you open up the link? I think like you want to show the animation, right? So maybe that's the uh, that's the audio from the anime and uh, the animation that you want to show. Okay, all right. So um, let me do this. So sorry, this is a fairly obnoxious presentation process. Um, so what I need to do, because I can't, I can't participate and get this stuff under control at the same time. Um, so I've got you either got you have to keep talking and get ready to do a presentation or. I or just oh, we, we, we do have, we do have a question from the chat like could, could Thea have been a Kuiper belt object that got, got flung inwards like I'm not sure I my my gut feeling is no my gut that's, that's just my gut feeling because I oh you're you're muted mm -hmm. yeah I would yeah. say I would say that it probably wasn't but I it like it could be um it we don't know like the, e exactly what it was. We know more about its composition, I think, than we know about uh, um, where it where it came from. It just seems very plausible that it was another um, planet or planetesimal. Um, yeah, and in, 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 I, th I, th I think it's more probably the case that it would also be a, a, another rocky planetesimal in in the in the neighborhood of Mars, Venus, and Earth, probably right. Yeah. So, my so this so this side yeah. of the asteroid belt, not the other side. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know if there's enough. I don't know if there's enough ice for it to be. Um, like I don't know if Earth has enough water for it to be a 
very icy body. Yeah, it's uh, like if 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 it came from the Kuiper Belt, like Earth would have probably ended up with a lot more water. And, and Earth is very yeah. it's actually pretty dry compared to its own mass. Like it's, it's a very it's very small amount of water that Earth has compared to the total mass of of course. Yeah. Uh, now, thinking of the Kuiper Belt and stuff, is uh, currently is what we call the Oort cloud the border of our solar system the very edge yeah uh our understanding of uh the Oort cloud i think is is uh slim because it's very very hard to see things out there um it's yeah they're, they're small and very very dim um but you do like Gravita the gravitational influence of the sun extends to like it it is it can matter for dynamics of stuff um all the way to like you know a good chunk of the distance to another star like over a light year it's very you know it gets weaker and weaker but it does have some influence i think that the Oort cloud at its very sort of largest extent is pro might be even getting have tidal effects from from other stars and things like that but i don't know how well we actually know that the Oort cloud like as a collection of particles and dust i don't know how much we actually understand about it yeah it's it's less it's less we we know a lot less about it than there i want to show you some simulations can you, can you make that full screen? Uh, probably yes. Okay. So this is a simulation of of Thea Earth collision. A lot of vaporization and molten stuff occurs. This is a very, it's a very recent simulation. Yes. Um, and there's a blob that 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 merged back with the Earth and impacted, and another blob that hung around that's going to become um the yeah moon. It, it's a uh, like you mentioned before that uh, like uh, a few minutes ago you mentioned that earth the, the impact could have formed a, a, an accretion disk around the earth but this simulation probably showed that you have you have these blobs like two blobs and one blob went downwards and another blob uh uh, basically, when one blob went downwards, it, it gave the other blob a gravitational kick to stay in orbit, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Something like what we're seeing here, where essentially the, the drill yes. is come down and it forces the other material back out. Um, and this and this now we're at the time of the Hadrian. As I believe, I believe the. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Hadean is defined, the start of the Hadean is defined as the the impact. Okay. If I believe if I believe correctly, I'm not sure if the, if that is the official definition, but I pop uh, I I would guess it is. I think that th there are still some people who um like astrophysicists and, and astronomers and whatnot who aren't totally sold on the Theia impact. I don't personally get it. Um I think it has become very much a mainstream the 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 mainstream position, but uh, it it re it requires a lot of computer power <laughs> because you just kind of have to simulate the stuff because these systems are chaotic. Yeah. Do you so want us to keep share this thing here? I'll show you. I think another one. Um, this one is going to be less likely to be able to, to show it, but this is another thing showing you the edge on looking down from the top and you see the material that forms the thing splits, collides again, gives yeah. it to the other material. Um, yeah. that material as well begins to come in and material from it it creates in but the the resulting you know counter thing is it gets ejected back out yeah and this or this whole orbit does not look particularly kepelarian <laughs> because it's it's 
losing mass along that sort of filament that you saw. Yes, yes. Um, and, and it's and, probably necessary to keep it in orbit. But if it, if it wasn't losing mass, then it probably would just crash down again, basically. Yeah. Right? And, and this yeah. is this is if you look at here, the time is like two hours. This is three hours. This is four hours. Yeah. Uh, five hours with it with the first merger, and then when it comes back down in because uh, it has, has an elliptical orbit and begins to around our our 12 begins to pour material in that has a recoil and it kicks out at here we run hour 16 and this is like our 19 hour 20 one 22 three and, and then we're out to a day um so if you look at 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 i guess it's from the other set here um also i i have to correct myself i i checked and the hadean is actually defined as the oldest uh, rock that has been detected in meteorites so the hadean the start of the hadean actually preceded uh the impact of the moon and such, yeah. Yeah, I want to show you the 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 wide angle version of this of this thing simulation here. Okay, so let's see if this is the wide the wide orbit model, and here again you see Thea coming in. Um, the initial collision, a lot mm -hmm. of vaporization and molt stuff um material there's a larger blob that's going to come back into earth and, and, and that larger blob gives the smaller blob a gravitational assist and such that the yeah. smaller blob is able to keep uh, orbiting around yeah and there are geologists that that believe that they found that that larger blob that just merged is is evidence of that is seen in the earth structure internally that there's a there's a gravitational anomaly. Hmm. So, so the Earth, the proto Earth was smaller than the Earth now after before Thea came along, right? It got yeah. bigger. Uh, but but the Not mass too. of Thea is probably only about ten to fifteen percent. Okay. Yeah. Of Earth. So. Like a lot. I it, it you know it's the biggest thing that ever hit us, for sure. Probably. Um, because you can make the argument that it, you know it's still us, <laughs> but uh, the the moon uh, at, at the end of that whole process, the the moon was left in a much closer orbit than it is now. Yes, and the and the Earth is also rotating a lot faster than it is today. Yeah, but yes. but not close enough to as the creationists say, hit the heads of dinosaurs. Quote quote. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Oh my god! I, <laughs> I love the 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 ones who think that some scientists thought that the the asteroid came in and like li literally like decapitated these people. Oh. It's a very special thing. I'm having this click forward to the thing because there appears to be no way to move it to the proper spot. There it is. Okay. Or back to this thing. I'm not. Uh, yeah. I'm not impressed so, oh, with the the technology of yeah that we're using, very, but very it's what it, it what it is what it is. Um, I've I've a, cool. I've a question about like we like we can we know the angular momentum of the Earth and the Moon after the impact. Can, like I can we figure out uh, what's the most probable. Uh, direction the thea came from basically like can we like we can we figure out whether the thea came from outside earth's orbit or inside earth's orbit almost so certainly out. outside yeah yeah probably yeah that's almost yeah. certainly outside i it i think yeah that that's because it had to the earth moon system has anomalously high angular momentum um, yeah and, and that is way way better explained by a collision from outside sort of coming in. 
um, yeah. Yes. Um, and there's a nice, um, this is, this is a different style of stuff of, of in, in Wikipedia here that I think that, that shows essentially that it probably came, it could have had material that was sitting at what's called L4 uh. about, about 60 or L, L5, you know, 60 degrees, either forward or backwards from earth and due to perturbations of Venus, uh, cause that material to, to move towards Earth, so that, so that earth and Thea could have been orbiting mm -hmm. around a similar path. But Thea was stuff that's accreted either 60 degrees ahead of or behind Earth. And due to perturbations from Venus, that that body moved moved closer to where Earth was and he ended up getting a, a collision. Was there a higher low probability that this collision could have just shattered, shattered us instead of like merging? Oh yeah. I, th I think I think we, we we could have ended up as an asteroid belt, right? But it could, there's just one possibility of this if it was like a, a head-on collision. I don't know not. if that would. Yeah, I mean, I don't think so because I think it would eventually yeah. would accrete back yeah. there. Really? Can, 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 yeah. Can, it, it, it's not possible for them to just obliterate each other. Like, uh, maybe, not, I'm, maybe it, I'm just... not with the mass imbalance. The mass imbalance was probably on the like on the order of like six to one to ten to one. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not. So, so, so if if the if the collision was more head on, then we we were basically a super Earth without a moon, basically. Well, yeah. You might have you would still would have gotten a ejecta, I think. Uh, yeah. You might get more ejecta. It could be that the mass would end up smaller. I'm not. Yeah. I'm less sure about that. So this is a model showing where the object Thea came from L4, and due to perturbations of something like Venus, it could have essentially wandered in towards Earth. So you see there is. There it goes. Um, gets in close. So these are they're they're co moving around around the sun, right? So so you're hey, having... actually the, the 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 reference frame is fixed on Earth. So the Earth, yes. Earth is of course of course still moving. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so that's the Earth Moon forming there. So that's what we're talking about with that. That's that. So back to. I'll stop sharing. Um, so oh, do back have a question, to, do have a question. Yes. What was the, Thea theorized to be made of? I, I, I think if your if the model that you just showed is correct, then it will probably be similar composition as Earth, because it also is forming in this in the same neighborhood, probably. And even more similar to the Moon, since yeah, most I think I I. Actually, I don't know. Maybe the uh, the moon is formed out of a, a slurry that was like roughly 50-50. Um, I, yeah. I, 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 but if, if it is, is the moon not deplete in iron? Like uh, it, it does have iron, but lo a lot less iron, relatively speaking, compared to the Earth, right? I'm not sure. Um, I'm looking for material here. I'm also not sure about that. Um, Um, it, it, one of the d difficulties is it, uh, d despite how um, well we understand like gravity, um, we can't just play the movie back, like play all the planets going backwards and figure out everything that happened because it's a lot of different interactions and it, it's it's a very it, it's a chaotic system. The slightest imbalance in what you know now will eventually propagate to be a complete you don't even you don't you don't know what side of the sun the planet is on and so you can only calculate backward and forward um a a finite you know number of of years and it's enough to do things like predict solar eclipses but i don't think it's enough to do things like a, a predict solar eclipses in two million years oh yeah I, I looked it up, and it turns out that like the Earth has an iron core about, which is about fifty percent of Earth's total diameter, and the Moon's iron core is about twenty percent of the, its yeah. total diameter. So it's it's a, cool. a like uh, relatively speaking, Earth, uh, the Moon has a lot less iron compared. So to I have, I have, yeah. yes, I have in my notes that there. So 
So the Earth's moon is, is, is rich in silicates and poor in iron. Um, and much of the, the models suggest that much of the mantle of Earth's moon came, much of the moon came from Earth's mantle. Um, it certainly is affected by the collision of Thea. And that uh, it explains this, this, by the way, this explanation is also explaining things like, um, in fact, I think it's probably it, where are we, where are we back onto here? We've got to get, so it's so, very difficult so, for so, me so, to, oh, sorry. Go, to, sorry. To, to talk and try to find, okay. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, Earth, this collision explains things like the earth's current axial tilt and the five, you know, 23 and a half degree tilt from orbit, um, the moon's five degree, um, tilt from, from earth, you know, earth plane. Um, but it says that the, the moon was able to cool a lot faster after the collision, right? The rocky crust and craters formed soon afterwards. It was, it was, it, it was smaller. It didn't have as much, um, of the thermal collision. So it was able to, and so able to cool faster. A lot of the, the Maria, the, the, the plural of, of the, the, the dark patches of the moon were formed from some of the larger collisions early on in the moon's history. But, also, but the also moon didn't have see... enough mass to hold atmosphere and without a core, it didn't have a, a able to generate a magnetic dynamo. So mm -hmm. without, a, without that, there's, without that asset, there's no weathering on the moon like you do out here. And this is also a fun fact about the uh, um, Maria that, or that, that, that is, I, I believe that it's uh, uh, maybe uh, Latin for uh, seas of or oceans, which basically refers to the fact that the, the, the people once believed that these dark patches on the moon were oceans. Yeah. 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 But of, so, of course they are not oceans. <laughs> so uh, you know, early on with this, with with that molten vapor blob of the earth, of the earth, um, you had what's called differentiation, and it has a density material had a big influence on what settled, right? So you have this blob that's that's, that's, that's sloshing around from this um, enormous collision, um, and we have the center tends to have much more dense materials than than on on the surface. So, um, so there's lots of iron. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's actually iron. A iron's around around seven point nine grams per cubic centimeter, uh, whereas rock on average is around three. We talk about rock that's at surface, right? However, inside the Earth, the the the, the iron cores that get crushed at a much much a much bigger density. So, if you look at the density of material, iron's at seven point nine rock typically surface rock at around three waters at one and the sphere is like 0. 0.0012 so this this drives a lot of the structure on the earth from this molten system so we don't we no longer had this dust bunny that had a, a fairly uniform accretion of material from its orbital zone due to the melting and vaporization a lot of the heavier material sunk towards the center of the earth and that's a big factor in structure so today the the um, you know the the inner core is is solid, mostly iron, a little mm -hmm. bit of nickel. Um, the outer core is liquid around the outer core. Beyond that is a is a mantle that has that has that has some flow. It can it's sort of a plastic type type thing. Uh, top of that is a silicon. It's, it's, it's silly almost. Yeah. And then the uh, uh, and then. Um, uh, beyond that, so so the, the the magnetic field of the of of the Earth and and believe many planets are done by the fact that you have sort of these unpaired electrons in a in a liquid outer core that generates a magnetic field. That's that's one model. I don't know if there's other models. This is actually, other models. It's actually a question that I have about like yeah. you previously you mentioned that you mentioned that uh, like uh, after the impact of Theia, the moon, the material forming the moon came a, a lot of that material came from the earth's mantle so basically that but would suggest that the earth ended up with uh, a proportionally more iron compared to before the impact yes. so but, yeah yes. so it's a, it's a yeah. very interesting to think to to uh suggest uh how how this affected the earth like does does this extra iron means 
or explains why Earth has a magnetic field compared to Venus, because Venus yeah. is similar in size, but it doesn't have a magnetic field, or at least not as strong yeah. as Earth. Yeah. This may, this may be a more of a geo for question for geologists in a, for a future episode, but is there a reason why the, 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 the four layers of the Earth is like it is, the core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust? Is there a Which reason is, why? As I just explained, is this, this, this slide here is differentiation. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, also, it also depends on the temperature, like the, the, the crust. Uh, I, I believe the crust and the mantle is mostly the same material, but it, it just the crust is just solidified. That's mostly yeah. the, the, the difference, yeah. Although, it, yeah. Okay, but although I think also there yeah. is some differentiation yeah. even there because yeah. there's a difference between continental and oceanic crust, of course. But that's that's yeah. that's getting to be more mm -hmm. finer finer detail of of that. Um, for for um, Earth, but but again, um, a lot of stuff explains. You know, that we have explained a number of, of fairly important things, um, such as for example the axial tilt. Right, Earth's axis is tilted at twenty three and a half degrees. It's it's twenty three point four and change, but call it twenty three and a half degrees, um, and that in part is due to the whatever Thea did, the angular change of 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 angular rotation end up causing the earth earth to shift um uh, so, and, someone is and then, and then the asking... moons or inclination around earth is five degrees is also from that original set mm. so they can they can propose but but in terms of dense material if they had a core it was very large and it probably ended up merging with the earth um yeah. and the result is the the moon has doesn't have an iron core, so it, does, it never developed a magnetic dynamo around it. And as a result, if it even it, the, any kind of outgassing that occurred as the moon was cooling, the solar wind stripped it away because you need you need a magnetic bubble to help shield you from the solar wind of, yeah. of the planet. No, and also gravity gravity hold yeah. and a, Go ahead. And I also also the gravity to hold the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. But there was also someone in the, in the live chat who, well, who says uh, he, that he was under the impression that the moon and the earth had, had similar composition. But of course, there are some notable differences between the earth and the moon. Yeah. So they have similar composition in terms of their surface materials. And, and the earth's mantle and the moon share a similar composition. Um, but, but, but the Thea collision didn't deliver to the moon, that outer blob enough iron for it to build its own core and differentiate it's it's smaller so it cooled faster the moon smaller so it cooled faster it outgassed not having enough mass and then that gas didn't stick around very well and then the solar wind dries away the west red west of the thing resulting in the moon not having an atmosphere so you don't have the weathering that you do on on earth as an example that's why you know astronauts footprints on the surface of the moon will last for many millions of years because there's very little to disturb it disturb the surface um and, and also mention with regards to this thing um that that the moon itself um has is is also uh, became sort of so-called tidally locked that's a bad term but essentially um the asymmetry of, of the moon, it's it, the moon's orbit is about, orbits the Earth about once every 27 days and it spins around on its axis about when, once every 27 days. The result is it has one face always facing towards us. Um, it also is, it, it, but that's that process, there's a tidal force process going on, which not only creates tides <laughs> of the, of the uh, ocean, as well as, um, you know, the rocks have some flexibility. Uh, yeah, I, I but it also, also believe causes the moon to is causing the moon to migrate out at a rate of about once about. You know, it's about it's about it moves the moon's moving away from the Earth about the way rate that your fingernail grows. Now, um, I also believe the the moon is like asymmetrical when it comes to density. Like the the one facing us is probably uh, slightly more denser than the one facing away. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's part of how that process goes there. There's a whole, the complex process of getting quote, tightly locked unquote, which is not a lock, but it's tightly facing is a complex process. Eventually uh, the earth will also be tightly locked to the moon and one side of the earth will always face the moon. That will take yeah. a, lo a much longer time. I don't know if the sun will, will die before that. Um, I, I think the sun will probably disrupt the Earth before the Earth has a chance to really become have its it, day go down to one month. And the the rate at which that happens, um, uh, it 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 affects how fast the like the Earth the Earth rotates. It it, it it's like slowly slowing down, um, and but there the it's ve it's very chaotic how that happens. Um, for one thing, it would happen more slowly if you didn't have the oceans. Because the oceans sort of slosh around and kind of act as a drag mm -hmm. um, on on the Earth, slowing it down a little bit. Yeah, there's, there's also that I, I believe the position of the of the continents also have an effect on this yes. because of, the, of that of that reason. Like if the if you have uh, different com continental positions, then the tide of the, the tides of the water has a different effect on the moon as well. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And finally, you're the Earth the Earth is maintaining an atmosphere in part. Its atmosphere is mostly nitrogen uh, and, and oxygen. A bit of bit of argon would be sort of the third thing, and then traces of other stuff um, like water vapor. Uh, the very lightest gases, um, hydrogen, helium, actually escape into space. They 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 Earth is slowly losing hydrogen and helium, um, hydrogen gas and helium gas. Um, stuff yeah. is trapped into rocks. Stay tapped into rocks unless you go and crush a rock or disturb it or a volcano ejects it. Um, but but Earth's magnetic field helps minimize the ability of the, sun, the solar wind. If anyone saw the uh, impacting atmosphere, if anyone saw the, the big auroras like I did um, the other day, that's one of those cases where you can get extreme bursts from the sun that can begin to penetrate in um uh, to reach the upper atmosphere of the Earth. But normally, the Earth is able to shield um, us from the solar wind. Whereas Moon didn't have, didn't end up with a, a uh, uh, much of an iron core, did not develop much of a, a dynamo. Um, when, when, the rock, when, when rocks outgassed on the Moon, um, the Moon's lack of gravity allowed that gas to escape and the solar wind stripped it away that's not happened on them on there is the uh the the so the magnetic pole of earth is not aligned precisely with um the rotation Correct. pole and in fact, the, the whole, actual <laughs> yeah that the the, the, egg, the the orientation of the, of the domains in the in the diamond are, are 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 tend to be aligned with the rotation but are not not bound by that and they'll yeah. they'll flip back and forth yeah yeah they they tend to be aligned they're more stable but they do flip back and forth are they aligned at all in it in, in any noticeable way like with um like the orbit like does the do the magnetic fields tend to when they're not flipping tend to be more aligned like perpendicular mm, to no the, i mean the, it, if you talk about the orbit of the solar system in terms of what the sun is, because the sun is the dominant mass. Yeah. And so if you try to measure the sun's orbital, the sun's equator, you find that Earth is actually about, I think we're about three degrees off, if I recall correctly, from the sun's equator. Okay. We call it zero because we, we're, we're Earth-centric, and so we say that's the origin of the solar system. Yeah. Is our path, I, but from a mass point of view, Earth is about I think it's about three degrees off. Is that right? Is it three? I think so. Like I, I believe the reason why, or I would guess the reason why the Earth's magnetic field is almost ish aligned with the Earth's rotation is because of the Coriolis effect. Like when, like the the outer core. Is molten well, as you mentioned before. I mean, that, and it's, so, it's more yeah. stable there. It's not not yeah. Coriolis, but it's a more stable thing. It's not Coriolis. Is different. Okay, but, but if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, like the 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 iron core or the, like the the outer core of the iron core is convecting, 
And when it's when it's convex, it's it's affected by the Coriolis effect, and and that, and that probably is the reason why it aligns with the Earth's rotation, why the magnetic field aligns or tends to align okay. with the Earth's rotation, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, so that's the thing today. So um, so we've gone from these you know protostar systems with supernovae and other and 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 um, and neutron stars seeding them with heavier materials. We've seen shock waves often come from supernovae. It can also come from active galactic nuclei and, and other stars um, um, uh, switching on. They're going to get shock waves that crush things down. The angular momentum differentiates stuff. You got a star in the center and material on the outside that they create. They start with the little pebbles and they turn into um, platytesimals that accrete to form large planets. Um, in the case of Earth, um, what happened was that we, um, what's happening? Why, why is it switching? Oh, I okay. was doing that. Sorry, stop it, please. Um, so, so we're in a situation where we have a, I don't remember where it was going. Um, so there was a continue. supernova. There was a supernova that that um, uh, helped form the sun by by causing sort of a perturbation that led to this collapse, and that that happened as an estimated uh, four point eight to four point seven billion years ago. And then the process of actually forming a protostar uh, takes on the order of a couple hundred uh, million years. And the question of exactly, I think, when we, um, when do you define the solar system as now existing when it previously existed, didn't, did not exist, is I think uh, an ill-posed one. I think the, the closest answer might be like when fusion started, which I guess is probably, do we think that happened around 4.6? Yes, about 4.6 so billion. billion years ago. So, so and, and that process of, of collapse, um, the, the collapse process, was coming from the fact that um, you know we have two we have two distributions of of elements on Earth with the called bimodal. Uh, when supernovae's and tend to generate material, they tend to have a kind of a distribution of isotopes, and Earth um, seemed to have two different isotopes laid on top of it, which suggests that there was probably a supernovae that occurred around 4.8 billion years ago of a star exploding. That shockwave began to collapse the, the, the molecular cloud, the cloud of mostly hydrogen helium gas um, that of which the sun began to form. 100 million years later, that is 4.7 billion years ago, a second star went supernovae. And with, the, with that sort of protostar nodule like you saw in those, those other diagrams, being there, um, that was able to catch a lot more material, particularly a lot of the uh, stuff. So, so the first thing seeded lightly with material because a lot of that material passes through the gas clouds. The second one now being in protoplanetary form, nodule, caught a lot more material from the second supernova that occurred. It took about 100 million years for that um, result of of things to end up um, to end up generating enough fusion that the sun quote switched on, and about a half billion years later, there was enough material to form what you sort of call Earth, but it had a lot one last little hurrah where Thea hit it, yeah. and Earth Moon thing formed, and we end up with Earth Moon. Beautiful. So if you want to move to a different spot, go ahead now. You can. No, that's it. That was the end of the. That's the yeah. end. Oh, yeah, that's the. Uh, yeah, those those are just uh, uh, slides that we never used. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is last. This is the last slide. Yeah. Oh, I, I one thing I could mention, like uh, you you mentioned that the Earth has a magnetic field, which uh, slows down the escape of hydrogen and such in from, from the Earth's atmosphere. But there's an interesting thing about uh, Mars. Like Mars used to have water on its surface, which is pretty 
indicative from the features it has. That it is like uh, these uh, places where one, there were once waterfalls and such, and, and, and ocean basins and such. And what probably happened on Mars is that as it was blasted with the radiation from the sun, the water, H2O, was split into hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen escaped while the oxygen was left behind rusting the Mars red. And that's if why I could, Mars is if red. I can inject in, I think I inject in there. So, so the thing you're missing that's critical is that the mass of Mars is only about one tenth the Earth. Also, oh, so, so, so things like oxygen at even Mars cold temperature achieves achieves escape velocity, right? That 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 not only did, can Mars not hold on to its hydrogen, but it cannot hold on to its oxygen. Mm -hmm. And even even water molecules have, you know, their 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 ability to get split apart by what this ultraviolet light from the sun because because you don't have a you don't have a visual ozone layer you don't have a much of a magnetic yes. field on mars the result is that the oxygen leaves and so people that talk you know people that say oh we're going to terraform mars fail to realize the reason why mars doesn't yeah. have an atmosphere is it can't hold on to it the reason yeah, why I, I'm not, not I'm not have a that. nice yeah. a bunch of water in mars's atmosphere is that that it 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 can't hold on to it right so even if you were somehow able to magically create some nice oxygen uh water vapor around mars it'd only be temporary it would leak into space yeah, yeah. is there, is the there any way to blow it away instead of mars is there any way to cool down the atmosphere of venus <laughs> <laughs> big mirrors big mirrors in orbit around right. venus <laughs> anyways i have some questions in chat sure. i've been going back here's one question Read it so that, so that people that aren't watching can, can hear it. I've heard it suggested that Jupiter's large mass protects against more frequent destructive element events as from asteroids or otherwise things that could collide. Well, certainly, um, Jupiter is a big, you know, attractive gravitationally. A lot of objects can, can hit um, Jupiter and to some extent Saturn. Um, so they certainly are 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 a convenient target if you think about the mass of our solar system outside the sun i believe jupiter is around 78 percent of the mass that's not in the sun so it's a it's the big heavyweight and and mm -hmm. and therefore it can attract a lot more objects um on the other hand uh, jupiter can also throw things inward so it's not always nicely protecting us but it certainly is a big like target and like, like, it's a big gravitational observe. attractor like, did we observe an impact on Jupiter like many decades yes. ago? In fact, yeah. I, had, I had the privilege of watching that in a point meter, tele, eight meter telescope, and I actually saw the plume move outside, move beyond the edge of Jupiter because because the impact was just be, unfortunately just behind the, the 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 our our view view line. But Jupiter rotates quite fast, and so between the material ejecting out of, above. Jupiter's atmosphere and it rotating. I actually saw the plume um, move out. I've also questioned. Shoemaker about Levy like... Nine was the uh -huh. was the original uh, mm -hmm. object that got shredded tidally and then. Is that the, is that the one where people made a cult, the cult to die? Everyone died. I don't know. I, 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 and those those sort of things, I, I tend not to. Yeah, that's All that's right. someone else can can get that fact. I'm, I'm not interested. Right. Mm -hmm. So next question was. So does that mean it's too late for any of the plantismals to eventually grow big enough to clean up the Kuiper belt? Um, there's a lot. There's a lot less material flowing around there than it was at one time. Um, some of those things do accrete, but there isn't enough. There doesn't appear to be enough. And even the Kuiper belt, we're talking about the belt that sort of uh, the material that sort of ends at the inside the outside edge of, of, of Neptune's orbit where, where, where Pluto being a member it sort of skirts the inner part of it. Um, and there's not enough that the material is now thinned out a lot of a lot of our our dwarf planets have already created a lot of material um, but they're so scattered to be very difficult for them to accrete to yeah. form a, 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 I, a more significant planet. Like I would I would guess that like in order for it for this 
it to be cleaned up is you have like one object has to reach a critical mass in order for, for it to clean everything up basically. Yes. And if you do and you have to have time. Yes, also enough material and enough and then there has to be enough density of things that can that can accrete to that mass too. So I uh, see like two more questions I can find that it says what would happen if a supernova and gamma ray burst were to collide? So a gamma ray burst were to hit a supernovae. Um, I, I don't know that much of anything would happen. I, I'm trying to think of it, anything would, would really happen because the supernovae is going to be the dominant action, right? When the star is collapsing and it collapses very fast, right? Once it once it loses its its internal pressure, right? It starts using iron and it just it 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 collapses in a very fast. I mean, as in the outer the outer layers get to be some nodal fraction of the speed of light when they slam into the inside. And it's, it's, isn't it like a matter of, of minutes to seconds? It, yeah, it's very, it's very fast. I think it depends uh, on the, the details of, of which type of supernova. Yeah. But yeah, yeah they can go. And, and so a gamma ray burst is going to be a beam of gamma rays and the supernova is going to have start to happen fairly fast. And the gamma ray burst would just probably annoy the material. Um, yeah, yeah uh, but I mean, you're going to be getting a lot of gamma rays from the supernova. Like oh, true. The, the gamma ray bursts, the reason that they're still so like intense is because they're collimated. But I assume a supernova, like I, yeah. I would bet a lot of money that it's also just a very bright source, probably much brighter than the gamma ray burst. So and then the, the stuff it ejects out, like isn't it, isn't it um, nickel so for the radioactive decay? You got a material yeah. decaying and you're getting all kinds of gamma stuff going there. So supernovas can be bright in their gamma stuff as well. Yeah. All right. I think that's all the previous questions I, I can find in the chat that we that we missed yeah. answering I, during the thing. I also wanted to just say we don't know. I don't I don't believe we have a solid um firm understanding of, of what causes gamma ray burst. There's like a lot of options, but them and like fast radio they, bursts, they're not totally. They do tend to form the poles, right? Um, and, like, and, like, they, 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 yeah. eject, they eject from the, the North Pole and the South Pole from of the rotating star, right? They... But there's also gamma ray bursts that can be formed through other processes, potentially mm. so on magnetars and so forth. So it's an active area, slow and fast bursts. It's a totally active area research, which means we're learning. We don't know enough yet. But I, so wrapping this up real fast, uh, I just want to say if you if you have any more questions, uh, we we will be having a a, a after show on the twenty second of June twenty second again seven uh, nineteen hundred seven p.m. Eastern sixteen hundred four p.m. Pacific, and that's on June twenty second twenty second. And if I can get my uh, computer working, I am going to try to uh, download all these videos to make one big movie before that happens. So yeah, I have all this in one 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 big movie thing. But other than that, anything you guys want to advertise that you're get, coming up in the future? I I will be appearing tomorrow on Bad Science Sunday. It's going to be wonderful. That's going to be a fun fun thing. Um, the unnamed tavern is um is is uh on the 25th um and it's a it's a interesting show with dapper and manya and, and uh chesh and we talk about politics and and weird things of of the day uh i believe that's on may 25th and i think the time there is 15 30 pacific um there's also a volcano show. Um, uh, I run, we do a thing about once a month talking about what's happening with the uh, killer volcano. And that's going to be on June 7th. And the volcano show will start at 1 p.m. or 13 uh, Pacific time again on Chesh's channel. All right. Ness, anything on it? On, on I, uh, like I'm mostly active on Jackson Reed's channel. Uh, so whenever he is active, I. <laughs> Like I often join his live stream and I also uh, write uh, or help with scripts yeah. for his videos. So yeah, Go check uh, him out. As for so, me, 
uh, next week, I we we be going from realistic science to mythical science as we talk about the the MCU Thor movies. And then in two weeks, we will be talking about the only living di- only living dinosaurs, the theropods. Yeah. AKA um, birds. Yeah. So again, if you have questions uh for for us uh for the uh thing and you're let's say, let's say you're you're either shy or you you don't want to uh to, to yeah, you could submit it ahead of time by putting your questions in in the link below so he will check there for this thing for questions or you can show up live in the audience um there won't be really a presentation it'll just say hey we've had before earth from the from the early Big Bang up till now, um, so uh, please be ready to have your questions, and we'll we'll give you that. Uh, we'll give you the answers that we think might be plausible. Of course, you have any corrections as well. You can correct us. Uh, we have one last question: Why does we do have retractable claws? Quantum physics. Don't don't does Scooby Doo being a dog? Don't dogs have retractable claws? Or no, that... they don't. Dogs do not have retractable claws. That's oh, they don't. That's that's why it's that's oh, why okay. it's confusing. Why oh, it's shows why Scooby Doo. This is why I'm not a I'm not a uh, biologist. I'm not a uh, uh, in in cartoons. Every animal is a, is a cat, basically. <laughs> uh, one last thing, if there's any. So geolog- I learned something. Thank you very much. <laughs> one last thing, if there's any geologists oh, out there who want to, now that now the Earth is here, that want to continue this series post earth or pre or during earth for for an earth me series give me a call or or t- have them contact me so we can continue this series sure. since earth is here now but anyways all right well thank guys. you very much for for putting up with these five shows and all of our errors and hopefully you corrected things and you learned oh. something i did too which is dogs don't have retractable claws <laughs> so. oh, i i actually have i actually have a fu- fun <laughs> fact there is actually a transitional uh dog in the fossil record which has partially retractable claws because oh. that's, that's, that's an ancestral trait that that modern dogs lost anyway all right if you haven't subscribed to these three people yet do so always fun content and see them on other channels but until then never stop learning and enjoy the randomness we will bye. see you next time bye bye Everyone, thanks for watching our movie. If you'd like to support our channel, or I mean my channel, uh, you can do so via PayPal or Venmo down below, or buy something off of our Amazon wish list or our merch store. Or just hit that subscribe, like, and share, and click that bell button, click that bell icon too. Anybody can support the channel. I greatly appreciate it. I'll see you all next time. And remember, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. Bye.